morning, everyone. It is day number three on the road to the international playoffs. It is our final day here in the convention center in Seattle with this amazing crowd before we are going to be heading over to Climate Pledge. And before any of that happens, before we see anything else, I want to introduce my beautiful panel. Resolution, you're back with us. How are you feeling today? Pretty good, pretty good. I'm excited yeah. to watch some high quality Dota games today. Yeah. I'm happy to be part of your group again. Well, we're excited to have you back. As much as we love Purge, we also love you too, Reza. But T, how was your day yesterday and how are you looking forward to today? Oh, it's chill. Yesterday, we got to see that now is the best of NA. Who'd have thought? Who'd have thunk? And uh, yeah, now we get to see some Brazilian Dota, which uh, I've got some, some history with. So. Great day of Dota again. I don't know why I was knee slapping. I was going to say, so you're much. already yeah. knee slapping in the Dota. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There we go. And Sheep, of course, how are you today? I'm so hyped for the final day. <laughs> you want to see? You thought I was going to say, I was yeah, yeah. tired, but I ain't. I'm never tired of Dota 2. <laughs> And definitely not your South American teams either, right? Absolutely. No, I'm glad. I'm, I'm really hyped to watch this team, actually. Uh, especially given, like, the stuff they've been saying in the break day and how they wanted to improve. So, ooh, we'll see how it goes. We can talk about that later, though. That's uh, not any of our business right now because I do still want to have a little bit of a wrap-up about yesterday. Chat about it because maybe people weren't here. Maybe they weren't talking about it. But, Rezo, did you get to watch much uh, on your day off while you are in bed a little bit sick? Yeah, I was watching most of the games, actually, and I'm a bit upset that the Nine Pandas didn't show their best uh, Dota yesterday. Like, uh, I don't know, the two games were just kind of like stomps from the Gaming Gladiators. They found their, uh, you know, their drive, their strength, and they were just kind of bowling all around, and, like, they got the Bristol back, they got Primal Beast picks and those beefy guys, and the Nine Pandas didn't, like, really have a good answer against it. So they were just kind of, like, at 20 minutes, both games were kind of lost already for them. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say, I think for gaming at least, I just love the fact they did the first pick CK as well. A lot of these teams, like, bristle back and it's like, maybe they pick CK to counter us? And then we saw gaming go, wait, why not just pick the CK, which is the counter to bristle, and now you can't pick it yourself and we pick it later? Like, I don't know, it was a really fun creative draft from gaming and yeah, like Rezo said, Nine Pandas weren't ready and because they're not, they're now not here. Yeah, it is unfortunate seeing those uh, four teams yesterday go home. We've got four more going home today when the time does arise. But let's talk more about this meta, this chat that's happening, because I was looking at the highly contested heroes from group stages compared to the highly contested heroes here uh, at playoffs. Dark Willow is obviously rising a lot, and it is that flexibility, but let's talk about it more. Chip, I know you're a big advocate for Puzz 1. We've seen it succeed on Shiro. Not so much, though, in the two games that it was picked up yesterday. Okay, well, here's the thing. Pre-yesterday, I was very excited about the hero, because I saw it in pubs. Oh. And I was like, oh, this is cool. This is new. After seeing it, I hate it. I'm <laughs> sick of it. I don't want to see it ever again. This hero is unbelievably slow. The amount of time that these pros are farming on it, even Shiro, right, with his win, like, let's not big him up too much. I feel like his team was a very key part of why they won that game Everything while he else farmed, around it. and then he just kind of showed up. That was still a long game, by the way. Yeah, it was a long game. This is the problem. Every single Willow carry game is so long because she uh, defends the high ground so well mm -hmm. with the realm, but it's like this hero is worthless in the early game, it feels like, or at least the way that the pros are playing it. I'm, the games are going forever. I'm bored of it. I don't like it. Teams are losing. They are risking their tournament lives on the hero, and I do not think the trust is paying off. Yeah. I don't think the hero that doesn't deal like constant damage output because like she has the, the, the her, her downtimes is like that strong and people are figuring out how to counter it like with more panga picks and like you know ways to deal with it uh, outside of the realm. Yeah, I mean, it's a perfect example of the new TI format, right? Because they've had this break, you feel like you've got enough days to do it, but like teams like LGD, they've been playing this Willow probably for two, three weeks before they even got to the Road to International. And then other teams, they've got four days to understand why it's good, get it into their scrims where they maybe have, what, four, five scrims potentially across the course of a couple of days. And yeah, I feel like they are victim to the new format. And hopefully, like Sheep said, they put it to the side for now, unless, you know, you actually understand it. But I would be surprised if three, four days, these teams can fully get a grasp on this hero. Hey, there could be a team that we see later today that's able to grasp up a new concept in, in four days, but Reza, you were a little bit, you know, upset about the Nine Pandas showing. Did you have a highlight from yesterday at all, though? 
the highlight. Uh, it's, it's high. I mean, nine, uh, now it's winning the TSM, right? Mm -hmm. Getting on top of the NA region once again, like, uh, I mean, for the first time, because they were suffering such a long yeah. time, right, in that region. And I'm just, I'm just happy to see their road just keep continuing, because I believed in them from the group stages uh, uh, right away. And I think uh, they, have, they have more to prove, actually. I think they can go even further. All right, well, I thought we were going to be seeing the highlights of yesterday. We're not. We're going to be seeing something better. We're going to be seeing Tsunami's face as he is down with the crowd. Listen, I'll give you some language highlights, actually, because we are going to be watching some Brazilian Dota soon, and I was hoping to get a little bit of a, a language correspondence. My friend, introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Mateus. I am with Evil Genesis. Unfortunately, we were eliminated yesterday. But now I'm cheering for the Brazilian guys. And you are Brazilian yourself, right? Yeah, yeah, I am Brazilian. I have worked with this team, and I think they are in a great spot right now, and I hope they win. Okay, so evil geniuses may have fell, but Brazilian Dota will continue to reign, because it's been, a, it's been quite a while since Brazilian Dota has shown up at a TI. So well, how's, uh, how's it been in your home country for Dota for these, I guess, past five years now? Yeah, the last time Brazilian Dota was at TI was 2021. Uh, I actually was working with the guys that are playing there, but after, after some time, Dota in Brazil was kind of left aside because we didn't show good results and then but now I think they've got to a point where they can play equal with everyone here. And that's it. I hope they represent well Brazil. So far they're representing very well. So if I wanted to get the crowd excited, give me some Portuguese phrase that I should be uh, starting to practice for them. So I know, uh, get, let's just start it easy. What's a, what's a good morning? It's bom dia. Bom dia. Okay, okay. How about, uh, how about a good game? How do you say good game? Uh, bon jogo. Bon jogo? Bon, bon jogo. Bon jogo. Yes, yes, that's good, that's good. You, you have talent for Portuguese. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. How about, um, how about tell me, uh, Toronto, Tokyo, you suck, we're gonna beat you, TI winner means nothing to me, and Baboom's going down. How do you, how do, you do that in Portuguese? Toronto Toco, você é um lixo e vai perder e nós vamos ganhar. Vamos, caralho. <laughs> that one's kind of complicated, <laughs> but I think the crowd's into it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, then. I'm excited to watch the game. We got a whole series ahead of us, but before we get to that, let's go back to the panel. Thank you so much, Tsunami. I wish I knew Portuguese. I would have said good interview. Anyone know how to say that one? No. Can we, get, can, we, can we get the translator? Get him up, up here up real it, yeah. quick. Yeah. <laughs> well, look, we're going to have a little bit of time. Maybe we can give it a Google Translate to be able to see that one in Portuguese. And for now, we are going to see the top highlights of yesterday. We're going to get to relive those moments of nouns hitting top eight. Roll, catches, decides to go for crit instead of the willow. Now throwing out the damage, controlling on the Bryle. Oh, nice. He's the chief the whole second round. So much damage from that Willow. When left alone, can they do enough though? Abed Chase, do they have enough to kill him off in time? Trying to kill him? And yes, they do. TSM taking a lot of damage, dealing a lot of damage, and everybody ends up falling. Hunting, Saber Light, still has Stampede ready. Kasane pumps it, catches immediately. Ari throwing out the kisses. What damage do they have? The egg is already there. Tomato hits onto it, but now the man to the walk away. Stun is there. Can they get it in time? They do. Barely managing to bring it down. Oh. Says no sorry. TSM, they're tired of playing second fiddle. Is them being pushed to the limit here in game one? Now the rolling thunder. Here it comes. The initiation. What is EG going to be able to do about this? Their building is going to be hit. Just take the rag. Doesn't seem to be much they can do to stop it. Panda's going to jump in with the overgrow. Trying to slow this down with Glyph also being used. Terrorize trying to push him away with the BKBs. Gaming Gladiators committed to getting the Megas. But can they get out now? Z Smile makes the jump in. Not quite enough to finish off Tofu. But here comes Whisper. Looks to finish him off. A oh, no oh, oh. Sword bounce back. That's keeping Tofu alive. Well, Whisper is divine. Rapier is in trouble. And he gets bursted down by Durantio. Divine on the deck because now fighting to keep them in 
the game as evil geniuses are going to be limping along here. A massive network deficit. Vega, oh, see smile. Round two. And it's an opportunity to hack. Oh, the Hex doesn't save him. No. But God puts him down. The Whisper will fall for a second time. Three dead with no buybacks. Are they expecting the initiation, though? Will they be able to oh, react this, in this time? Sneaky way. Sneaky way. Uh oh, they don't have quit now. White team initiation comes in. The corner's here only catching the match. And the that's right in the overgrowth that's going to stop the damage, too. Oh, the Ravage will be able to fall. An absolute disaster for Gaming Gladiators and Evil Genius, which they will feast in this fight. Quinn is They're going to take away the Aegis. So Rachi is back in the play. And yeah, Quinn's back with the shield rune at that. Oh, it's Shell Grace. Just at the right time, he will be able to let They finish up the tree. But Durachio fighting for his life right now. Great Avalanche will be able to cover him up. But the Shallow Grace are just won't die. destroying. He will not die. Finally, because deals with him. But the damage is done. Durachio lives. White Monk getting gone on by the Brew. Not able to get his ult out quite yet. Continuing to get silenced. There's a lot of damage being applied to Moo. Is this going to be enough to actually take him out? Getting oh. to the other side and finally gets off his ult. And that is a lift onto the Brewmaster. As you can see, the kick in to Mato in a lot of trouble. Surrounded so pops his BKB. Trying to focus now on the Brewlings. None of them will die quite yet. Uses the Eclipse finally. Most of the focus now onto Yamsen, who actually gets away. And now the Song of Siren from K1, holding everybody in place. Looks like the Tramp is going to be the first to fall to Mato. Trying to focus down Mu again, who will somehow live the Sprout. Just continually be a thorn in the side of TSM, who have already lost two, including the likes of Bryle. Lots of close frames being applied to the Naga Siren. Gunner getting the double kill for now. Rolling onto Tomato. Lots of damage being applied. He's going to get the lockdown on him, and it likely will fall as well. A triple kill for Gunner. Being pursued onto the high ground into the enemy triangle. There's the first egg, I do believe, as Tomato trying to save Kasani, but just dies to the illusions. Tomato has kind of sustained his ground. Has to be really careful. This is the Divine Reaper we're talking about. The Shrimp's going to keep him alive. A little longer, but beautiful Kong. Tomato's dead. Divine Rapier on the deck. Who will pick it up as nouns knock out their NA brethren and TSM from TI? What a game. Nantares, he's getting surrounded. Rest in peace. Goodbye, my friend. Many pieces. And now yeah. this tower also. They've got the tree armor, at least to delay for a little bit, but the Chen's up here. Mid. He's got his ATOS done. He's looking for the setup, gets the dead shot pushback. So that had to drop the ult to try and hold back to Fu. Another little Another way to toy. Does get Key Attacker out of the combo. They'll settle for solo. Tofu and Ace running him down. Axe is there. Kiyotaka. The and Derecho. He's actually found Key Attacker over the tier two. Sweeps over from the <laughs> side of the map. Takes out the OD. It's getting pretty messy, this one. Just way down here, but they've, they're ready to fight. Oh, yeah. that is, they've got the four of them. Quinn, he's ready to start things off. Goes straight over towards Miro. They'll turn with the ult. They've got the soul by now. And the two of them silence as well. Double Double Doom will we'll be there. But is it going to be But Quinn's enough. perfectly fine. The super they're overcast. Fine. They can't hit the egg. They've got to run. They've got to split here, Nine Pandas. Key attacker, he doesn't make it away. Duracha takes it down. Miro turns with the TP, but he Stephanie died. finds it. And Quinn goes in, takes out Solo. He's out for good. Runs his drives to the top of the Lotus. He can't even finish and it off. himself. Quinn comes in with the grab. It's all over. GG is called. Gaming wow. Gladiators today completely crushing Nine Pandas. This wasn't even close today. With those four best of threes that happened yesterday, we do see our lower bracket filling out a little bit more. We did see Shopify Rebellion, TSM, EG, and Nine Pandas going home. But Nouns, Gaming Gladiators, they will come up against each other in that lower bracket round three, hitting top eight for themselves and of course it does leave the bottom half of that lower bracket for us to populate there as a yeah for sure i mean when i said nouns can go far in this tournament i forgot that they're gonna face today <laughs> <laughs> do you take it back Sorry, now you're just like <laughs> yeah, i'm not sure what's gonna tough. happen i mean considering also the previous games nouns they won like uh, two games which was like 50 and 60 minutes which like which meant that they're not really confident wins but they're like back and forth but for gaming later they just stomp completely nine pandas so they like they understand how to pressure well and like how to close up the game super well so uh, it's gonna be a tough one <laughs> for them yeah. for sure. I mean, even against EG, like, sure, the game went 69 minutes, it's pretty nice, but the fact that I think gaming, they had control the entire time. It was like their game, they had like 20k lead, they lose a fight, they wait again, another 20k comes into the bank, and then they win the game. So gaming right now, haven't dropped a game in lower bracket, that series is gonna be so incredibly tough, but NA crowd, 
in the climate pledge arena maybe knows so they get a little bit more energy maybe oh, yeah. maybe maybe uh, look i don't know how it's gonna affect them but they're definitely gonna have a massive crowd cheering for them that one i know for sure right now though we are gonna be heading it down to purge he's got some information on one of our first teams bet boom Thanks, Nat. Yeah, BetBoom is the team that I want to look at for this upcoming series. Uh, if you guys aren't aware of them, they are an Eastern European super team. They were formed at the last, uh, beginning of the last season, and they have most of the best players of the region on the same squad, including Toronto Tokyo, who won uh, TI with Team Spirit as their mid player. Now he's playing five. Uh, now, after they formed, their results were pretty disappointing. We had really high expectations for them because they would smash their online qualifiers, and then they would shift into the land portion, and they would often uh, underwhelm. Uh, but what they ended up doing was a roll swap between Nightfall and Pure. That's Pure here, that's Nightfall. They switched third uh, third position and one position. And after that, the results started meeting our expectations a lot better. They would go a lot farther in their runs at tournaments. Um, and once you get to a LAN, if you ask teams what teams they fear, BetBoom is almost always on that list because they are so, so talented. Um, and they had things going for them pretty good in this tournament as well. They got second place in their groups with the best result compared to other second place teams. They went seven and two, only losing to Team Liquid. Um, and after that, they did lose a close series of nine pandas, which is what got them here in the lower bracket. But here's some nice things going for them in the tournament so far. They've got the fourth shortest average game length out of all the teams. That means they are playing really, really fast, and they're going to adapt really well to those teams that are playing greedy and slow. Nightfall has the lowest deaths average per game out of any player at the tournament, 1.9 deaths, very small amount. And GPK joins him for the best KDAs of the entire tournament at second and third. These guys are seriously high skilled. And finally, things to watch for in the upcoming series. They played Night Stalker Carry two times already in group stage. They are set to run fast. Uh, speaking of which, Centaur is their most picked offlane hero here for Pure, but if that does get banned out, he's got a nice roster of other offlane heroes to pick. And finally, one of the best supports of the year was Techies. Techies, they're actually still picking it. Almost nobody else is, so you might even get to see that play here out at the road to the international. So with all that said, lots of high expectations for a bet boom. We'll see if they can live up to them. Thank you so much, Purge. A lot of information being put out there of their group stage, how they're ranking when it comes to other teams in those stats. But I do like the hero information uh, uh, with uh, the fact that they're playing at Night Stalker carry. I, I love Night Stalker. I think the hero is really interesting. The last time we saw it played as a carry was when Beastmaster was really prevalent in the meta, and it would be the answer. Like, you play Night Stalker, you get the shard, then you're able to just eat these ancient creeps and during the fights and stuff. Like, he would, had less uh, effect because of Night Stalker. And then he kind of fell off again. So anytime he comes back, I love him. I think he's a super fun hero. Uh, and it's been interesting to see how like players adapt the item and skill builds too, because I think I've seen some where they're not even like maxing Void. Like, use this max Void, use it to try and fight a bit, and then we saw some players like maxing the fear and the, the passive and just bombing it that way instead. A lot of options when it comes to, to Night Stalker if you are picking them up in this meta, but we've got some information about Bet Boom. It's only fair that we see who their opponent is. So let's look at today's schedule. Bet Boom are our first team coming up, and they're going to be versing Keed Stars. Yeah. That's going to be it, and that's going to be the first one. Tundra versus Entity. That's who I alluded to much earlier. Tundra being the team that maybe they could pick up a new strategy for themselves in that four days and know most of the ins and outs for it. And then they will be playing later today, so whoever wins our first series has Talon as their next opponent in the third series. And then Tundra Entity, one of those two, will be facing up against Virtus Pro. Two teams that fell from the upper bracket back on Friday. Almost lost the days of the week then. Yeah, what a day as well. I mean, I'm just thinking, first of all, we haven't seen Bet Boom Keed Stars ever occur in history. Like, this is the first time these teams are going to match up. Sure, the players might have had some games against each other. And also, Entity Tundra. Tundra just hasn't lost to Entity since Tour 2. So, this is going to be an uphill battle for Entity at least. And uh, yeah, we'll see how it works out. Which uh, matchup would you really like to see later down the track, Brezzo? I mean, I would love to see the Tundra, Tundra Entity because I think for this uh, specific time, I think they're kind of like equal in terms of skill. I don't think Tundra is like way too ahead because they're not really confident. They're not, they're not looking confident with the top zone yet. They, they haven't like found this cohesive, uh, you know, chemistry in their team yet.
<laughs> yeah. Whereas Entity, having that uh, small roster change, they're looking great for themselves here in the road to the international. But, but boom, we have a small video on them. We're going to find out more information about this team. After clinching the title at TI-10, Toronto, Tokyo and Team Spirit faced some turbulence, bowing out early in the TI-11 playoffs. Seeking a fresh start and another shot at the Aegis, Toronto, Tokyo made his move to Bet Boom. It was, I think, after TI. I needed to think, because my goal is to win TI one more. I, I want to become a legend player, like maybe Papi is. So that's, uh, that's my, uh, that motivates me. When I think what's the biggest chance of the success, it will be if I switch roles and go to this team. I was thinking like, that I could be good at any role in Dota. The most important part was that I should enjoy this role. That is a lot of stuff on post fives that I didn't think of. Now, even if I will back on meet or on any other role, I feel like I understand Dota even more. So it helped me a lot. When I look back at these three years, what I can say is that I learned so much, not as even as a player, but as a teammate, as a human. Players are together for a long time. Really hard to live like this if you are not trying to be a good teammate. They are also the part of success. They cannot ignore them. If you ignore this and like blame your teammate or make him feel uncomfortable, it will affect your results. I'm really proud of this team and I believe we can do it. I love the confidence Toronto Tokyo is talking about at the end that he really believes in this vet boot team and uh, talks about being a good teammate, how much of an effect that that has, how important it is now for a roster for the five stack that you guys are. And Keith Stars, the five Brazilian team teams? Five Brazilian players. Wow, that's a lot of players. Looking well into the future there. There are five Brazilian players, so I'm sure they all get along really well too. Yeah, and also for Brazilian Dodo, it's been such a rough kind of showing, right? In 2021, you had SG, they got to rock up as a national team. But for me, it goes back all the way to like 2019. That was the era of Brazilian Dota. You had Pain Gaming, you had KLC Esports with majority Brazil. And then it just faded away. It's, we had so many years now where we haven't seen them. And for Keyed Stars, when you see the amount of days since their last tier one performance and showing, like King RD, for example, 1600 days, KJ, 742, like the numbers speak for themselves. They haven't had that international tier one experience for a nation that was so powerful years ago. And now they get to be here as a full Brazilian team. It's like, it's great for the, the nation, great for the Brazil scene. And, I would love for them to do well, but like we were said, they're up against Bet Boom. Mm. It is going to be quite the challenge for them. Imagine the passion you need to have for the game to keep on trying after 1,629 days. <laughs> we did the, you did the maths, trying. didn't you, Rezo, huh? of how long that is? You did the maths. It's like four years or something. Yeah, yeah it's, it's incredible like, just to, to see these players come back and play at the, mm -hmm. you know, at the biggest stage uh, here in TI, uh, road to TI. <laughs> there you go. I know you're a big uh, South American fan. She we got all the information on Kid Star, so give me some more of your thoughts. Of course, can't wait to share. This is what she's been waiting for. No, I mean, I, I love reading interviews, and K, uh, King Adi, he talks a lot, which is really interesting. I mean, obviously, first of all, he's like 31 years old, so he's representing the, the older Doha players, and he talked on that, um, saying that it's kind of interesting how Doha is like so mechanically advanced now, where everyone's got faster reaction times. And he's like, but, I think experience is still so valuable, you know? He's like, I really pride myself on my map movements and decision making. Um, I do think it's an interesting dynamic, though, because he talked about how, like, Brazilian Dota, you have the old players that stuck together for so long. Like, I, I was following, like, Wolf Team and stuff because I really like Tavo, for example. Yeah. And uh, that he spoke on how finally, after all this time, they don't really want to stick together anymore. It's been years and years and years, and now he's playing with three younger players, and he's just talking about the enthusiasm and excitement. Like, he comes to this TI every single day. They want to play Dota. They want to, like, uh, watch replays. They just want to talk and talk and talk. And he's like, Jesus Christ, like, I have these kids, man. Like, I, can't, I can't keep up <laughs> with It's almost like a dad just trying to keep yeah. up with these kids that are wanting to constantly be playing Dota. Yeah, legit. He's actually just like, I... I'm feeling like the age a bit where he's not as passionate, but he feels that like the younger 
kid's passion. And he's like, you know, one more year. But he's been saying that for years at this point. But, but I think it's important, it. right, to, to have that balance in your team because you can't have like five young players because yeah. they're going to come to Lens and then get, they don't have like this dad that, you know, that has their backs and they don't like have this uh, freedom of like showing because they, they know they're, they're protected. And at the same time, you can have this like, you know, five old players that are not like really passionate. They're like just showing up to work and like, ah, all right, let's play this cream, <laughs> guys. <laughs> no, you, you got to have that balance in your yeah. team. Yeah, also for them, at least the, in South America, that there aren't these like powerhouse coaches. Mm -hmm. So then you kind of need that experience to come from the player. So for this roster, like King Adi, he's kind of stepping up to be the shot caller while still being the pos four with yeah. all the, the experience and stuff. And it is kind of a position of the region, at least. And yeah, I think so far for them, it has worked out. They're still in the road to the international. Yeah, and they could keep going for a little bit longer. They have the chance for themselves today. We're going to find out more information. It is a video keyed stars. Vivo Keed Star's journey this year has been one of grit and determination. Mid-season, they faced the setback of dropping to Division 2, but they fought their way back, securing the premier invite from the SA qualifier and sealing their spot at the International. The first two weeks, like, we lost everything. <laughs> so sometimes we're going to play, like, really good in, like, one day. And the next week, like, OK, something happened in the house because we're living together for too many time. Right now, it's feeling really good because we have, like, three people who really young. KJ, Analog, and FCR. So I'm really the old guy of this team. I don't want to play anymore. <laughs> I mean, man, man. I have like ha um, the white has like in my beard, in my hair. So it's like I feel like really old. We're playing video games like for all day. So it's kind of okay, man. Let's go play another year. The bad thing about me right now in my age, I don't like to play more pubs. That's the bad thing for me right now because I'm really old and everyone's like, okay, you need to do that, you need to do that, okay, keep it playing. It's like, man, I just went to chill, watch some game. I mean, I, I just play like with my fucking legs in the table. Just like, okay, it's just more on pub. Four years ago, we have a lot of teams from Brazil right now. We only have two in the deep sea. So we need like new young players because another another region in Dota 2 have a lot of young players. I think this is really good for us right now, which is five Brazilian players, the organization for Brazil 2, is because we're gonna show everyone like, okay guys, if you want to come to play Dota 2, you can do it. You aren't wrong, Sheep. He does <laughs> love the whole King RD there, especially of Vaddy's age. He's like, I got white hairs in the beard, in the hair. Let me tell you, I'm not sure I can keep up with everyone that's constantly wanting to play there. He's like, I'll watch that. I'll watch. One more pub, <laughs> I'll do it. <laughs> Have you ever felt that, Rizzo, where you're just like, oh, I guess one more I can squeeze in? No, I didn't. I mean, if you're super tired and you play 15 yeah. games a day, yeah, sure, yeah. then you can have that. But I love how honest he is. He's like, he's, yeah. just, he's just putting it out there. I, I love this guy, honestly. Have we ever heard a player do that type of interview before they're about to play for their potential TI lives? Like, you know, they're two series away from getting to TI, and he's like, ah, I just don't want to play. You know, I'm just here because I have to be here because there's no one better than me. Look, I will say, I do think that it was recorded recorded not in the off days, that piece. Yeah, it was, mm. I think it was before. It was earlier, time. before groups even started. But That's what he was feeling. It's still this before year? He, yeah, it was still this year. I love it. When? I do enjoy the honesty. <laughs> Let's compare our two teams, though. We've talked about them separately. We've had our information on Bet Boom. We probably haven't covered it all. We've had our information on Akeed Stars as well. So here they are. This is their record so far in the road to the international, their group stages, their seeding matches as well, and how they fared against those upper brackets it matches there is a big big difference in the average win time there oh wow yeah yeah I mean, I feel like for Keystars, at least, they're the ones who are struggling. They got the 30% win rate in the groups. They naturally, because they're having more losses, they'll have more deaths. The wins that they have, I think they are a team that is struggling to go up against some of the bigger names that we have in the tournament. So the wins that they do get, it is going to be a, a win through time rather than that perfect execution of 30 minutes. Whilst, of course, Bet Boom, we've spoke their praises for so long now. Yeah, I remember reading, though, that I believe it was Pure gets impatient 
if mm. in the games I did read this too. Yes. So if they are able to take it to 50 minutes, they, they self-admitted they lose games because Pure gets impatient. So you have to play on that weakness mm -hmm. and take the game as long as possible. You reckon that's the strat? We go for our average game time that we've been winning on. We, we know the formula. We stole the game out and we just wait for Bet Boom mm -hmm. to become a little impatient. Late game Dota is a whole different thing. Just play like game. nouns. They're simple. What did they do yesterday? They picked Nago, they picked Brewmaster. Skip wave, skip wave, skip wave. Brewmaster split, hit tower. Copy them and maybe you can do it. Oh, I just like the horn every time. <laughs> Me too, I get excited for it as well. The horn does obviously mean that our day is about to begin. We are getting ready and underway for our four best of threes to begin to see four more teams eliminated out of the road to the international. Let's get our day number three started. It is a beacon, sounding a call to greatness that echoes worldwide. A crucible, forging a single contender worthy of rising above the very best. And a celebration, gathering a community of millions to witness history unfold. It is the International, the final proving ground where the world's finest Dota teams assemble to face each other in the ultimate test. Each challenger has earned this honor through hard-fought victories in matchups around the globe. The journey has tested some more than others, but the favorites and underdogs all know the road to the Aegis defies all prediction. And anyone can carve a new legacy here. The Aegis of Champions returns to Seattle, and with it the eyes of the world. Twelve teams compete for ultimate glory. Only one can seize immortality. Who will emerge victorious? The battle begins. This is the last hurdle for so many teams. We have our top 12. We have to get down to our top eight in the road to the international before we do get to TI next weekend. And we got two teams, Bet Boom, you know, a team playing for expectations and Keith Stars playing for the generation future of Brazil. Well, let's welcome them out. Let's get our first team out here to the stage. incredibly skilled Eastern European team isn't unfamiliar with elimination with lower bracket they're going to be able to do it but their opponents also need to come to the stage tell this best of three is the first of a couple stages for them shape oh my god if they can beat bet boom this is insane like that would be the most hype result this today by far i think i i'm so jazzed for them i want them to do so well especially now that we've lost eg 
Yeah, yeah, SA region came in. They had four teams representing them. We're down to Vivo, Keat Stars. They're coming up against Betboom. It's a difficult one, but it's not an impossible task. Rezo, I haven't even mentioned this yet, but you stood in for Betboom earlier this year. Okay, I, I was waiting for this moment to pick your brain a little bit more. It was that Berlin major for you. Obviously, you got to... Twice. I did it twice. You did it twice. Berlin major and Bali major as well. Of course, I forgot about the Bali yeah. major. Yeah. I mean, I can tell you all about this team. What do you oh. want to know? <laughs> what, whatever you're willing to share in the time that we have. I mean, I think, uh, I think KD have a, a pretty good chance of winning just because purely like the bad boom, they tend to underestimate their opponents. Like, they tend to do it. <laughs> so okay. this is one thing they can be, you know, hoping for for this series. And as long as they drag the game and Pure gets tired, like, easy peasy. When you say underestimate, do you mean in regards to the prep that they bring to the series? Or do you mean in-game, where they might make calls that are a little bit more relaxed and more maybe pub-like compared to, you know, I the Rose International? The yeah, it's the state of, like, uh, we got this, guys. Like, mm. we, we're going to win this, like, any, like, anyways, you know? Sure. So this is the feeling they go to the game sometimes. I'm not, I'm not sure it's going to happen this time. But sometimes they do that, and because of that, they, I mean, we, we lost the group stage in the Berlin Major because of that. We underestimated one team. It was like from, uh, what is it, South America or like uh, SCA? I don't remember the, the, the each team exactly, but they were like the bottom of the group. They lost all their matches, mm -hmm. but we lost to them 2 0. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, because of that, we couldn't really foresee the group stages. So um, I, I'm, I'm wondering how, like, how today they're going to prepare for this, and maybe they learn from that mistake, right? And they, like, they're going to respect their opponents very well. Yeah, that would be a really big learning lesson for themselves. Um, the thing that always confuses me is the pure and nightfall, right? Pause one, pause three, there was a moment. Nightfall was pause three, obviously, last year. Yeah. Comes back, swaps to pause one. Pure was pause one last year, changes to pause three. Like, we talked about the Night Stalker carry. Obviously, they're both used to having off-lane heroes for themselves, but is there ever any realm in which they've had this discussion, whether you were part of it or if you even think it's possible, of them changing that up, maybe seeing them playing different roles in different lanes or really try and stick to what you already have and it's just easy to prepare for that? I mean, I think, uh, I think Night, Nightfall, just at one point, he just realized that he wants to be a carry player and uh, they kind of like, they were like they were the core, the team, him and Safe, and they kind of make uh, this uh, make this decision. And Pure had to like uh, understand whether he want to be the part of the team and switch to three, or just leave the team. They're gonna like find a, an, another position three uh, player. Uh, but it's been working very well for them. I think his transition was very, very smooth, and uh, he's been playing exceptionally well on the position three as well. And sometimes they they do switch a little bit, but not towards the Pure as a as a carry, but towards the GPK as mid, because he was be he was playing the monkey him more and more mm -hmm. on this tournament and uh, they they have this you know pretty aggressive drafts where where Night Stalker, Monkey King, and I'm saying some, some yeah. Tide Hunter would like appear and they'll just be super aggressive. Yeah. I think that's the key thing for Bad Boom, right? Because you have your one and three who have experience in the inverted roles, you then have this draft where maybe you don't need to go traditional carry, you can get those two kind of semi off lane style heroes and then you activate your mid to be a little bit greedy as well. And I think they're in a perfect balance of the team of control. It is kind of like crazy though to see um, Nightfall like playing any kind of like semi carry sort of like playmaky thing because we saw on the stats earlier, right? He has the lowest death count of any player in the tournament. He plays so carefully. He even he, he thinks by himself, it's his philosophy of like, do He thinks if he makes a few mistakes, very few mistakes, and rarely dies, they'll just win the game. It's like, Rarely will there be a disadvantage to just playing incredibly safely. And I don't know, I feel like that could potentially be exploited. We've seen people talk about South American teams even, like, their chaoticness catches us by surprise, and then we just <laughs> lose because we don't know what's going on. I think if you can disrupt that, like, stable way of playing that they want to do, then that's a way to take victory. That is something I've grown to really love and enjoy about the South American region over the past year is that potential chaotic aspect with Viva Kids Stars. Where does it come from most? Is it a side lane? Is it going to be in mid? Where's going to be that gotcha for them, Sheep? Honestly, I'm actually not sure what they're going to bring in this match because in the group stage, they had a set way of playing that they liked and they tried it. Like, for example, Tusk, they centered a lot of their strategies around playing around that hero. And then they went 0-4 with it. <laughs> and they said, okay, well, I don't know where, what happened, but like this patch that came out but just before the event started really ruined their strategies. So they've had to refocus and align things and bring in new ideas in this break just before they're playing now. 
Um, but since and then, we've seen Tusk come back into the playoffs, right? Other teams are winning with it. So hopefully, mm -hmm. maybe they can pull that strap back in and go back to their comfort, and we'll see that come out. I just saw FCR yeah. demoing Magnus there for a second. Magnus? Maybe Magnus could be the hero. Of you didn't think it wasn't just a random click? I mean, he had Underlord to start with, and I was like, that is not a hero you warm up with. You're not going to like, OK, this is my elimination game. Let me practice my Firestorms. No. Where do I put my portal? Ooh, you know? So I think Magnus, uh, maybe. He just getting some spoilers there, potentially. I, I know they like to play fast on, on Keyed, but they realize that the games are going later now, and they want to try and play for that. So it's kind of weird. You're like clashing what you want to do versus what you think is good. I just hope that they're not going to pick Furion, because the last time I saw they're playing Furion, and they, he was maxing trains. No. Oh, oh, no. AJ, no. <laughs> this is not how you do that. He was on demo mode as well, by the way, with Profit. With Profit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. It's, it's been days, Rezo. It's been days since we've seen them play last. You know, maybe there's been that change you that adjustment. You think he learned? Think he learned? You could the probably run, one. run that's down a lot, there that's right now. a lot of information for four days. <laughs> but maybe that's, maybe that's like their ideas, right? They're like, okay, everyone's maxing Sprout, but who cares, yeah. right? We're gonna take the tree ants. We're gonna try and push, and we're trying to go fast. And my, maybe now he's like, okay, this was not the play. This was not correct. We're gonna slow it down. I thought I had an way. idea. It didn't work yeah. out. There's also that disconnect that we saw. Their winning average time was what was it, 50? Plus, 50 plus, 52 yeah. minutes, right? So the fact that they're talking about we want to play fast paced, it's like, okay, why isn't the fast paced working out for you? Why are these games having to be dragged on for so long for you to win? I mean, because if you're in the wrong place at the right, uh, wrong time, not right time, wrong place <laughs> at the wrong time, and you're making these like slightly incorrect moves, you're not reading the map as well, sure, you might have an aggressive draft, but if, if you don't get the kills and it doesn't translate to the mid game, you are going to get out farm. So I think for King RD, yes, he's been playing, you've mentioned the task being 0 4. This is a hero that he's been playing for years. It is like his number one hero. So clearly, in the interview where he's saying he's not playing pubs as much, etc, etc, now he's picking Tusk, didn't work out. I think for King ID at least, he needs to enter this series with confidence in a couple heroes that can allow him to play the map, to punish the lanes, to get his team to want to take the fight early. So I think if they can start, you know, progressing the game, force Bet Boom to have to think a little bit more than they maybe expect to in this series, mm -hmm. that's when we might get a close one. I'm trying to think about uh, Bet Boom, if they're, what they're going to be prepared for, what they're going to really want to do, and if we are going to have very chaotic skirmishing games, who does get favored in that? I know it's still very draft dependent, but <laughs> who can execute team fights that we've seen so far in the road to the international out of the two? I don't think Bet Boom will give them chaotic game. Even if Keed maybe I don't know what Keed will do. They said they, try, they understand the meta more now after losing to LGD, so I think they might adjust here. But I, every time I've watched Bet Boom play, they are so reserved. Like, they try so little to like, engage in like, stupid team fights. Yeah, they're a very disciplined team, to be honest. Like, they have this uh, thing going on for them that... Uh... Yeah. Sorry to cut you off, Orezo. Our draft is going to be coming up. So let's get game one started. It's turn to bad. <laughs> Vivo Keed Stars versus Bet Boom Team. Game one. Now we have the time, Arezzo. You can give yeah. us all the information about their discipline. So they're very disciplined and they, they like to draft in a way where they set up like four to five heroes for each role, for each player, and they're like kind of like drafting around those heroes and rarely going outside of the marked heroes. Yeah, they have uh, one of the smaller versatilities of all the teams here, so it kind of does reflect that point. And I feel like for Bet Boom, I would expect them to go for the Kunker, the, the very reactionary style of draft. Allow Key Stars to cross the river and be like, you know what, come fight us. But they'll just always have this counterplay, they'll punish, and then they'll just play from there. I feel like, yeah, quite a farm intense style from Bet Boom is probably going to be the big key to beating this team. And Nightfall is a player, he kind of reflects me in my, uh, you know, back DC years where he would, he just want to play like perfect game, you know, this perfect KDA rarely dies because he thinks in that way, you know, his team can rely on him and he's going to carry the game for them. But if he does make mistakes, like this is his strength and this is his weakness as well, because in the games where you are kind of like pressured against the wall, you're going to need to make those, you know, risky decisions to turn the game out. But he's not going to do that because of, you know, that fear of dying. Do you think he selected himself for fantasy? Is that why as well? He wants to get better points? <laughs> no. Okay. He just, he just a perfect, uh, what is it called? Uh, a perfectionist? Yeah, perfectionist, yeah. Perfectionist, yeah. 
Draft bands here we do see on the screen. Nothing too out of the question. Maybe the Lone Druid is the only one that pulls my eye. Everything else feels very in meta, uh, feels very safe to ban, and, and feels very straightforward. But that Lone Druid, I thought it was going to be extremely popular in the off lane, this meta coming to Road to the International. They've not got it a single time so far in the tournament. It has been banned every single game against them. Really? So yeah, a lot of respect towards the, uh, the key star to Lone Druid. I mean, it's like you got it one time, right? I think. Sure, I meant Keith yeah, Stars yeah. have never got it. No, I, yeah, no. I just mean, I think it, within these two teams, she was the one that hasn't mm -hmm. ended up playing at this tournament. Ten seconds remaining. The Bristol was still in the pool, and I'm surprised that Tree was that first pick for that bit. Yeah, me too. I think Bristolberg should be like the very first pick, if anything. <laughs> Like, I don't think that Hero has a lot of counter picks, to, it, to be honest. Like, you can always have your game, like, no matter what. And if you play, like, if you trust around uh, around it well, like uh, Gaming Glider showed in the previous series, like, you just get this strong ball lineup where you can push the towers. It's just, like, that sentence. We've also seen in the playoffs, like, people, uh, teams trying to pick, say, Viper, and it's like, oh, cool, we now have the break. But the issue there is the bristle kills you so quickly that even, yes, you're standing in the break, but it doesn't matter. We don't, can't pump out the damage as you're kind of pumping so you out yourself. You can just say it. It was Lol and Team Spirit in game one, and it didn't look very good on Friday. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Yeah, sure. We can call him out. You mispicked Spirit, but they still won the series. So I guess, yeah, true. They're in exactly, the up bracket. You we can, yeah, they're you, you, should, you should be saying it. You know, they had that idea. No, team Failed in the, miserably. I was going to say, a team in the upper bracket had that idea. We didn't see it work out, and that's okay. That's probably why other people now aren't seeing it as that counter, as that strategy towards Bristleback. <laughs> I think the A ban is gonna follow up here to protect the Bristol back. It's the Five. only hero that I can think of, like, you know, doing some damage to him. No, they don't care. So they go for the damage over time type situation. You dilate the Bristol, you stuff him from quilling. It's one of the counters, it's not the most, like, punchy counter, but it's one there. Of course, CK already being banned out by Keystars is the number one response to Bristol back right now. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think heroes like Axe and Legion Commander are also good, just because you can turn him in the way you want to, you know, you want to kill him. But people are not really valued those heroes very well because they don't have like very big damage output. Oh, wow! They're just getting the core of the strategy out right out. Of the <laughs> like this is what we want. There's no secrecy here for sure. This is my bristles, my offlay, my Luna is my carry, and we're not worried it. about counter picks over here on on Keed Stars. I. I, I'll be honest, I just didn't expect this type of drafting coming into a, to a game. And what Keystars is saying is, if we show our hand so early, we're showing heroes that are very prevalent right now, right? Like Luna with her shard, super think, tanky, yeah. take the damage, and now you go for a Terra Blade. I, I just wanted response. to mention Terra Blade right yeah. away. It's, uh, it's the best hero I can pick here, this spot. Maybe Avenge. It's not the worst, though. We have seen this matchup where it was in the Liquid game where Luna when isolated, just kind of gets wrecked by TV. Ten but there's also situations where you have the damage reduction with your shard, yeah. scard, you are able to BKB to not feel the effects of like a scardy, and then you can have your satanic and still fight. Uh, I think the worst moments for the TB in that game was when there were two heroes standing together and Luna could life steal off someone that wasn't TB, because obviously like, you. TB has so much armor, it's so hard to, to do damage there. So if, if they can isolate Luna in these fights, it, it's a fine matchup, but it's not like completely one-sided. I'd say Luna still stands a chance. No, I agree. Before we got into this, I was mentioning how Bet Boom needs to play a little bit more defensive, I feel. Allow Keed Stars to play the map and just punish them on just the potential better understanding that they've had, because of course Bet Boom, more international experience. And their draft's kind of doing that now. You've got Trim Protector to delay the game, Terrorblade Illusions to delay the game. You have an Illuminate as well. Like, Keith Stars, you expect this lineup to do well early on. You expect them to ball up, get the first Roshan, and to try and get the tier two, tier threes. It's the second Roshan, and after is when you expect Betboom really to punch their ticket into this game. I'm not a big fan of the combination of Trint and Coddle in the same spot. I f I'd, I'd much rather prefer some more active uh, hero like, you know, Grimstroke or Dark Willow uh, on safe, just because, like, uh, they, they kind of, like, need to have playmakers, but it's going to be, like, the GPK and Pure Job to do that, to fulfill that role. Yeah, I was thinking Russell <coughs> Luna, like, an I a problem that stands out to me between them is that they both enjoy farming Ancient Area. So I wanted to see Keed pick up, A, a support that's going to be able to stack a lot for them. I like Skyrath. If he plays in that offlane, he can go to stack and at the same time come mid for, like, runes or to, like, gank mid lane, potentially. 
Um, but yeah, I want to see them stacking the Ancient a lot. And with these heroes on Bet Boom, I don't see how they really like invade that Ancient area. Yeah, I think... Oh, wow, they just go straight Storm Spirit. I was going to say, I feel like they can either do Beast Moss to Storm Spirit as options. They go for Storm Spirit, but like, a Beast Moss would have been, you know, the lane, the axes, the push, the fight. And yeah, now we see instead, uh, it's going to be the uh, Chakra, amp up the Storm, take the fight, and for Keith Stars, yes, they have the ball in, in play. They don't have very good lockdown. Like, their entire draft is about let us get to 20 minutes with an Aegis, A click down the lane and hope to win that, that engagement. Like, this mid pick for Keedstars needs to connect everything. Like, already Puck being a pretty good band for that because you can control where the fights are. Like, Pepe, it just looks like they want to play very reactionary the entire time. I mean, it also looks like TP has the freest game of his life here yeah. because they don't have damage on him. Just can stand his ground and just fight. Now, I'd like to see Beastmaster band out from Keedstars. Legion as well. Quite a natural uh, combination with the Keeper of Light. A lot of sp uh, spell spam, protection, you farm up. Dragging the heroes around the map also helps a lot. Finding his pickoffs. And you already mentioned the turnaround potential gets Bristle back, making him face you. And yeah, there's the Beast Master ban. Yep, first ban. I think your spirit needs to be banned as well from Bad Boom. Just to make sure yep. they don't have a good combination of like Sky. I mean, Earthshaker is there too. Like, it's between these two. They're considering the ban. There's still, like, a Pangolier as well. We don't... We saw uh, Gaming Gladiators pick it up, but I just want Keedstars to have a mid-hero that goes, look at me, I'm doing a lot of things. Meanwhile, Luna and Bristle are like, hey, we have so much farm. We're going to try and crush you, you know? Like, I just want that just really annoying mid-hero. And, of course, yeah, the Puck that we mentioned. Like some, like, Evoker? Like a... Uh, tornado? Yeah, it's gone now. Yeah. So you banned in Walker. Well... Nice ban. Yeah. As you were saying, you're like, oh, potentially Invoker and Bebe. And we're like, yes, and we will ban that. Okay. This is a pretty good pickup for them as well, mm -hmm. just to add up that extra damage for Storm to engage on anybody because we they don't have that follow up from supports. Yeah, we saw the Storm Spirit Dawnbreak combo on that Friday, and you were talking about how deadly it was, how disgusting to see a Storm zip onto the back line and a Dawn. pretty broken. Immediately ult down, and your supports disappeared. They, is Kunker still available? So could they not just Kunker on Keith Stars? And just, it brings all the control, the tankiness as well. So if Bet Boom do want to take a 25 minute fight, they might have a lack, lack of damage because it's Cottle Tree supports, not the best at the mid game fight. Terrorblade might only have a Scardy. Like, I feel they have a couple options here. The Pango for the kills or the Kunker for protecting the ball and actually getting your heroes in a position of winning on the game. But these are the Kunk big two that fine, come yeah. to mind. I like the Kunker. It's, it has a big impact in this game. I like Shaker and like uh, Earth Spirit. They need some combination oh, yeah. with a uh, Skyrath Mage, because uh, those two heroes are going to be the ones that uh, are setting up the pace for mm -hmm. PD. Just to do something here. That's all I want to see here. Yeah, same. And so far, they need to deal with the Terrorblade. They don't have a good answers yet. Luna and Bristlebeck are not the hero with these supports, especially not the hero that's going to, you know, stop the Terrorblade. It's always scary, but in this position, they might also be discussing, we don't have that natural counter to him, so let's try and just outpace it. And I don't think so far at the Rotary International, outpacing has been a thing. The game limits have been going to 40, 50 minutes plus. We've seen multiple hour-long games now. So I think the idea of winning in 30 is something you shouldn't be grasping onto, but maybe key stars do look towards that in this game. I feel like you can't force that play style, though, just because of how Bet Boom's lineup is. It's 100%. so easy to punish. If Keed are not 100% clean with their initiations, like they dive a tower one time, game's just over. Yeah. They feed like three heroes on a random team fight in the enemy jungle, done. <laughs> Look at it. <laughs> and it's so. Oh, they're all clapping. Oh, that's Ooh. so wholesome. Okay, they're having themselves off with this last pick. Let's see it. Oh, everyone clap. There we go. <laughs> Two. Ember. Ember. Oh. He's finally not neglected this Ember Spirit. We see him. Rosa, I know you're a little bit of an Ember Spirit fan. You, you didn't get the Earth Spirit that you wanted, or the Pango, but it's you did. It's another get... Spirit for sure. Yeah. I mean, that's something new. Definitely, we didn't see the, I don't think ever. Unpicked so far. Unpicked, right? Yeah. Um, not a big fan of the pick, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> that's why they're clapping. They were trying to get the fans on their side, and we picked Ember. So, oh. And everyone's still clapping, You've though. already right? clapped, though. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Bait them. Yeah, I think it's an easy game for Bad Boom, to be honest. I mean, I feel like, so for, for Ember, the entire draft of Keystars, it's 
feeling like their identity, right? They come into this game with, this is their prep, this is their notes. They're the first pick in the bristle, going for a Luna in the first two. So I respect them for going to their style, keep, keeping true. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it's going to potentially look like a bloodbath and bet boom go one up. So that's, that's it, really. All right. Chief, where's your take on these two teams and their drafts? It's the kind of game where I go, oh, I think like Bet Boom's lineup is easier to execute, and they have like a very clear win condition for themselves. But I also look at the heroes on Keyed, and I'm like, well, I could see them using their 100 spells a minute to just absolutely dominate mm -hmm. if they just kill everyone. Yeah. It is a legitimate strat. It is a strat. We'll see if it's going to play out for them. But before we do see that game, we're going to be seeing Tsunami, who is joined by the Keyed Stars coach. That's right, I'm standing by with D-Flash, who, as much as I care about the game, I want to know how you're doing, I want to know how the team doing in this international event. How are the vibes right now at this road to the international? We're fine. We had a really good preparation this, this week that we had for, like, it was a really good boot camp in one week, you know? So it's a really good, really good preparation. The energy looks great. I love how at the last pick, there was a little clap going on. What was that about with the Ember? It's something that, that we know that we're going to do well. So we're going to hype up, you know. Seattle, you ready to see some Brazilian Dota? <laughs> so let's watch it. Let's go to game number one. Thank you so much, Neil, and I'm excited too. I gotta say, Trent, it really like brings a warming to my heart when I see a fellow old person do well in Dota. I'm sure there's a lot of people out here in the crowd that can also relate right, to that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 31 years old and over, and please yeah. clap now um, because no, don't tire yourselves out. No, no. <laughs> exactly, it's early. Okay, save the claps. You know, only have a limited reserve here. That's a good point. Uh, but it's gonna be exciting one to watch, where we're getting to see this team, Bet Boom, oftentimes thought of as like one of the top dogs. You got to be wary of but they haven't always been able to live up to that hype. No, there's been a lot of expectations since they first formed this idea of like kind of another super team of the region and immediate expectations that have still not been met. And yet the expectations are still there. Shouldn't, shouldn't we give them a little bit of a break maybe, you know? I mean, I think they don't give themselves a break is the other thing, right? This is a team that definitely always has incredibly high standards for themselves we're going to see how they do it, being able to deal with it. Uh, and one of the key heroes that feels like it's a part of this draft is going to be Save playing on this Coddle. He's going to help to buff up that Storm Spirit, lower down the cooldowns of Metamorphosis too. A lot of different ways to try and get this engine rolling. Certainly a, a bit of a classic save hero. You know, he, he likes to take these heroes that I guess kind of used to be fives. Coddle's more so a four these days slash a mid. But uh, I mean, he's really aggressive on like a Bane, for example. You know, he would like rush the Aghanims and stuff. So, yeah. Uh, but the idea of just being super greedy, really good chakra combos in this game between the Storm and even helping out your Terrorblade a little bit with some of those cooldowns. Pretty nifty. And we get some early camp blocks here as well, as you can see. Yeah, trying to get that one blocked out, make sure that this bristle gets off to a good start. Did get that first pick overall. The panel was saying that they kind of liked the idea if Bet Boon would have taken it themselves, mm -hmm. uh, but was not what ended up happening. And then they run for this Ember in the last pick, and I think it does kind of fit what they need. Like, obviously, a hero that doesn't really, uh, hasn't been in the meta too much throughout this road to the International, um, but, you know, just somebody low cooldown initiation can kind of commit without needing to fully go in. I like it. And also has some ideas versus the Terror Blade too kind of used to be seen as this bit of a, a counter pick to the hero, which is a little bit difficult to get into the mid unless you hire commit for like Zeus or Tinker. Right. Currently though, analog, pull, oh, GPK. I mean, talking about spirits, this is probably I would say his best hero. Like if I had to choose what I am trying to survive at the road to TI with for GPK, oh it is Storm Spirit. Uh, and he's getting analog very, very low in the mid lane. Got to be careful about his positioning. Does still have that fairy fire at the very least, but something to watch for there. Um, and then, of course, these side lanes will be interesting to see how uh, it goes as well. Obviously, Pure going to be on that Dawnbreaker playing together with save. A lot of spam potential there. And Dawnbreaker really only limited by mana in the laning stage, it feels like sometimes. So Coddle, a perfect combo with that. And also has relatively low cooldowns, too. So oh, yeah. even with those earlier points in Shocker Magic, it could maybe catch you off guard a bit there to, to suddenly have like a, a second round of spells come out see how they do against what feels to be a faster tempo draft from Keed Stars. Yeah, hoping so at least. And uh, KJ here, Mr. Uh, King Jungle, as uh, Avo was, you know, letting us know, wanted us to make sure that the people were aware that this guy was known for his, his micro heroes. Right. Yeah. So he's on a clockwork. Yes. Uh, as you see, you know, summons cogs. Exactly. So just have to micro them. 
King RD in some trouble, getting chased down. A couple more hits. FCR is gonna play a little bit of intercept and make Nightfall not feel comfortable chasing any further. So keeping himself alive in this top lane here, uh, as there will be a couple of denies here and there by Nightfall as well, popping into that metamorphosis. So at least for now, two minutes in, I want to see if they can maybe make any type of aggressive play on the side of Evil Keed Stars uh, once that metamorphosis runs lower. It's still tough. He's just such high armor on Terrorblade. Yeah, just get the farm, you know, okay. get the stacks going. That, that's hopefully going to be the goals here for the Trizzle. Uh, I was like to do some of their games this morning, you know, trying to see like what heroes, you know, because obviously they're coming in as the underdogs. They know that's Vivo. Not, uh, again, should not be really considered super underdogs. Because right. I, I do think that Baboom are a team that struggle a lot when it comes to like mentality, as well as like going to these matchups, like Reza was saying on the panel, this idea of like respecting other teams. They definitely think highly of themselves and for good reason, but obviously that can be your downfall sometimes. So uh, when you look through uh, Keystar though, they have not actually lost with this King RD Skywrath Mage, and he's mm. kind of been cooking in the games. So if there was a hero that I would want for him, it's probably either like maybe that support Earth Spirit that he's played a whole lot in his career, but then next to that, probably the Skywrath Mage. I mean, teams have been making it look really solid. It sets up really nicely for this Ember Spirit as well, right, when you make these rotations. Oh, yeah. You can see they're getting some CS while simultaneously laying out a little bit of harassment. We'll see if him and KJ can play together later on to try and set up for some uh, some solid kills. And the other thing, just looking at Betboo's lineup, it's a little bit strange, right? You're throwing out a lot of nukes. You're throwing out the Illuminates. You're throwing out a few other things, but they don't have that like big tanky frontliner with the exception of Dawnbreaker. Dawnbreaker doesn't really want to inhabit that space, I feel like. Much more coming in at the later stages of it. So I want to see how Betboom try and play the mid game here. Yeah, see how aggressive they are versus how much they just want to sit back and farm and get humongous on this tricore, right? right? I mean, we've seen these Dawnbreakers obviously get pretty huge later if they go for these damage builds too. And probably the way Pure is going to go as well here is he's comfortably diving under this tower. Oh, and Toronto Tokyo getting lower. FCR wants to find the finish. One more quill spray and it's going to be enough. Check your emails for the Crimsons, and well, KJ now also catching onto this Dawnbreaker. Pure in trouble under the tower. He goes down. They managed to find a kill up on the top lane without King RD even being there. I've checked, Gabe. I got nothing. Oh, no. That's yeah, sad. No. It's okay. It's out of pool, maybe. Like, fun? <laughs> Anyone? Any tips? Anyone wants to yeah. give one away? Unbelievable. So uh, we're seeing now the stacks being built up over in the triangle as FCR is going to get isolated and brought down. That is the downside to having the Skyrath Mage out of the lane and then, of course, Tree coming back in. Yeah, super solid punish. I mean, we know Tree's still very good at that, right? And he goes down one time here. KJ, ooh, playing it to the limit there. Nicely done. Even body block in the creeps to follow it. So gets himself into a decent position. Is going to have to maybe take a walk, or he might have some uh, regen coming out on that courier. But at least for now, it's a little bit scary. Uh, yeah, really, the, the main person that's been hurting so far has been this Bristleback. Not able to get a ton in the mid lane, though. GPK getting lower and lower. Analog backs away. Does not want to try for another slight. Yeah, still you know, both were holding some charges for a while there. Analog still has this is eight. Bad. Is he going to go down again? FCR in trouble, and they're going to pause. For a we'll see if it's actually going to be enough to get the kill. There aren't really that many rotations coming over. King RD is very far away. Yeah, he's pretty dead. Yeah. <laughs> Let him go there. I mean, it's been a rough one for the old FCR on the, uh, the bristleback. Well, when you do your walk of shame back, you could stack the Ancients on the way. Okay. How about that? I like you know, that. No, since he can't TP anyway. Maybe the timing will line up. Well, as we are ready to get back into this game, that probably is going to be the big thing to watch for here is FCR still, well, surviving that ring of health, buying a little bit of extra time. Toronto Tokyo kind of gave up on it, didn't want to chase any further. He had so many stacks, he was kind of scared. Feed, he comes out, but they will finally clean up. So, yeah, they did not want to uh, lose the tree in the pursuit of the bristle there. And we'll see if GPK gets lucky here. Comes back towards mid there with that bottle. Six minute rune coming up. Got save down bottom, doing a stack while covering. Toronto Tokyo coming in. It's a party in the mid. Looking, hunting. He gets it, the DD GPK. Just a little bit too quick on it. Now the hunt forward, chasing King RD. Pops the stick, tries to get away. There will be no escape. That is the power of a DD on Storm. Yeah, Analog uses the chance to at least go and take their wisdom rune, or sorry, their bounty rune, so get something for it, but uh, 
couldn't go back to his run because GPK was kind of covering it there with the DD. And, um, misspeaking of Wisdom Runes, they are coming up here soon. Let's see if anyone makes a, a play for it. This is nice. Like, Toronto Tokyo's in the neighborhood. That this is good already scouting out those stacks, though, and like you're talking about, being able to move over to try and steal that Wisdom Rune. Uh, uh, it, I mean, if they lose the Wisdom Rune here, this is really bad for Vivo Keed Stars. Radiant are scanning. Already in some trouble. King RD making the move over. <laughs> okay, they're, they're looking yeah. at scan they, misses, though. They, they know, although are they going to be able to get it? See who is quicker on the fingers. Analog spotting Toronto Tokyo right onto him as he get it in time. King RD able to get the wisdom runes. So that'll be a freebie. And pass it right back to Analog with the kill there too. So yeah, a bit of a bad throw there. But that's okay, it's just space. It's all space, right? Bringing lots of heroes away. I mean, you get some free farm there mid for GPK. He's got his Falcon Blade heading in towards the Treads here. So each gets delivered. Uh, bottom lane has been really quiet uh, since all that action earlier. Yep. Kind of retreating back to the jungle. Three points in the Lunar Blessing right now. So just farming up a storm. Also nighttime. So we got that globally at the moment. And I mean, it, Coast Joseph has been able to sort of be left alone for a little while there, it feels like. Um, but it does sort of feel like Terrorblade is getting the lion's share of the farm. Uh, I would be very concerned about Nightfall's uh, levels right now at this point. He's, he's going to start taking over this game if they can't shut him down soon. Oh, Pure as well. Tries to jump right on top, but nice stop there with the Lucid Beam. That's a lot of stacks. It's also a haste right now, bottom loses the coin flip there for GPK. So obviously uh, all spirit heroes really dependent on the runes. That's kind of their whole goal for the most part. I would say in this game in particular though, GPK really needs them because as the Ember Spirit, you have Clockwork and Skyrath Mage. So just like you got Clock for a little bit of setup and then you got Sky for like follow-up damage. So yeah, it's quite a bit that you can do even without runes. Whereas the Storm Spirit, you know, you have extra mana, but in terms of like the actual active movements, you're really depending on these runes. Right. Well, and of course, when that's taken away, they can't come on in and contest the stacks. Now, there are other heroes rotating into the Radiant Triangle. Yeah, no, these were the ones that were scouted by Toronto Tokyo earlier. GPK taking it slowly, but the silence is there. Analog right onto him, starting to bring him lower and lower, but... The root. Okay, do they have enough to get the kill and get out after? Yeah, at the very least, is going to be able to chase down one, but out of mana. Analog going to give up on the chase for the storm for the moment. Good damage on top of him, but can't find any follow-up. So Nightfall making the rotation to keep GPK alive. Yeah, I think without that potential for a chase down there, because he was low on mana. And you know they want that kill bad right now. On the other hand, though, Pure's about to hit six. So right. try that again. Could be very risky. That's Danger Town. That Dawn ulti can completely change things around. A 2,000 gold lead already for Bet Boom, though. And this has just been solid laning, good movements around the map. Let's see if Costevile is going to be able to keep back up. You can see the damage not really there. He's trying to farm all that he can. Yeah, he's on a mission just to farm at the moment. Well, we need to look for these level sixes on the sky and the clockwork, right? That, that's oh, yeah. kind of the goal. And that's one of the things that stacking is supposed to provide for you, that bonus XP. But again, they are just getting right in here. They want these stacks. They don't want to give them away to free, uh, for free to... Vivo here, but great vision. Also trying to cover this area so they know when they're making these aggressive moves. Yeah. No stacks on the hard camp, though, so it means it's pretty tough to try and go on in for the, the Ancients, uh, stealing them at least on Bet Boom. And a regen rune, again, lucky for Analog. That's what they need. Yeah, that hurts. For the storm, that is. <laughs> Denies out the rune. And is another pause as we get a disconnect. Pure having some issues. As we're 10 minutes into this game, 3-3, three to three, a slight lead, at least for now, for Bat Boom. I, I'm, I'm thinking about the next couple of minutes and how they play out. Do you think that Storm, like, needs to continue to look for these runes? Can he start to get active uh, earlier? Or, or is Bat Boom just going to continue to, like, sit back and not try and fight that much? I feel like he's kind of going to be at, like, the desk with the big red phone. Okay. And it might ring and be like, I need you here now. Yeah. Because they're, they're just doing something. Like, there's kind of like a red phone for the storm and a red phone for the dawn. Ideally, they kind of just want to farm right now. But, you know, if they have to answer the call, they will. Whereas on the other side, Vivo Key Stars, they, they actually have to make the aggressive moves, right? right. Like, they want to get this XP on the, t the support duo, and they just want to go. Your support duo on the side of Bet Boom, yeah, Tree can set up for some stuff, obviously. But it, it's obviously a, a much longer cooldown. I mean, two full minutes on that early overgrowth. So... 
If anything, they would want to be doing smaller ganks and, and trying to hunt down that uh, Luna would be the easiest one, right? Try to You kind of know where she's going to play. That bottom half of the map, you're a train protector. But in order to open up that possibility, sometimes you're tempted to try and take this top tower first. Not the okay. they, they've been really aggressive near that tower. They have. Constantly moving in for it. But no damage on it at no. all, as is, as is common, <laughs> right? I mean, how often do we see these off lane towers knocked down that early, right? You can't really make the move. It's too scary. Ooh, hook shot. A little off the mark there. KJ not able to connect. And a smoke now with GPK save. Bristle, he's under vision. They know about this. Immediately jumps. That's a big move. And the silence is there. FCR backs away. They managed to get the stun. Good hits. It's going to be enough. They bring him down once. Bet Boom bringing all five heroes to contest and steal the Ancients. That was quite the commitment. Now, can they all get out? That's the other question. They're in very far. Analog chasing. They get the silence now onto the Dawnbreaker. KJ, they have meta. They're just all fighting up on the high ground. They take down three. They take the stacks. Bet Boom can't even quite manage to get that kill on to save. And what a ward, man. Just up on that pillar. Not often you see it that early, but it just did everything. Yeah, it's only got a minute left. This thing has done lots of work. All of that early movement, right? That's all from Toronto Tokyo. Yeah. When he went through, yeah, he didn't get the Wisdom Rune. Yeah, he died. But he scouted all these stacks. He got down some great vision, and that just kept paying in dividends way more than missing out on that one Wisdom Rune did. And speaking of more wards, he's trying to sneak another one in there right now. Yeah, wants to shut down this Bristleback. It feels like they have done an excellent job, better than I've seen most teams do at being able to shut this guy down. So not a great start. Still trying to get into that Aghanim Scepter, and they're going to continue to stack jungle, but they haven't taken out that ward. Yeah, it's been an awkward game for King RD because of that, because he's felt like he's had to be mid quite a bit to try and contest these runes. He hasn't had a lot of time for stacking. The stacking that he has done has been stolen, so he hasn't really gotten a lot of rewards that you're hoping for. He's also a Skyrath Mage in a lane that doesn't necessarily have any real kill threat, you know? Like, maybe a little bit at first, but Sky likes to be in those lanes with, like, I don't know, like a CK, you know? Right. Like, stun, pull back, lots of damage over and over. We bully some squishier heroes. They didn't find those opportunities here. But he hasn't lost yet. No. Well, and, and to be honest, I think that there's still a very strong timing that's coming up for Evil Keed Stars, and they're going to see it right now. Right Skyrath and, and Clockwork are going together with the Ember. This should be a kill on anybody that they find. They've also lost out on some of that vision that was a little bit deeper, so they don't necessarily know where they are. I mean, you can see the scan that they used right now. Right. Nobody there. No. So they, they have no real idea what's happening. That being said, with it being missed like that, you know, maybe Pure will be a little bit more cautious down here as he's stacking this bottom Ancients. Playing over in that area, Vivo looking for anybody up on this high ground, which they're not going to find. Oh, and the flare. That gives them away. Ooh, backing out. That boom still sitting in the middle. Okay, good ward though, right? They leave that behind. Spots some of that smoke, I think. Catches them right away. Still looking for an opening. King RD, the smoke will break. And yeah, you can see they just back out. Bet Boom, we're only stepping over there to try and break a smoke, playing it very safe. Maybe down bottom, over by the Dawnbreaker. King RD leaves a dangerous way. Cogs push back, silence there, not dropping the Mystic Flare, just Dias forcing back the storm. Wait, goes in. The hook shot decides that he wants to party a little bit more. On to pure control. Mystic Flare not going to do what they needed to there. Oh, he, he remnants behind. Now log. Wants to find somebody. GPK, low on mana. Does he have any help? Uh, yes. I don't know. He, he has a lot of spells. help. He has a whole lot of help. Everybody's there. And now with the Dawnbreaker coming in, that should be enough to kill him up. No remnant away. But Pure was all over it with that hammer. Perfect placement. I feel like he missed the memo that they'd already used Hookshot as well as Mystic Flare. You know what I mean? Because yeah. there's not a lot of benefits going in further after that. Dude, they dropped everything. They did the Seeds of Serenity. They gave him a Mango Chakra Magic. Everything <laughs> for GPK. Well, and then, of course, one of the best things that can happen, your TD just shows up and hits a tower for you. Not a lot of carries doing that these days. <laughs> what a deny! <laughs> All right, KJ, let's go! That was pretty sick. This piece of Walt. All right, morale's back. <laughs> As FCR is under wards again, it's still sitting at this 3K uh, gold lead for Bet Boom. And they haven't been able to just make their draft work. I mean, that is one of the problems, right? Is that it's very telegraphed, the moves that they want to make. Um, and you can just sort of react accordingly as that move. 
pure sitting oh, with yeah. the blade now and just cleaning up these stacks. They're getting so fond. Yeah, he's going to be closing into a pretty early deso, I would say, considering. Malog forced to remnant away. And just like that, we're getting closer and closer to the Aghanim Scepter. Wanting to see some other type of a movement soon from them. An Elstrom for the Ember. Yeah. And Bet Boom. I mean, again, with you're sitting with this tree here, it's a couple points in living armor. There's no real hurry. But look at this move. They want to try and punish and, and bully this Bristleback again. Bringing in numbers. CR gets jumped on. No mana. They got right on top of them. Stick charges. It's not going to be enough. This Bristle is going to go down. And these types of moves from Bet Boom, it just, it, it's devastating to the Bristleback. Yeah, only the second kill they've managed to get here for uh, GPK in this game just because haven't found enough runes, really. But uh, the vision, again, being the main reason why it's super easy for them. Very safe play. And they need to just go back right to farming. And you're not looking for oh. constant fights with these two. This could be good, though. Blade Nail is going to do a lot to King RD, but they managed to bring him down. So a little bit of help going the way of Evo Keed Stars. And now Luna online. As that Yasha done is going in for the shard after. And this early Luna shard. Seeing a lot of the, uh, Luna players go for it. Obviously, you're not going to get it from the Tormentor. Right. So you're going to be the rich one. So if you want it, you're going to have to purchase it up. Unless you're going to wait really late. I mean, he's been getting pretty freaking farmed here. Already with that shard on top of Manta. A tier one tower taken and looking for more of a 420 minute mark. What can they do? Analog feeling very brave with uh, Wand and Illusion Rune. Yep. Well, Stabile is going to be a problem here if they're not careful on the side of Bet Boom. He's really starting to ramp up that farm. And he's got the Shard done now, too, which is uh, pretty cool, obviously, versus like Storm and Dawnbreaker. Probably like two of the bigger ones who just like, get right on top of you, you know? Ooh. Hookshot used. They're in no man's land now. They kill off the Courier, but might still run to some issues. Nightfall right there. They jump in, kill off both of the supports almost instantaneously. So Bet Boom have had enough. They bring in numbers. And they just purchased up the uh, the Etos, though. So maybe that'll give them an opportunity to actually bring down GPK. That'd be a great way for them to fire back here before he picks up that BKB. Because you can imagine, like, BKB comes out, they go for an Aegis, and then there's a right. BKB Aegis Storm approaching your Tier 2s. And with a Terra Blade backing him up, this is one of the few lineups that might actually push these Tier 2s a little bit earlier, as we've seen so many teams delaying that push. Nightfall has just been swarming this map, though. Oh, yeah. Well, they're going to find, for a moment, the Overgrowth, and the turn is... Very strong. He did not stand a chance. My goodness. That is what you get with the shard and the overgrowth. Wow. Yep, first item shard. We're medallion, trash. You know, we don't need that anymore. Just buy shard, get aggressive. Uh, it is very uh, reminiscent of all these like tree specter lineups that we've had, where oh, they're yeah. just running around, setting up for easy shadow steps. Radiant Storm Spirit, you know, has a similar attack. bit of reach. So you can try and provide some good options for while also giving you some defensive capabilities there with the living armor. So it's a nice combo. KJ sitting nearby with King RD, and we are seeing the reason why Ember has not been picked a ton by some of these other heroes. Now, Tarleton, what's that? You know, he is, uh, he's actually right in vision. They see him here. Flare off to the side, and now they got him. So that will be an easy bring down. And Vivo Keatstar is going to try and take another Tier 1 tower. How fast can their tempo move? If they go into Roche right now, this is interesting. I mean, four points aura, four points goo. They can definitely do this, uh, especially if they try and approach. Like, there's no tree, right? He would be the one to be the most frightening one to set up on you. But uh, there's no ulti available anyway. This is a great steal because Storm Spear players, they love getting this. Now, the good news is that he's already building BKB because the worst case is when you're going for this like offensive item and then you're trying to depend on this Aegis to sort of give you that next bit of uh, aggressive potential. So it's not a humongous loss for Bet Boom, but it is something that Vivo definitely need right now. I feel like if they, if they give this Aegis up to Bet Boom, the game is very, very hard. Staying in this one, level 16. Close to be like highest in the game by a pretty good margin. And yeah, this is going to be interesting to watch. It's, it's all together right now, right? This, this yeah. is kind of it. Like, they're going for this BKB timing next uh, on the Luna. So Cospilly just going to try and do his thing. See if he can stand tall in these fights. Nightfall also, though, almost into the Scotty, too. 
So a bit worrisome for a lot of these heroes, right? Mostly like the Luna and the Bristle. Yes. No, I mean, that, that is going to be a problem. If Nightfall is just free to hit, uh, I bet Boom are going to win that fight more often than not. It feels like they're going to need to find an angle on him, either with KJ or getting in there with the Ember Spirit. Part of the problem, too, is that you're probably going to try and do some sort of a group-up play, I assume, soon on Vivo Kitsa, is trying to right. take advantage of this Aegis, and you're doing that versus Maybe Keeper of the Light as well as Terror Blade. So lots of control of the lanes. So wherever you're trying to group up, the other two lanes probably are not going to be moving in your favor. Yes. And then you also have to worry about if someone comes back defensively, some sort of a Storm Spirit, just immediate uh, initiation and jump in that they don't really have to hard commit to. It Hold. is really just mass BKBs right now. They just finished it on the Dawnbreaker. Obviously, Terrorblade not opting for that route, instead going for the Scotty, but they will smoke now on the side. Bet Boom and Nightfall just able to sidestep that hook shot. They still have vision there. Connecting, holding on to the Manta. FCR on his tail, turns Manta, Metamorphosis, good damage out. King RT already gone, and yeah, they are blown into oblivion. Man, GPK jumping in there with the Grove Bow, too. He tags a couple of people as the Illuminate comes through. Are they really going for more here now? Analog shows up, starts throwing it out, but already dead. They didn't have a moment to do anything. The GPK you committing Courier is deciding to fight. Okay, he's in trouble, going to start to fall, and they don't have that much left in the tank at all. That was not the fight that Vivo Keystars wanted to take as that boom take full advantage. It seems like they're feeling that uh, they can't actually force an engagement with the uh, like with this actual advantage that they have maybe. So they're like, okay, this is it. Like this is the one fight we're gonna get because we can't control the lanes enough to find something. Right. But uh, yeah, that's that is not looking ideal, huh? Losing out on your advantage on the map. Lane's going to worse state. And it almost feels you basically have just lost that Aegis window of like, right. oh, this is our group up strength. Now that, that phase of the game just ended much faster <laughs> than they anticipated. Yeah, that's a fair one. And now we're farming. I mean, it does sort of feel like, okay, if they're able to throw everything out, then maybe that and take down the bristle, um, you know, we're going to set up for a situation where we can take a good fight afterwards. But they didn't have to commit that much for him. He does not feel super strong right now on FCR. Still trying to get into that Bloodstone, but still they do make the group up play together with no Metamorphosis available and are able to take the mid-tier one tower. We'll see what they try and do next. Getting into that Manta or Analog. Yeah, it needs a bit more survivability here. I mean, they have a really aggressive support duo, the Clockering and Skyrath Mage, who I would say probably didn't hit all the goals they were hoping for with this in the early parts of this game. We're likely hoping to try and set up analog for some earlier kills. But part of this duo is that you don't really have great save potential. Sure, sometimes you can get like a hookshot save maybe that can break up a fight, but generally you're trying to keep that for the offensive potential. So analog can have to try and depend on this Manta style. And other than that, building into defensive items can really hurt an Ember Spirit because, you know, he's trying to juice up that damage there in the Slight of Fist. He wants to get those bigger items later on, like the Agonims. It's a hard line for him to balance. Absolutely. And obviously, being, you know, lower on the net worth does not help either. If there's one sort of silver lining right now, it's that the difference in terms of net worth between the Luna and the Terrorblade isn't that horrific. There's still only about a thousand gold separating the other cores from each other. Um, but you'd love to be ahead right now on Evil King Stars. As the entire wave is shoved out and likely gonna only look for these clockwork pickoffs with Skyrath Mage. And for Bet Boom, do they have to do all that much at this point? No. I think they just farm. I think yeah. they're just chilling. I mean, they just keep pushing waves. It feels like the growth will, you know, line goes up in their favor. It feels like for the most part, as long as they're just hanging Radiant out a little bit here. Right now, though, Nightfall, he's feeling like he could do a little bit of something now with the Shadow Blade. I mean, this has also been one of the things that they've talked about is overestimating your opponents. We'll see if Bet Boom put themselves into a bad fight or if they just take a great fight. KJ is there. They have the BKB and an immediate blow up onto the Luna TP out. KJ gets away. So that was a simple pick off for Bet Boom and into that Bloodstone for the Bristle. Yeah, the timing on that, too. Coming right up towards this tier two. They got Wave coming through, being guarded by Pure on the Dawnbreaker. And they're gonna snag this Tormentor. Easy peasy. 
save. He's gonna get that one, so even more maneuverability around the map. Very scary yeah. with a uh, Storm Spirit, of course. Right. <laughs> yeah, this is scary stuff. Six to 15, getting everything that they want at this point. We'll try and push out both of the side lanes right now as the Desso's completed onto the Dawnbreaker. Every meta is just a new objective. Yeah. Like next meta, it's probably going to be mid tier two, right? The meta after that, it's probably going to be Roche. And then they're going to try and go high ground. That looks to be the plan here. Pure is attempting to take this Tormentor. Will he be another victim to the Tormentor? Let's see. Let's do some math here. So oh, it's God. about half and you're at about half, okay? Uh, so this player is a strike. See, it's regen and you're not. <laughs> yeah. All right. This is now the... Pure. Uh, this is an interesting okay. one. Okay, Toronto there we go. Shows up. They get there in time. GPK Let's go teammates. Back. Woo! <laughs> a little bit of help from his friends. Okay, Storm just got that. That is crazy. Yeah. Second highest net worth on the team. Thank you, everybody, buying their own. Key stars chasing through the jungle now, but well aware of what's going on. You can see Radiant Bet Boom awesome. are not going to be caught quite so easily. This Arcane is running out, though. We'll have to get something, but it's just not going to happen. They're trying to force this with a Bloodstone on the Bristle, feeling yeah. like, hey, if there's any new spike that we're going to get, this is probably it. It's a lot of spikes, actually. They, That's they just true. keep on coming. There's a lot of vision here. Analog right up front and center, down to half HP, but the Bloodstone okay. heal! Okay. Pretty insane. GPK, Mystic Flare down. Even in the BKB, it did a lot, but not quite enough. And the overgrowth is huge. Nightfall just running in, doesn't even need Metamorphosis. Stabila is trying to get away and will turn to fight a little bit, but with Metamorphosis Pop, he does not stand a chance. Everybody falls. Bed Boom are way too strong. Yeah. Oh, maybe he lives? Looking, hunt. I mean, living. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. <laughs> All right. And rough one. The meta is still up, so your tier two is down, and I don't imagine he's gonna stop. No, they, I think they are gonna continue to go. There are no buybacks at this point. Bet boom, way too strong at this stage of the game. 27 minutes in, just farming all for this push, and a tier three tower gonna go down, as well as most likely the first set of racks. Yeah. I mean, you had Clockwork, Sky, Ember. You have six kills in 27 minutes. Things oh, yeah. probably didn't go the way you were hoping, you know? It's uh, not the game plan you were aspiring to. Yeah, not even a little bit. They'll get the melee racks and give up after that. And heading on up towards where they know the next Roche will be. That boom. In firm control of this one. 18,000 net worth lead. Bam! They hit hard. Oh, it's time to get a little bit crazy, right? We've got to find these big plays. Uh, almost have an Agnum Scepter up on the Clockwork, so some coverage over the Roche Pit. Maybe KJ find something with the uh, the multiple flares once those are out. It does get purchased up now. Uh, analog, get lucky with a good Manta, maybe. You know, right. manage to escape something here. It's well, gonna, it's gonna take a big move. Well, All right, 18k lead, just 100 to zero. The Storm Spirit, even game. That's good. I yeah. like this. I mean, to be fair, when the B even with the BKB out, like he took so much damage from that Mystic Flare. Um, it's not to be underestimated the control and damage that Skyrath Mage can do in the fight, but they kind of need these BKB's charges to wear down lower and lower. Still at seven seconds on Storm. It will be helpful. We'll see if the overclocking can get it done for them. No jetpack still, though, and also no force staff or anything, so right. hard to hit the uh, ideal plays in this one here for KJ, but they're going to have to try. It's a bit of a late Roche, still 50 seconds left. They group up. Uh, they, they, have, they have to apply the smoke to FCR. He had a great start to that fight. Almost yes. like the perfect position. Like, back turned, multiple heroes, started doing some sweet damage, but no close. I mean, this actually is another one of those moments where if they can take a good fight, it, the key is not just immediately all done. Oh, they just smoked. Yeah, that's uh, it's a little bit unfortunate. Oh, where where are catch they? Them. The old wraparound. The, the wraparound coming. <laughs> Do they realize it? So Ember has a remnant right there in those trees. If he comes back through, he'll break all their smokes. So AJ Reg in position, out. smoke breaks. They throw out the flare the wrong direction. Now they spot him right onto FCR as well. Hook shot not on the mark as Roche is respawning. Pure in onto the bristle. Good damage already out. Nightfall is there. They, they don't have anything else left in the tank. They gotta back away. 
Keystars cannot contest this Roche as everybody tries to TP out. Pure chasing. Oh, they're, they're going to cut him off. Yeah, finding him. Four seconds still. BKB. Trouble wanting to escape. Has BKB still. Yeah, he's got wand overgrowth too. Yeah, they, they're going to get him. Coast W is going to fall. Broken and killed. Pet boom. Just no mercy. Uh, well, it is daytime now, so they're going to have to make a bit of a migration here across the map at this point if they want to go for this Roche. Uh, who just got X? Is that Storm? Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> that item is a closer. I'll tell you that much. Oh, yeah. When you're going high ground, Storm Eggs, I feel like, is one of the best ones in the game because it just lets you YOLO in there a little bit. You catch some heroes. It's just GG, you know? You catch three or four heroes in that thing. A little non committal black hole. Exactly. Ah, they're feeling it. Feeling pretty good about themselves at this point in the game on the side of that boom as they will claim this Aegis, get a cheese too. Yeah, it has been Nightfall's game, that is for sure. Everything that he wants, he gets, including the Aegis, apparently, even with the Storm in the game. So high ground likely to come out soon as they will pressure out each of these waves, catching the mid one. And for Vivo Heat Stars, I mean, it, it, you're just sort of hoping to get more items to get a good fight on your side, but there really is not a whole lot that they can do once this high ground push comes in. We'll see how they decide to do it. What tricky plays do we have here? We got anything? We got, we got no four staffs. Okay, now that makes it a bit tough. You know, 60 minute items. Yeah, okay, <laughs> Suns fan. Perfect. If they just get those. Yeah, exactly. It's the key. Yeah, but what if you did get five Book of the Dead? You know, it's just like, what if? That's right. Well, they're trying to kill you. They're killing themselves. Hook shot to get away. Didn't quite connect, it looks like. Oh, analog. Trouble. Pulled back in. Sitting still right up front and center, and GPK is just going to let him go. Doesn't want to use that much more mana or have to pop the cheese. So cutting waves, this is what you have to make the play for. They might be moving down here, though. This looks kind of scary. Recall's coming out. They bring in GPK if he gets the right jump here. Oh, run into one. Oh, they see him. They might force the BKB. Turn. Yeah, that's a problem. Oh, now he's just gone. He's gone. Yeah. Just like that, they bring him down. And Bristle didn't even manage to grab that next creep wave either. A little unfortunate. So. Up on the high ground, Nightfall going to start to lay into this. As continue to try and spam these waves, they're even going to glyph it, connect now, bring down the Ember. Oh, man. They're giving them nothing at this point. Bet boom. They know how to close out a game. I mean, Nightfall's casually just pushing up here with his Aegis. Not going to use the Metamorphosis quite yet. Just hold on to it. York steps up, still just six kills for Vivo Keedstars. Have not been able to get anything going for a while. They finish off the Silver Edge, but with no buyback, they still have 24 seconds until Luna's back up. Buyback now on the Ember, try and heal with the Bloodstone. Clockwork is already gone, and well, FCR gets jumped on by Pure. The right click's coming through. It's going to be enough. Now they pull him back in. GPK in for the finish. And as Luna is going to respawn, can only look on as other allies are already dead. Bet boom, closing out the last set of wrecks, even buying mech on the tree. Oh, just to make sure, you know. As they chase the overgrowth there, Costabile tries to do what he can. Nightfall right on top of him, does not appear to care about that eclipse at all. Eyes on the prize, focusing down the heroes, focusing down the buildings. And with a 36,000 gold lead at 34 minutes, Bet boom, they are going to take the win in this one. GG is called. All right, okay. So things didn't go according to plan there for Evil Key Stars, of course. But I'll tell you, Bet boom, very comfortable in this game. Right? Oh, yeah. I mean, this is an absolutely classic heroes for these players. Again, the GPK Storm, one of his absolute best. He crushed that first wave. Like, oh just right God. from the very beginning of this game, that advantage he got in mid, that really hurt them on Evil Key Stars because they're very dependent on this Ember. I mean, it's a risky pick in a sense that no one else has been going for it, but we still understand how the hero works, what the hero wants to do. 
those goals not achieved in this game. Oh, no. No, and, and I, I think on the other point of view, for Bet Boom, the idea of just having this draft that if things are just calm, if they're set, if they're ready, and you don't end up having to, like, push the advantage if you don't have to take that many risks, that, like, game state is one they're very comfortable with. Um, so I think in game number two, need to come up with the answer to that as the crowd gives a little bit of love to the team that came out with a very dominant victory. One of the most dominant ones we've seen in a while. Yeah, I would say so. That's a good way to start your morning, right? Oh, yeah. These, these gamers, the, the morning games, they have a bit of a hard time with them here. So this is nice motivation. And maybe that's all they need for Vivo Keys. They're just going to wake up a little bit, right? Absolutely. Just morning game. That's all you tell yourselves. Wow, an impressive showing. I am seething with rage because I just saw Trent got a Crimson Witness. So we're going to head on back to the panel before I choke him to death. <laughs> well, well, we'll let you have that time, you know, uh, Lyrical and Trent doing amazing there, but bet, boom, game number one win for themselves. We didn't know too much, Brezzo, about how the support combo was going to work in their favor. Obviously, two great heroes, that Trian being a real lane dominator, but the Coddle, do you see now in the end the reason for the pickup and you really enjoy it despite it maybe not being typically that active support? Yeah, I mean, this game looked like just straight up bed boom favored from the whole like very beginning because this turret blade was untouchable, absolutely. And uh, you know, KT they never really tried to make any moves to even come back into this game. Like, I know their heroes are really like hard to pull off, but at the same time they're just kind of like giving the the free win for the bed boom. I feel like for me it's like KT they had this window of you know, they get this 19 minute Aegis, two minutes later Bristol loses it by himself. Three minutes later from there, Luna's dying top by herself. So I think there's this big window in the mid game where maybe Keystars, if they connected their group up together, if they actually tried to force it, they could have got something going their way. But yeah, like Rezo mentioned, the fact this Terror Blade was top net worth, that Kotal freely moving, shackering the Storm for more fight, shackering the TB for more meta. Like, it was just such a fluid game from Bet Boom, dodging the smokes, making their moves. It was a little bit of a mismatch uh, in this first game. I thought it played out very similar to what you were describing as well, Shape, that, you know, one misstep, one overreaction from Keith Stars would have resulted in this, okay, it's kind of all for Bet Boom, because we did see them invade that triangle. We saw them trying to do something something and yes maybe they got one kill but they tried it again and it just kept failing that triangle was no longer viable for them to invade yeah i, th I just the way I, it played out it just felt like keed had no idea how to deal with bet boom's play style bet boom you know they did try and, and contest that ancient stack brought five whole heroes i think it showed that they had a very clear understanding of their goals in the game like bet boom were like this is what we want to contest this is what we don't want to let happen we're going to keep playing our st but we're going to keep our play style where we you know, play passively and, and build our lead and take things. Like, if we see a good fight, we take the good fight. We don't give a bad fight. And then Key just had no idea what to do about it. Like you guys both said, it was just like, they're not making the moves they need to, to, to get a hold of the game. Yeah, we saw a carry comparison there very briefly of the post game stats. I mean, what was it? Nine, zero and 12 on Nightfall. So we harped on a lot before this series started, before we even saw the draft, how much Nightfall likes to play for that KDA, likes to be stable and I mean, with that KDA, you, you were definitely a stable carry. Yeah, he is. And they were playing very disciplined as well. They were not making any moves that would just put them into danger. And this is how they like to play. But they need to abuse it. Like KG, they need to create some chaos in order to win this game. And like, you know, the next one or two games, hopefully, right? They need to create some, some, some sort of chaos that this structure that Bedoom has is going to like fall off. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was, I was saying, sorry, I just feel bad for Costa Vile. You know, oh, he had, but he had like 1,000 less net worth for like the 24 minute mount. Like he was keeping up, he was keeping his pace, yeah. but he just lacked like the team move to make something happen. Like they have the farm, they just don't have the, the choices in the game to actually translate into a winning position. And it's why they do need like a 50 minute long game to kind of find some of these wins so far. I felt like Luna hit a little bit of a timing. It obviously wasn't enough. And again, what we've all been saying is there wasn't that grouping up for them, that five, that, that cohesion. But for now we are gonna head down to Tsunami. I know he is eager to talk to us in the crowd. That's right, we are getting close to the end of the road to the international, and as we've learned from years and years and years of experience, no one knows what's gonna happen at this tournament. So I figured, why not leave it up to chance? I've got this board here. It's got all the teams remaining in the tournament, just randomly spread out, and I've got some placements in my hand. So I figured, why not let the crowd figure out where these teams are gonna place once we move to Climate Pledge Arena? Who would like to figure out who's going to get eighth place in this tournament? Who wants to throw eighth? My friend, who, uh, who are you rooting for, first of all, in this tournament? 
who, um, I mean, I think the one that should win is Team Liquid. I'm cheering for them. Okay. But show me who's going to get eighth. Why don't you give a little toss? In a North American TI, this is really how you're going to do us, my man? I, we have to be realistic, so they have a good team, but uh, it is what it is. All right, all right, all right. Who wants to give me seventh place? Anyone? How about you want to give me seventh place? Who are you rooting for? Uh, Spirit. Okay. okay. Let's see who's getting seventh. Bad Boom? Okay. Bad Booms, I mean, they're up one series right now. How much further are they going to get? We're going to see. We got sixth place here. You want to give me sixth place? Who are you rooting for? LGD. LGD. All right, let's see who's getting sixth. We got a backup. We got a backup. I'm, I'm inclined to believe that you must be a very good Dota player because you don't throw very well. Yeah, I, I guess I don't. I'll give you one more shot. Tundra! Tundra 6! Okay, we got an interesting tournament on our hands. All right, fifth place. We're getting up there. Give me a fifth place. Go ahead and stand right there in the middle. Who are you rooting for? Uh, liquid. Liquid, all right. Try not to get liquid. Ooh, we're right in the middle. Guys, what do you think? Is that Gaiman or Azur? Gaming. Gaming. Whoa, everyone wanted Gaiman. All right, Gaiman fifth place. Fourth place. Give me a fourth place. Who are you rooting for? Uh, I really want Nouns to win, but I think Team Spirit's going to win. Okay. <laughs> fourth place. Give me another one. Give me another one. Let's see. <laughs> well, then where are we splitting the average? Are we giving this to Spirit? Is Gravity taking this down? Yeah? Okay. Now we got the podium finishers. Third place. Who are you rooting for? Uh, I, I want a Chinese team to win. Okay. Yeah. I still got second and first up ahead, though, but tell me who's in lower bracket finals. So I'll aim for Liquid for this one. Okay. <laughs> I, I think there's a trick to spin this. What? Whoa! Whoa! You almost hit me with an Azur there. One more. <laughs> the direct impact, I think I'm inclined to believe that was Entity on contact. We got third place on Entity. And now we got our grand finalists, second place. You there, right there. Come on down. Who are you rooting for? 23 Savage Talent. Asian Dota. There's second place for you, my friend. Who we got? Aim. Ready? Fire? <laughs> I don't know. Give me another second. That's LGD, yeah. We're giving it to LGD? We'll give it to LGD. Let's give it to LGD then. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, are you ready to crown a champion for the international? I see a lot of hands up in the air, a lot of people, a lot of pressure. Come on down. Who are you rooting for, my friend? Well, I mean, I'm rooting for nouns, but they got eighth place, so. They got eighth place. Liquid's a good, you know, Liquid's a good standby. Let's see if it can make it happen. Can I up and do it? No, you may not. I'm sorry, gravity and physics must do the actual determination. <laughs> easy, easy, think about it. This is for Insania. This is for Insania. What would he's very calm about this. Is it really this hard to win a TI? You can't just toss something at a wall? Who else wants to crown a champion? You did one already, how about you? Over here, come on down. Who are you rooting for, my friend? Azure Ray. Azure Ray, come on down. You want a China China final, it seems. Can you make it a reality? <laughs> See, this is the problem. You choose for favorites, you're never gonna get it. You gotta leave it up to fate. Can we really not figure out who's going to win this international? 
One more. I'm running low on patience, my friends. We have a whole week before we get to Climate Pledge Arena. I can't reach that anymore. Do I have a backup first? Have we used up all our first? Can we really? Okay. Who has thrown the most games of Dota? Oh, all the hands went down immediately. I don't believe any of you for a second. You there, come on down. Who are you rooting for? Azure! Are you gonna repeatedly throw it into the corner over and over again and miss? Oh, I got it. Why don't we stand a little bit closer? Take this uh, other first place off. A little, little, little I'm, I don't trust any of you. A little bit. There we go. I gave you a handicap. That's what the bracket's gonna look like, my friends. Let's send it back to the panel. <laughs> I absolutely love it. I'm down for physics and gravity to decide some more future TI winners there or uh, seeing how, how well our gamers in the crowd can throw. <laughs> They're useless. <laughs> <laughs> that was really bad. <laughs> It was, they don't know it the was, technique. They don't know the technique. We, we practiced this. Behind. We did in the green room. Bro, you, it's more of a slap than yeah. like a toss. Yeah. yeah, if you do it this, there's like Not too much trick, spinning yeah. and then yeah. it like flips over itself and you just kind of, sure. no. It, look, they, they started off great. It, it was uh, on time. It was on pace. But unfortunately, it took forever to crown a winner. But right now, we have to see if we are going to be crowning Bet Boom as winners of this series or if Keed Stars are able to come back in this game number two. What are they doing? What is that reset there? Because there wasn't much opening for them to be able to get anything done in game one, two. So they've got to go back to the drawing board when it comes to draft their play style. What works? Again? I mean, first of all, I think there's the spirits are high. You know, so analog keys are looking pretty happy there in the back room. And after that first game, that's a game that can kind of knock the spirits out of some teams. But you know, to see some you know, little chipper faces there, I think that's the main thing here for this team. Make, your, make sure that you have that mentality coming into the game, uh, into the second draft. And if anything, don't you've got to play your own game. Like, there's kind of a little bit stagnant. The players are walking back out now. They're returning to the booths. They're going to gear up for game number two there. We did hear a lot from Keith Star's sheet that they like to have that energy, the positive and the enthusiasm from the young ones maybe being why there's still some bright smiles. I just want to see them come out swinging. The only thing worse than losing is losing by doing nothing, you know? Like, you, yeah. if you're in that game, that last game, you, you got to kick yourself knowing you didn't just run at them with five heroes, you know? It's like you, when you play open qualifiers back in the day, mm -hmm. you know, you play against the good stack. You're like, all right, guys, we're, we're down 30 kills, <laughs> you know? Let's just smoke us five, run at a hero, and murder him, and then call GG. You got to at least try some stupid shit like that. Yeah, put everything out on the line. I want to see it from Key Stars, but I want to know more about them, their journey here at the Road to the International. In the first day, we have a really great day. But the problem, I think, I don't think we can understand the meta about the heroes in the second day. We're going to learn from our losses. I think we had a really rough series against LGD, but I think we're going to take it well as a team. The biggest part of being here is like the practice and the experience. You don't get that from home. So like you kind of need to go first so you can actually improve. You can improve out of nothing. Every time you come to TI, it's like, we're in TI. We want to take the ashes and like lift right now. It's like, fuck, that's mine, bitch. So it's like, you understand it. Like we, every time you like, we need to be sure to not like start fighting the middle of the tournament because we need to like keep the mind clear. That's a good thing we need to do right now. This is my second TI, and I don't want to expect like, okay, you're gonna be here, and I want to do that, right? But I think we need to take it step by step. No expectations, purely taking it step by step, and they have a big step in front of them right now, a hurdle, I would almost call it Rezo.
Yeah, I mean, they looked pretty stressed in the previous game. That's why they were like so, you know, stuck with uh, not making any plays in that game. And I think King Gardini needs to be, you know, a step up and be a leader here and like show his, you know, this uh, carelessness mentality in a way that, you know, guys, we just, you know, there's nothing to lose for us. Just let's go and uh, enjoy ourselves. And, you know, they need to create this chaos. This is Brazilian Dota. They need to be playing aggressive. They need to pick heroes to be aggressive as well. But he, I didn't see that in the previous game. So they need to change uh, drafting-wise a little bit towards that. Yeah. Maybe just keep meta heroes, but, you know, play your heroes. I, that's what I like, yeah. I think we've seen success with other teams, especially like Nouns, right? They're, they're playing the heroes they want to play. And I want to see Analog on, like, his Invoker. I remember he really loved that hero. Hero. I actually knew about him years ago because he used to make uh, analytical videos with Bowie on YouTube and teach people how to play Dota. Yeah. And I always loved those. I mean, and he was a really good invoker back then. I think he made a guide and everything. I want to see King RD on his tusk. Yeah, you went 0 4 in groups. Who cares? Now we're in the playoffs. It's a new day. It's a new dawn. Pick your hero. If you like it, if you're comfortable on it, just play it. Like, now is the time to just stick to what you know how to do. And if, it, if being on heroes that you're really good at is going to allow you to go and push and make those plays because you know the limits, mm -hmm. then I think that that is like a risk worth taking here. Yeah, it is going to be difficult for them. Like that previous game, they were trying to make some of these moves that you're talking about, but they're making a smoke into a triangle where Bet Boom's already on the other side of the map. They then reset, go again, and then it's like, I feel like that first 20 minutes, it was a lot of, okay, this is how we'll get into the game, this is how we'll make our statement, but Bet Boom was just reading them perfectly. So I think the points about the chaos, the point about this, these are great, they just need to make sure they can do it from like minute six, minute seven, and get the ball rolling from there. If they're waiting for a much later timing to make these team moves, the map's already understood for Bet Boom. They're gonna know how to kind of just strategically kind of just outplay you. So I feel like for Keith Stars, I, yeah, I fully agree. I want to see them just dictate a little bit of the early game so that they can play some of their Dota. Was the focus not heavily on lanes then, and that's a change? You say like this early pace of Dota, does that start at the lanes? Yeah, for sure. The, the, the lane started so poorly for them, they couldn't do much. All right, well, they're going to get a do-over. They're going to get a game number two, which is starting right now. Five seconds remaining. Vivo Keed Stars versus Bet Boom Team. Game two. They talked about in that video there, what they had from groups was learning from losses. Viva Kid Stars faced a loss in game one, so a learning lesson for them. Bouncing back here in game two. Do they ban out any of the heroes that Bet Boom picked up for themselves? Is that the learning lesson? I mean, just don't get counter pick heavily with picking Luna that, that early, right? <laughs> They'll reveal two cores at the start, is that what you're saying? Yeah, a little bit like that. I mean, I know they, they're coming here with the strategies already. They prepared like four days before that, but uh, more aggression. I want to see more aggression from them. And what a reaction already, throwing in the Storm Spirit in the first phase ban. Like, that's not something you see too often. Maybe if it was like a year ago, you'd see it against some other teams, but... Yeah, this is a, a very reactionary band for sure for the series. Yeah, I don't really think that but Boom actually aiming for that hero that much. They only picked it because they already had a good setup with Coddle. Yeah, exactly. And it was like good 18 pick. But uh, yeah, they just respect it too much, I think. But Boom also getting first pick again. So this is two games in a row that they're going to be getting first pick. And I wonder if they're just going to run it back with a tree opening or if Vivo are going to read that and try and take it out, take a comfort away from Toronto Tokyo, a lane stabilizer. I can't believe they got first pick twice. I think first pick is pretty established. Like every time I look at the coin toss in the lobby, everyone is taking first pick yep. if they win. So it's kind of weird that Key don't seem to value it. But they seem to value Radiant over having first pick. Yeah, so That's what they want. So Radiant does allow you to have kind of access to the first kind of daytime Roshan. When you think about kind of that 20-minute mark, it's going to be on the, the Radiant side, so it allows you there. Players do talk about how the jungle feels nicer because you have more camps in your safe lane jungle, and the higher ground area is kind of bigger, so it's harder to get ganked into. So there are advantages towards Radiant, but for the trader for first pick, I feel like you should be looking at pick order nowadays more often. I think when you think about drafts from maybe previous internationals, there was a bit of a debate between the first, second, and then the side. There was a bit more contention, but right now I think we are seeing a heavy shift towards first pick being the more dominant one. So I've been thinking pretty hard about this ban. It obviously does lead into their first pick. It's going to be Dazzle and an instant tree? Yeah. Un unsurprising. Oh, we're going to see Bristle again. Uh, I think they should have it, actually. Yeah. 
but they should change the other heroes. I mean, there's I was no problems with the Bristol. It's just like uh, he wasn't maybe being able to to play the game because uh, you know the trio of like Ember, Skyrath, and Clockwork they didn't like create the space that is needed for the Bristol back to be able to go and you know do the, do his thing. I would. Uh, so I would be really surprised if Keatstars was scared to pick a Bristol now. I don't think there's any other team right now in the road to the international in this position that wouldn't want to go for Bristol back unless they wanted to ban it themselves. But it just logically, this hero is so powerful, but they are actually going to go for Nature's Profit. Will oh, they no. think about Bristol now? Oh, no. Yeah, oh, no. <laughs> Oh no. oh no! I mean, no. I I just hope that they they watch that game and he's gonna max pros this time <laughs> on KG. But I mean, yeah, they I, this this here allows them to play aggressive actually. So I kind of like that. They can make this chaos happen. It's chaos through numbers. That's gonna be the key thing. Like when your position five is playing the profit. You now know, like minute three, if there's an opportunity where Betboom's trying to be the aggressors on a safe lane, suddenly it's a try lane, you get a kill, and then you can give entry that way. So, yep, that's going to be cool. I'm keeping a close eye on the second phase of bans because Spirit Breaker was taken out in the first phase last game for Betboom, and I'm wondering if they're hoping to keep it in the pool for themselves. Uh, Keatstar is also thinking the same thing because they get the first pick out of this banning phase. Yeah, I love the Spirit Breaker. For Over the Bristol? especially. I think for both teams, they're going to enjoy Spirit Breaker um, because you've got one team with an Nature's Profit, so you want to be able to shut them down. They're going to ban it out, but yeah. <laughs> That's what I was wondering. Is it going to be banned out? Are they going to fight for it? No, yeah, it should be probably banned out. Like the tree with the shard, invisible, setting up for the free charge, Profit, always pushing in lanes, allowing Spirit Breaker to get the good charge as well. But it was probably needed to get banned out. Yeah, I think the global presence makes fighting very easy. You can take the fight like wherever you want. If someone's out of position, everyone's going to be able to converge. There's still heroes like Dawnbreaker, right? Still in the pool. <laughs> if Keed want to play around that sort of idea, um, I'm glad Spirit Breaker's out, though. I think that just makes it too easy, and I would easily see them picking it up. Are they going to burn Bristol? No. Heroes still in. That would be scary. I think if, if Keed, like last game, seeing how they were unable to sort of make plays happen, if Bet Boom are able to get their hands on Bristleback, I, it's when this hero gets punished that it looks so weak, but I don't have the confidence in Keed from last game to think that they could pu punish it. Yeah, especially with the armor from Trin Protector. I think that hero is going to be like really hard to deal with. They've done the complete inverse. Game one, it was the double core reveal. Now they're going for the double support <laughs> reveal. Yeah. Completely switch of the strategies, mm -hmm. probably because they lost faith in the previous strat. <laughs> but I think Bad Boom has an easy Bristleback pickup right here. It's it's such a free game for him actually. <laughs> already, already. We're gonna see the time tick down. I don't expect they're gonna wait too much longer. Okay, it's a Dark Willow. Instead, the Bristle still going very unignored between them. And Dark Willow is the same flex as last, uh, last, yeah, last, yesterday. That's the day and time I'm looking for, yesterday. L last day. Last day. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think, I think uh, it's more of a save hero, right, for them. I don't think uh, Nightfall played it that much. Uh, so far, he hasn't touched it, but of course, a lot of these teams have been forcing it quite heavily. Again, for Betboom, because they have first pick, picking Willow here with, let's say, an offlaner or something. Yep, they go for the Dawnbreaker. You then at least convince your opponent, maybe they flex it, maybe they do. So now these two picks for key stars, it's like, do we need to think about carry Willow? Is it just going to be the save playing it for? It's a lot of nuisance in that regard, but once again for Betboom, it's the same logic to deal with key stars. If they want to run at us, they're going to run into an overgrowth, living armor. It's going to be, you know, some terrorizers, solar guardian. Like there's so much counterplay potential for Bet Boom that you're kind of offering key stars to play quickly, make a mistake, and then get punished. Is, Is this keeper on the line mid? Yeah, I I don't Second, like that right? so much. I was hoping for a conquer or invoker personally, just in terms of comfort of what they've played, ways to to team fight ways to deal with Willow potentially as a core. I guess Keeper's still fine too, right? Because you deal a lot of AoE damage. I love Invoker too, but uh, surprised they went for the Coddle. Jesus. Okay, they are copy-pasting nouns to some degree, right? <laughs> you, you said how Betboom get impatient. Keystar's probably feeling that mechanically they are, not mechanically, but strategically, sorry, they're kind of getting a little bit outpaced. This is a, a, a draft of hour-long 70, 90-minute draft. 
Let's push out lanes with a Nagasari, skip waves of Illuminate, Clockwork with an Agonums and Flare, Trian just TPing in. Like, yeah, if they can stall the game, this could go forever. We might never leave the arena or get to the next series. I said today was the final day, but we're actually never leaving. There this we is go. A void we're all stuck if in, I can't in win the ages, game. no one can. <laughs> <laughs> I'll hold you all hostage here. Do you just have to answer Naga here then? Like, Pango or it's, something? It's Panga Kunka or Ember. Mm -hmm. Right here. I think I wonder why Ember. a Naga Siren exactly though, right? If we're talking about illusions, if we're talking about doing split lane pushing, there's still other illusion heroes in the pool that it's, you could have picked up. Double edged sword. It's good because for Willow, if it does become carry, you then have the song set up to get onto the Willow and then throw in the damage on top. And then if the Willow's then flex the support, it's another route that Naga can dispel, be it through her spell or through Manta, and then it's already treated with another route. So it just kind of covers both the flex potential of Willow and then, yeah, puts in a good spot. I, yeah, I like the ability to reset their fights now when Dawnbreaker. It's so annoying playing into Dawnbreaker because usually the play is, okay, Dawnbreaker's going to farm on one side of the map. You have to make sure that you go to her, kill her, and then you can do whatever you want, whether it's like take a Roche fight or take a team fight in general. This way, they can just poke out that Dornal, hit the song, reset, and then go back in. Yeah, I think Kunka actually it's just got banned to go down to say. I mean, they also see that uh, Bedmoon supports doesn't really have a ways to deal with lanes, right? So they can just uh, split push them super heavy. Mm -hmm. But there's like Dawnbreaker, Luna, and one more hero that's gonna deal with lanes. Bedmoon does. Okay, they ban up. I say Bedmoon does need that hero that goes to investigate where all this rat is coming from because they don't have that hero. Other than Tree with Shard, it's not as, I guess, comfortable for Dawnbreaker to join the fight. Puck would have been very good for that. The early first phase Storm Spirit ban right now would have been exceptional. Just get in, Dawnbreaker, connect, get a kill, and now you have quite an advantage. What is a replacement hero when Storm and Puck is banned though? Dark Spirit GPK. is still there. Yep. GPK loves that hero. I've seen him playing a lot of pops on it. Would you say, so say Earth Spirit, and then you mentioned Pango earlier. Is that still in contention here, would you yeah, say? I yep. think those two, pretty good. I guess it's nice that they took the carry because it seems like there's a lot of mids open to them. They get banned, it doesn't matter, there's still something left. Yep. The Luna, especially with the uh, the shard with the moon glaives, it lasting seven seconds, I think it was like 25% damage reduction. Like it's very good for this hero now to stand her ground and take fights. So before, you was always this squishy hero, you press Mask of Madness, oh my armor, and now I'm waiting for items. Like the shard gives you that tankiness to join fights and with all the, the buff ups that Batboom can throw in as well, Luna has become a, a hero that you like to see now against some of these uh, illusion heroes. Yeah, the, the other hero I was thinking about was Sven for them in this lineup. It's pretty cool too. Mm -hmm. Kind of like Team Spirit style. Team's and they banned out the Astro, yep. Cool. Ooh, another buff up. They go Invoker, yep. <coughs> I mean, they don't really have a good way to deal with Naga, to be honest. Yeah, this game's gonna last forever. <laughs> I'm telling you. Is this like a, a late game Naga that you're talking about? They don't have that ability to deal with or even finding her early while she's farming to shut her down, they still might struggle a little bit with. Yeah, I think that too. Like, I think uh, it's gonna be hard for them to deal with illusions pushing out the lanes. There's not like, Dawnbreaker has to deal with it all the time. And uh, I mean, in Walker and supports are not really be able to, you know, when, when she gets to like some butterfly Manta, the lanes are gonna be into them very hard. What you do have as an option, though, at least, is a lot of scouting potential in Boom. So if you are playing into Naga, you kind of want to find like the point where she is... So sorry, T. No, 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 I'm no. so excited. I was really excited. It's okay. <laughs> but, um, you know, like, you're going to be able to have Tree going in deep to put deep wards down. You're going to have him looking around with that shard, Invis, Invoker the same, playing with Ghost Walk. Like, they're going to be able to find Naga potentially, and then be able to bring in Dawnbreaker through all to gank her. So, like, they have ways to reach the hero. And what I was thinking about then was maybe this Coddle this entire time we said mid, if they push it to offlane, they now go for a Pango themselves. So you're not really having to play that offlane potentially. You just keep pushing out the lanes and you for another hero. This is an entire draft built around push out lanes, wait for an opportunity, and then take that fight. It is very reminiscent to how Nouns did win yesterday. It takes a lot of communication though with this type of lineup, and uh, we'll see if they can. 
So what are some of the downfalls or the uh, advantages that are going to happen for Vivo to potentially come back in this series and win game two? Well, Kim Gardee is playing Nature's Prophet, so I have hope. You have hope? That's, <laughs> that's where your heart lies. And he's going to you know, kill the map with it. So, yeah, they're, I mean, that is it. They're going to be playing the map, not the game, with these heroes, I feel. Whilst Boom, it's going to be farm up, take an Aegis, and then try and see through all this split push shenanigans and actually start you know, progressing the game themselves. Where does your faith lay, Sheep? Well, I want to see Keed win. <laughs> so, so I want to see a game, three, game. Yeah. I would like to... I like their heroes. I see the win condition for both teams. I do. I just want to see a third game. I want to see Keed bring the hope. You said that you see win conditions for both. Uh, is it the same as what T and Reza already said for Bebum and Keed? Oh, yeah. They're the smart guys on the panel. Oh, I agree. You're completely. Just... Resolution, <laughs> resolution former pro. Yeah, you're, you're pretty good. Thank you. I think he's smart. All right. I'm just more interested, T, for you. <laughs> T got completely... Oh, I got ruined there. All right. Oh, T, sorry. You're great, too, man. Thanks, man. I want you <laughs> a little bit more on the Coddle uh, offlane before we go to our casters. Uh, what exactly is it going to be doing? How does it function? Uh, farms quickly can buy any active item needed for the game to then push your team forward or just skip ways forever. Okay, well that's what I'll be keeping my eyes on and that's what I'll be looking forward to as we do head to our casters now. It's a lyrical and Trent. Thank you so much, Nat and Trent. We are here. We're taking a look at the second game. A little bit of hope being felt in the arena. Maybe they're hoping that Bed Boom take it out 2 0. Maybe they're hoping that Keed Stars can pull it back and we get a game number three. Yeah. What are you thinking, though? We do get this final little uh, switch up there. It's going to be the Coddle 3. I think they're hoping for some tier five neutral items. You cool. know, like we're, we're going late. That's the idea, right? Like they, they said, hey, we couldn't really close it out early. We didn't get this aggression that we wanted. Uh, what if we just uh, ignore yeah. the enemy team? What if we play a single player <laughs> game? Okay? This is now the co op <laughs> mode that I they, like they want to play. Uh, they're they're just going to farm some yeah. neutrals. They've currently taken a pause right now to discuss the strategy. Don't worry. You're going to be fine. That's yeah. not why they're pausing. You can't do that. Yes, they're the not rules. doing that. <laughs> yeah. No, but I think that uh, Naga Siren is definitely that style of hero that you're talking about. We saw it yesterday with Nouns, how they were able to do it. Um, and it kind of takes away that mechanic that we were talking about of if it goes late, Bet Boom just win. Um, Last game, though, <laughs> they hit Terrorblade, and they just you know, went and hit the buildings. Yeah. They used meta. Yeah. It's really good at doing that. Now they have Luna. They have Alacrity. They have Dawnbreaker. They definitely have these heroes that can just like go and start doing things. Right. And it's going to be very hard for them to ignore. So they're going to have to be really on point with pushing out those waves, yes. getting good vision, and then you're battling up against oh, the tree again. Right. Well, and I, I think just like mentality-wise, one thing to think about is that you're doing your mentality there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is that I yeah. like coming into this, I was like, all right, if Vivo Key starts to come in and win game number one, I think that they're going to win game number two pretty hard. I think it's hard to pull it back from them, but it's going to have been up to, uh, of course, the coach and King RD pulling those young guns back and getting right. them ready for this game. And putting it all on the shoulders of that fellow right there on the Naga Siren, Stabile, ready to take over this game. We'll see if he can do it, though. Ah, I see one of the predictions is last player to be killed. When there's one thing I know, that's yeah. Nightfall, right? We just, okay. Because he just never wants to die. Okay, got it. Solved. But what if he's not killed at all? That's the other flip side to that one. I don't know. That's a great question. Do they have to die once? Yeah, I think so. If he's been killed, then he has to die one time. Last player to be killed. Oh, my goodness. He wouldn't have been killed otherwise. Wow. It's just simple. And what if that tree falls in the forest? And I'm not there. These are questions I just don't know the answer to. I wouldn't think about it too much. As we get into this one, and Bet Boom already Easy stand up on their high ground. Uh, Still up, uh, willing to throw out the voice lines. Got to show your your strength early on. Indomitable will, yes. one might say. I like that. Analog running away. It's not wanting to get caught. Are they still going to play contesting for this? Sprout already leveled up. Reza will be happy. <laughs> <laughs> that KJ tree, I mean, you're looking at it, you're like, can can you max Treants? Yeah. He's really making sure. The, an the answer's looking like no. King RD making that switch up there and already has the Ooh, blood grenade geez. for down bottom. Wanting to get aggro and already building into the medallion. But we'll see how mid lane goes. This was really one of the big problems in game number one. GPK got off to such a freaking hot start. Let's see what they have to do. Pretty interesting matchup here to see. 
uh, the Pangolier, of course, has, has been a bit of a contentious hero. Oh, yeah. Where does he stand now? Are we Pango believers? I mean, we're all Pango haters. Yes. But now it's almost getting kind of sad to see the hero. Oh, die. and just like that, King RD brought down. Oh, shit, it's been trance. Pull up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, clearly. Or we could even pull up the camera. It just ends up falling. Well, that one uh, was a quick one. I mean, the other air area that we did run into some issues is Toronto Tokyo is taking a beating um, for FCR. And also from KJ, the waves do manage to connect, but with the blood grenade, the rundown, he's looking close to dead. Do they have enough damage? Yes. Manage to bring down the Toronto Tokyo tree. Yeah, meanwhile, that death there onto uh, King RD, that was because they had the level one connection there with the Bramble Maze. Okay. So it's gotten them good, and then Tom would have that early damage. You can certainly see. I mean, that's the, the scary thing about Dawnbreaker, right? Even just straight up at level two, uh, now that uh, you're threatening that as well, it could easily be a second death here. So King RD has to be very cautious here. Went with the Blightstone as well early on, so kind of hoping to be a bit aggressive himself, but he's one getting smacked in the head with a hammer into immediate brambles. Oh, that's not good, is he is going to die. And a rarely seen thing, he's going to have to walk back out to lane because he can't get level Prophet? two. He's walking? I have never seen a Nature's Prophet have to walk back to lane. That hurts. That one's really rough. Well, I mean, the thing that I was going to talk about before all hell broke loose down bottom is that um, it, it, in the last game, one of the big problems was the contention for the stacks, right? I, that really... Sorry, I have good news. You're still not going to see it. Okay, he's waiting? Yeah, he just waited. He's Okay, he's yeah, waiting. He waited for the TP. 22 seconds, he's like, eh. All right. And uh, he wanted something delivered to him on the courier anyway. It kind of worked out. I mean, you know, he's, he's, in our old age, the knees get a little bit rough. You don't want to use too much of the walk, and if you can't help it. And then, you know, you get a race band on your Nog Siren. So it's okay. That's a good point. Yeah. But uh, the, the Toronto Tokyo rotations to steal the stacks were a huge point of contention, and that really felt like it set Bat Boom up for just success the whole rest of the time. Not going to happen, most likely, in this case, because they're not going to be building stacks. Ah. Solved. The ultimate answer. I mean, they probably will have some stacks, at least, though, for FCR, you know? Yeah. You can definitely get in there with the Coddle, try and farm up as fast as possible here. Going to be an interesting game. We haven't seen a lot of Coddle offlane in a while. No. Uh, this was one of the, when Coddle, like, first became more of a core, this is kind of where we saw him a little bit more often than mid, I would say. Like, you know, many years ago, before we had our more recent round of mid Coddle. Right. And uh, it's really annoying. He just, like, runs around the trees as much as he can. Tree, going to try and deal with that. But tries to push out waves in a very hidden way. It's not that many places to go. And with King RD making the move over, they're going to be able to bring down that tree. Nice steal. So Vivo Keystar is making some action happen. As the cliff will come out, stops that, or rather gets the extra aggression on analog in the mid. But you can see right now, man, the, the CS is all going Bet Boom's direction. That is true. Yeah, they are hurting hard here on Naga and Coddle. 15 and 10 on Nightfall. That is scary. I mean, you can obviously come back from a laning stage loss, but losing all three lanes is really tough. Again, more aggression down here. Four onto him. Stabile backs away, keeping himself alive as King RD underneath the tower. I mean, they're still just playing up in his face. Doesn't have anywhere to go. Starts to walk back in towards the tower, trying to do what he can, but it's not going to be enough. He just dies. Oh, man. Bet Boom, they are absolutely all over him. Yeah, and even with these Nature's Prophet picks falling off, you know, they're not making any mistakes here on the side of Bet Boom. They all came prepared. They had their quelling blades, right? The only person with that one was Toronto Tokyo. He's good. He is a tree. Oh, yeah. Making sure that nothing gets messed up. I want to commit to these kills. Ready. KJ, caught with a Lucent Beam here. I mean, everywhere you look, it's just Bet Boom running at him. Th this this level of aggression is hard to deal with, although this is pretty nice. If they can catch GPK oh, the underneath the tower, a couple more hits. He just needs one more base slowed. They'll get it. Analog gets a little bit of help in mid, and that will set up for a little bit of success their way. Still, I mean, when your Naga Siren has 11 CS at five minutes, you know you're having a rough time. Analog's definitely that bright light, though. Yeah. You know, maybe get a couple runes here, make those rotations. They're always going to be helped out by uh, King RD on this Nature's Prophet. Has the medallion here, too. So he's he's ready for the high aggro Nature's Prophet. No treants. We just want TPs. We want sprouts. We want damage. Let's see if they can do it. I thought I heard a teleportation coming in, but not opting to go yet. King RD hanging out in Fountain. Has it back up again in a sec. 
Where will he look to? Looks like it's mid to refill the bottle. Oh! Does he get the refill? Yes. Okay. Now, see, that should be dispelled. <laughs> I mean, come on. Dispel the, uh, the Yeah, fountain. the fountain buff. So when he comes back down, he can't give it and to Volker him. doesn't need more. Stabile backs away. Your gets hit. The roll through. Wait a minute. They find one kill, but can they get any in return? Analog making that rotation, wanting to bring down Pure. And bounce back and forth. A couple more hits is all that they need, and they will get him. So Vivo making some solid moves, and in fact, up top, KJ pairs together with FCR to get the finish. Yeah, they're going to grab that bounty rune there, too. So chasing them way deep into the jungle. If they can't contest Nightfall, at least they're picking off his friend. Well, the CS doesn't look good, but the kills are making up for it. At the exception of the Naga Siren, who is about to maybe get passed over by the Willow. Oh, jeez. Right. Gotta play catch up. That part's not great. But it's a Naga Siren, right? I mean, we saw this just yesterday. Like, we've said multiple times, right? We, we had similar feelings looking at that Nouns game, and then Hector just vanished for 40 minutes. Right. Came out with a victory. Absolutely. Oh, can he manage to vanish? King RD already in trouble. Not quite able to get out of there. The Sprout was almost enough. But Toronto Tokyo finds the last hit. Also needs to be careful. That ward laid down by save is going to scout this Naga Siren's movements. And now, of course, uh, this has to put the little the warning bells up there for King RD because we do have the Solar Guardian available. The Dawn ult. Oh, yeah. As it's, as it's quite well known. This is going to be a scary couple of minutes here. I mean, yeah, they, they are going to have a really good vision. They scout Toronto Tokyo as he heads through and nice. steals some CS. Get that, get that loot. Yeah. Dude, he is left on an island. Walks back. They're still wanting to hunt or at least just keep him under control. If he just follows him this whole time, this is completely worth your time as Toronto Tokyo. Oh, yeah. No, 1,000%. Now the chase is there. Abum with the Nature's Grass. They're diving. This Game. is by the Tier 2 Tower. Where's Game. the help? Can't connect onto the Brambles, though. So that at least keeps them fine. But Analog making the move still underneath this ward. They spot save. And it looks like he's going to take over this bottom lane now. Yeah, and now you have this, like, King already has been TPing mid to refill this bottle. Now he needs to come down here and try and get some ward sound, right? Like, this is a classic situation with your Radiant side, Lunas and Naga Sirens. They're going to be in this wishing well down here, so you need to get some defensive sentries up here. Because you know they're going to have wards. Nightfall makes the move. King RD there. Roll up. Wants to chase. Nightfall gets hit. Will it be enough? The Dawnbreaker ultimate comes through. The second round of the stun. He misses onto Nightfall. Instead, he realizes, I need to get the heck out of here. Numbers show up in mass for Bet Bowman. KJ wanting to get out. The slow, it's enough, but not enough to get away from save. So when all is said and done, it's a lot of heroes rotating top. King RD, does he oh. manage to get caught? Wants Brambles? to run away. I don't know. I don't think they don't know. Now they're going to see him pass uh -oh. right by, and uh, that one's a little bit spooky. Solar Bind onto GPK. Couple more hits. Jump for it. Gets him. Analog gets the kill, and King RD TPing back home. <laughs> it was so low. Barely gets back home there after the earn charge. They're fighting back, Trent. Yeah. I mean, it looked like it was just going to be a free pickoff onto the support, and instead it turns into a kill in GPK. Much needed right now. Analog is definitely carrying the weight, and KJ making these moves with the clockwork. They get in range for a swashbuckle for a finish. Does it look like they're going to make that full move? I don't know how many times he's filled this bottle mid. It's got to be like six at this point already. It's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, they're giving everything that they can to this Pango. He needs to have a good game. Like, they, they absolutely have to carry this Naga through the mid game. And getting closer to Fusil Blade will do that. And this pressure up top is also keeping Toronto Tokyo from chasing in the bottom lane and setting up plays. Now, that being said, the Solar Guardian will be back up in another 30 seconds. So you might see Toronto Tokyo do the Twin Gate, go hunting, try and find the Naga Siren, because they still have this ward, right? No one has come down here from the side of uh, Viva Peace to try and de ward this right. no, It's just all been left alone. Oh, but he's got a free wave up top. So Toronto Tokyo doesn't really want to go anywhere. Luna's in the jungle. No. Needs that level six. Hunting, finding GPK, slow down, roll. Bringing everybody. Save shows up. The roll connects. Gonna hit him on the backside. Finds it. Rolls through. And the finish. They are hunting GPK. And well, they are killing him. You know, if there was one strategy I would take against Bedboom, 
Yeah. It might be killing him multiple times. Right. You know, chain killing GPK. Uh, he said before in interviews, you know, he definitely used to get really tilted playing Dota. It's something he's worked on. So hopefully it's not going to be impacting him too hard. But it's very frustrating when it feels like you're doing the right moves and you're just getting killed over and over Ooh. again. That was a close one. Yeah, I nearly got another one there. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, not just because, obviously, a very important hero to kill in the Invoker, but wanting to uh, play some of that mental games as well. See if they can do it. And if there's one thing that's going to tilt mid laners, it's dying to Pango. <laughs> that has happened more than a few times. Pango's got a huge stack right now. Oh, that's a Midas for uh, Stabile. Man, that's Diffusal Blade just about done here. Another 600 gold. Get some Ancient Camps there as well, but oh save those for anybody else. Okay, I think he's dead. Yeah, they're bringing numbers for that one. That's a, uh, an easy takedown for Pet Bull. They're building GBK back up. You know, he needs some earn charges, so. Rotation, finding save. Analog on him. Not going yet. Bramble connects, terrorized to boot. They bring in oh, your... Oh, good cogs. Yeah, that was nice. Walk off that uh, interception there, just in case. They didn't actually have GBK that close. I think they might have been a little bit concerned that there'd be like a follow-up after. So. Right. KJ still trying to get to level six. He's got it right here now, though, so not too bad overall in terms of timing. Yeah. And, of course, pairing that together with the Wrath of Nature from King RD could be really quick blow-ups if they can find the right targets. Yeah. Will that end up happening? Still 7-7. Seven to seven. Smoke up now with Coddle in... The clockwork running into GPK. Hookshot finds him. He walked into a ward. In trouble. Starts to die. There's no Dawnbreaker ulti because they used it top. GPK goes down. Another death for the mid laner. Got him again. I don't want to here. Go out. The bounty being claimed again. There's just wanted posters everywhere of this invoker. Taking him out. And yeah, 8 to 7. Only 1,000 gold lead right now. It's mainly on this Dawnbreaker. I mean, GBK has now taken that bottom core spot there as Kosvili has the Midas going. So, into the hot tub, farming it up on this Naga Siren. The plan is simple. Keep oh, yeah. farming. Can they do it? Still a little while before Hookshot's back up again. And we'll see. The ward was up there. Just a sentry to take away. I'm curious if Save actually finishes up this uh, Yule Scepter. Kind of an interesting first item on a Dark Willow, considering the matchup they're up against, you know? Yeah. Like, doesn't really help you that much in the lost situations. Not, uh, I'm not seeing it. I feel like the Force Staff might be super helpful, too, for your teammates. Definitely a very individual item. Like, right. I, I'm not seeing a lot of, like, cancel plays that are going to be super useful. Yeah, you, you, if you're in position where you're, like, canceling a Pango ult or something like that. Yeah, you're, maybe. Yeah. You're likely already going to die. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll see how he does with it. At least for now, got to be pretty happy if you're KJ. Being involved in a lot of kills, getting a third of the way, or rather a quarter of the way towards that Aghanim Scepter as stacks are being built and taken. Diffusal done. This is the item that makes this hero become so terrifying. I guess it's mostly just like a single setup. Because one thing we've noticed several times is he's always waiting for the Brambles um, from setup plays, right? Okay. So I guess that's, he's thinking of it more of as an offensive potential. Right. Yeah, interesting. Has a 2,000 gold lead. Do you think that if for Vivo Keith Stars, they need to keep trying to play looking for kills? Because that has felt like they, how they've kept it close. But is there ever a point where they want to sit back and farm? No, they actually need less kills, I would say, compared to last game. In this game, they're doing it way better, right? Finding many more kills on the map. Analog. Oh, the hook shot. Oh, he blocked it. But he gets the roll off. Analog trying to escape. One more hit. Will it be enough? The sun strike actually off the mark because he got stuck. And GPK is going to be the one to go down. I'll take that, please. Thank you very much. Oh, I think the booth is its tilting. It's up on an angle. <laughs> oh, no. What is happening? Save. Now also chase KJ there. They drop down the Dawnbreaker ultimate, but FCR, he gets out. Nightfall still hunting. The Coddle in some trouble, but actually might be able to get out of there. They drop the Eclipse oh, on a King RD. Run. Ring around the Rosie trying to get out of vision and well, might actually be able to escape as he hides through the trees. Jukes the other direction. Now Nightfall gets shown up on Sprout and Manta to get out of trouble. And him, like, he actually made the save there because he was trying to connect through underneath on Nightfall to stop FCR from escaping on the Keep of the Light. So King RD made a huge play getting in there with that Sprout. That's what kept that combo alive as they try and kill KJ. Yeah, he's dead. Oh, FCR! Woo! 
Almost went for that step back. Toronto Tokyo is going to die, though. All right, we have exploded into a flurry of is... kills in this game number two. Yeah, he's 5-0-2 on analog this game. They really have given him everything, and he is definitely paying off right now. That's what you want to see. And of course, think about this. All of that movement, all of that action up on the top side of the map, and look who's down bottom. Well, Smile is almost at the Manta style after going for the Midas. Is a Naga's Iron in this game? I mean, if, if he's free to just AFK farm like this, Bepboom are going to be in trouble later. Second best KDA, right? Oh, yeah. 0 1 0. He just wishes he was 0 0 0. Well, FCR is going to give up his life here, but will be. Oh, you can see the heat map down bottom yeah, yeah. where he's been at as save. Also, it's jumped on. Have we caster cursed them? Because now Vio Keystars are losing all of their heroes on the bottom side of the map. Beth Boom, they strike back in a big way. I mean, they know where the Naga is, right? Oh, yeah. So they're kind of playing this wall here with their other heroes who are slightly less important. Of course, your mid tower is also just being hit by a creep wave, which doesn't feel great. No. And, well, the mid tower for Bed Boom is already gone. It is going to be a tough ask to take one of these other tier ones without contention from Bed Boom. Although they do have great split push on the side of Evil Heat Stars. Ghost walk initiation up here. They have vision down. They see him. Combo. They see him. Yeah, and King RD just <laughs> dancing in their face, letting them know what's happening. like that. Another move. Smoke up. FCR. KJ. Ready to go together. We've had a, a couple games with the Muerta versus the Naga Siren where they haven't been able to actually song TP. Right. And in this game, we have the Solar Guardian, which could come into play, right? Depending on like where the enemies are positioned around. Yeah. Might not be able to find those opportunities. They drop down a ward. That one Radiant might have been scouted. Just barely, the sentry going down because it was on the low ground. And you can see that, yeah, the rest of Bet Boom, they head out of the way. And so we'll get the D ward here, but not able to connect. They were looking for another invoker kill. They have put so much emphasis on trying to catch GPK. Zero, five, and five. So poor. <laughs> yeah, he has not been able to get off to a good he, start. He's looking for that 18 minute invoker minus. Yeah, that hurts. But. In spite of his woes, they are going to get both that tier one tower in the mid lane and a lot of pressure onto the tier two bottom. Well, Heat Stars, they are just trying to take the top side and a lot cleans up the tower. They're going to smoke Twin Gate? Okay. Is that the idea here? Still a, a long ways to walk to get close to anybody. I think they, yeah, they were hoping that they were trying to set up and bait on this wave, I think. Okay. But they're going to be moving through some dire vision here. See if they give themselves away through that smoke. Doesn't look like it. Ooh, thought about picking up that bounty rune. They see the Naga Siren illusions on the Luna illusions. Smoke on smoke. Bounty rune goes away. Toronto, Tokyo, and save group together. And it does look like they're trying to set up with a Dawnbreaker ultimate onto this. Yeah, so, the overgrowth, definitely the big leading force they're hoping for. It doesn't look like it's going to end up happening. That ward expiring soon from Keed Stars. And they give up on the bait play. In Toronto, you're probably not super confident in just having the sentry up on that pillar now, right? Because there could still be a Radiant Ob, so. Yeah. Can be a bit frightening here to move through. But with the backup of Invoker, he's confident now. I mean, and they at this point, I feel like they've succeeded in making the space for the Naga, right? Like, they're, they're in a really good position uh, with her. Still want to get to that heart, obviously, and more items before you actually start but fighting. Bet Boomer just doing the same thing we talked about last game with the TB, right? This was the concern during the draft, is that, yeah, yeah. if you want to play super greedy, Nightfall was really willing to push towers earlier, much earlier than other TBs were doing, and he's doing it on the Luna, too. They find one here mid. Going to try and bring him down. Analog roll did not go off gets brought down. A good connection. Toronto Tokyo able to play Interrupt. This has seemed like a really good answer for the Pango. I mean, first, what, first death of the game too, right? So that yeah. streak going to pure. And this is the point of the game where he's looking for that big jump when you pick up the Deso, because he already has the BKB, so his BKB and his Echo. AJ trying to farm has two components of the Aghanim Scepter, but Save is stepping up to the high ground with Toronto Tokyo. A lot of heroes in tow. 
AJ, they drop down a ward. Should see him in just a moment, although he heads off to the other tree line. I just love how aggressive they are with his Luna. Like, they're yeah. just following along. They know that if they get a single kill, they can immediately go into the towers. If they force out a song, right, that's 130 second cooldown, they can immediately just go right back for it. They have to hard commit with some sort of a hookshot play or something and a rolling thunder if they want to defend here for Vivo Keystairs. Instead, they they know that they're about cutting waves, right? Yeah. Oh, they're going mean... to miss out on this Wisdom Rune. So Wisdom Rune and then also Tormentor going the way of Bed Boom. Although, I mean, it's not super easy. Pure is actually... Yeah, yeah. And King RD, of course, says, hey, if you're taking mine, I'm taking yours. Yeah. So nice pickup. Wants to back away. Toronto Tokyo spots him. Knows that he's going to be over there. And the root, the connection, tries to TP out. Gets broke. Uh, no. Oh, no. no. He just escapes. All right. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. I guess, uh, you know, no overgrowth means no chance for a kill. Well played. All right. Probably surprised he got away with that one, but he'll take it. Nicely done. He taunts his way in the fountain. Oh. Well. 10 to 11, still only 3,000 gold separating them. And Nature's Prophet, I mean, he's going to become another core if left to his own devices and just farming up. Starting to build up that net worth and can soak up so many areas of the map that the rest of his team can't get to. One thing, though, that uh, commonly happens in these Naga Siren games is the big XP uh, advantage that the enemy carry oh, yeah. gets. Like, you're right now, Naga, level 14, Nightfall, 17 and a quarter right now. Very aggressive on the map, super confident on this Luna. Still has the 9 second DKB, has the butterfly. Is it done? I think it's just about, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it's coming out right now. So oh, that's yeah. full Ooh. butterfly completed. Yep, had the more mask assembly from the mask, so. Yep, and uh, I guess Roche, right? Yeah, he's already running there. Uh, they did flare it, however. It just okay. dissipated. I don't think they saw them go in. <laughs> Nightfall's just pinging it, like, team, hello? Yeah, they're uh, they're hunting King RD instead. Analog heads back to base. That's going to take him a second. GPK was trying to hunt and wanted to go for a kill there on the Nature's Prophet, but decides not to. So, heading through the gate, and eventually they will... Clean up that Aegis and get it onto the Luna. I'm assuming it's going to be onto the Luna. Yeah. They have such strong confidence in like their ability to actually push with their carry. Yeah. More so than I think other teams have been showing a lot in this current patch, right? That's kind of why we're having these very dull mid games where people are very scared to, to go forward for good reason. They want to ensure that everything's secured. Tier 2 seemed to last a really long time, but Nightfall just feeling confident. Even if it's not this huge net worth lead, they understand like with the current position, with the heroes that they have and the itemization they've gone for, mm. I don't really see an easy way for them to fight on the side of Hero Pizza Stars. They, they have to play very patient. Well, this is maybe a little bit of a bold move, but they TP right onto GPK and got him caught. Still in more trouble, rolling back and forth. He's gone. Okay, that works. Just kill Invoker. Now look for more. Can they get out with the rest of them? Analog is feared. Tries to survive through this. We'll have another swashbuckle up in a second, but the stun, the root, the control, it's enough. So GPK appreciating what Pure is doing. Yeah. As long as he understands that his deaths don't really matter, right? Yes. Like, this Dawnbreaker's humongous. He's just a whatever. He's like, eh, I'm going to come back. I'll cast a couple spells. You want to keep killing me? That's fine. I have a Spirit Vessel. Whatever. Look at my Dawnbreaker. Look at my Luna. They're going to carry me through this game. Speaking of, that's a DD on Luna now. Oh, perfect. As we take another look at this fight, GPK <laughs> just right on top of him. Uh, King RD was able to make that kill happen. But seeing in the world that we're in again, it's going to be KJ going down to Toronto, Tokyo. Bet boom. They're getting ready to walk up a high ground. He was catching waves. They managed to kill off the whole wave that's at the tier two. We'll see what Bet Boom want to do. Because again, three and a half minutes is a long time. Do they want to sure, walk up high so. ground? Just, just go, man, right? Don't get too crazy here. Clean up the tier twos. If someone steps out of place and you get the kill, sure. Then we can right. go high ground. But of course, you can see there, the Nature's Prophet cutting waves up top. They're going to continue to do what they can to defend this high ground. And the question is, do Bet Boom actually feel confident going up to themselves, or are they just going to try and collapse the map down a bit? I mean, they have. It's, they're all gone. All the Tier 2s, 25 minutes every yeah. Tier 2 knockdown. This That's is good. not something we're seeing a lot this event. No. 
Now the shutdown is imperative. They, they have found many shortcuts on the road to the international. Mm. Okay, everyone else has been taking the long country road. Exactly. Very scenic though. We've seen some some fantastic things. Well, speaking of seeing things, King RD is going to TP out. <laughs> that is well rooted immediately. Not nah, so this time. GPK to get there in time. And sir, no, tornado's there. Doesn't have a way to get out. <laughs> They're trying to rebuild morale. Yeah, see, you can do it, buddy. <laughs> there it is. That's what he needs. First kill uh, on the that board. Is his first kill. <laughs> Dude, they have been putting so much emphasis on just shutting him down. It's funny to see. But Aghanim Scepter done for the Pango. So more spam, more ability to hold high ground. As the Naga Siren Illusions will spam out. Already has the entire heart done and working on the butterfly. When is the point where that starts to become a bit of an issue? The, this Naga Siren uh, in this game. Mm. Well, at the point when they can actually get it on the map a little bit, because it feels like they're still struggling, right? They can, they can hold one lane right now. Yeah. They, they still have to win a good high ground fight. Then it feels kind of good, right? Like you win one high ground fight, then you kind of push it on the map. You try and destabilize their idea of lane push right now. King RD's doing his best. He's TPing all over this map right now. Oh, yeah. To his death, but, you know. Oh, almost got the courier there. That would have been nice. But look at these. Like, the, the little treants are going to chase the, or pull the creep wave all the way over. Very annoying to deal with. He's also dropping these all sentry combos across the map as well. Again, trying to, like, open up these opportunities because they have hookshot, they have pango. So right. they can get these quick in and out kills. Uh, where possible, and then that's what's opening up the space for possibility to try and get out here and, you can and maybe get his, his butterfly, but I, I'm pretty sure that, you know, Nightfall still kind of just shreds these. I mean, they're going high ground right now with Nightfall. He's so, oh my goodness, as Harry hitting buildings. It's really nice. It's so beautiful. A right is saved by Zemitis, though, which is something to consider, too. They're, they're, <laughs> they're ready for the late game, but for the also attack ready speed. to for the end it right as they immediately burn him down to about half HP. 24 seconds left on this Aegis. And they time this out now, maybe. And maybe try and keep him alive. Take the fight right afterwards. Rooted. Down low. The, I mean, Barracks are already ten, gone, but Nightfall seconds. alive. Imagine. They're looking, hoping, hunting. He still has Satanic, though. So if you show up, I mean, he just turns. Yeah, but in. if you hit the crate, oh, if he cancels this. Oh. He was trying to get like a, the perfect flare that would right. cancel it. I mean, he's the satanic, that's weird. But that's okay. So one set of racks down. That boom. Gonna try and play for that next Aegis and close out the game at that point, most likely. We'll see if Keedstars can do anything to upset the balance in between now and then. At least for the moment, Nightfall is definitely the one to watch out for, though. He's just way too big. One of the things with these Naga Siren lineups, too, is that in order to get these big team fight wins, you kind of have to get a lot of the Riptide, which usually comes down to this idea of the enemy team being, like, chain stunned. It's just, like, held in place. You got the Blender going, right? And, and they do have that, because they have this Pangolier. Uh, maybe eventual Caudal Egg. Oh. Kind of cool. Well, this one is pretty good right here. GPK does pop the BKB, turns to fight. They get the lift up as the stun came through. So King RD is the one left behind as... Tango ulti was used. Oh, wait a minute. Clockwork? They don't quite see him. Oh, pure chasing. He wants KJ. Just Jetpack. got a vision. They see him now. Jetpack. Cogs. Tries to get to the far side. Gets him stuck in the cogs. Now the battery is <laughs> Jetpack. Roll away. Does have TP. Hoping to escape. KJ buying more and more time for his team. But it looks like eventually they're going to find the kill on the clockwork. Playing cleanup. Yeah, and at the same time, though, Naga Siren pushing out as much as possible. Illusion spamming down bottom. Grabbing the ancient camp there, too, and Butterfly now delivered. As long as he can stay alive, maybe that's going to be what they're looking for. A fast Butterfly done for Postabile. See where he goes to next. But the, the map starts to feel very small when you don't have any more Tier 2s up. Pure. Hunting. He gets him there with the net. Backs out for the moment. The root, the control, the sprouts there. Hammer gets him out of harm's way. And with that BKB TP out, manages to escape. 
Yeah, not going to have any way to cancel that for a long time until we get an eventual bash here for Pango. But it's not basher next frame. It's going to be the Blink Dagger. Picked up at the same time as Pure is going to snag one on that Dawnbreaker. So maybe a chance to stab into the back lines here. Maybe just another chance to try and kill GPK. It's probably what he'll do. <laughs> yeah, just jump on him again. See if it ends up mattering, though. Because at least for the last couple of minutes, those kills have felt much less important than it did earlier on. It's been all Nightfall and Pure this game. And they've been carrying it well. Pure is incredibly farmed. Getting close to crossing up that Naga Siren. Yeah, the teammates are getting a little jealous. You know, like you said, Save's got that Midas. It's only a matter of time until Tron Tokyo just queues up the uh, Aghanim Scepter, and we could just stay here all morning. Absolutely. Or, I guess, afternoon now. <laughs> We've already passed it. <laughs> Perfect. Ward. Making it able to... Come on in and take away that vision. And Naga Siren Illusions cutting waves. They have one or anything to deal with this bottom one, though. I mean, it definitely feels like it's just waiting for that Roche, uh, which with a minute and 20 seconds away, is going to be spawning down bottom. Toronto Tokyo, he, he's on it. All right, this he's is so his job. Ready. It's good to be playing Tree and Protector when you just have to be the tree, right? Look, he gets flared. If he just stands still, they may not notice. Right. Down the Roche pit, he's ready. Yeah. Just, wow. <laughs> That's a lot of APM. <laughs> His numbers are going through the roof right now. Look at this guy. Yeah, Half yeah he's just gaming right now. This is the highest oh. level gaming you this can is, do. Yeah, this is, <laughs> there's two replays. I mean, can you tell the difference between Herald <laughs> or Toronto Tokyo? You, just, you never know. Oh, Living Armor. Nice. Big, big play. Big. big stuff there. That, that took a lot of effort. Is he in the booth? Yeah, he might be. I think he's still in there. Let's go grab a sandwich or something. He still hasn't moved. Oh, oh, he moved outside the pit. Oh, back in. Misclick. Okay. Yeah. Got to keep your hands warm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they're going to smoke through. Oh, and actually go for a, a little backstab play here. Interesting. Now, they will lose a tier two tower, which, of course, Trance very upset about. Oh, FCR. Oh, don't go oh. too far out here. Okay. Does Get still that. have Song. Has, Roche? Has he, used it? he hasn't used it this whole game, right? No, no, no. Song of the Siren used yet. Sunstrike shows. That might tip him off. Oh, mirror image. Tornado lift up. The tear rises there. He does not manage to get it off. And that will be the beat down that they were looking for. Second death on that Naga Siren. It is crazy that considering the state, though, there's creeps hitting their towers. Yeah. This is really frustrating to play against. There's no doubt about that. It, it is starting to give that little glimmer of hope of, like, how can you not stabilize the map at this point? And right. it's just because of the way that they're... They've just got all these little things. This Aghanim Scepter. I mean, they put it all in the panel, right? The Aghanim Scepter on the clockwork. The Nature's Prophet constantly TPing in there. He's also got pretty low respawn time still, so those deaths didn't matter too much. That's the benefit of the low levels, man. Yeah. I mean, Never silver lining. It would be great to get 20. That would be nice. Oh, yeah. That would make things a lot better. But this should be Bet Boom now claiming the Aegis. All of their waves are going to be shoved out completely nice. across the map when this happens. You see that GBK actually just sunstrike the tree line there uh, all by the cliff. Okay. Make sure. The clockwork here trying to be sneaky or something. Yeah, no opportunity for that one. So Aegis, cheese in hand, Bet Boom claim it and that is an Aghanim Scepter done on save. Okay, it's go time then. And we have the MKB on the Luna here to deal with the Naga Siren, so no concerns there. Approaching the high ground, GBK also wants to have a little bit of fun, so picks up a Blink Dagger to just hop onto the high ground, kind of like on that Storm Spear with the eggs. Just wants to secure things. Hookshot not gonna hit. Ooh, slow down. Oh my god, that was a lot of damage. That is not what you want to see <laughs> with the initiation. When you jump on the Dawnbreaker and two of your heroes get down to half HP, you know you're having a bad time. Oh, and there it is. Whew. Moves in, gets the kill, gem on the ground. I mean, th this next four minutes that the Aegis is in Luna's hand, this could be the end for Keith Stars. Their hope here at the road to the International and for Betboom wanting to move on. It's going to all come down to can they delay through this period of time? Look at that 93% win probability from Dota Plus. You know, it's actually been stalling there for a long time, though. Oh, yeah. And it's been around there for the past five, six minutes or so. And they are holding on on Vivo Keatsters. No doubt about that. They need that one amazing high ground defense of some mystical variety. But I, the fight doesn't even feel like the thing that saves you, unfortunately. It's just the, the wave push. Like, if they actually get to the high ground, oh, yeah. that's terrifying. 
No, and, and they're going to get there very soon. There's one creep wave coming in. FCR is going to try and deal with it while simultaneously the other waves are shoved out. They do still have a glyph available. All right, a couple creeps still alive. Takes them out. There's the glyph. That's Bloodthorn right. done. So someone needs to kill this wave or they're in big trouble. Yep, that's what needs to happen. Rooted, they're throwing out the flares to try and kill the wave off. And Nightfall under control, and yeah, Analog is right there. He's on to him. Gets GPK yet again. The overgrowth connects. Save is right on top of him. Doesn't manage to quite find him. And with the BKB wearing out soon, Analog still in trouble. Tries to jump away. Disarm. Escapes. Will it be enough? They're still trying to deal with Nightfall. And Nightfall is almost dead, but not quite falling yet. Keeping him very, very low. And he's life stealing off of the creeps. A couple more hits. 30, 20 HP. They come in and take him down. <laughs> it's only the Aegis. But at the very least, they got that. There's just so little left in the tank. Though. A glimmer of hope, perhaps. They need whatever they can get. King RD is still cutting waves on the bottom line. Can they get out of there? Manta, Dodge, trying to escape, pulled back in with the EMP, and he is gone. 70 seconds, yep. no more Naga Siren. Bet Boom just looking to clean up. Yeah, too many BKBs still up there to even try and go for the songs. We might not even see one this game. They got a full minute right now to close it out here with the Alacrity Luna. They're making these plays look so easy. Bet Boom, just move on up with your carry and hit some towers. That's Mega Creeps. 45 seconds with no more Naga Siren. And while they are rooted, it's the only thing holding Nightfall back from hitting these buildings. He steps forward. Analog can try spamming out something. King RD is pushing along this bottom lane. Uh, the fans are approaching the stage. They smell blood in the water. They're ready for this one as the Ancients expose. Bet Boom stepping forward. They are going to take the victory. They are going to move on the road to the international. And Vivo Keystar is there out of here. Ah, uh, Bet Boom expectations perhaps met here this morning. Not something you get to say too often with Bet Boom, but. You know, you watch this, you be like, how did, you know, how they would think they had a chance on the other side? These guys are so good. Absolutely. They look so clean together. They, you know, GPK is just dying, but it doesn't matter because the game's being carried by the Dawn and the Luna, and they understand that. So nothing to be concerned about. This is what we're expecting from this lineup. The question is, can they, can they keep this up? Will it keep going on their path? Right, that is the big question mark. I mean, you come in, you have this expectation for Bet Boom of putting forward a solid show, and you can see the crowd, give them a little bit of love there. Um, it, it, it's what we were hoping to see from them. Uh, the question is, are they going to be able to maintain this? Obviously, still have more games to play today, a lot more on the line. They're going to give a little bit of love there, but crowd, give them a little bit of an applause, put together a heck of a performance, yep, both yep. teams. Keith start in Bet Boom on this early morning here on Sunday. And Vivo, uh, you know, Keith Star's not a team that people were, were really, you know, having a lot of expectations for, not sure what to expect. And I'd say they outperformed, right? They played really well in the group stage. Oh, yeah. You know, obviously, had a lot of fans here. We're very happy to see them play up on stage. But I'm sure also feeling like maybe they didn't meet their own expectations here this morning. Absolutely. Um, and I, I think that overplaying uh, and overperforming, um, it's so interesting to see some of the score lines in this one because Pierre makes moves everywhere. 11, 1, and 7, a hell of a showing. Nightfall, 1, 0, 6. This guy did not get involved a ton in the kills. No, he, but he hit those towers. He hit so many buildings. I think more building damage done in this game than any hero did hero damage. Uh, and, of course, Toronto Tokyo taking some pictures there with the fans. The TI winner hoping to make it happen again. But an impressive showing from this Bet Boom team that at times have not been able to live up to expectations on the stage. They're doing it right here. Yeah, hopefully they can take this momentum, right? Go back, prep for later today, sign more shirts. <laughs> that's, that's what they're here for, right? Oh, totally. Sign in all the shirts. Um, and GPK, I think that, you know, you got to give a little bit of, uh, of love here in this one, too. A player that at various times has dealt with sort of mentality issues, wanting to sort of keep himself from tilting. He got so much focus on him in this game. Six deaths before he got his first kill. And at the end of the day, it's like, you know what? My team is going to yeah. carry me. And, and what happened? He got tipped by all his allies, right? That's character growth right there. That's what you want to see. Let's head on back to the panel now and let them talk through this series. We're going to chat about the series, this game number two, what it means for Bet Boom, and obviously everything that Keed Stars put on the line for themselves. It does unfortunately result in their elimination, but uh, it's going to be 
a big uphill battle for themselves. I am talking about this game, and I'm wondering when the camera's gonna come back to us, because I have a very familiar face, a very special guest on the panel here, Dendi. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. You can hear the massive applause for you. We all have, have so much respect and love for you. You looking around? You see any other familiar faces in the audience? <laughs> Are you uh, a big Bet Boom fan? Are you happy to see them persevere and have that 2 0 for themselves? Um, it was you can say uh, no. interesting. You can say no. It's <laughs> okay. You don't have to be here. Yeah. We accept no on the panel. Bro, his, his shirt is signed by Fear. Yeah, he has favorites. It's very cool. They're playing there, right? Fear's back in. <laughs> tell, tell us about the shirt, please. What please, is the story? What's the law behind your shirt? Oh, you want to know yes. the story yes. about your shirt? Yes. Okay, guys, this is something you need to know. This shirt is TI1 shirt of Fear. Yeah, this is legendary Woo! shirt. <laughs> yeah. Nice. And uh, so far, this. TI here, like, it's amazing. Like, it, it, it gives me a lot of uh, memories of TI1. Uh, same stage, kind of, in the same way, mm -hmm. right? Like, those towers, yeah. those flags, the scene. I'm actually uh, curious why players don't scream at each other, because if yes. I would be there, I would be, like, standing up loud and just go, you know, go crazy. Yeah, we mentioned that as well. We thought that some of the players would have some interactions, and they might not have interactions with each other, but they do with us here. We've got Pyrian standing by with our winner's interview. Thanks, Nat. Yeah, I'm here uh, with Save, indeed. Congratulations on that win. You must be delighted. After you lost the Series to Nine Pandas, how do you lift the team up? and sort of get them back to winning ways? I don't know, we just played uh, a lot of pubs this week, a lot of scrims, uh, watched a lot of replays, uh, casual stuff. So just, just scrimming, practicing, getting back to it. Uh, you guys have Talon next. Have you studied them much? You played them much? What are you expecting? I don't think we played them much, uh, but it's definitely a really strong team, and I think it's going to be a good game. So you're known for your stoicism. You're kind of steady guy. You don't smile too much. Can we get a smile after this win? There it is. Can we zoom in and get a nice smile from Safe? That's good. There we go. Nice. Thank you so much. All right. Back to the panel. You're uh -huh. doing absolute work there. We're trying to fix some issues. Then he's like, I don't know what you guys are saying. He's like, well, let's just talk about the show. But uh, Pyrian, putting in work, you got a smile out of save there. So very impressive. It's not the only win that Bet Boom are getting there for themselves. But let's break down the game a little bit, Rezu. The main thing I wanted to focus on was Keith Stars. Is Nature's Profit? I mean, it was much better. OK. The skills pros. I like that. points. But you got to have four. you got to have four when you're playing this here, this patch, right, Dendi? Of course. <laughs> like, <laughs> when you see all the profits, they're just like owning the map with the new sprouts. But uh, I mean, KD, they, they, they made some aggression happen this game. It was like clearly not one-sided game. They carried this chaos that we wanted to have, to have and like see. But at the same time, like their draft they didn't really have a clear win condition of how like they want to end the game. Whilst the uh, Bad Boom lineup, they have this Luna. And they go high ground, and you know the game is over. But uh, Downbreaker from Pure, such an amazing performance. Two games in a row, he was like beyond godlike in both of them. Like they, they have to respect his Downbreaker from now on. Yeah, he finished the game 11, 1, and 7. And you're mentioning Nightfall and the building damage. He finished the game with 29,600 building damage on the Luna. And I think Bet Boom, they saw through Keystar's strategy of skipping the wave. Because once they got themselves in a position near a tier 3, it disappeared. Like 30 odd minutes, boom, mid rats goes. They reset for a couple of minutes, back at it again for the top lane. So yeah, Bet Boom, they weren't trying to play this game of keeping the, the map open. They got to their item timings, and they just rinsed through Keystar's. Yeah, I mean, the laning stage was very rough for KD, right? Mm -hmm. this, yeah. this Naga had such a hard time, and he had to, like, bite Midas and come back the entire game. So he wasn't that, you know, fat Naga that would push the lane out and create the space needed for the KD to make all the moves happen. Right, it's like you have the contrast there between Thornbreaker, who's just rushing a BKB at 16 minutes, and then is able to just go fight and fight and do whatever he wants on the map, versus a Midas catch-up sad game. Yeah, it also like they have Caudal, except instead of like some, you know, fatty, beefy position 3 hero, and it's not like it doesn't allow them to have that frontliner that's created, you know, all the positioning for the for, for, for his team. 
Dendi, do you prefer playing lineups that are more farm orientated or fight? Do you want to farm or fight? Oh, I love fighting. <laughs> Whenever I can, if I can have a lineup that can fi fight, I will be very happy. Like, uh, yeah, it, it looks like it's pretty hard to play for a VivoK star this game because having no front lane, uh, like, you need Pango to have an excellent game, and then Naga coming back uh, from such a big goal deficit, like, Bad Booms had two tempo drafts to, for VOK start to handle. Mm -hmm. So, if, uh, yeah, like, I, I'm always up for fighting. Like, if you ask me any day, like, uh, give me some hero who can fight, I'll be very happy. You want that aggression li aggressive lineup for yourselves, and that is what secured Bet Boom that 2 0 for themselves, getting double wins there. Keyed Stars, it is the end of the road for them. They are eliminated. Any words of encouragement, then, you know, facing elimination, knowing that your road to the international is over? Anything out there for the teams that have, are in that position right now? Oh, definitely. Never give up. Uh, MMR is just a number. Age is <laughs> just a number. <laughs> so just keep, keep your road going. I really respect uh, Brazilian guys. Mm -hmm. Like, I have insane amount of respect to them. Like, I even wanted to play with some of the guys in the team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, uh, and I'm happy they group up together and show such an amazing performance. Qualify to TI and, you know, like, they give it their best. Yeah, so I hope we just keep growing, you know, keep, keep moving forward. As they said uh, in the interviews that uh, TI is an amazing experience for them to yeah. grow. So I'm really, really happy for them. Yeah, I, I wish them all the best. I just hope that King Gerdy is going to play in 30 days another tournament and not be <laughs> 1,432 days or something. We can hope. We can definitely hope they're going to see more of them. In fact, I know that Pyrian is down there. He has the exit interview ready with a member of Keed Stars. Yeah, hi. I'm here with KJ. Uh, unfortunately, you guys did get knocked out. But does it feel good to be back with an all-Brazil roster at TI? Yeah, for sure. It the being here with a lot of uh, all my teammates being Brazilian, being here, uh, it's very good. But we wanted more, of course. We trained a lot, but uh, yeah, that's it. We, we trained a lot. We wanted more, couldn't get more, but that's it. It's boring. That's boring part. Here okay. with Brazil, it's fun part. Being with Brazil players, <laughs> okay, <laughs> boring. Awesome. Well, what was the story with the hat? Is this like your uh, your special hat, lucky hat? Not anymore. Not anymore. I thought it was, would bring me luck. It did not bring me luck. But it, I have some nice memories with this hat because I bought it with my uncles and when I visited them, I mean, doesn't matter. Didn't bring me luck, not using it anymore. Well, it's a great hat. You should keep it. Um, what are your plans for next season? What are you hoping to achieve next season? Uh, of course, play TI again and go further and play the other bigger tournaments if they, whatever they come, and just keep working with the team. It's a very new team. This roster, like we have like three, four months, and we're playing against teams that are have more than a year long. They've played TIs together, so even though we got a bad result, I think it's kind of decent for the amount of time and the preparation we had. You you have to keep grinding, right? And that's it. Just keep grinding. It's a process, right? So. Have you got any words for the fans out there? Anything, any shout outs you'd like to give them? Não deu para dar surra neles. Não deu. Tomou surra, mas não desista. A gente vai continuar treinando. Agora a gente vai treinar. Brasil vai treinar. Brasil vai longe. Confia que eu não vou desistir. Então vocês não podem desistir. Então só bora. Well said. Thank you so much. Commiserations this year. We look forward to seeing you next year. Back to the panel. Such a beautiful exit interview there from KJ. Rezo, Dendi, do either of you guys have, you know, like a lucky item when you play on stage or pregame ritual at all? I actually never had that. Never? I never believed in any of that yet before. Okay. Now I believe. You make your own fate. Now I believe I have like a lion next. <laughs> like, now I believe. <laughs> but before I didn't have it. Okay. Um, I had the Paj doll from the Paj set. Yeah. Uh, but I didn't bring it to every tournament. It was like one tournament. Okay, this is gonna be my lucky thing, but maybe I should bring it more. Maybe that's why not everything is working out. <laughs> you yeah. gotta start carrying it around in the backpack, bring it to all the tournaments for you. But it is unfortunate for Keed Stars seeing them eliminated here. It was great to see them play on the stage here at the convention center. Bet Boom gonna be playing again second time today. They'll be in that third series. But for now, we've got to look towards our next series, the second best of three today. It is gonna be a Western European showdown. We've got Tundra and Entity Sheep. 
Oh, I love European donor in the lower bracket. We're just calling them away, giving space for other people to finally shine. Uh, yeah, this one's very Tundra favored in the past, right? Entity definitely had their ups and downs. I think last year they kind of exploded into the scene, had that good showing even with a stand-in. Everyone suddenly gave them all their focus. Oh my god, who are these guys? This is cool. They were hitting some of their first lands internationally and even first TIs. Um, obviously, I think the pressure got to them. They did not perform to expectations, and since then we've seen them kind of refine themselves. Now they've got Gabby on their team. Things are actually starting to look up. I think they've been putting out some very solid performances recently. When you were playing in DPC this year, Dendi, was there other regions you were looking at? Were you watching the Western European teams of play? Of course, of yeah? course. Yeah, we were trying to watch as many games as possible. Of mm -hmm. course, it's not so easy to watch everything, but yep. yeah. And uh, did either team, Tundra or Entity, stand out to you? And do you have a, a not a favorite, but one that you think is more likely to win in this matchup? Um, I think both teams are incredibly strong. So it's very hard to even call favorite now, because we see what's happening at TI, like there is uh, some upsets happening, right? And uh, now uh, Tundra have Thompson. A lot of uh, players and teams who played screens against them, overall, we're like, showing that they're doing really, really well with Thompson and uh, Entity have Gavi, so it's very interesting. Yeah, it's, uh, it's inter interesting to see what's going to happen. I also think it's 50-50 matchup at this point, okay. because I think Tundra is not really like at their final form with the Thompson, because they need to get used to each other. Thompson is a very unique player, and you need to like kind of understand how he wants to play and like how to follow up him, and like how to use that, uh, that pressure that he's creating. Uh, but at the same time, yeah, with Gabi, like they, they found this cohesion in Entity where they, they, they brought him in and he's, he has already like his signature heroes and he changed the role as well from position one to three. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, been, it's been working out for them pretty well as well. Yeah, Gabi is probably the one player I'm the most excited to see play on the stage. He's had some really unfortunate past history with TI, uh, especially last year. It was tough for him. So seeing him here, playing it, T, do you have anything more when it comes to either Entity or Tundra before we do see them out walking out on the stage? I just don't want to see him play Venomancer. You know, there's a, so obviously some SEA Venomancer. Just don't touch that. You know, you're on a lower bracket, you're on elimination. Just, yeah, steer clear. But no, I feel like... Well, uh, Reza was saying, I think Gabby has entered this roster and already started to shine, and you can feel that the draft does dictate often quite around his hero pool. And then you have players like Watson, where so many people claim like one of the best pub players in the scene right now. Is he still rank one? It's, I'm pretty sure he is. I think like, he is. It would be illegal if he wasn't rank one. Like This guy is insane. So I think for, for Entity, very close matchup, and we'll see how it goes. Uh, anything on Tundra, though, that, that transition for Nine very quickly into the plus four? It's about, I think, Nine finding his form, but also Skidder having the confidence to play for the late game. I think uh, with Thompson, you've got to be very careful. Yeah, that's valid. We're not always looking at those side lanes, but we're going to be seeing the players walking out. Our first team coming to the stage right now. year for themselves, narrowly missing out on the international stage for a couple of events, obviously having a very difficult road for themselves leading up to this moment. But here they are in the convention center on the stage. We're going to be seeing them play up against Tundra, who are coming out now. Maybe in a position a lot of us didn't expect it down in the lower bracket. They've got their stacks of paper. They're hoping to have the repeat for themselves and potentially even a three-peat in Thompson, but they have to do that lower bracket run. It starts now for themselves, Rezo. Yeah, that starts very well. 
uh, right now. And uh, I mean, I, the, the, why, why, why I said it's 50-50 matchup right now? Because I think Skitter uh, not at his like you know best form right now. Because I, I've seen his uh, his gameplay, and he's not like really confident about like how, how to move around the map and like how to create like you know this Yatora type of like follow me team. I'm gonna you know I'm gonna go and get them. So it's uh, uh, Watson in that sense looking to, like way more confident. Yeah, and that's kind of what I was touching on before the walkouts. It's like the idea, I think, when you have Topson on your team, expect the space to be made. Expect chaos to occur, and you need to have your side lane cores to see through that and go, when do I want to join the chaos, and when do I want to farm and utilize the chaos? And I think Tundra is still kind of in that kind of growing period where sometimes they get dragged into a fight that they don't really need to take, where in the past, previous teams Topson was on, the carry players were able to always kind of see that perfect kind of picture of what do I need to do with him and my team. And if Tundra in the break since the group stage have found that form, then of course this could be the start of their low bracket run. You know, I never really thought about Skitter in that way, but now I'm reflecting. He, uh, after Tour 1, was a little bit slower to pick up on what was really meta in the, in the carry roles, and so she, you'd think that Skitter might be the slower of the two when it comes to widening that hero pool, picking up what is going to be meta in the patch and playing to what other teams are doing? Or do you like the fact that they keep pretty headstrong about what works? I think... Both of these teams are, their carry players are good enough where they will be able to pick up the heroes that they want to play. And I think maybe on Tundra's side, when you're playing with Topson, maybe you should just kind of stick to some reliable stuff and let Topson go crazy. Make sure you're just kind of reliable. I think, I mean, reliability is probably like the word you could use for both of them. I think Watson especially is like always a stable uh, player on the team. He's just going to do what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. I think the change that happened to Skitter is that he had this structure of like where he would play some Naga, CK, and Medusa type of heroes in the previous TI, and they, they had this, uh, I mean, I, I would call this script where he, he knew exactly what to do mm -hmm. in the game and like yeah. what is his role is, but at this time right now he's not really like, he didn't found that uh, specific key to his playstyle and he doesn't really have that, you know, understanding that is like, I need to be doing this in game and like my, my team is going to win because of that. Mm -hmm. Then you know the mid lane pretty well, especially this year. So between Topson, Stormstormer, are we going to see a lot of wacky picks? We know Topson does that, but does Stormstormer do that too? Um, Stormstormer have his own hero pool. I, I really admire him. He's an insanely good player. I really like him. He's very nice. And uh, he plays on his heroes pretty well. Maybe, uh, and he, he kind of have all the meta heroes, I feel like, uh, added. So um, kudos to him. Uh, I had a little talk with him about uh, behind the scenes. I give him some tip about one hero. I will not open the secret to you oh, guys. Can I say? Okay. Can I say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, about Topson, uh, I'm impressed uh, with his creativity. All the time he's bringing up some crazy ideas and he's kind of making them work. Uh, I, I, I'm also the guy who likes to bring some crazy ideas into yeah, the game. Yeah, we saw two or two yeah. three. Didn't you bring the witch doctor to the mid lane? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I love it. I love it a lot. I'm waiting until someone pick it. Maybe now, who knows? I'm, I'm sure like, David Moo is grateful for that. Yeah, because yeah. he's been playing it offline. Uh, Maybe he, he found this also at the same time, like the, the idea how it works. So about Thompson, yeah, he br bring those heroes uh, to, to the limit. Uh, with some heroes I might not agree or not understand myself, yeah. so it's very interesting. So for me, I'm as mid laner, I always watch all the mid laners, what we play and trying to learn from them. And <laughs> uh, if I open everybody, I usually see, oh, okay, he's playing this, he's playing this, he's playing this. It's, it's meta, we're all playing meta, but when I open Thompson, he's like, this guy mid, okay, this guy mid, this guy mm -hmm. mid. I'm like, what's going on? Clings mid. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> always clings. So clings, yeah, clings, for example, I don't really understand this hero that well, mm -hmm. but it looks like it's working for uh, Tundra. What is his build? Does he go like Aghanims and stuff? I don't remember. Yeah. Because I think with Aghanims, that hero is actually like a very powerful one, and he can create a lot of chaos in the fight and a lot of damage output as well. Yeah, always crazy builds. You, you can always find, even when he played uh, back in the days, so it was like Puck, right? And Everybody playing Puck with some Kaya Sench, and then Thompson is playing with Urn of Shadow Urn and, yeah. and Ethereal Blade. And yeah. you're like, okay. That was a good one. That was a good one. <laughs> Going back to the Clink's point, you're saying Ags, he just went Deso Daedalus Hex. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, just the most mind. fine hero kill hero, but yeah. it's, it's a Thompson form. No, I, I like that too. Yeah, I think that's always going to be the argument between Thompson versus other mid laners. It's going to be like creativity versus consistency, where it's like, at what point are you pushing the boundaries too far? And does it occur in your practice time or inside the booth? And I think that's always going to be the cool thing 
where if they've been able to use that creativity in their scrims and truly understand what it needs to do in the game, that's when they can make incredible runs. And sometimes when it's a little bit more spontaneous, you can have those issues where, that's a great idea, let's go for it. And then 40 minutes down the line, you're like, ooh, this kind of made the game a little bit difficult. But of course, I thought Tundra, with that extended break, they should have been able to kind of fine tune it to make sure they do excel during this. Mm -hmm. Well, with Entity having that roster change, having that offlaner change, Sheep, do you think it's easier for them to draft? Is the offlane more stable for them than what we saw in DPC through this year? Yeah, actually. They, uh, you know what my favorite part of Entity is, is Fishman, because he will go into interviews and he will just frankly say what he thinks about people and players. He's like, yeah, well, we really like Gabby. He makes the game easier to play because previously they played with Toby and he said that Toby was very hard set on, this is my hero pool. It's like, you know, these are the heroes I want to play um, and they want to build around that, whereas Gabby is much more free-flowing. He is positive, he will play anything for them, um, and that, I think, does give them a lot more freedom, right? I think, like, Toby, it was like, you kind of wanted to get, like, Brewmaster and stuff every game, whereas Gabby's playing whatever they need. He's playing the, the fighting guys, like your Spirit Breaker, your Dawn Breaker, you've got this weird Venomancer that T mentioned, that he can also play, like, your stereotypical offlaners, like your Axe. Right, Gabby is very versatile, and I think he fits them well. And he was very eager to play. Apparently, they were like, "You want to? Do you want to play with us, Gabby?" And he was like, "Absolutely, right now. I don't even need time to think fly about it. Fly me in. Just send it." And they were like, "That's what we like to hear. Get him in. Get on a plane. It comes straight on over the Venomancer. Dendi, do you like it for the offlane? How is this hero in your eyes?" Oh, I of course, if I'm offlaner, uh, I might like it. But I hate to play against Venomancer. <laughs> I used to hate to play against Venomancer back in the days. Now it's a bit easier. This is a toxic hero, uh, not so much fun for easy laners, I think. Like, uh, it's a lot of pressure on lane. And yeah, about Gabi, I completely agree. Like, uh, I think he adds to the team what the team lack, in a way. Because we have uh, Stormstormer and Watson, we're more like a little bit farmer in tiered, in a way. And he can be the kind of space creator from from offlane, so he can add up like uh, this mixture together and make it work. And yeah, it's working really great. Really, I think uh, Stormstorm is playing pretty aggressive. And I think in Gabi they found a guy who can actually like be the second guy who can carry the game for them. Because for Toby, his kind of playstyle like being you know cancer is like Venomancer, Brewmaster type of thing. But he would never the guy who would like play Dawnbreaker and like uh, you know and, like Magnus and be like this uh, second carry that can rely on. I think the main thing for them is having three cores that, you know, in any game, one of them can step up and make a statement in the game. I think, you like, for example, yeah. saw that with Bet Boom as well. Like, when in the previous series, like, you know, in the first game, it's like, oh, the carry's dominating. The second game, now it's the offlane. And I see that with Entity. Like, even though they are in the lower bracket, like, at any minute, it's like I'm expecting some potential invoker from Stormstormer, some incredible, you know, Pango players or something. And then, of course, to Gabby or Watson, it's the same thing. And that's what you want to have in a team at this level. Do you think it also could be a little bit of both that Gabby is uh, that fallback for them and so Stormstorm is willing to be more aggressive now that he reads that this is the meta and it's just happened at a perfect time for them that the momentum can carry that way in a game? I think it's both. Stormstorm was always like a very aggressive player and right now the meta is kind of fitting them that they took the position one player that translated to position three and it's like it's not that big of a change, right? The, the hero pool has changed but you still like farm a lot and like you, you do most of the time the things that Kerry are doing nowadays. Yeah, and uh, you know, from Stormstormer, when he kind of broke into the DPC scene at least on Hellbear Smashers when I was coaching him, like he was very, not immature, but he was naive to the pacing of competitive play. And then over the years, he has just become like his own player in that sense. And I think now I look at him to be very reliable. Maybe not on Earth Spirit, but everything else, I think I'm like, oh, you know this guy's going to have a good game. You know he's going to always have points of entry. All righty. Well, we've talked about these teams plenty. It's time we talked about a draft, and we're going to see that coming on our screen right now. Five seconds remaining. Tundra Esports versus Entity. Game one. Our second series of the day is just beginning. We're not even halfway through it. Game one here. Our draft and our bands will be coming up on our screens. If you were in this position, Dendi, 
If you were on Tundra's side, what are you looking to ban out in hopes to still be able to pick up for yourself? Oh, well, it's pretty hard to guess because we, we had some break also, right? Like it was a seven day break for the team. So mm -hmm. a lot of things could change. Meta evolving really fast at this TI. Like if you're watching every team rating different heroes, every team setting up for different heroes. So it's, it's really hard to guess. Like uh, I see only supports kind of staying the same, but cores like mixing up all the time, every and day. And all the beefy guys stay the same. The Primal Beast, the Bristleback, uh, what is it, Kanka. Has been raided a lot. I'd actually, I'd, I'd love actually if that TI, like every two or three days, Valve would get the players to power rank the meta heroes. Obviously confidential. And then once the next big patch comes out, it's like, so for the previous TI, this was the belief of the heroes. I'd actually, I don't know they're going to do it, but it'd be cool to see the, how teams' perception of meta changes. Because in draft, it's, you kind of have to assume and guess, but you never really truly get their opinion until way later. Aside from the you know, from everybody. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Let's play a game, guys. Who, like, what hero is Thompson gonna play this game? <laughs> That's a Let's, tough game. That's yeah. a tough game. To Let's play. all have one prediction. I mean, he was playing Magnus in his pubs, right? I mean, Magnus is an obvious choice, yeah, because he practiced it a lot. Yeah, but I think it's Clinks. Oh, I, I want, I want a Zeus. Zeus, I want yeah, to see Zeus. Also. Nice. Yes. Let's nice. go. Double Zeus. Double Zeus. Natalie, what is your? Ooh. Well, I don't know. At first I was going to say Dazzle, but it was like this one immediately removed. I kind of wanted to go a little bit basic, maybe just an Earth Spirit if the draft allows for it. All right. Yeah. Sounds good. Spirit. Beg for the Pogna. No, I'm good. I love a good time. I don't want to see more Pogna's Pogna. in my draft, yeah. you know? In my, in my pubs. <laughs> Not draft. <laughs> in my pubs. Go I like that uh, Tundra decided to go for CK, yep. you know, back for Skitter because it's one of his better heroes. So exactly what I was about to say. As well. Yeah, it's just like it's stable for for Skidder. I think the, we can't, you know, beat around the bush. He has had some shaky performances, and for CK, it's like it's stable. Lane's going to be good. You know the game, kind of the trajectory of the hero the entire time, and it is a hero that if Thompson is going to push the boundaries on how aggressive you can be, CK can always join at different points in the game. So yeah, I think this is a very nice way to uh, to start your first game in the low bracket. Yeah, but then you get primal beasted. And I, I rate Primal so highly, especially against these heroes like Chaos Knight, when he has all that health and he's going to get the Ags. He's just going to be able to be in the midst of this Chaos Knight who will not be able to use crit anymore, right? He just gets broken. And I, th I don't know, I think Primal being able to just scale, like being really strong early, being able to do well in like most mid matchups, if that's where you put it, into then being able to become a super late game, like terrifying hero. I just, I love Primal. I feel so confident about any draft with this hero. No, but oh. it's the Primal Beast, right? Like you can say that against any other hero. Like CK is one of the better ones actually who can su sustain on that lane against him. He has stun to put him in mm -hmm. place and like not, you know, care about him as much. Yeah, but and he has a very yeah. high base damage as well to be able to last hit against him. Yeah, that's only if it goes off lane. I like seeing Primal play from mid because then it's really easy for supports to like TP mid, fill a bottle, smoke them up. Like I think we've seen Primal be so active on the map early when they do go mid. They're like very, it, you can be like level four and it's easy for you to get a kill on a side lane if you like go for like a bounty rune ba uh, bo bottle refill and then you can just quickly slide to the side lane, get a kill, go back mid. Yeah, I agree. I mean, yeah. especially for Entity, Thompson can play a sick Primal Beast as well. I love Primal Beast. Primal Beast is one of my favorite heroes from mid and I think it's extremely, extremely Strong. By the way, Apparition is one of uh, great uh, partners for, for Primal Beast yeah, because his <laughs> yeah. Vortex is amazing and also his <laughs> Ultimate. But overall, Primal Beast, Primal Beast have insane amount of uh, great partners. And we saw a lot of Primal Beast first picks even at uh, playoff, right? Like it's pretty much in meta. And there is always a different answer to that. And I'm always curious, like, uh, because we saw, for example, Mikota play Kunka against Nisha and he completely yeah. demolished him, but Liquid came back. It was uh, a game like this. When we saw uh, Primal Beast answered by Trent, which I think is not a really good answer, and when we saw an, a Shadow Demon answer, which in my opinion uh, is like the best hero against, against Primal Beast, and if Tundra pull it out, because I don't see it banned, it, can, it might be a problem. It's completely shut down with hero, like literally completely. Yeah, fully agree. Just the fact that you can just banish that hero away and Primal, once you're in the fight, you're kind of stuck there until you get your cooldowns back to then get back out. And instead, they are going to go for a Weaver. This is a hero that they have played so far in the four roll. But I think the main part from this phase is just the Grimstroke. When you have Grimstroke, CK, the lane just plays itself. It's always points of aggression, always take that fight. And yeah, the Primal can also try and fight. But if you're trying to initiate and now you're getting two, three stuns thrown back into your face, 
you can't stay there and trample the entire time. You're going to have to disengage. So this safe lane is going to be very potent from Tundra. And I've seen this fear before from Nine, and I mean, to me, it's pretty underwhelming. I'd, ra I'd much rather prefer if they pick something like Shadow Demon or Phoenix yeah. on that spot, because those two supports are having like much greater impact than Weaver, in my view. Uh, but at least we're gonna give a lot of like tempo to the game. It's yep. uh, gonna be great partners for whatever mid laner we decide to pick for uh, Topson. It can be I don't know Invoker or uh, it can be Earth Spirit. So Anything can work. Pangalier potentially. Pangalier is uh, not so strong, but people still pick it, yeah. right? Like it's a little bit uh, downgraded since mm -hmm. last patches, but still it's strong. Wait, we said we wanted Zeus. We should just be channeling Zeus right now. What are oh, we doing? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Ever is Naga Siren, right? So now. See? We yeah, need something yeah. to deal with illusions, so Pango also can be that option. Exactly, yeah. Actually. I think Pango's a safe bet, but my, my heart, hopes and my dreams. I think this uh, Naga pick creates so many opportunities for 33, actually. He can pick his favorite darks here. here. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, there, there is a way he can pick, like, a uh, Legion Commander, I would say. But, I mean, I think darks here is the one they're looking for. Makes sense. You can also throw some additional spells onto your CK to get him into the fight as well. Yeah. Your. That's the thing though, because they go for Pugna. Okay. <laughs> Top some Pugna mid lane. Your shard. You can then instantly kill the illusion. So for the the mid to late game scenario here, Naga isn't always going to be. No matter what items you buy, your illusions will be dying. That's yeah. interesting, very interesting answer, because it's also into AA, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, it's not gonna save and primal heal beast. somebody. And Primal, yeah. and primal yeah. Beast, which is like <laughs> oh, a counter oh, pick, so yeah, <laughs> in a way to Pagna. So it's very ballsy from Thompson, I would mm -hmm. say. And uh, we'll see how it works, because in my head, at least, when you have Grimstroke and Weaver, you want another, like, yeah. kind of frontliner yeah. hero. I like, agree with you. Pango can work, Air Spirit can work, something like this. Maybe Invoker could work, but Pagna is a little bit of a question, but I don't want to question Topson, because no, no. <laughs> he definitely <laughs> knows his uh, thing. Yeah. He it, sees the world a little bit different, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm I'm trying to like rationalize it in my head. I don't understand Topson's mind. He is too big brain for all of us, but maybe he's banking on Primal rotating around, taking like a quick mid tower, opening the map up for his team. Maybe CK is intending to play very early with the team instead of farming more. Because I mean, right now they need him. Uh, they need something to play with, like the Grimstroke Ink Swell. Maybe they can get that on the last pick of Tundra if they don't want CK to be fully involved. Again, I feel like. You know, Pugna kill Naga Illusion, you're asking for frontline, some yeah. like 33 Tidehunter or something. Yeah. Just if he, they, they, they okay, they ban it out. But like, Dark Tundra Zero. need that body, basically, to soak a little bit. Because if they don't have that frontline, CK, he either initiates with an explosive kill, or he waits for someone else to set up the vision of the fight. And if they don't have that 33 style hero to do something, they're always going to be waiting for the next who starts the fight. And Pugna could potentially be food. So yeah, I love the Tidehunter ban. Darkseer that you mentioned. I'm not even sure Darkseer is good anymore no, because they have they have exactly. now in the mid lane. I really think we need some kind of another stun because right now if I'm looking at this game from Primal Beast perspective, it's such a free game for me. Mm -hmm. There is nothing yeah. that stops me. There is like CK, okay, this lane maybe it's a bit harder to gank or do something on it. We still don't know where Primal is going. It can be off lane, right? And uh, when every other lane, like Weaver do nothing, Pagna do nothing, and if we pick another guy without stun, like Primal, give, uh, Primal B is going to have a really good game. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. think Entity might be looking for Magnus on the offlane, actually, just to pair, pair what, what they already have with another, you know, carry type of hero, so this Primal and then this Magnus are going to be this beefy guy that's going to create a lot of opportunities for them in the fights. <clears throat> I personally would like to see Primal mid, just because of what Dendi said of it already looking like such a good Primal game. I really want him to have the best time, because when you look at the safe lane, Grimstroke, CK, whatever offlaner goes to this lane is going to have such a horrible time. It's going to require like either a lot of help of rotations to come and try and like offset that, or I don't know, I mean, I mean maybe there's a world where you just like hard stack your Ancients and then Primal can take them and recover that way after playing the offlane. Oh, you know one hero that is really good uh, as well? It's Omni Knight. Yeah. Okay. I love the Omni. I'm actually surprised that uh, people are not picking that hero like very often, because uh, his level 10 talent is insane. If you go like Echo Saber into Anchor, like it's it's just very very strong hero nowadays. 
I think people shied away a little bit from Omni after groups because it felt that uh, positioning in fights was really difficult for him. Sometimes maybe it was the way that they drafted around him that he had to sit back and be more of a protector rather than getting to jump in and actually be that body whilst people were still building that way. So it was really dependent on the draft that happened around it and what aggression they wanted to be able to do and if he was going to stagnate and fall off. I mean, I saw the game that Cassani was playing in Omni night and he went like Midas but oh, yeah. of travel too. <laughs> no, no one can forget that one. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't games for Omni. Oh, oh my what? God! You wanted to say thank you. I wanted to say thank you. Uh, I. Alright, we can tell okay. us why. Okay, so I was thinking thanking because I really. When I was thinking about frontline, maybe the frontline from Tundra can come from how Weaver plays. The fact that he's Sakuching in, setting up the fight through, hey, look at me, I'm here. And then at any point, you have a Silver Edge Blink CK, the, the Blink from Sanking, you also can go Aghanims. So this Naga, throughout the entire game, how does she actually take a fight into the Life Drain insta-killing your illusions, the Ag Sandstorm, just mini stunning them the entire time, or even the Grimstroke down the line having the Ags to take a clone of you? It's a very anti-Naga draw for sure. Can it potentially be Grimstroke meet in Pagna 4? Because I know Pagna Sanking was a pretty good lane before. I'd, like, I'd, I'd it like potentially see, yeah, can be, potentially, right? Yeah. It's interesting. Sanking I like because um, he's pretty good against heroes like A and obviously Naga, right? Like he, those heroes are afraid of mobility and Sanking is pretty mobile too later in the game. Oh, oh Storm. Stormer Invoker. All right, all right. I actually don't like this pick. It's heavily it's, comfort, by the way. It's into Pagna. How is the matchup, Dendi? Is it favor for Invoker? Uh, how is the matchup? Invoker is very strong. I'm actually not sure if it's favor for Invoker. I think uh, Pagna is also an extremely strong laner. So, like, I don't, I didn't have this experience lately. Every time he picks it, you have to just remind everyone the amount of games he's got on it. 2,855 games through pubs and competitive play combined. What? Like, Mm -hmm. It is a filthy amount of games, and if you ever want your mid laner to be comfortable, why not have near 3,000 games on a hero? I do prefer Tundra's draft. Okay. <laughs> well, it gets shifted, the Primal, to off lane, something that you didn't really want to see sheep, so are you now also the side of Tundra that you think this Primal might not be able to hit the timings that he needed to be that frontliner and create space? No, I think... Just like I said, maybe if they are just going to help him get back into the game, whether that's Stormstormer rotating to top lane, um, whether that's stacking the Ancients and giving him stacks, I think Primal can find a way back into the game. Uh, I personally love Sanking so much, and we rarely see him, that I'm going to be ruining for Tundra just based off that alone. Sorry, Entity, I love you very much. But <laughs> I'm, I love Sanking. I think that hero is... Uh, is got very stark weaknesses in like when the enemy carry is super strong, but I think that you can get a lot of farm out of this game. I don't think he's going to be that pressured. I think it's a pretty lovely sanking game. All right. Alrighty, well, you know, we've been talking a lot about this. We don't know if it's comfort. The only way to really know the answer is to ask the coach himself. We've got Tsunami with Entity's coach. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm standing by with Metrum of Entity. Metrum, about a year ago, you had a very memorable match in Singapore against RNG. Now, a whole year has passed with this team. How have you grown as we look into this international? I think right now we feel more confident, like we got some experience. Also, I think we are already like committing for the next year with this roster. So we feel like anyway that we how to say it, like, you know, we go into the games with feeling that everything's gonna be all right, no matter what. So I like it, like we, I think this year it's a bit easier for us than last year. The energy seems good. Now tell me, if you had any other player besides Stormstormer, would you have last picked Invoker there? I mean, maybe some players, there are some good players on Invoker and we were like thinking, okay, we actually had a lot of options. And yeah, we just decided why not we give uh, Stormstormer his Invoker on the first uh, stage map. Why not put on a show? CL, you ready for this? Yeah. So let's get ready for game number one. Oh yeah, and we're ready for it because I love the confidence coming out and they're going to need it too because looking at this matchup, if you're looking at a team, you're matched up against the TI winners, you're probably the underdog. You're matched up against a player who has won two TIs, you're probably the underdog. If you're matched up against a team who you have lost the last seven official matches against, Probably the underdog. Avery, is it true, though? Is Entity that much outclassed by Tundra? I mean, they have to rank one player on two servers. Damn. They have the Joel man himself <laughs> showing up with the Twitch chat support. True. That true. counts for a lot. And they have Gabby, who I consider one of the most 
weird carry players of the past few years. And this guy is a huge tempo creator. You take a player like that, put him in the off lane, give him a hero like Primal Beast, anything can happen. I don't know if they're that unfavored here, Cap. I, I feel like this, this match is a lot more even than I think people are going to give it on the scorecard, particularly if Tundra don't begin to find their footing, which has been hit or miss with them with this roster, that they're trying to gel with super fast, right? Sure. You can put a you can put a player like Thompson into this team, world class player, world class lineup. How fast can they make it work, especially in a lower bracket elimination game? Okay, well we heard from Entity's coach. What about Tundra and their feeling post draft? One last thing, guys. We have been practicing for two months, and it's time to just play the fucking game. <laughs> Honestly. We are really fucking good. If you don't overthink things, just play the fucking game. Do whatever you feel like. It's gonna go good. Bye -bye. It's good to see that even TI winners need that boost of confidence to remind themselves they're really goddamn good at the game. And uh, it's a surprise to be seeing them in the lower bracket here. And that is probably something that shakes their confidence. And I agree with you. I think Entity, they are certainly no pushovers. And they are a team that is probably going to test Tundra, especially a team who hasn't really experienced too many lower brackets in their uh, history. No, arguably had the most dominant TI bracket run of all time, right? So this yep. is new territory for them. But it is familiar in the sense of, you know, we had the NA DBC yesterday, and now we get some European DBC yep. League gameplay today. These are two teams that are very familiar with each other, and sometimes in that interregional matchup, things get really weird. So I would not be surprised if these games go long, I would, especially since we have, you know, a Naga Sire and CK game. Both these illusion carries making their way back into the meta, and for good reason. So you control the lanes, you control the map, you control the gold and the equilibrium. It tends to work out for you in the long run, especially with how these games are being paced. Yeah, and Entity, no strangers to long matches at TI. After all, we heard Tsunami alluding to it earlier. Their best of one against RNG last year went 107 minutes. So we do end up having a long one. Entity is more than prepared for that. This is a game that's going to get stalled out for sure. And it might be some early action on the lanes. I mean, you have very strong kill lanes, a lot of early synergy. And I feel like a lot of the tempo is going to come down to mid. Normally, it's these off laners, but you have a Storm Stormer Invoker versus a Tops and Pugna, two Grandmaster tier heroes here. You can't really ask for anything more signature. And yeah. It's just going to come down to which of them gets to control the early game a lot more, in my opinion. Does Thompson get to play the aggressive Pugna with the Grimstroke combinations, rotating to these towers, getting early pressure? Or do you get first blood? on Fishman himself. Well, second blood anyway was Fishman giving up that first blood earlier when we had that listening, but good to see he's able to bounce back. What do you think about this uh, nine Weaver anyway? It is a hero he's been going back to over and over again. I don't know if he's getting the exact results he wants with it. For me, it's been a little hit or miss, but I understand the power of it, right? If you get into that mid game in a decent position like the Furion where you're very high net worth on the hero, you just become a fourth core. It's a scary fourth core hero. Sure. And that's, I think, how Tundra prefer to operate. Let Thompson make a lot of the space on the map. Nine can become that secondary mid on some of these huge scaling supports like the Shadow Demon he's also like. And suddenly you're just playing up against too much scale for you to conquer in the late game. One thing that's kind of curious to me is that in the past, when we saw Weaver support, people like to be able to run it with physical damage dealing cores. And here, yes, they have the Chaos Knight, but Pugna, Sand King, really not going to take advantage of the Swarm too well. No, it's not the best Swarm game, but I mean, Swarm is Turn never around, bad. Gabby fighting up against Skeeter. Skeeter is going to just try and man up and see what he can do here. Runs into the Brambles, and that's enough for Gabby to get away. Scott Free with the kill on Skeeter going to Kataomi. He's going to throw the Blood Grenade just for harass here. Yeah, you're going to have to back up a little. A lot of resources committed from Kataomi, but happy to get this trade. CK down. Really nice for Gabby's tempo here. And we've seen Primal Beast go first phase for a reason. You give this hero a fast start. He's going to be able to combine with Storm Stormer and take the fight around these runes, around the aggressive jungle areas, and scale into the CK as well. Both these teams have really addressed the illusion carry. Going at it again in that top lane. Pivots, goes to Kadomi instead. Hits him with the ink swell, but he's already disappeared into the Shadow Realm. And Gabby's going to go back for it again a oh, second time. Rotation. That's because Fishman has made the rotation unable to quite get any extra damage in, though. They're relying on that third person to change the narrative here. And now Gabby is in potential to be run down by nine. Gets him with the blood grenade. That's enough. A big Gemini hit. Level three paint off here for nine, especially with those grenades. This is a great blood grenade user in the Weaver. Just chase people down with the swarm. The grenades slowing them even more. Get these big hits in. Nice counter rotation from the Tundra, keeping Skeeter in this lane. That would have been a debilitating death, especially with teleport on cooldown. As Stormstormer flees for his life. 
Well, you can see pretty clearly. better this matchup. Yeah, this matchup is going the way of the Pugna for sure. And Storm Nine. Stormer. He's going to get him here. No Got him mana on the swarm. TP away. A desperate one for the Blood Grenade. Again comes through. The extra damage that's required. Thompson thanking Nine for finishing what Thompson started. And now he's just going to get it. Free runes here, free rain, extra tower damage. Waves are going to go straight into Stormstormer's tower. He cannot TP back for this disaster on the mid lane. As we were talking about, which of these mids is going to get the better of the tempo? Well, <laughs> it is already Thompson on the Pugna. And he has a lot to combine with. Like this Grimstroke Pugna combo, this goes back to OG at TI8 and TI9, right? He is very used to playing this. This is the strength of the hero in Tundra's lineup. When Snaking starts to move around, you have Sand King to go and set the stun up make the team fight easy. And I want to point out that there's some hidden scale in this Pugna with the new Ags where you can you reduce spell damage on enemy heroes. Yep. It, the debuff lasts a long time. If you go in the fight, you ever get this late Ags, you start channeling it on a primal, channel it on an invoker, even for three or four seconds, it's like you get hit by a Mage Slayer or something. It skews a lot of these magical damage cores going into the Pugna. And this tower's just gone at five and a half. I mean, is this one of the fastest <laughs> towers down in this tournament? It's got to be. I, that is the fastest for sure. Thompson draining his mana pool to take the objective, and he really wants a six minute rune. He it will be a haste rune going over to Storm Stormer. He'll take advantage of that to help run down Snake King. And he'll get the bounty rune before he falls. Storm Stormer gets some much needed golden experience to help him recover after a really rough landing phase against Thompson. Uh, he's just going to probably just go Vessel into the Vitus here. You need a recovery Vitus at this point. Way too much has been taken off the map. And it's going to give space to Thompson. This is where his next decision, pretty important for Tundra's early game. Do you want to rotate this Pugna? Do you want to just keep farming it up mid? Probably not. It's probably going to be in the bottom, right? Play through the Sand King, kick the Naga out, take another tier one, and just open up the jungle super early. Snake King can now just leave, play with tops, and get that combination going, especially if you get Wisdom Rune for an early Grimstroke ultimate. Fishman eyeing it up. They know he's here, so they're going to bide their time. Topson's Wait for the seven minute where he pops out. Yeah, they went for the smoke over, but I think they felt the rotation was going to land in time. Fishman desperately trying to get that wisdom rune to spawn, but it will not show up in time for him to seal it away. Yeah, you know, let him bottle. Uh, nice little core. That is very nice. <laughs> I think they know Fishman's game. I feel like every game I've ever watched a Fishman, he makes that move. This man's not afraid to die, so he may as well take the risks if you're not afraid of death, right? Drew. The level five for nine here. Sanking is not a hero that we've seen a ton of, but 33 is making it look good so far in the laning phase. Top net worth and straight up rush into Vanguard. So now he's kind of untouchable. He's going to go into Boots of Travel, Blink Dagger as his options next. Did you like the Sanking pickup when you saw it? I think this was a pretty good spot to pick it because they knew the lane was going to be free. I mean, it's an ancient apparition. Not, there's yeah. no way they're kicking 33 out of this lane with a strong support in the Weaver. You know he's going to eventually kick the Nog out as well, even if you wanted to leave him in the one-on-one. -on -one. And then he just overtakes your jungle, starts clearing through stacks, and he didn't have any. Watson does manage to dash. dodge the blast, but he's running into Snaking. Now, the rest of Entity was on their way. Can they bail out their carry here? Nine is going to try and get him with Ink Swell. That's going to be enough damage, but at the same time, Thompson does die, and he was probably worth far more than the Naga Siren was, and they're going to clean house on this one. What a read from Entity. Gabby shows up at the right place at the right time, and that is a lot of extra XP and gold for Stormstormer who needed it. That's where that first rotation with the Pugna. It's a double-edged hero, right? You're just so damn squishy if these fights end up behind the towers and deep areas where Entity can bring reinforcements. Thompson doesn't get anything done with that early lane advantage. We're all evened up again. So sure, you got this tier one mid down, you but you had me, mid's a different lane than it used to be, right? I don't feel like this tower just debilitates the map like it used to. Yeah, it is way more side lane focused because the map has grown bigger. We see a lot more yep. focus on these deeper side of the map uh, neutral camps rather than the ones that are closer to mid. Less focus on the triangle, which mid lane is usually pretty good at helping to control. Exactly, ancient shifted away. So all these little things draw you to the sides of the map instead of mid. This tower was nice for Thompson, but it is not an end all be all here. It's going to be a lot about these fights, and all of a sudden, Entity, strike back, strike back big, and I mean, their cores are in solid positions now, right? Skeeter was still suffering up top in this matchup because Snaking left it early. So Tundra, they're going to go back to what they've done all year, which is out efficiency you on the map and get the stacks going. Probably 33 here, who has always been the main beneficiary of the Ancient Camp progression on the side of Tundra. Wouldn't mind the fast bots idea here if you're just planning to scale. 
This is the build that will help you go late game against the Naga Siren. You're, you're looking for that Ags, Shivas, maybe even Radiance. If you're really feeling it. I feel Not like we haven't right -clicker, though. seen like a big boost in Boots of Travel purchases from before the map was enlarged, but it's got to be way more value, right? With the, the way the map is bigger. I mean, I always like this item. Yeah. <laughs> when did you ever buy it? I liked a lot of the items I never got to buy. <laughs> a man can dream. Yeah, you always want what you can't have, I suppose. I mean, I think the, the Boots of Travel are just nice on some of these melee heroes that like to run around in the middle of the fight because they get stuck there. Like, extra move speed is no joke in terms of dodging some of the primal spells or getting out of an AA Vortex. Sure. There's some value here, and he's still top network on this Sand King. Particularly if he wants to join fights like this top, the, the bots would make a lot of sense. As Skeeter has just been hounded up top, he's trying to defend this safe lane, not get too much room to the Primal Beast. At which point does that break, though? At which point do Entity <laughs> feel confident enough to try and kick him out of here? I love that neutrals can defend themselves pretty well from now on. Armlet builds up is going to be the play, but Entity still seem to be just like they may have countered Tundra's move beautifully, but they haven't really made much aggressively themselves. They seem to be still in kind of mode recovery. I think they're happy with this, though, based on how that mid lane went initially. They're not happy with losing their spirit vessel completion. No. That's rough for Stormstormer, who's probably just ready to make a big move. And they're just going to go top. I mean, the move for Andy is to this top lane it's to kick Skeeter out of here while he's still here, only level seven. They have a huge amount of magic damage to throw into him, including this Ice Blast that Fishman just picked up. You have to be careful of your Tundra in terms of who you're showing on the front line, because there's a lot of long-range magical bursts. You throw down a Vortex, Gabby charges in, he could potentially have Bedlam on top of him, and then an Ice Blast gets thrown on top, right? I mean, there's a lot of long-range artillery here for Entity to just throw in a core without committing to the fight. And the anti-healing is a big factor, right? Because they have so many... Absolutely. Uh, like, there's the Inkswell with the Shard later on. Gabby charges oh, he went forward. He's going to be silenced. He's going to be in trouble. The Sand King gets the jump, and a beautiful jump at that. 33 closes the door on this fight before it even begins. Yeah, Gabby and Kataomi are probably going to be run down as well. At least one. 33 with a third number there. Triple kill for him, and Gabby hidden in the trees will barely survive. That was a guaranteed fourth kill if he saw him. So that is just almost an ultra kill for 33 out of nowhere. Putting an epicenter to better use than I've seen in a long time for a level one spell. And now they're going to steal ancient oh, attacks on top man. of him. Tundra is, he's out of control already, right? That was yeah. about as good a blink reveal. We were talking about him going bots and like, let's defend this safe lane. Insta buys blink, 1130, gets a triple kill into ancient stack steal. And now he's already up to 1750 gold again. <laughs> That blink just literally paid for itself. Yeah, you know, Tundra, when we talk about uh, farming efficiency on the map, especially ancient stacking, big deal for them, we usually talk about it on their own side of the map here. Them taking away Entity's farm is just going to be so debilitating. A big pickup, though. Dobson, he'll fall trying to pick up a power rune, but 33 is going to show up and maybe get a rebuttal here. There is the Bedlam out, but the Nether Ward is doing some serious damage. Can they finish up 33? No, they'll ball die under the Sandstorm. And Fishman's gonna get run down. No tower to protect you here. Nine gets a double. Tundra will we'll go ahead and defend Thompson's honor. Uh, that move top just cost Entity so much in this game because all of a sudden <laughs> your Weaver is ahead of the enemy in poker here. Nine got a huge amount out of these skirmishes. Full Solar Crest done. A very nice item he can throw just for the bonus armor on these frontliners here. Thompson's still struggling against the AA Blast. I mean, it, it's hard to just man up in the fight with a hero based on healing. Gotta get so away far. before Skeeter can grab you. This is turning into 33's game right now. He's about to run away with it on a hero that conventionally does not run away with games, right? This this is not supposed to be like an axe or something where it's mega fat, you get crazy blink strike team fights. It's a hero that has struggled in the meta and he is well out ahead. So can he continue to transition into something and can Entity Kind of stall Tundra's momentum right now. Get back in this game. Bring Stormstormer once again back into a position where he feels like he can have an impact here. This move top is still looming for Entity. They just can't open up the tier ones right now, which if you can't open up the tier ones for a Naga lineup, there's just nowhere to go. Smoke rotation from behind grabs the two supports. Picture perfect for 33 once again. We do have Watson. Watson close by. Might be able to help Gabby get out. Yeah, he's going to use the song. Forced to use it. I don't blame him. Put 33 to sleep here and get the hell out. This man's just finding too much. And it's making it look too easy, right? 
It's just smoke in with like max ink swell on the Sand King. It's guaranteed chain stun based on how you can cast it now. This combo is even deadly. Oh, that is before. a cute move. He may not be able to get there in time for the stun, but the extra movement speed helps him close the gap on Watson. Watson, of course, using the song to help others, no longer has it to save himself. Nine, just setting up everything. One of the best killers in the game. Reads Thompson, gets down there immediately. Reads Watson, wow, now you're messing me up. <laughs> Too many suns in this game. Yeah, there's a lot of them. Arcane Rune for Thompson. That is very scary. Even scarier, BKB is closing in soon. Once he adds that, they have nothing to stop him. A counter smoke from enemy. And a lot of a lot of the good kills they've gotten have come off the back of Fishman getting in there with an A blast. He's just taking down a big core. So it's got to be Gabby setting it up. And oh, that would have been bug. fortuitous if they rounded the corner and grabbed that bug in time nine. The smoke is just difficult. You look at the map. I mean, where is the Radiant Vision right now? You have one OBS around mid, and that's all you see. And now Entity is here in force, but so is Tundra. And the way things have been going lately, it seems like Tundra are going to clear house on yet another team fight. Kazumi does manage to stop Thompson there on the side, but Gabby's already dead. So these two supports are left with no cores to help them. Nice TP away from Kataomi, but it still hurts to watch your Primal Beast, the big playmaker you have on your team, fall once again in these team fights. It feels like you just need BKB, right? Or Heart, something to tank all this magic damage coming out from Tundra, because once they set up the zone of control with Sandstorm, they drop a Pugna Ward. You know there's this Inkswell procking on somebody that you don't want to just linger around. It's hard to commit in, even with a Blade Mail on the highest ranking in the game. Again, you just got to go back to stalling this team out of mid, get to your next set of items. But right now, 33 dictating where these fights are happening with all the initiation power, and he's still holding this top tower. This is the part that's causing any so many problems on the map. You are getting constricted quickly here as Nine running in mid. Another great sneak swell target, by the way. Maybe Watson, though, finally showing up to one of these right. fights. I mean, Naga Siren is not supposed to have to be active, but it does feel like a game where Entity is going to rely on him earlier than they should. He can have good impact versus these supports, even versus, you know, the, the two beefy boys if he finds them with this Orchid second, which he's considering. I agree, like, you wouldn't want your Naga to have to be this active, but it might be a game where he has no choice. Magic first damage! It's going to be trouble! He's not living through this one. He didn't even have Song of Siren back up again. If they could catch 33 on its way out, unfortunately, a Tornado totally blind throwing that one out did not clip 33. Again, the Vision's just not doing any, any favors right now. The Vision's supposed to come off the Naga being able to shove the waves. Instead, they're getting shoved into you. You can't get really deep observers down because you don't control more objectives on the map. Got to work with what you have right now. And every time Watson goes down, that Orchid gets delayed, which means it's a chance for Dispel items to come out on the side of Tundra, make it less effective. Kind of racing against the clock here in terms of can Naga drag this game back for the team. Storm Stormer's going to be trying to drag back his own net worth into a somewhat decent position. Again, he's behind Nine's Weaver. He's completing the Hand of Midas now, but it's going to be a long road for an entity comeback if it's even possible. Oh, definitely possible. You just can't get dragged into too many bad fights. Sure. 33 will go back for the pipe as well, so he's going to. You know, maybe skirt a little bit around scaling directly than Naga, but this is a really nice item for the team in all these engagements. You're looking at basically only magic damage for Entity. This might be for the best. Fishman tanks the death instead of Gabby, who they were setting up on for sure. That, that was a valuable death. They going through the portal, trying to get out of here. Tundra are in pursuit. Might be able to find one more. Yep. That's Omi. Does manage to get off the Shadow Realm before the Silence Air goes for the TP, but the Inkswell can stop it at any time. 33, continuing to control both side lanes here. Would not be surprised to see Tundra continue to try and hold this top tier one as long as they want to. Another example of desperation calling for some moves you wouldn't normally see. Stormstormer trying to cut waves because the Naga Siren just cannot do it by himself, but Tundra had this map locked down. Just nowhere to go. Even Thompson playing aggressive mid, because he just rushed BKB. I mean, this is not a greedy bug to build at all. This is, okay, you have an AA Blast, so what? I'm gonna stand here, not take any damage. He's gonna abuse the fact that that tower went down early and just play solo. 
everything is going through the Sand King right now, so why not gobble up some extra waves? And again, you're talking about this Orchid threat on the Naga. I mean, there has to be some threat that any set up here in the next few minutes. It can come from the Primal Beast with Bedlam on top, Vortex. There's still a lot of long-range magical burst. Get some more aggressive wards down. Wards that have stayed up for the most part. They still have that deep ward on the left-hand side of the map on that ancient camp. So Tundra is having so much information on where Entity is and where they're not. Nobody's bottom right now, so free damage on this tier two. And Orchid is completed. So ideally, Watson, he gets to shove some of these lanes in. That top tier one did eventually die to creeps. Open up a bit more space. You can maybe get this primal BKB. That's your big timing. I mean, the BKBs are great versus Tundra's lineup. It negates pretty much everything. If you can get there. That ward, that ward, that ward. It's going to pay off. Got him after the Manta. 33 has the Inkswell to chain the stun onto his epicenter. Beautiful stop. But if Skeeter could die. Oh, man, what a dodge. Gabby charges right through that red flag. And now Skeeter can continue to chase down, surviving through the Ice Blast easily. Tundra. This is just absolute domination. There's just nowhere to run. Even Nine looking for Stormstorm with the dust. Just want everybody after these fights. And again, if that connection with the Primal does not hit, I mean, your team fight's basically over. You have to be able to land this Onslaught Pulverize on a big core target and just follow it up with all the spell damage you have. It's another engagement where Stormstorm doesn't even get, really get to use this vessel on anything. At this point, if they had a hero to take the Tormentor, they'd be taking even more away from Entity. Beautiful stuff. I mean, this is like a relatively old school. Once Grimstroke got put into the game, this is one of the first combos I remember with Sand King Grimstroke. Uh, it's a great Grimstroke lineup. Tundra really showing how this hero can just enable everything at the same time, right? All four of the other heroes are great with the, the Inkswell or Grimold combination. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, this Sand King one's just even better. They can perfectly change on it now. 9 and 33 are apparently able to do this. I mean, the Swarm actually helps you out quite a bit in being able to do that, right? Tormentor can't kill it, so you're just getting constant minus armor there. Gabby in some trouble. Needed to be able to get his BKB. He was closing in on it, too. 400 gold away. Now knocked down to 600 gold away. And they are going to take that Tormentor. There's just no doubt who's in control of this game right now. Tundra choking Anity out. Heart for Watson? <laughs> heart? Is that your go-to now? Yeah, I mean, he's going to be way behind the hearts of uh, both Skeeter and probably 33. Aren't They're it? both going for it. I mean, has Watson even gotten on the dire side of the map this game? Not really, no. Like, sometimes you can get deep in the enemy side and start cutting waves, but I think the, the early pods playing Sand King, he's just too afraid to go for that type of smoke enemy jungle type play. You just get kicked out immediately. Even if they caught Thompson, he's got a BKB. The only thing that I can actually stop him from there is really realistically the pulverize. Nice little net. Yeah, they'll get uh, the Grim Shoke at least. Spirit Vessel just to make sure in case the Orchid wasn't enough. Storm Stormer will nag that last hit. 15,000 net worth lead for Tundra at 23 minutes. Working towards, as you said, Nine's going to scale up into a fourth core for Tundra, which just makes this lead all the scarier because they're going to scale really well into it. He's building a Gleipnir on this support Weaver. Another Orca, though, does not have a Dispel, and you're gone. That's a 5x streak, 1,000 gold in the enemy's pocket there. So Watson making this Orca net work on the heroes he can find to make it work on right now, which I guess is pretty much everybody outside of Thompson with the BKB. The yep. pipe on 33 many didn't go for a Lotus, for example, and we have Manta on Skeeter, but you're not really going to find Skeeter in this game no matter what. So if you can keep finding some supports, find even the Sand King with this Orchid, get a few more cheeky kills out of it. Suddenly, Watson, number one on the net worth chart, can stall this game for a really long time. They really are banking hard on him. We saw Thompson now has his shards, so really easy way to deal with him. Mass illusions, but it's going to be caught here. Force used BKB. Tundra are there in with some reinforcements. They're going to easily kill the Dark Willow, holding for this Roshan, I believe, as it's going to go over to the other side in one minute. But Tundra are clearly strong enough to do it on the Radiant side if they want it. 
There's capability to take this fight. You did get to the BKB on Gabby. I guess if it switched, it might, might have even been more likely here. This is, yeah, this is not a fight you can take, but the fight capability is slowly going up. They even got a gem. So this is Entity preparing to try and win the next fight at all costs. So they have vision of the same King guaranteed when Gabby goes in with the spell immunity and just try and put it to as much use as they can. Oh, he almost sniped it. That was pretty close. That was pretty much the only thing you could hope for on the side of Entity is that they snipe the last hit on Roshan and get that bounty away from Tundra, get a little bit of gold into their own pockets, but not the case. 33, he's gonna have hearts. Skeeter completing that as well, and now has an Aegis. These are gonna be some tanky heroes. No BKB, of course, on Thompson right now, but not enough heroes around on the entity side to really make much of a fuss, threatening the uh, Terrorize, but actually gets pushed back and pulled back in then by Skeeter. We have a shield run on Watson. I think Emmy were debating to fight this, especially if it's behind the tier two here. Just gonna have to give it up though. Still, Stormstormer getting some pressure top. I mean, hey, this is a radiant here on the dire side of the map, so. Small victory. The rat action begins. Uh, little by little. It's really Entity's motto at this point in time is one tier two remains for them. And all these towers are constantly being defended by Tundra. Besides this top one, it's really the only place the Naga Siren and this Invoker have managed to hang out for a while. That's the thing, it does have to kind of eventually be Stormstormer who carries this game as much as he's gonna have to come back. You you cannot rely on the Naga illusions in the fight. You have the Pugna AoE ward off the shard. You have a Grimstroke who can eventually create his own illusion off an Ags. You of course have Sand King who's just gonna create his own control that Tundra can sit and not really care. Naga Illusions are not going to win you this game, even if it gets stalled ultra late. It has to be the two other cores coming back at some point off a team fight. So that's what you're looking for. Wait out this Aegis and get something going on the map. Right now, Skeeter happy to just force the issue with his two lives on the heart. BKB done for Stormstormer. So that's second BKB here. Again, these BKBs are really good in these fights. Not a lot of physical to throw through outside of you getting reality rifted off of a swarm bug. Yeah. Tundra, it would be pretty early to be hitting high ground for much of the games that we've seen anyway. Nobody really wants to hit high ground unless they have an overwhelming advantage, and Tundra do kind of have that already. They have two and a half minutes to make use of this Aegis. Uh, would that be the ultimate reverse trap card? Tundra ending the games early. Nobody saw that one coming. <laughs> As they're gonna push 27 minutes. Tops and Pugna sieging your high ground. I mean, okay, they gave up on the siege. Let's just commit the course. Daring Entity to go on their front line here. And it looks like Entity may not oblige. Okay, they're gonna smoke up. They're gonna try and do something here. They're gonna pop the glyph now. I mean, you have to take this fight. This is Tundra just daring you. And if you're not willing to take it, what are you doing in They're this actually going outside of the base goal for nine instead, who is cutting the mid wave. This shows how little faith Entity has in being able to take these fights. Nine may end up falling. They just need a little bit more damage. Please tell me they're going to get something out of this. Okay, they do. Meanwhile, Watson was trying to push some of the heroes away towards that bottom lane, stop them from being able to get here. But they're here now. 33 is going to make jump forward. BKB immediately activated by Stormstorm to protect himself from these stuns. They'll lose their support, but maybe they can get even more. Immediately, an Orchid placed onto the Sand King. Remember, he is tanky with that heart, but they have plenty of damage thanks to Watson now being here. They might just be able to cut 33 down to size, trying to get away over that haste room. No such luck. Thompson turning it around. Great Nether Ward with Bull, oh, but a song. Uh oh. We got some heroes with BKB. Thompson. I just probably that activates up. his. <laughs> Immediately tries to get away. Storm Stormer into the invisibility. Hiding out Skeeter nicely. The Pulverize is going to be able to grab Hi Thompson back. while he's Magic Immune. They know that Magic Immune is running out soon. Thompson needs the help. Where can he get it? He's not going to get it anywhere. And he's somehow making even. this comeback work for them. Even got the Weaver buyback that turns into absolutely nothing for nine. Just crushed his economy. Gabby finding the openings. A nice smoke flank. Honestly, I think they were thinking they were going to have to go all the way around Tundra and look for the smoke from behind. Instead, they just found the Weaver mid. Might have just been a better case scenario. They also got snaking with the Invoker BKB, so both supports out of the fight initially. That's what you're looking for if you're Entity. And Watson, 
Sure, you lose that Rack's bottom. I mean, he can't defend it on his own, but you're happy to make that exchange, right? Your Aegis didn't even do anything there. Skier oh, absolutely. still holding on to it. Yeah, I mean, you were in it for the long haul. Now we have an 8,000 net worth lead uh, that was cut down from, what was it, like 16? Maybe even more? I mean, Tundra was way, way far ahead. All they got was a melee barracks? They I have. think that's totally fine for Entity. Should have listened to themselves and not gone high ground. Exactly. Learned your lesson. Never go high ground. <laughs> Now you get some breather. You get to deward some map with this gem. The deep obs for Tundra that were locking you down. Suddenly they're all gone. And it's Tundra who lacked the vision right now. They're going to have to force the fight blind. We'll pick up Skeeter's BKB. Yeah, much needed Another since dispel. that second life did expire. So yeah, he, he is still very big. That is the one thing that Entity were not able to address in that fight is Skeeter. If he was able to just sit there and take it in terms of going on them, it would look very different, especially with a double damage rune. That certainly will help the next engagement. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Entity probably still planning on dodging unless uh, Tundra tries to hit the high ground again. After all, they're closing in on some pretty important items. Gabby the Heart, Invoker trying to get that uh, Aghanim Scepter. Actually, went Blink Dagger instead. I thought you needed just more firepower, just more damage against this double heart. What do you think he's uh, trying to reap out of the Blink Dagger pickup? Just, I mean... Invoker's damage does come from spells, right? It also comes from just being in there with BKB Alacrity, right? Clicking people. Blink allows you to do all this instantly and maximize the time where you have the debuff immunity versus a lineup that kind of relies on you not having it in order to lock you down. Sure. Like, these BKBs are just so valuable for Andy. You need to make the duration they're up work for you and get as much as possible. That's why taking out the supports is nice. You take the Grimstroke out of the equation, suddenly... You not having BKB isn't as big a problem because you're removing so much of the control and right. so much of the combinations in terms of double suck, double stun, all these stun chains. In some ways, I think snaking is the best target to take out of the fight first, unless you can just kill 33 off the bat. And honestly, 33's item build this game, he had one of the craziest starts on Sanking we've seen in a long time, but he transitioned it into Pipe Park. And what these items are great for is that like early high ground timing, going with the team, sieging that base, saying, go on me, my regen's gonna be too much for you right now. It's not gonna be some early like Shiva's Ags that would have dealt with the stationary fight into Naga, Invoker, Post, BKB, that type of thing better, right? He's yeah. pretty susceptible to getting bursted from physical damage. He just doesn't have any armor. He even went for Yules. So a lot, ex a lot of extra utility and dispo on the same computer. You're looking at 10 armor with bonus from a Cloak of Flames. You start getting hit by this alacrity, you're gonna melt. Yeah, we saw that in the last fight anyway. Second round of Tormentors are coming up, so Tundra will take theirs first. And at this rate, they're gonna be capped out on. Surprise, Tom. Skeeter doesn't have his. Surprise, he didn't try and solo it. Just for the highlight. Reason. Later on, Aghanim Scepter, he can do it. <laughs> and he's going that axe. So pretty interesting to see him go this. I think it is one of the unexplored areas of Pugna in the yes. current patch. Just being an anti-spellcaster, not off of the ward, but off your ult. It's not really how people perceive the hero. Because a lot of these matchups are still seen as mo like more okay to play as long as you have BKB running in play. Yeah. But this drain, it, it gets rid of a lot of the damage on any side, particularly in the Primal Beast if Gabby just goes in. So I like that Thompson's going whoa, back. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> okay. Careful there. Can't afford any more Tormentor deaths. I hope that's a, a stat they put in future Battle Pass compendiums. How many players are going to die to a Tormentor? How many of those were Fishmen? That's what you wanted to follow up with. Yeah. Bloodthorn now done for the Naga Siren. Another big item pickup for Entity. It does also mean there is a bit of a downside to this Naga Siren being so far up in the network chart. Does mean he is going to be capped out kind of soonish. You know, he only has that one slot that's a, a rate band slot. Then you start getting some diminishing returns on any of your follow up items from there. Yeah, it's interesting he completed the Bloodthorn. I, I almost think the defensive value in it is better than the offensive amp here. Right, like him getting that Mage Slayer buildup, getting extra magic resist. That seems really nice for his Tundra's line. Yeah. Whether he can actually get in here and use an active off it, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of dispel building up. Tundra the Ice Blast on cooldown. Tundra is more than willing to take the fight. 
Kato Omi's gonna be in some trouble here. Zelf Yul's trying to protect him, get off the Terrorize, does get in onto three, what and group them up together as a result, and Watson Gabby immediately pounced on this opportunity, taking out the back line. Thompson and Nines Weaver are both dead. Meanwhile, Skeeter is trying to do what he can, but he can't really touch this Naga Siren too much. Song's gonna go out, the BKB means He's that cheated. only his hero can do the damage, so the illusions are rendered totally futile. They don't do anything, and now, with 33 caught in a corner, He's going to try and burrow strike over the side. Just for TPD up, but they have the vision to be able to stop him. Kajomi's going to make sure he stays dead with a buyback and Yule's usage. Three dead on the side of Tundra. Heroes that do not have buyback. All of a sudden, Entity went from, okay, this game could be over by 20 minutes or something, to now they're going to even out the net worth lead. They're going to get the Aegis. They're going to get the cheese. These EFPs with the suck on them. They're so annoying. It, it ruins your positioning in a lot of these fights, just dragging you in awkward positions. But the biggest thing here is Katomi with this Terrorize on three pre-tops and BKB. He got nothing off in that fight, just did not see it coming at all. And all of a sudden, you're just stuck in a bad engagement where you don't have the damage to take this. I mean, Skeeter's BKB is great here. What's it doing? Absolutely nothing. Naga's just healing through everything. And 33 never even gets an epicenter off in this fight. A lot of things wrong on the initiation there for Tundra, and maybe not respecting the turnaround potential. Especially going up the hill like that. This is the type of game where you'd rather get these BKBs out from Entity and then take the fight afterwards. I think just running into them and taking that into eight seconds where they're happy to sit there and hit you back. Yeah, you've been ahead this game, but you're not that far ahead, right? Sure. Your items don't count for a lot in the physical man battle here, because it's only Skeeter during that duration. The, you think that Ice Blast being on cooldown just wasn't enough an advantage for them to, like, force it? They need to take more methodical fights, which we've known Tundra for. I mean, there's definitely some mis-execution there, right? Like, if Thompson gets BKB and he gets all his spells off, that can look very different, too. Sure, yeah. All these things are, like, a bit hindsighty, but they definitely got clumped up on that ramp, and they got punished hard. And all of a sudden, you're looking at a 1K game with an Aegis on Watson. And this is where that Bloodthorn feels great, because now he can just go in and start manning up on people. It doesn't even care if he dies. And now the Naga Siren Illusions are strong enough to really start taking some map control away from Tundra, whereas before it felt like so much of this Pugna and Phantasm Illusions running down the lane were actually securing more. Aghanim Scepter almost done for Stormstormer. So if you can get the lockdown, especially since the Ancient Apparition got the shard, right, you could have the possibility of hit him with the Ice Blast while the Sunstrike Cataclysm is raining down on him, that by itself is going to be enough to wipe out the supports, maybe even more. I can always sleep Kata. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> sleep Kata uh, Ice Blast for sure. I don't know if that's what you really want to go for, but you can pull it off if you're good enough. I mean, the offensive sleep, and then they immediately come out, like Thompson's going to use the BKB. That's a dream for Gabby. Because Gabby's like, okay, you used your BKB. Yeah, that's the I'm going to slam you into the dirt that's now. The, that, that's why the BKBs are so powerful for any. If you just go in on Gabby, BKB, and you start pulverizing somebody, you drop a Kata there, what's the counterplay from Tundra? Yeah, I mean, their the, whole, whole counterplay is... I guess it's like the, the spell shard. It heals, right? It's the, the ink swell that heals and also hard dispel. We yeah, also have the, the, the Pugna heals, but the Ice Blast counters so much of that. So. I mean, I guess the strong dispel from Snaking is becoming more and more important. Yeah, it is. Like, throw it on the Snake King, throw it on Skeeter, and let it break some initiation chain from Entity, potentially. But a lot of their spells that are throwing out are just AoE, right? Like, we saw in that fight, you get hit by a Terrorize, you get hit by an Ice Wall, Song, the Onslaught through, these Ice Vortexes. None of these spells really care about you getting a strong dispel on one of your cores outside of maybe the Orchid. That's one of the things that honestly has caused Tundra more problems than I thought would have in this game, especially with the timing that Watson got it at, but he's been catching these Weavers, catching heroes without the Dispel later on in the fight. It's just sealing the deal. And now you have an Ags on this Primal. A lot more AoE magic damage coming through. Yeah, in that last fight, the Terrorize set up Gabby to get in there, but his AoE damage was nice. With When you get Aghanim Scepter, you can actually start soloing heroes. He's going to be a problem. These long, drawn-out fights that were supposed to go the way of the double heart pickups of the Chaos Knight Sand King. Now going to start playing against them when a Primal Beast is 
getting round and round after his Aghanim Scepter. Gabby, the smoke runs into Thompson, but on the other side of the trees, they don't see him and do not react accordingly to catch him. I remember, th this Prowl Beast still has a cheese from this Aegis. He's a great cheese target. There's no real anti-healing on Thunder's side. Yeah. He should almost guarantee get it off in this next fight. He even went Martyr's Plate for the extra tank ability and resist. I like that. Jump forward here. Did manage to find the real Naga Siren. Not that Tundra is going to do a whole lot with that just yet, but if they can kite it out a little bit, Skeeter jumping pretty far forward. Got grabbed by the Pulverize before he can get off the Phantasm, and he's dead. Skeeter, you are not the one playing with your food anymore. You are the food. Lingers way too long. No BKB, no Phantasm. Got the silence, and now the song. Looking to just grab as many heroes as possible. It's only going to be this Weaver, but they also spot Sneaking there in the corner. Nobody has the mobility to stop it, though. Thompson, smart move. Smokes up with the ninja gear and immediately runs down the mid lane, knowing that losing their carry puts them in a position where they could be losing barracks. He's got to get out there and cut the creep waves as uh, long as he doesn't Stormer get knows. caught in the process. Stormstormer knows he's around here somewhere. Misses the tornado. Thompson deeper into the trees. If he got caught there, if he got spotted, he would die. He does not have his BKB. And this is where some of those Pugna games just start to feel bad, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's a reason we don't see a hero a lot. It's because when the game starts to go wrong, it can go really wrong. And you can't rely on him to just play a defensive-oriented Pugna with saves on a core, because that A Blast is always there. There's a lot of interrupts from Invoker. Becoming a very tough game for him, despite having a tremendous early game here. Thompson struggling to make his impact felt in these fights, outside of dropping a Nether Ward and hoping it's enough. Entity have just reversed all the momentum in this game, and now they are the ones with 10k gold lead. It seems like just cruising into this ultra late with the Invoker scale. And there's a reason this guy's got almost 3,000 games on it. The Invoker scale, I mean, we were talking about it early on, of like this Hannah Midas, will it get the Invoker back into the game? A little bit doubtful that it would, but he got there. And now, Katomi, who also went a hand of Midas, he can also be a scaling factor for Entity. So it's not like it's really going to be stopping anytime soon. He's got a hand of Midas, and as part of the components to his Aghanim Scepter and his, his uh, gold bank right now. So. From bottom three to top three, Stormstormer's journey in this game has yeah, that... <laughs> been everywhere. But he has found his footing now, and he's just in the late game. And Tundra will let that momentum slip. We're going to try and claw it back with the smoke forward. A jump on to Gabby. A hard hero to bring down. Well, they they got nine. Plenty, plenty of chain stuns. Yeah, they did find nine. And Gabby gets a half health before he has to use his BKB. Now he's going to charge back in with the old scepter. Put on Thompson. BKB inks well. Both being trying to get him out of there. What a grab there with the soul bind, though. Double stock going out. BKB from Stormstormer trying to get him away. While Watson protects his heroes with the Song of Siren. Activates it now to be able BKBs to stop are down. straight for this Chaos Knight. One on one. This carry battle it is no match. Stormstormer, 200 HP. 33 got frozen. Could not finish this invoker off. Uh, even the supports are surviving through this one. Thompson in trouble with Gabby and Watson surrounding him. Finally, jump forward from 33 will help finish off the Ancient Apparition, but he's being kited around now. A stun on its way, hiding underneath this sandstorm. Desperate, trying to keep Entity at bay, but they will come, and they will come and hit hard with Gabby. Charging straight through that sandstorm and flattening the Scorpion. That fight almost got turned off of a crazy sandstorm in the back off 33 and a great leash from Snaking. But honestly, these BKBs are just doing way too much for Entity right now. And Watson, there's just nothing controlling the Naga in the fight. He is putting out the most damage right now, just shredding people. Too many problems to deal with right now. I mean, which fire do you try and put out first? And all of it went on Gabby at the start. That is just not the target you want to be going on if you're Tundra. And one Gabby is very happy to tank up with this Martyr's Blade. Didn't even have to use the cheese. I mean, it's just heart regen with 5,000 HP. We're seeing this carry matchup. I mean, the moment we got the butterfly on Watson, things really did start to turn. Yeah, Skeeter can get an MKB, but it's really not doing much for you when this battle is an illusion battle, not a hero versus hero. It's all about who's using those illusions more effectively. And the Hex on Watson, I mean, that fight started off with nine getting nothing off. He was trying to scout, play aggressive with BKB. It's another instance where a hero on Tundra with BKB that is supposed to guarantee them an entrance into the fight doesn't even get it all. The initiations have just been all entity for the last 20 or 25 minutes here. They will reap their reward as they get a full lane and two tier threes. 
Game started with Tundra taking one of the fastest towers in the tournament, taking one of the fastest barracks in the tournament, and now they're the ones dramatically behind. 21,000 net worth lead for Entity. A full lane of barracks down in the bottom lane, and a Roshan fight that they have to contest, but have no momentum going into it. Skeeter, his smoke breaks, and immediately the retreat. And this is just Tundra hoping the smoke works out. Hoping that Skeeter can somehow create some sort of opening off Illusions. Phantasm up in 10. Gabby. Once again, wanting to be the target, trying to be the person to break the smokes, get the information. He's got that cheese still after all. Katomi blinking forward, trying to get an initiation. 33 gets his jump on the invoker, immediately the Cataclysm. Skeeter already down to half health. Pops Phantasm tries to go back to Watson, but Watson is kiting this one out. They don't need to fight him right oh, now. Oh, the gold by double pull back in. Could that be good enough? No, the Terrorize pushed away all the Chaos Knight. 33, he jumps in, trying to control up Watson as long as possible, but the song, the song goes off, bails him out, and now he starts healing back. Back up. Oh, yeah, he's ready to get this going already, popping that trample, wants to be able to lay down these cores. 33 with a sandstorm trying to protect himself. If those impales can do enough, maybe they can still turn this one. Maybe Tundra still has a chance as Skeeter goes back in, trying to go for the big primal beast, but he is tickling him. It is not real damage. Thompson is raining oh, a lot, though. though. Maybe it's Thompson <laughs> who can do this one, but the silences are still a problem. Out of the BKBs, he's doing what damage he can, but the heart is rectifying any bit of damage that is being being done. Entity are healing up time after time, and the ice blast will put blast. that heal out of the place. This fight has gone on so long, but no heroes of Entity are dying, and every single one of them of Tundra will fall. They just can't kill anybody. There's too, way too much sustain in these types of fights, especially this Naga song. You're healing up heroes with percentage off of such high HP pools here. Gabby, I would love to see the amount of damage Gabby has taken this game. They probably killed him 10 times over, and yet still not once. Yeah. I mean, Tundra are putting out the deeps. It's just not all going into one target. It's all getting spread. 33 does find Stormstormer again. This is the target you want. Another great Soulbind, and what does it yield? The song resets everything. You still have some BKB duration up, and then Gabby just goes to town. Not to mention second Ice Blast. I mean, you can't win the fight off one. The second one should do the trick here. Now you're just looking at potentially Megas. Yeah, Tundra. They don't have the buybacks to be able to contest this really with their full squad. This is looking like the buildings are going to die too quickly. Unless Thompson can somehow persuade them not to hit the I buildings mean, and go for him instead. 33 damage. jumps for it. Oh, Two-man throw strike, not too bad. Cataclysm goes out. Thompson's got to dodge that one, but 33 can't dodge anything. Not when he's been grabbed by the Primal Beast. Locked down there. More draining from Thompson, and they are going to be able to force Entity back here. They respect the fact that with that buyback from 33, they still could get caught in a sticky situation. They leave that final me melee barrack still up. And Thompson is struggling, man. Life Drain is an okay spell, but it just looks like it doesn't exist in this game. You have cores with 50% plus magic resist sitting on heart regen. Doesn't even, it literally doesn't lower your HP at all. Yeah, and the, the whole idea we're talking about with the Aghanim Scepter, maybe lowering some of the damage that's coming out from these heroes, particularly the Primal Beast. Maybe he starts doing nothing in these fights. Well, it's only just now here. It all these long so Life Drains, late. he didn't have the Axe. So at least now you're getting some utility effect out of it. Yep. But you cannot rely on this Got the sight Vice Bloodthorn. Watson does not put his hero in danger. He lets Gabby charge forward. You said, you take him out. I'm going to wait for that second life. And sure enough, Skeeter does a buy. He immediately buys back. Soulbind onto two cores here is pretty right. nice. Saw. But the Song of Siren ruins everything. Look at the blast. Here comes the Ice Blast lined up. Goes straight for nine and Thompson. Thompson. Pops his BKB, trying to kite backwards. Gabby's going to be the target once again. Puts himself forward, gets the dispel, turns around, goes for Thompson without that BKB. Yeah, they'll just pound those bounds into dust. Peter finally back. He still has no Phantasm for nine, however. Yeah, he's doing absolutely no damage with just his Good hero. In luck. fact, he pops the BKB, and now he doesn't do anything as Gabby once again grabbing hold of these heroes, not letting them go anywhere through this one. Runs over the Tank King as well, and Entity do it. A comeback, one of the biggest disparities, one of the fastest disparities in this playoff so far. Tundra had a full lead, and he held on and turned the game fully around. That is not a game I expected them to come back that swiftly, and it just turned on a dime. Ever since that one fight, Entity never looked back, never lost another engagement. Stormstorm was below nine. Didn't even matter. I mean, if you're Tundra, you come out of that game, you're like, 
what the hell else are we supposed to do? Mm -hmm. Or what the hell else is this lineup supposed to do? And you can go back to some of the itemization here on 33, on tops and right. Maybe you go for slightly more aggressive items, higher damage items, whatever it is. But ultimately, at a certain point, these fights just started to look impossible because there's no physical damage combination with the Weaver Bug going through. You can't take these core heroes down, and there's so much sustain in the hearts, the magic resist, and the blood thorn, the martyr's plate. AA is negating your healing. That differential, way too much to overcome. But man, what a comeback. At one point, Endy were down. I remember looking at it. They were down 14 levels. <laughs> oh, God. In experience difference. Hey, that goes to show you never give up in a Dota game. You always have the chance to be able to come back. And Entity proved that here with Swift comeback. They make it work in game number one. Never back down, never give up. And Entity are the definition of that. A beautiful comeback for them, Sheep. This Primal, you hyped it up. It wasn't looking so great in that earlier part, but he really came online and did a lot in team fights for the later part. Name of the game, Chain Feed. <laughs> it felt like Tundra were trying to cover too much of the map, so they kind of gave away like a little kill, which turned into another kill, which turned into another kill. And this all aligned with when Primal Beast got his BKB, which was a massive power spike because he was finally able to just get in there and use his spells. There was no defensive items on any of the supports, so every time they were getting gone, they just could not get away. It's like, okay, cool. Your Weaver's trying to build a Gleipnir. Fantastic. Well, now you're dead, and your core is dead, and everyone is dead, and Primal Beast is massive. When you looked at these two lineups, Dendi, would you expect late game to go in favor of Entity? Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. Overall, if I look at the lineup of Tundra, I was already worried when we picked Pagna into a Primal. Mm -hmm. And it went really well for them, right? We had upper hand, we were like pushing uh, a lot and doing a lot of good stuff. But it's really hard to break high ground uh, in a Dota right now. And it's, it's really hard to break through high ground with Pagna, CK, and Senking, to me at least, against those heroes. So obviously, this game would come to a point where Primal going to get his BKB, and uh, they, they might find some comeback mechanics. And that's what happened. Like, uh, they had really good uh, heroes, uh, much stronger mid-late game compared to uh, Tundra, I think. Yeah, so good on them. Props to Entity for being able to prolong it. We've got highlight reels, but this time, a little extra something on top. We're going to have a little bit of a listen in and know what was being said at the earlier parts of this game from Entity. Okay, they want to fight here. Okay, we don't have ice blast. Can they don't fight. No rush, don't, no rush, please. Bar here, bar here. They're jumping. I got my spell off, I got my spell off. I'm yelling myself. Look on Pagna, guys. I'm here, CK. I'm watching. 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 I'm they're close to Watson, guys. Sunking, Watson. Look on me. Uh, Sunking, I'm Sunking. stunned, I'm stunned, I'm stunned. I will Sunking. kill Nathan. Okay, nice. Some communications there, listening in to Entity. They knew what targets they wanted to go on T for this 33-minute fight. Uh, yeah, it was such an important moment for them because just minutes before Tundra, they were hitting the, the melee racks. It was 27. They had, what, 17,000 gold lead. Everything was going Tundra's way, but it was that brief moment of splitting up and the points that they mentioned about the Primal Beast. This is the reason why it's going so well. When Primal gets online, all he has to do, guys, I found Pugna. You sit on top of him, now you're not life draining. You're not breaking the Naga illusions, killing him off instantly. And then Watson can get to play some actual Dota 2 for once. And Entity, they had one chance to get back into this game from poor positioning from Tundra. They capitalized on it, and then they pressure outside Roshan. So, yeah, to see through all the noise and the, the, just the aggression of Tundra, incredibly commendable stuff from them. Would we expect Pugna to be stagnating like this, Rezo? Is it a mid hero that's put on a timer? Or was it just the entity lineup that he had no impact on later game? I mean, I think Dendi was right about like they're them picking them this into, uh, this this hero into a primal NAA. It's like already hard, but they had a, like such a good window of like ending the game, like having a seventeen thousand gold lead. Yeah. Yes, like um, they they couldn't really split up that much, and I think nine was a big part of like why they started to you know shake in a little bit because they caught him once on top lane, then they caught him on the mid lane, and then after that kind of like they they found this little ages to snowball out of control. Mm -hmm. After. The big shuffle around in Tundra is obviously nine going to pose four picks up Weaver. We've seen it a couple times this tournament, and I do know that Persh wants to break it down. He wants to talk more about this support Weaver and 
Thanks, Nat. Yeah, that's right. Weaver support, uh, only or Weaver as a whole played 12 times in the tournament, five as support, three of those uh, with nine playing it. And I want to talk about the pros and cons of the hero as a support. Now, the best thing about him is that he's very fast and he's invisible most of the time. His base damage is great as well. So that can basically give you more out of the laning stage in terms of trading than some other supports can at times. He ends up getting first blood. And here's another really impactful part. He's able to block camps pretty easily. So he doesn't have to play some weird sentry game. He doesn't have to put his life on the line as much to block these camps every minute. And that means that the safe lane for Entity is likely going to go a little bit worse. Here's the second time he blocked it at the four minute mark. But here's the real value the hero when he wants to help his side lanes he's so fast and invisible that he can always get there in a lot of different circumstances that you normally wouldn't get from a support so that means that his side lanes are more likely to go well if he's playing really really well which he did this game in this game even abnormally he walked through the middle of the map to go back to his lane snag the storm stormer solo kill which was incredible this almost never happens from a support perspective massive play there and then he can also easily go plant wards down and this is really important because that gives them a lot of vision and control of the map. He can get in and out, he can scout stacks, nothing's really there. So at this point, he crosses the map to the other side of the jungle, and now he's jungling. But what he's accomplished by doing this, if I can get the right tool, not that one, sorry, sorry. Uh, that one? Yes. Take a look at the map really quick here. By having the ward here, they basically just have vision of this entire map. You know, he, he knows when they're going to cross over. He's going to block smokes by standing here, and he's going to guarantee that he has net worth for him and his team. He even manages to snipe the courier after this from uh, Storm Storber and delaying his spirit vessel. And once again, as he's getting items and net worth, he TPs even though the fight's away, and he's always contributing. So this gave him a big advantage. This was seven total, or sorry, six total kills in the early game. The problem after this was he ended the game with only nine. So. Uh, Really, really good early game, but later on, definitely fell off. A pacing that they could have hit, there was a potential for them to close out the game early for Tundra, and back to the drawing board a little bit for them, but then if you're in this, you had a lot of faith in your draft. How do you look towards game number two? Uh, game number two, I believe I would like to pick something more stable, less risky, because... Um, yeah, I would believe in my team that we are capable of winning no matter what. So if we're just picking a stable things that very strong in this current meta, it's going to work out. Obviously, we can still pick a Topson hero for Topson. Mm -hmm. uh, we probably had a lot of practice with that. So yeah, I would go for something like this. Yeah. yeah, they had the group stage, obviously every other part of the Road to the International that they've uh, played in. So we're going to catch up with them in the break days, and we're going to have a look at that journey over the past few weeks for them. This is DPC. We managed to qualify to the first major in Lima. We didn't really do very good, and I realized I have become complacent after winning TI, and I, I didn't have as much of a drive. So that tournament personally woke me up. It took the beating at, in Lima to for me to understand that, okay, I'm contributing to this majorly. I need to like change it to, to get better. After leaving Lima behind, Tundra started to find their groove, securing a top six finish in Berlin and third in Bali. But not everything was smooth sailing ahead for the defending champions. And then coming to the third league, we kind of knew that getting Nera to a Bali major might be a problem because, you know, he's from Israel. We basically tried as much as we could, getting as many points as we can in the last DPC league, and then we did manage to win it. In the Bali major, Nera actually got to play, which was crazy. But then we had another problem with Saxa, who had some uh, anxiety and sleep issues, which uh, didn't allow him to play. So we had our coach, AY2000, stand in for us. And the guy is obviously great, but it was still kind of like a shock to us that in the middle of the tournament, we have to like switch players. Snakey had to switch to plus four, and it was a whole mess. Tundra recognized the need for change ahead of TI. Saxa decided to take a well-deserved break, leaving the team to welcome Topson in the mid-roll and transition nine to pause four. The guy is a two-time TI champion and nine is switching to pause four, which is gonna be a very interesting experience. And you know, we'll see how it goes. Hopefully we're gonna repeat, you know, we're gonna win the TI again and Topson's gonna be the first guy that has a three TI wins under his belt. It's too early to tell, but I'm obviously very excited. No one else besides OG won two TIs. The guy is a beast. Hopefully I'm not going to disappoint and perform up to his standards. 
Some big goals there for Skidder. The players of Tundra obviously wanting to go back to back, but uh, wanting to carry Thompson as well to his third TI. There's still that potential. They're not eliminated yet, but the backs are against the wall, Rezzo. They are already one game down. And uh, would you say interesting is the accurate word for Tundra so far? Interesting. I mean, yeah, that's what he said. That's what Skip different. said. I mean, I, I, it's crazy to me that he says, like, I'm going to live up to his stars, which is he's already a TI champion. And he's the most recent one, not like Thompson, yeah. who was like TI champion like a few years ago. But he still thinks like, you know, that highly of a Thompson. So that that shows that he's like very, very passionate about like how, how they're going to communicate and like play and like, you know, get inspired by his play style as well. Yeah, I mean, luckily for, for Tundra, if you're going back to the series, in their position right now, while it's just kind of sitting off stage, they're realizing this was kind of their game to win, right? When they're in that position, it's probably very easy to pick like the single couple points where it's like, this is where we lose the game. This is how Entity come back in. And Entity as a team, throughout their entire year, throughout Western Europe DPC, they always play for th those moments. Like even when they're down, they're always, they have that chance of a comeback. Like Stormstormer Invoker, Watson, like these players are incredible at finding victories in these difficult games. So for Tundra at least, the bounce back will just be make sure that we don't have that miscommunication at the pivotal point of the game. We're going to look at Tundra. Obviously, what Skidder is excited for and the interesting play style that they have. So it's only fair that we also have a look at Entity and their past year. I mean, of course I care about winning TI. What the fuck? I mean, for sure. No, I mean, uh, like, prize pool, everything is cool and so on. But everybody, I think, is playing in their hearts this game because, like, they, they want to be the best. I mean, I think that what makes a sports, like, a sport person, a sport person in the end. Like, we want to be the best. We want to make cool plays. I want to look back at this TI and I want to look at these bots from the games and I'll be like, man, I did some fucking cool plays, you know? Okay, he's going to roll up as he was getting charged in right there. and. Flying the life being used, another strike kit though, that roll's gonna end in any second. Pulverize, the pulverize catches the brown as well. And here comes Golem the as well. the fear on top of that, there's the team fight. We went into this tournament really confidently. Once again, we looked at the groups and I think everybody was like, okay, Spirits might be the favorites, but we were like all like pretty happy. Like, sure, we're gonna, we're gonna have a good run. Thomas uh, gives a triple kill. There's way for him to die, to runs back in, goes for the break, goes for the bash, and ultra kills Thomas, <laughs> gets the rampage. So it was a bit of a, like a little bit of a, of a bummer that we lost against um, Azure and up in the lower brackets because I think everybody in the team was like expecting that we will beat them. But once again, of course, also Tundra and Game and also in the lower bracket. And it's gonna be hella good feeling to fucking 2 out Tundra and get the champions out. Oh. Um, I think what I just care the most about is that everybody's trying. Our team are believing. Like, no matter what happens in the tournament, I just want all my five teammates to have a good time and make the best out of it. Fuck it, if we lose 0-2, I don't care. I want to play my best order. That's all I care about. Well, Stormstormer can at least come back into game two knowing it's not going to be an 0-2. And his dreams of 2 0 the previous TI champions could come true, Sheep. I could. I mean, they played a really good comeback. I, they understood their timing super well. I was very impressed with their, with their comeback last game. Do you think uh, the five teams, members of uh, Entity, are going to be happy to walk out of this one win or lose team? I mean, win. Why not? Why, let's not talk about losing for them right now. They're the one that game up. They're, they're the ones in a good spot. Might need to get a swear jar for Storm Storm with his TI <laughs> yeah. winning uh, after that one. But no, yeah, I think they are the ones in the position because when they're behind, when they're ahead, like they are a team, they win quick games and they always find ways to just to win out the difficult ones. They are a scary team to face in the lower bracket. Stone Storm is such a nice guy. Like I wanna, I wanna have more of these type of players in the in the scene because he's so passionate. He's like every time you see him, he's like really enjoying it. Like you know, every time he wins something, he's like he's showing it all. Like you know, like like Dendy before. He's I'm Storm Stormer fan for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, me too, me too. It's because he was playing for so long, right? It's like he started during like 2016, playing in his national teams, playing in some German teams, and it was like years and years of just not kind of being good enough to break into let's say like the tier two scene of DPC of that time, right? And he finally hits it now and yeah, look at him. At the road. Yeah. I, li I like it when he gets knocked out because then he comes on the panel. Oh, that's such a selfish reason, but I fully understand. Love him. Storm Stormer. <laughs> <laughs> it might not happen though, he might get the two. Tundra are up for elimination. They need to win this game to do or die. Let's see how they feel about being on the edge of elimination. Okay guys. 
the pressure is the highest it's ever been, you know, but let's remind ourselves that we are here for each other. We practice all year, all our lives for this moment. And no matter what happens, let's make sure we are like the best teammates we can be. And we, we are at, as comfortable as we can be regarding the hero picks and how we play the game. And let's keep the communication very smooth and chill and the, the game will take care of itself. The game will take care of itself. Pick up those comfort picks. We thought Skidder was on a comfort pick last game too. No, yeah, he was entirely. And I feel like this is a game that we shouldn't really be analyzing draft too much on. It really is about in the game, the plays, the choices that you make. And when you are technically a newer team because of Topson, there will be moments where there is that slip up. And I've said it a lot. They made that one slip up and Entity capitalized on it. What sort of game is the hardest to come back from, Dendi? You know, a, a game like this where you are pushing high ground one slip up or a game that felt really even at any point and it just unfortunately didn't go your way? Uh, it's, it depends on draft so much, right? So in this game, Tundra had draft that we had a tempo. And if they slip up like we talk, uh, it's very, very hard to come back. And in those games, it's almost impossible. Like you're searching for those moments and do you have the heroes to, do we have comeback mechanics? Like, is it possible to even play in the late game with those heroes? Like, you're searching for those questions all the time. Uh, but if you have a heroes uh, who have very good late game, if you have very stable draft, it's, it's usually not so hard to come back. Okay, it's pretty hard, but at <laughs> least you have those opportunities. You're searching for those options, and you're looking for them all the time. Like, we saw games with Dark Weevil, for example, that can go for 70 minutes, 80 minutes, and you understand that this hero can kill everybody in, like, few seconds, any yeah. stage of the game. There's always that potential. We'll see what they're going to draft for game number two as it begins right now. Tundra Esports versus Entity. Game two. Let's see what Tundra are comfortable with, what they want to bring out in their potential last game in the road to the international. Or as you wanted to play, you know, guess the tops in here in game one. Do you want to play it again in game two? I mean, of course. <laughs> yeah, I'm still liking to see, you know, the idea of clinks on the top, yes. Uh, but I, I do want to make them, you know, make them one small adjustment, which is like, uh, I think support heroes are really crucial in this meta, and you need to have a lot of damage on them, because like all of these, like you're playing against Primal Beast, he has 4.5 thousand HP, you need to make sure you have percentage-based damage that can, you know, chop off of it. So. Instead of like uh, playing with the Weaver, I'd much rather see some you know Phoenix on that spot. But Phoenix is already banned from Entity, so it's not gonna happen this time. Yeah, I hope we don't give uh, Primal Beast a free game like this again. Like, there it is. There. Get rid of it. It's already Your banned. Out. Nice. Fulfilled. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, I'm surprised that Tundra aren't picking up Dark Willow a little bit more. We know Nine favors him, uh, favors her. He used to play her in the mid lane when he was doing that for Tundra during DPC. And then in 2 or 3, he talked about the fact that when he used to play plus 4 in pubs, that that's where he got the Dark Willow inspiration from. So he clearly has that under his toolkit. It's just not a priority for the middle. I mean, I think for Nine, he definitely thinks about how to, you know, have that experience from mid lane and translate it into his role right now. But I think for Tundra, it might be like a little bit too much since you have like this creative Topias yeah. from the mid lane. It's already playing these weird heroes, and you have a, the same on the position four. That makes your gameplay not as you know steady or like grounded. I would say. I think most of the heroes that he's been playing so far provide information in the early game. We saw the purge bit with the Weaver, Sakuchi and getting the wards. He's playing Earth Spirit, Spirit Breaker, Tiny. All of these heroes like to investigate in the early game. They like to kind of show themselves on mid, maybe get a kill, go back to top, use some twin gates. And uh, Dark Willow can do that, but again, I wouldn't be surprised if they do bring up some like range support for him. They have done a couple times so far, but I like when he can provide information for his team. I do think it's like solid to remember as well that Tundra were kind of owning really hard in the last game, especially early. Like I thought Purge's breakdown of Weaver's movement on the map showed why they, it was so effective in that draft. Mm -hmm. um, I love that he went for that solo quest early, Ten getting like the crowns that let him be so like tanky, and then be able to use the ink swell for his team to be Five sitting on top of heroes. I really liked how they used Weaver, and I thought their draft was great. Now we're seeing Conquer in the game. Oof. The, we lost 
<laughs> we lost. Primal and CK. No, I was thinking. Oh, I was trying to see we, we lost. We lost, we lost. Like, we lost. Daz like Dazzles in the pool. That hero looks obscenely broken every time it comes out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but still, we probably can use Punka on two positions for mm -hmm. sure. So yeah. Well. Not sure if we're gonna see Dazzle straight away on yeah. uh, Tundra, but it's definitely hero Topias can show Entity on a very high level. Ooh, Ooh, that's interesting. I feel like maybe they thought. 33 was targeted quite a lot in the last draft when it came to bands, that he was willing to be that first pick, just get him on something comfortable that knows late game if it does go there again with Entity. I think Thunder is one of the few teams that actually like exposed this Doom and like uh, still value it as highly because other teams are kind of like ignoring it completely. Um, not really sure how, how good this hero is nowadays. I mean, into this matchup with Kunko, right? Now it's a very not easy game, but the fights are going to be clear for them, right? It's like, stop Kunker from free casting. Don't let him get the Torrent Storm, the boats, the multiple pushbacks with the wave, the Xbox. Just go. And Kunker, his itemization, it's your favorite, isn't it, Rosso? The Blade Mail, Heart, and Ags, BKB, like, it's enthralling. But you don't really want to go for, like, an early Lincolns or something to maybe punish the Doom a little bit. So, yeah, I see right now this is just a very snap response. No matter where you put your Kunker, he's going to get doomed in this game. So maybe Entity needs to start thinking about ways to either find the Doom to prevent that, or ways to save this Kunker and make it noisy enough that it's hard for him to always cleanly connect on that spell. Yeah, Grimstroke is obviously taken out because it's too much to have Doom and Grimstroke at the same team, which Tundra already had before. We were also going out to a lot of reactionary bans from game number one on the side of Entity. The Naga one, also being taken out, do you think it needs to be a first phase ban? Or is this a entity don't want to play it and they don't want to come up against it, so let's just take it out? I mean, it's just prevention from Skeeter having his comfort zone, which was like, you know, before he had like this Naga and, uh, and CK as one of his top, top go-to heroes. So they're just taken out of his comfort zone, basically. Nice oh, proper to snaking. That's good. They want to play aggressive once again. Mm -hmm. I was just looking if it was a, a snake hero or if it was going to be swapped between Snake King or Nine. But yeah, I'm only Snake King explained it so far and we're into the international. Yeah. What, what's the benefit of having it on a plus five instead of a plus four? The moves you make are five always towards remaining. just mid and four. You naturally, Skidder plays quite independent carries. So now, if he's playing an independent carry at minute four or five, your profit is always looking at the map. When you put it in the four roll, offlaner, it's not always right now in the meta to have independent offlaners. So if you put that in the four roll and he's leaving that, now you're punishing your offlaner and hoping that things go well. So I, I like the fact that when it goes five, it should just play the map really well. <laughs> oh, damn. Here we go. Oh, oh my goodness, that's amazing. <laughs> Real fan. Nice uh, yeah, are you even really a fan if you're not wearing their face, full face on a t-shirt? He's got a Fishman one under, so in case they do get, he can just take it off and he's ready <laughs> he for, yeah. Undying, one of the best Fishman heroes. Yeah, what is it, Dark Willow Undying or Morphling Undying or Medusa Undying? Do you think what it you can be here? Dark Willow? I mean, Ten seconds might, might have been. We lost, we lost Grab Ally, but it's fine, I suppose. I think it's this... Pick is less effective against Doom than it used to be because obviously Doom was changed. You can't heal anymore, um, so you lost that. But I think the ability to still be able to put someone in a tombstone is going to help when you're playing against the Doom. You're also just giving yourself a strong laner. It's going to allow you to punish uh, the enemy much more. Like this Nature's Prophet wants to go around killing everyone, right? Undying kind of helps make that a little bit less effective. Yeah, the lane from Entity, like Undying plus anything, should be able to pressure a Doom and at least delay the timings where Doom hits that stride of minus efficiency, I have my Octarine, I'm farming, I'm farming. It's going to delay that by minutes, which is always helpful. And I mentioned at the start, the Doom pick into Kunker, you need to save him because he's the Doom target. You have the grab ally, the Tombstone, sure it's been nerfed, but it's still going to just eat through that Doom cooldown. Yeah, if the Tomb dies, he's going to get stunned, but again, Surviving the Doom is the key thing, and now Avenge swapping play as well. Yeah, they've very answered, double save. Yeah, they've answered it with a nice double save. And I'm it's very good setup for a range carry right now, like mm -hmm. for someone like Luna or uh, potentially Dark Hero, like you said. I'm not sure about Dooza. This hero was not so strong lately. Could they like TA safe lane potentially yeah, as well? Yeah, one of uh, favorite Watson heroes, TA, have a potential for sure. 
I'm just not a big fan of Venge and Undying together because, like, as you can see right now, like, you consider three heroes on the on the entity side and you calculate all their damage and it's like, you know, 600, 800 damage. Yeah, and uh, I think it's gonna be a tough game for them, just I've, purely because of the supports. I've seen the Kunkka Venge matchup, the lane, sorry, where you put, like, the Wave of Terror with the Tidebringer. And in the offlane, it's just a lot of spam to go down. So no, 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 I'm talking about like you know in the engagements game. in the game. Sure, yeah. sure. I think maybe Entity are looking at just the lanes right now, and hopefully they have a big picture for the game. But I can see some strong lanes. But yeah, in the game, it, it can get clunky if they're behind. It's going to feel quite awkward. So we, we, we don't know where is Monkey going yet, right? It can be Nine Hero, or it can be Topia's Hero. We still flex it around. Mm -hmm. so it is it's interesting so to see. that Batrider is not a hero anymore. <laughs> I look at Tundra's lineup, it looks so free. Yeah, potentially. Storm Stormer is uh, one of uh, definitely professionals on that hero. Like, yeah. He knows the hero really, really well. Like, one of his most played too. Yeah, I think it's and time to pull it up of their sleeves. He's been playing in his pubs as well, so it wouldn't be too, uh, too jarring if they didn't oh, really? want to go for it. Yeah, he and still played. does. Yeah, six matches, 50% win rate. So it's still fresh on his mind, what's, what's and it is a very good game for it. Time for it that last yeah. two weeks. Of course, the reasoning is you play very aggressive, you chase down the Monkey King. Eight days, by the way, now. Thank you. <laughs> and they go uh, Terrorblade. All right, Terrorblade makes sense. Terrorblade makes their lineup look a little bit more, like, better. What was that? Why do you say it makes sense? Because uh, they have constant damage output now in the fights, and it makes up, like, the, the, Venge, uh, the Venge Aura, he's, been, he's using it pretty well on the, you know, Tombstone as well. And he provides the objectives for the team as well. A lot of physical damage, Monkey King Alchemist jumping on top of you, and yeah. a Terror Blade. You can always make some plays, turn that round, hit asunder, so it, it deals well. But pacing might be Entity's issue here. They're quite low damage with their first four picks. They are survivable, they help each other out, but that kind of mid-game timing of some, let's say, Radiance BKB out, any active item on Monkey King, the threat of the Prophet, it could overwhelm Entity yeah, once again. Mon Monkey King and Prophet can do so much uh, like around the map, because some Dying Venge, when you don't really those heroes who can do a lot on the map uh, compared to those two. And also it depends on how uh, strong of, uh, of the lanes is going to work out for en en Entity because this Kunka Venge lineup potentially, right? Like I don't know how well we're going to do against Alch uh, Furion probably. Also if it's uh, Monkey King who is post 4, he might roam also. Like we, we can see a lot of like changes. Yeah, they don't really want to put Kunka against Monkey King on the mid lane, right? It's a, it's a very bad matchup for him. Yeah, they don't know where is this monkey going. Who have last pick like, from uh, them? Tundra has last pick. Mm -hmm. huh. So they to surprise us. Yeah, like they definitely don't want to uh, get Kunka mid, I guess. So it's going to be offlane. So we already know the lanes of Entity for sure. And we don't know Tundra lanes yet. They also had, the uh, Entity had pretty similar lineup against uh, Azure Ray and they lost those games. So I'm not sure why they decided to go for it again here against the Tundra. A hero sometimes they pick is like a Visage in this position for Entity. Like, you can just play out a pretty chill lane, and then you can set a little bit of pacing. I still like Sheep's point about the Batrider is pretty okay, but I think Visage could be like a stable version of that, where you move to the Kunker, take a tower, you do things on the map for your team, because they don't really hit any buildings or objectives right now, until TB's online. Like, they're kind of missing that component. I think with Visage, they're too much physical, uh, you know, heavy lineup, mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, they can just build. They go for the Batrider. Nice. Yeah. Good guess. Yeah. Nice, good guess. I like the Shadow Demon ban just before they pick it as well. Yeah. Make sure they don't get that cleanse. I like it way more because now they actually have a mix of like physical and magical yeah. damage. Yeah. So their lineup looks way more balanced in that way. We still don't have that much burst early game. Like uh, we need to wait until we get some items and hopefully their lanes go well. Like it's a little bit still scary to pick Batrider without seeing enemy mid laner, and there is like Furion who can also like TP in on top of you, like make make this like change on the lane. So I feel like Stormstorm is probably gonna play for his farm on this lane. I'm surprised they didn't ban Queen of Pain, right? Yeah, yeah. Queen's available. Um, it's not Topio's hero, right? Like he no. doesn't really play much Cope. I think he can. Oh, absolutely, he, he can. For Agonims. I think he'd like that. You wanna is it when say Zeus again? The little jump away, you know. Zeus? Zeus is nice. Maybe oh, Puck. His yep. favorite Zeus. Yeah, that's that's the hero he's like. Quop's good, but Topson hero not so much. Puck very good against Batrider, because he dives you, you hit coil, yeah. TP in. And it's free game for Puck, or it's nothing. Yeah. Also it's not bad against TB, like it's pretty decent. But Zeus is fun. Look, he's smiling. He knows he, he knows. Oh no, there's some sign. Okay, uh -oh. hold up, hold. Uh -oh. 
He's What's smiling. coming? Uh? He's smiling. Yeah. Is it Pudge? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. We're not gonna have to wait too much longer. The time is running down. Tundra putting us on the edge of our seat to see what's gonna get picked yes! up. There is Zeus. Yes, they did it. He called it. He called Bed Rider, he called Zeus. Well done, final. You guys just know our mid laners. Are you gonna know the outcome of this game though? I'm waiting for Tundra in this one. Yeah? I think it's a really strong bat rider game. I, 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 I'm ready to bet it all. Oh, my boy, Stomp Donner. All on a two Every for entity, everything. Everything I have. I like Tundra Draft way too much, like this game, even further. It, like, I, I'm going for entity, just so we're like fighting here. <laughs> you want to be split down the middle? Yeah. I really like Tundra's lineup. I think this uh, Zeus for Latry is a lot of damage. I appreciate the Batrider pick, but it's... Like Storm Storm needs to go like 10 and 0 in this type of game to buy the time for everyone else to come online. Meanwhile, you got like Phylactery Zeus, some early Radiance BKB, some Monkey King and Nature's Prophet globally jumping around, TPing around the map. It's a lot of threat, it's a lot of pressure, and uh, I'm just a Zeus enjoyer. It's an amazing Zeus game. It's a banger. For sure. I hope he buys Phylactery because Mikoto last time didn't buy it. I was yeah. surprised. It'll be illegal if he doesn't. We can, yeah, we can talk to him after if he doesn't. But yeah, Phylactery is insane on this hero. What is the win condition for Entity then? I have to ask you the ship or, or Dendi this one. If we survive to minute 25 without like game being too uh, destroyed, I think we, we can definitely win it. Okay. Yeah. It's 25 minutes, that's the same in your eyes as well, Sheep? Yeah, I just want to see them survive it. Because if they get run over, you're just playing with a bunch of like defensive supports that can't really do anything. You have no explosive damage. You need Stormstormer to have a really good game. If he doesn't have a good game, it's difficult. I think the key of this game is catching up Zeus. Like from with the Bat Rider initiation, if they get Zeus, then they might have a good chance of winning this game. But if uh, Tapias have a really good positioning, then it's, really, it's going to be a really hard one. Okay. All righty. Well, uh, we're going to see how it plays out. And before we do, we have the privilege of getting to talk to more coaches. It's Tsunami and Aoi. That's right, I am standing by with uh, the Tundra coach, AUI2000. A lot of smiles in the booth when that Zeus pick came out. What's it like having Thompson on the team with... Uh, he's, he's known to play some pretty obscure heroes mid, but at least this one's a little bit more typical. Um, and Thompson's an interesting guy. He's like, uh, if no one's picking the hero, then he really wants to play it. He's something like mid-Ogre, and Invoker's first pick, he doesn't want to play it. Hero gets nerfed, no one's playing it, he wants to pick Invoker every game. Yeah, it's, uh, interesting. He's a Dota hipster is what you're telling me. He is for sure a Dota hipster. <laughs> and in uh, this game now, it's, uh, it's an interesting approach because Tundra, last year, you guys plowed through the upper bracket completely undefeated, at least not having to go down to lowers. Here, you're now one game away from elimination. Does that change your approach to the draft or as a coach? Uh, I hope not. I mean, <laughs> I think a lot of the last year, like the TI-12 year, we spent trying to figure out how to reset from losses. And I think at TI that year, we did it really well. So hopefully the same tools that we used then to reset, we'll be able to use now. Sounds like we're in tune for a three-game series. You guys ready for some more Dota? <laughs> Let's get game number two underway. Tundra are going to be put to the test here when it comes to that mentality in the lower brackets. One game down against a team that they probably feel like they should have won that first game. Uh, how do you be able to bounce back from that, Avery? Uh, coach and leadership plays the biggest part, honestly. I think people yeah. can rile you up, get the energy levels where they need to be. I mean, sometimes you have to energize people up. Sometimes you have to calm them down. Get everybody in the right place of mind. If you're laughing, you're having a good time, you're probably going to reset and do okay. Okay. And believe in what you brought to the tournament. That's what's going to get you to the grand final at the end of the day. I think my favorite part of <laughs> that interview is Curtis going, hey, it's interesting. Yeah, I had some I sense thought... of like, it's not what I would pick for the mid, but you know, what yeah, I, I, I can't, can't argue with thinking them. about the, the Pugna impact in that last game. I mean, it's I don't really feel like that had much to do with Thompson. It's no. Just, that, the core Pugna just did not seem to be able to do enough there. And hopefully this hero will do a bit better for Tundra. The mid Zeus versus the Storm Stormer. Batrider, all eyes on mid, Avery. That's why Zeus is a very interesting hero relative to that Pugna. In terms of, he, he's similar in that he's doing a huge amount of magical damage in the fight, which can suffer versus these big regen-oriented sustain lineups we've seen in the meta. But this game, there really isn't too much of it, right? There's like some boat rum. Maybe you get a hard on Kunkka, but otherwise, you have pretty good matchups in the bat and TB and just striking them down. And of course, Zeus has percent base damage, whereas the Pugna doesn't. So even if you get these really huge tanky HP pools like we're used to seeing right now, at least Zeus has some tools to scale into them pretty nicely. 
And of course, you can always just run them over with Phylactery. I mean, dare I say, will this be the... Please buy Phylactery. Ah, I, I don't so ask good. anymore. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> Every time I ask for it, we never see it. So, okay. I, I think Thompson is the guy who would buy don't, it. Don't buy it, Thompson. Okay. Don't buy Flash this game. It's terrible. Let's see what he ends up doing. Early trade happening on the tower. Yeah, very much like that. Use the heavenly jump to slow him down underneath the tower. Stormstormer gets overly aggressive here. Yeah, and it's was... not even time for the water rune to spawn. So, yeah, his courier is going to be coming out with a bottle. But there is going to be this window here where Thompson's going to be feeling very good about the lane. This is not an easy match for Bat. It used to be a lot better. Bat's laning has been nerfed. Zeus has the escape mechanism. It does have perfect CS for the first two waves and has that bottle rush. So Storm Stormer, he's probably just going to look to get his farm and, and take over the map more than necessarily shut Thompson down. Yeah. I mean, you can get to some BKBs on the side of Entity. You're, you're having a pretty good time in the team fight, I think. But this is another game where Tundra can play really fast and already once more nine off to a pretty fast start, though Watson will get the rebuttal. If you're looking at Fury on Monkey King supports, this is a support duo that wants to just come out guns blazing and run the map over. Especially if they can get ganks on mid going with the Fury on. You can even connect to those with the Monkey on the 6 and 8 minute power runes. That would be my game plan if I'm Tundra right here. And just free up the space for your side lane course to get a huge amount of XP because Alk is not going to get pressured by a Kunkka. So Snaking in theory has some decent freedom to affect the other lanes here if he wants to commit to it. What's the point of drafting this uh, Kunkka nowadays, particularly in the off lane for Gabby? What are you trying to get out of it? Water park? Uh, <laughs> same okay. thing as any Kunkka, I guess. <laughs> I mean, the off lane is not trouble. that great for him in a lot of the carry matchups. Alk is not going to shut him down too hard, though, so maybe they felt like this flex was warranted. And that's really what it was about, right? They got to hold this mid pick till last. They could have still put the Kunkka mid in this game and gotten another off laner. That was the value. Based on that, it's just how much Gabby can contribute to the game with the utility. And, I mean, Gabby's looked pretty good on this offlane Kunkka, too. I think it's just a hero he enjoys playing and has had a decent amount of success with. So, something entity is very comfortable flexing between those two roles. Snaking almost dying earlier to that blood grenade. Comes back. That's the power of Furion. Just TP's away. TP's back into lane. And uh, plays aggressive into the venge. Our other side lane, Watson. See him just holding the creeps in front of the tower. He's doing all right for himself. 14 and 6. And compared to the Doom, who's 12 and 2. So it may have cost Fishman a bit of a sacrifice, but Watson's having a good time so far. And as you talked about the last game, why not put all, or at least a lot of your eggs in the Watson basket? Because this guy is damn good in this carry role. He's proved it by being top of the leaderboard for a really long time, I feel like. So many times I check it out. There's Watson. Definitely held it, and for good reason. And if you're going to put him into that single basket, an illusion carry is not the worst way to do it, because it's a carry that can affect the map, come out of the lane, flash from the jungle, and contribute pretty heavily to the fights. I really like the combination of the Venge and Terrorblade in this game. There's not a lot to dissuade these huge hits coming through with the Minus Armor and the Vengeance or an Amp. And you have that swap save form that can just reset the fight. You also have this swap for Wukong or Zeus later. This combination could be really nice in the late game, especially with fighting around the Tombstone. Something Tundra's going to have to think about because who is killing Tombstone in this game? Alk or Furion, I guess? Yeah. It's a bit dicey, right? Especially if you get this Axe on Cook and he has all the AO control. Snaking turns Rupert. around. He knows he's dead. He tries to put the damage back onto the Vengeful Spirit. Not good enough, though. So it's just not that strong of a lane past like the first one or two levels here. I fully expect Snaking to want to rotate. Maybe he's a bit scared of leading Skeeter alone, but you don't pick Furion to sit in your safe lane for five to eight minutes. There's just better heroes to do it. So now's the question of where you're going to go with this Furion and what are you going to make happen? And it looks like straight in the top. That's where he wants to be. Collect some Tombstone Gold, maybe. Yeah, they'll kill that Undying and kill his Tombstone too, I believe. He'll what take a, out to nine, and Stanking will collect the bounty on the tombstone. the hell out of that tombstone. He really did. Show it who's bots and go back through the portal, perhaps. So, I mean, not the craziest swing in momentum for a first fear on TV, but... I was wondering what Thompson was doing there, uh, playing so aggressively in an entity side, but I'm looking at the CS chart. Despite that, like, that early bit where, you know, Stormstorm almost killed himself underneath the tower, He's doing really well in CS, 38-2, and two, so this Zeus does actually need to get in there and stop this Bat Rider from farming the neutrals so much. The upside is Thompson gets to hold his resources because he's not getting pressure, which means you always have Thunder God's Wrath here in the early game. 
available to combat these side lanes right now. And I mean, Pop is getting traded out really hard. Yeah, Watson's getting a bit low. Whoa. He does have a raindrop already, probably in big part because the Zeus is a factor in this game. He has a lot of stick charges here as well. Big Lotus for 33 here. Really needed the extra region in this battle. I fully expect Tundra to want to make a move on Terrorblade very soon, particularly if they can get him at the end of this meta. You have Thunder's God Wrath versus the lowest starting HP pool carry in the game. Yeah. You want to use it. Do not want to sit here with this spell off cooldown in the early game. Tops is begging his team right now, please. Create something for me. And we should be seeing those opportunity, particularly with the Nature's Prophet. But uh, with... But still, it's thinking just sitting bottom, right? Yeah. Very a slower early game than I would have expected out and of this Tundra support duo. And if you're going to be the ones making the first move here, not the move that Storm Stormer really wanted out of this one as he runs into nine. He's going to try and chase him down and might be successful in doing so. I He's going to want sticky napalms on him. He wants Wisdom Rune. Oh, yeah, he does. You're right. Thompson's going to be able to make the connection, though. He's trying to go for it, push him away, but it's not good enough. They grab the lasso. That will burn out 33 ever so barely, but it is not looking great for Entity as uh, not only do they claim that Wisdom Rune of theirs. Oh! Fishman tried to go in for the deny. Now he's put himself. Oh, nice cut down to the trees. That was pretty good. Unfortunately, he is still stuck. He's up against a Zeus that actually has no mana. So it's going to be a slow death. He's living here, I think. I, yeah, actually, decay. <laughs> this is going to be close, man. I, Fishman with the jukes today. There's just no mana left. Thompson had to get re Got another the decay coming in soon. Thompson, no, will finally show up. The raindrop's still enough. Another round of decay. You know he's dead, but he cost him an extra, like, solid 30 seconds there. Watson, thank you. That's a full level for me. I don't have to deal with any of these. That's a Fishman highlight reel if I've ever seen one. That, uh, yeah, that genuinely is. <laughs> that's, that's why that man dies so much. So when he does die at the right time, it makes you work for it. Yeah, he's very practiced at it. Very sacrificial player, Snake King. Going to be pulled back. The X Torrent. Not a problem for Gabby. That, that is also going to be an issue. I guess you've got the, the combination of damage over time. you got the fire and water. you got the water part combined with the damage over time from this Bat Rider. So they've got a ton of area that is just going to be tons of damage being thrown around. You don't want to play into it. Probably some lore implications. Watson gets the Doom implication here. Sling yeah, Skeeter knows. Hey, if they're making the move in the top lane, they're not trying to help out their carry at all. I've got to vacate the premises here. Moves over to the other side of the map. Stormer Stormer will pursue. The rest of his team is going to be following him. But they're TP back bottom. Bit behind. Skeeter's just double dodging all these ganks right now. Doing his best to disappear on the map. Not the resort for a 33 kill. Yeah, they'll get that one instead. Pull them back into the magic missile. Will be good enough. Stormstormer on a killing spree. Something that the panel said they very much need Stormstormer to have a lot of momentum if Entity wants to be able to win this game and not get run over too early. I was thinking to tank this boat bottom. Still, his early game has been rough, right? This is a slow nature profit game right now. Can catch up later. Sprout can definitely be annoying in the late game. It's been a slow one for Snake King. Yeah, that it's all been Stormstormer on the map. Three to one, bot's no done. He just has a magic wand windlace and then some consumables. That's what it takes. That's what it takes. Another self stun. Just so eaters sure. Spending so much trying to dodge, but There's some damage. the success. Oh no, not so successful. Watson gets off the Sunder last second. And again, where's the connection for these plays, right? If Thompson's going in, he's going to fight this with an ult. You need to be there with both supports 100%. Whatever's happening bottom is just not worth the exchange and losing momentum for your Zeus. And especially giving it to Watson, where this raindrop in a cult bracelet has already paid off in the early game. Some extra magic resistance, some tank ability, survive the ult, turn it around. Watson getting involved, making it count, and turns it straight into a tier one tower. That's a good point. The 5% he gets off that neutral item probably made the difference there in him getting off the Sunder. Every little bit counts. That's crazy. Tundra. A slow early game for Tundra. Yeah, they got to be feeling a bit nervous, especially after being down a game in this series. And bottom, Arcane Rune off the smoke. Chemical Rage on cooldown. You could drag him back, and there's no chance of him out regening the damage. Game is turning into the Stormstormer show right now. Yep. Level nine bots are done, and 
He is well on his way to a fast BKB, which I think was the scary part of this game for Tundra. What do you do versus BKB bat here? It's pretty much guaranteed free team fight for him every time, unless you want to doom him and maybe you slap him off a tree first if you're the monkey. That's about it. And he's just going to have stacks on top of it. Ah, they are giving Stormstormer everything here. That was such an efficient move. He kills the carry team back just in time to sack the Ancient Camp one more time before he clears it out. And all on an Arcane Rune. So he's another lasso up in 20 seconds off of this farm. He's going to go heal, can instantly make another play on the map. It's an incredible pace for the mid Batrider. Level 10, highest in the game. Big Damn, good for him. nine. Somebody like that one. Oh, yeah. Steals away some neutrals. Still waiting for Tundra to strike back. Maybe happy to farm up with an Alk Doom. I mean, you have double fake gold acceleration here. That's something working for you. And there are some stacks waiting for Skeeter, but not a huge amount. Hey, don't worry, Avery. Thompson listened to you. Yeah. Did not go Phylactery. Has a Kaya complete and will be going for Yules afterwards. One day. One day we will convert all the Zeus players. That might be coming in from behind Fishman in his golem form. Thought he could take this fight, but too many members. That is the advantage that Tundra is supposed to be having, but they can't even finish off Fishman. Okay, I spoke a little too soon there. The global effect of the Zeus comes into play. Thunder God's Wrath will claim his life. Also scouts this Stormstormer move. So double the value for Thompson, who would have died there to this hasted Bat Rider in the bottle. This is a guaranteed kill for Stormstormer somewhere on the map. It's just a matter of who's going to pay the price, because Hasted Batrider, there's no answer right now. And I guess unless you want to purge him up on 33 side. Thompson's so funny, man. The way he plays so aggressively. Like you say, he sees the Batrider, and then he just promptly goes to farm that camp that was anyway. A little, that was a little insane, yeah. I mean, Thompson just figures, like, if he dies there, I mean, what are you supposed to do, right? You can't stop playing Dota just because someone gets a rune. Another self-stun. Him back pretty deep here. That's going to be into the X boat as well. An additional bit of burst damage. Is it enough? The raindrop helping to protect him, but the damage over time does do its work. Tundra are here with all four heroes, though, so maybe they could collect on Gabby, but now Entity, the supports are showing up. Oh, immediate doom put onto the undying. No tombstone here, it seems. Didn't even have it. <laughs> I don't know if they had that read, but nonetheless, they will shut Fishman down. Shows up to that fight and instantly gets met with a doom to the face. Still, you know Tundra went more off this move. They really do. They're going to try and get Stormstormer, who has collected quite the killing spree, but not enough damage. Entity doing a good job protecting each other, connecting where it feels like Tundra have kind of failed to, to do so quite as successfully. That feels like it's been the story of the game. I mean, they're catching up in net worth on the support. Snake King's definitely recovering here. But it does feel like they're getting outnumbered, and it's just the Batrider mobility on the map. You know, like Stormstorm is finding these openings, bringing the right support in the follow-up. That's another big out kill to slow down Skeeter's timings, pushing towards a Radiance here, which of course is Alchemist Terrorblade matchup when you're going ores and stuff here reflected. Al Terrorblade is going to have a really good Scotty timing in this game. And that is what Entity are going to try and play around. This is a very classic Entity ball-up lineup that we've seen work for them in a lot of the regionals, right? You have to get an Undying Venge, put a Terrorblade with it. You hit this Scotty, you go into the Roche, you go into the Tier 2s with Tombstone and a Swap save. That is a big ball to fight through. And on top of it, you have Kunkka throwing Boat Rum into it. It's going to be a lot of EHP coming out of nowhere. You're suddenly have to deal with. And it's going to be a tough fight for Skeeter to commit into, especially when he is well behind on a hero that is not used to being behind. No, not at all. He is sitting at 6,500 net worth on an Alchemist. This hero is supposed to be top of the net worth chart. They have a Doom on their side as well. This is a lineup with Furion on top of all of that. It's supposed to be printing money constantly. And the net worth chart is pretty much even. They have a 1,000 net worth lead, but it's really not as much as it needs to be. Another pick off here. Doom is going to be found here in the top lane. Entity are bringing a lot of heroes to these kills constantly, which is the reason why they're not able to quite keep up with Tundra in net worth. But turning that kill into a Roshan is a uh, nice little move that you could do with an Undying. Stormstormer is going to need some help with the mid lane, though, and they're already seeping to try and hit, bail him out. They're going to catch nine as he tries to get away, but pulled back by the X. That was a defusal rush for the monkey. So this is nine wanting to get aggressive on the map, try and force something. It's just gonna turn into space off the death, I guess. As Tundra's still looking for their first set of items to take a fight. 
It did stall that Roche, however. It did. Yeah. Gave up on the Roche by keeping the supports in. So whether Nine knew that or not, I don't know. But he did get some value out of that play. Some time wasted from Watson here. Let those gold mechanisms catch up. You're saying they're only up 1K. I'm surprised they're up at all, given how slow this early game was for them. Yeah. Well, we've hit the scary timing that you said Tundra needs to look out for. BKB is complete for Storm Stormer with the boots to travel and even a double damage. So they are very, very dangerous. And Tundra obviously just going to be playing to allow those abilities that print them money. They need the time for it to do so, particularly they need that Radiance on the Alchemist for him to really start scaling up pretty quickly. It's going to explode out of nowhere, though, right? You have Octarine, Midas, Max Devour, Doom. You have Radiance coming out on the Alka. If you let these heroes get away with the next five or ten minutes here untouched, they are going to be top of the net worth charts, guaranteed. They're going to be able to take a good fight off it. I mean, Tundra's game plan is just create enough threats that, okay, if you go in with BKB Lasso, you focus one hero down, they can still win the fight regardless. That's where some of the long duration spells like the Tombstone, the Boat Room, they're really nice for Entity right now. Because even in that situation where Tundra commit, I just don't see them winning a long fight. They don't have the, the heroes to deal with those spells, those big ults right now. But this game did get slowed down with that kind of failed Roche play. Yeah. Felt like it took some, some gust out of the wings. And it's time that Skeeter has not been killed by Stormstorm for a while. Which I'm sure he's very happy about, and that'll finish his Radiance. That's complete. We do have a pipe done for Gabby. So combining the BKB with the pipe, they are kind of untouchable in the right five on five. If they choose to activate those those things, then there's really not much that Tundra could do to stop it. So I have to imagine they're still probably thinking about that Roshan. When can we do it? How can we get there can without say, giving too much to Tundra? Thinking got stunned by the Ogre Bruiser. <laughs> on a range he? support. Was he teleporting away or something? I mean, I have some history with Snaking, but that was embarrassing. I just want to... <laughs> I've seen Snaking do a lot of shady stuff. <laughs> Getting stung by an Ogre Bruiser on Fury. <laughs> not, not his finest moment. Yeah, just sure. to call yeah. him out. Just to make sure that that gets called out. Yeah, yeah. You had to watch him win a TI, so That's in turn, right. you're also going to make That's sure right. that you see him get stunned by an Ogre Bruiser. absolutely abuse my power. <laughs> hey, round two of Entity doing Roshan. Yeah, this one should be a little faster and go a little better. Solar Crest for Fishman going to guarantee the pace here. I mean, your enemy supports are going to fall behind on the map compared to Tundra's because it's Monkey Furion, right? They're going to farm everything they want yeah. compared to Avenge Undying, who have way better spells right now. But if they're not getting the fight, you have to put them to use somewhere. So that's where if enemy gets split up on this map, it's not going to feel great for them. But if they get into the five on fives around the objectives, which this Aegis should allow them to do, that should still feel very good. And if you're Tundra, the question is, do you want to take that fight? Do you want to keep splitting the map? I feel like you just keep splitting the map. As long as Batrider is not picking you off, I don't think you're too sad about this. Yeah, I think you 100% agreed on that point because you could see Tundra are clearly advocating for that. I mean, they saw that entity win out to the Roshan pit, right? They saw those two supports rotating through oh, the yeah. portal. <laughs> Wham! <laughs> I'm glad this is why we need one camp. You would have missed that. That's true. That was... That was... <laughs> I he almost want died because that. of it. It's true. He's so the highlights of Snaking's career, though. Tundra want to draw out the game. Is that what you're saying? It's a shocker. Well, yeah. <laughs> Jump in. Practice. As we say that, they're the ones to make a quick move to blow up Fishman. Does he get caught on the way out, though? Katoomi, if he gets close enough, he gets the swap in Good with the running Wukong's man. They don't give a damn, apparently. Katoomi swaps back to Batrider, finished off nine before he gives up his life for that. So one for one in the supports there after Fishman dies. Tundra, our position to hit the tower some more, which is almost Dude, dead. going to be close. 30 HP on Stormstormer. Almost ends up ticking out there. Wow, I'm surprised he got that low. This spell does a lot of damage now. A very heads up Doom by 33 to just make sure his back can't do anything with that BKB. First pop for Stormstormer yields nothing there. 33 shows up in time and early blink definitely helping out. That's a nice little fight for Tundra. Again, we're seeing this net worth explode even when nothing's happening, right? So they're happy with these little exchanges and trades. Stall the game. Yeah, the Honestly, game was totally fine for Entity five minutes ago when it was even and it right. felt like they had picked up the pace. But now it, it does feel like they're having a hard time getting a hold of Tundra. And right now, is it the timing, right? I mean, the timing is going to be the Scotty on the Terrorblade. The question, though, is that Roche got stalled? And, like, you're not going to have an Aegis with this Scotty timing. Are you happy forcing towers without a second life on the Terrorblade just running in? 
Might be a little awkward. Snaking will pay the price here. Damn, he is. He went from, what was it, like five, six minutes in when he said he had like zero items. He almost has an Aghanim Scepter. I mean, that's Furion. Print that cash. Yeah. And that's just going to be more and more like map problems that they have to deal with. Jumping away into the trees, nine. No Drop tombstone the drops. Stone outside of the range. They know he's there off the decay, and they'll finally catch him. It takes a while, though. Yeah, double crawling supports. It's just so much time. At least this is efficient. They bring all these heroes here. Might as well do the Tormentor. Tombstone helps out a bit, and Fishman will get rewarded. A little bit of grab ally action. Grab ally, indeed. I mean, nothing crazy to grab ally against, but never bad to get it for free. Nonetheless, this game has definitely stalled. This Aegis did not yield too much. And now if you're Entity, you have to prepare for this next period in the game where you're going to have to fight Tundra on their terms in the sense of you're going to have big defensive items coming out, right? Manta Alka is going to continue to push in the waves from the map. You're going to have a BKB on 33 at some point. And Thompson already finished the Octarine. His Zeus is pretty tanky. Yeah, this He's is my biggest to go concern. With Zeus has always been a pretty good answer to Terrorblade, right? Oh, yeah. One of the best. So it is somewhat single core lineup. I mean, Entity are putting all their eggs into Terrorblade, getting strong enough and being able to end the game. Is he going to be able to do that against uh, an Octarine Zeus holding high ground? That's where those Aegises and the, where they line up with Watson's itemization matters a lot to me in this game. Like, you need to make them count and get a lot of value off the map because, yeah, you're running a gold deficit. It feels like you're running against the clock a little bit here in terms of if it's truly a four protect one lineup and your one position has dubious core matchups in the ultra late, are you happy just stalling this game out? I mean, Watson, I feel like he thinks he can carry any game. And I've seen him carry a lot of games. So there is some truth in that. But in the ultra late versus a Doom, a Furion who's going to be rooting and disabling you, the, a Monkey King who can turn into another core, and I mean, Nine is farming a lot right now. Going back for a pipe, very interesting item. Yeah, He may have the good matchup out. against Alchemist, but against That's everybody else. And even that matchup is not, it's not like some crazy deciding matchup. If the Alk can pick and choose when he goes in, he doesn't have to be the first contact. Like Skeeter jumping in with six slots on anybody is going to be pretty scary this game. He'll find a freebie here. This is where the map becomes very difficult to play, and it, it falls back to Stormstormer. Can he continue to find pickoffs and close out the lanes with this Batrider threat? It looks like it's not going to be totally free. Katomi goes through the portal and catches Snaking on the other side, so they'll get support for support, five for five. But it does leave just more space. They see a lot of heroes, they get a lot of information on the side of Tundra, and that's more time where Skeeter knows he's free to Farm up Ancients, Thompson's pushing out lanes everywhere. He's going to get an Aghanim Scepter next, which is uh, yet another split pushing mechanism that they can use. People don't think about it that way most of the time, but you can use it that way. It's going to be so annoying to get all the lanes pushed in in this game. And Thompson's favored this extra Lightning Bolt mini stun talent at 20. You get extra stun duration, and this Ags becomes really annoying. It locks people down. Pretty obnoxious when you think about stacking this on top of Sprout, hold people in a Wukong, even some extra stun on a target fleeing away with Doom. Yeah. And there's like a little, a lot of little small things that can make this Nimbus really obnoxious game. And of course, you have Octarine to back it up with some extra CDR. A absolutely nothing wrong with this build outside of your missing Phylactery, but so far, it's making it work. Not going to let it go, huh? Nope. Three-man smoke up from Entity. This is your Scotty. This is a big timing for Watson. You really want a full-out team fight out of this. You have all the utility to back it up. You have drums, you have solar. They have the scan. You have pipe. Just need a target to hit, and there's a Yules and a dodge. He's going to hop away, swap back, though. Tops it, still going to be caught and killed. Very important that Entity got something out of that smoke. They still may be trading out Katomi, Glimmer Cape, maybe. Oh, grab I like, OK. There we go. Are you happy if this is all you get, though? That's the question. I, I feel like you kind of need to get, you start got to get some objectives, right? I don't know if it's that mid-tier two or what, but. Storm Storm's hunting Snake right now. Radiance Does not want to let the split push go on too long. He just misses him. Both these silence getting shoved in by the Furion, and instead Tundra are going to try and turn it around on Storm Stormer with early bots for 33. If they get him after 
the Firefly is down, then maybe I could see it. Doom into Sprout, hold him in place. He has no way to get away. I think they're worried about it being that close to a tier one still. Sure. Turnaround potential from Entity with saves is pretty formidable in this game. Something you're gonna have to think about on these single target jumps. And it's the thing, when you're trying to, to uh, split the map as much as they are, making aggressive moves sometimes just feels unnecessary. Do we really need to do that? If yeah. we could just, you know, continue to... I mean, Storm Server still hasn't dealt with the bottom wave that's pushing into that tower. No, he's scared of the map too, especially since he's the gem holder, which tells you, I mean, these sidelines have been a problem for Andy. Ob's in the sidelines as well, that Snake can, can plant pretty deep, helps him split push here. And it'll be a two-man smoke that went through mid with the two stun jumpers. Looking for a big core pickoff while the meta was on cooldown here. Like Tundra are gonna find anything though. Even with the lanes going in, any are just playing it safe. I mean, look at where Watson is right now, man. This guy wants nothing to do with the map. He's he's full HP, full resources, just going back to base. Yeah, he's buying gonna... out the BKB. Yeah, buy out that BKB by selling his magic wand. Roshan could be up right now. We know it's gonna be in a minute and a half is when the actual spawn time is. And Watson wants to fight right now. Meta at 20, they want to fight into Roshan and get Nagus, and the meta after that, take objectives with it. So you need to set the map oh. up for yourself to make sure everything goes as smoothly as possible to get prepared for that. Well, right, Austin. A little, a little bit of a speed bump. Fortunately, he's got Octarine, so I guess it's going to be on cooldown a little bit faster, but Kato on me. That's true, then you can misclick it in 55 seconds instead of 60. <laughs> yeah, but once it gets down to that uh, six second charge, then you, you know, it's not it's not the worst. If you misclick it. I get him scepter done for Kunkka. So we have the water park in action. It's open, ready for business. That's gonna make that Roshan fight a whole lot harder for Tundra, yeah, fighting in a set area. They're all items designed to align for entity, hit this ball timing for second Roche, which is really where Watson's gonna feel one of his strongest peaks in this game. He just needs to be able to connect this meta onto the big cores here. Tombstone is also a huge spell for Entity. If they can keep it up during a Roche fight, it's really going to do work in the long engagements because there isn't a direct Tombstone killer that wants to just run in there and man up for it. Every time you run in to kill the Tombstone, that means Watson's probably hitting you. No one's really happy about that yet because the armor items are still what's missing from Tundra's side. They're going to be thinking about AC and Shiva at some point in this game. It's not there yet. Oh, the tidal wave is coming in. Nine. He has to hop out of those trees. They spot him, but they can't catch him. And uh, Entity are set up to do that, Roshan. If they don't do it now, though, it's going to cross over to the other side, so... Oh, you definitely do it now. Yeah. And Tundra, again, showing no real signs. They have all the information that this is going on, but they don't really care to contest. Yeah, the upside here, if your Entity is, if Tundra's not contesting, you get to save the meta. Which means that next fight that you wanted to take after you secure this Aegis can happen immediately if you wanted to. Watson will hold on to it. He's got Titan Sliver. He is damn strong right now. It's all about kiting him out in the fights. Getting to a point where Skeeter can just play aggressively because he's going to Octarine on this Alk. This Alk is not going to be tanky at all. He, this is, I mean, very greedy, very efficient. You can play off the spells, concoctions, mantas on the map. You can be very annoying. When it comes to the head-on battle, you're doing absolutely nothing to this Terror Blade. Hitting him with pillows here, so it, it really is putting more weight on Thompson to carry the brunt of the damage versus Watson in actual exchange. Or maybe even nine with a Wukong that lasts. I mean, he's got Scotty on his own. Oh, he gets the courier and is he gonna get away? It's looking like that's easy. Meanwhile, Katomi gets uh found in the top lane as Tundra pushed forward to that side of the map. They are really creating problems on the lanes for Entity. Just yeah. can't get any single lane into group up right now. Every time you suffer a pickoff, the game gets salt some more. They are continuing to scale. We've seen Storm Stormer carry some of these late games with Batrider, a hero he's very comfortable playing the late game with. A dead even game right now. Do you feel like that's going to swing into Tundra's favor more 10 minutes from now? If Entity hasn't claimed anything with this Aegis? I think Tundra are okay with what's happening right now, right? Yeah. These Aegises were never ones they were supposed to get in this game. So if Entity don't get something done with the Aegis, it feels okay just waiting out and taking a fight afterwards. In fact, Tundra feel like they can just take the fight now. Four-man smoke the bottom while Snape pushes top. 
I mean, the, the lanes are, every single lane is pushed in right now, so they probably know Entity's yeah, gonna look split at the, up a little bit. Look at the Treants on the map, right? snay has been splitting these Treants, blocking camps with them, scouting it out. That's another source of vision, where they just see Entity when they get split up and look for the pickoff. They're again playing it very patient, not forcing the issue. Nine is the only person really showing aggressively in Entity's face, and this time, He's going to pay the price for it, but that happened eventually. Okay, gobbled up here. So maybe that's just the small little opening that Entity feel like is enough for them to take an objective off the map. They still have yet to take a tier two. They're going to head towards that bottom one. I was like, Fishman has found a lot in this game. <laughs> He's got a blink on top of the drum and solar crest he finished earlier. There's a lot of net worth on this Undyne and blink grab ally. No joke in this game. If he can help a core that's deep in the fight out. Yeah. Save somebody from some sort of chain stun. Give him a crucial couple of seconds against the Doom. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, these MD supports, they don't need as much net worth as Tundra's to function decently in the team fight. Right. Their spells are really powerful between the double save, especially if Katomi can get to an Ags here on the Venge. Then you have double all the spells to throw into action. You're probably going to get a shard at some point as well off Torment or just buy yourself off the Billy Gold. And taking towers is a good way to give your supports that bit of bump up in net worth. Oh, yeah. So this ball is still very strong for Envy. Watson still cruising top of the chart. How quickly, though, can this ball bounce around in the map in an attempt to stop Tundra from pushing out every other lane? Because they telegraphed that push so heavily. Bought uh, mid and top. They've been pushed straight into those tier twos, even taking a bit of chip damage here. And the Treants continue to see everything. Pressure at tier two. Snake King giving all the vision in the world for them to continue to do Tundra things. Which what? is farm with broken gold spells. <laughs> and maybe it's best entity don't try and force it too much. Maybe they should be content to like, okay, they, they want to play late game, but we're also fine with playing the late game. We don't necessarily have to go high ground with this Aegis. They only have a, uh, another 70 seconds left on it. Take another tier two, though. They're well set up to do that, at least. That is another small combo, right? You got the Thunder's God Wrath into the Nature's Wrath. Double the Wrath. You get vision on all five heroes, they instantly get rooted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just saw there. They're happy to just throw it out for the vision. Though two ults on cooldown. Another 60 seconds. Is this the high ground for Entity? Well, Stormstormer TPing back says no. Though it is up again in 20 seconds. He's playing the CDR game with Quickening Charm plus Octarine on this Batrider. Yeah, I think maybe he's just looking to see if he finds anything. He finds the right kind of pick. Maybe his team follows him in. Uh, it's just 40 second lasso, 20 second teleport, double frame flame break charges. Oh my god. Sneaking's going for a Shadow Blade. They, they, <laughs> they're going to be just rats all over the map. Nibbling away at wave after wave, tower after tower. Right, they're gonna fight the Tormentor. Try to anyway. There goes that Nature's Wrath, but they Skeeter were thinking about fighting the confident. Tormentor. <laughs> <laughs> Thought about it for three whole seconds. See, Thompson knew better. Though. What would have been the point of Flactory in this game? I don't think he's cast a spell on an enemy hero in 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah, actually, this might be like the lowest hero <laughs> damage that Zeus has ever done by 34 minutes because Tundra are just not fighting. They are playing a game that is very different, which is... Uh, they're trying to fight this. They are, they are. They're actually doing a lot of damage. The supports are getting a little bit low, and all of a sudden, 33 and Thompson, they both show up to this fight. Ooh. Immediately, Doom gonna put on to the Batrider, forcing out that BKB. Katomi will eventually die underneath the acid spray. And Skeeter, he, he knows Stormstorm has to heal right now. Why not force the issue? Got up the blade mail before he got stunned. Blocked out by the Sprout. Really can't go too far, but he can push him inside the base. What a brilliant move from Gabby. Watson oh, really takes advantage of that and he brings down 33. Slows down Skeeter a little bit. Can he catch up though? Just Needs no meta. more teammates. Nothing to stick with the Scotty on the Terror Blade if he doesn't have the ranged form here. Another pretty decent read of Tundra to take that fight off of what was turning into a nine clown chase. Here I call it that. <laughs> Yeah, he's jumped on that clown car a couple of times and made his way around the map. He got a bench buy out of that. More economic damage done. Another fight Stormstorm with this BKB doesn't get to do anything. 
Man, this must be a very frustrating game for enemy. They're not even really behind, right? No. It's not like anything is bad happening to them. They're still kind of cruising towards their strategic objectives here, which is mainly, you know, the big damage items on Watson. And there's one of them, MKB, completed here for the Terror Blade. It's going to shred through the Radiance. Anything else you might have offered here if you're Skeeter. But Ske uh, Skeeter's itemization scheme is just... It's crazy, man, honestly. He is not going for any sort of fighting alchemist. He's just going for spell casting alchemist. <laughs> Maybe that's the best option you have is an alchemist versus the terror blade. It's an it's interesting magic. idea, right? Just never man fight him, never give that terror blade the, the true carry on carry. It's just going to be concoction talents on low cooldown with manta illusions going in on low CD, even as berserk potion off the shard. Yeah, and uh, soon if he starts giving away those Aghanim Scepters like he was thinking about doing, he had it queued oh. up anyway, he could start getting Spell Amp. I mean, he can definitely pull some good Ags here. Even the Monkey King Ags might be pretty good in this game at a certain point if Nine can get to the Scotty, for example. Yeah, I have a feeling the way Nine sees his role in this game, I'm not sure if he's going to be scaling up too much. I mean, what else is there to do, though, right? That's What is Tundra's true. game plan other than at 60 minutes we're going to beat you? Side the buy, Storm Stormer recognizing they need more control. Yeah, that's the one downside for Envy right now, is if you're not taking the fights, these supports are in theory gonna outscale you a little. Having a poke at him, he's got BKD cheese, so they're just trying to see if they can get a reaction. And boy, did they hit one from Fishman and Storm Stormer. They immediately start trying to run down Thompson. I mean, you want to catch any time you can get it on this map. You'll be thwarted yet again. Pull some heroes all the way to the top part of the map. Bottom is totally free. I mean, Storm Storm even completed bots too early here. Just to increase the chance he can join some sort of catch on the map, get some pickoff going. The second you get one pickoff on one of these ratting supports, it helps you a lot. It's <laughs> so ridiculous, man. Skeeter, Skeeter picks up bots, so now he's like out there on the map always oh, with his Manta, Radiance Manta, pushing down lanes. Stormcrafter, more magic spell damage coming out from this Alchemist. What is the end game, though, for <laughs> Tundra? Delay the game so much, but what does it eventually lead to? Are, like, are you confident that Tundra, you said super late game, I'm not sure if this Monkey King's gonna end up scaling, so I'm gonna say mostly Zeus and Doom. Maybe the Nature's Prophet. Actually, Snaking might be the one to scale up more. If the supports get farm on Tundra, I think they win it ultra late. They don't, though. <laughs> I feel like Watson's cleaning them up. Is he gonna run into the ward sentry that's there farther on the right? He ran into the scan, they know he's still here, and they're gonna find in the Shadow Blade now, put on cooldown. All right, big pickoff. That's one of the ratting supports, so it should give you some time and some freedom to get these lanes and set something else up here. Set up a, a Roshan kill. But if they get the Aegis, are they gonna be able to hit the high ground? confidently of course they can't do it they can't just like barrel down like let's go high ground no matter what I mean, but you're gonna have to at some point in this game yeah the thing. does mean that you're gonna be pushing right into the trap that tundra is setting for you which is the split push combined with really a good high ground defense they have a really good refresher shard lineup though uh, pretty much any of their heroes it does some serious work right i think kuka is the most logical one here with double park double boat Double wave, it's all incredibly nasty. There's not a lot to prevent it on the side of Tundra, especially if 33's BKB is down. That's the only BKB they have. So that's the one thing also going for Gabby in this game. All of his spells are going to be amazing. There's not really anything that's going to change it from the side of Tundra. I mean, you have a Doom going in who ignores it, but everybody else is just going to get caught. Avery, there's so little happening in this game, we might see a wheel of cheese. I severely doubt it. But <laughs> they've got two cheeses. Entity have, have taken two Roshans. There's pretty much no fighting, so they've never had to use that consumable item. All right, Katahomi's stacking up the Lotuses. That's possible. The sad thing is that it's not even that good. <laughs> yeah, it's not even worth so it. much effort for... I feel like I almost rather have the like three separate cheeses than the block of cheese. I, I know Lotus people are going to hate me yeah. for that statement, but... I guess first Doom, cheese is not amazing. We'll see. Another smoke by Tundra. 
Wow, and Entity on the low ground right. here, really grouped up. Yeah, oh, boy, this is opportunity. And surely Skeeter jumps in immediately trying to blow up the Undyne, but a swap back in from Kataomi is going to be able to bail him out. The X marks the spot, pulls Skeeter back in, but Wukong look at Ike. He got the Junter in with the Wukong's command, but the Alchemist is being blown apart by the Watson. They have the control, and they have the damage, and they will make good work of it. This is the opening the Entity has been waiting for. Finally, Tundra made a move, tripped over their own feet, and now Entity will take a lead here. They're going to have an opportunity to hit the high ground, surely. Tundra just gave it to him. Watson is going to make quick work of this tier 2. Meta is running out here, but you have to be thinking about the double saves here from Endy. You have Blink, Tombstone, and you have the Swap. This Alk does not do any direct damage. It's just remote spell casting, pretty much. I mean, Skidder tries his best to burst the support. Doesn't even look close. Couldn't get through it. Lincoln's... 33 actually making the jump in here, seeing if they can finish off Watson without using the jump, but he gets off the Sunder, and that's now trouble. E4 step down, Skeeter. Oh, anyway. tidal wave trying to get him, pull him out. Boat coming in. There's the water park. It's, it's not something back. they can fight into, so it's going to be a tie back on Skeeter. Nobody can come in and save him. And look at Watson, he doesn't give a damn about that, dude. He just seems on going to town. Now he's going to run down Thompson as well. Looks to be able to toss himself up in the air. Enough time for a jump. Can he jump away? He's got it now, but he'll fall anyway. And that's no buyback on him. Two heroes, no buyback. The most farmed heroes on the side of Tundra. And grab that third core. Pull him back in. Tundra have totally fallen apart. They push this game a solid 40 minutes. But in two, it'll end. They have Doom by with no Doom. Meta be damned, Watson's gonna end this game right here, right now. They surely are. X marks the spot with the swap going out there. Wukong's man, but it's a support monkey game. Who yeah. cares? Ignore it. Watson is ending this game right now. There's nothing you can do to stop him. Throw all the spells you want. You don't have the stuns. You don't have the damage to stop this terror blade. He still has no meta. Yeah, he's doing it all melee style. It just doesn't damn matter. You don't have a single carry left in this game to fight the one that is the rank one Watson. And that is it. it. The TI-11 winners are eliminated by Entity 2-0. That is not an outcome I think a lot of people were expecting, especially for Tundra, who were so strong in that group stage, faltered a little bit at the end, found themselves in the lower bracket, and then find themselves against a very familiar opponent. And Entity just come out guns blazing here. Game one with an impressive comeback, and game two, it felt a little slow, it felt a little clunky, but in these end fights, you go back to the itemization on Tundra, like, what is it building towards, right? Yeah. It just felt like you have to throw everything on Watson, and then what? And even when they did throw everything on Watson, he just stands there and kills him. And as frustrating as that gameplay was for Entity trying to catch Tundra all over the map, you could tell they maintained discipline. They understood we will get that opening eventually. And Tundra gave it to them. And boy, did Entity take full advantage of it. Amazing stuff from Entity. This 2-0 against Tundra keeps them alive in this lower bracket, but it does mean we're going to be saying goodbye to the TI winners. As uh, you know, they had an amazing run last year. Stayed in that upper bracket, one of the most dominant victories in the entire time. But, uh, you know, they come here at TI-12. The, you said they had their moments this year. It did look like they were getting back into shape, but when they needed it most, unfortunately, just weren't, wasn't able to, to put it together. No, and Entity, maybe find some momentum in the lower bracket, right? This yeah. is a very scary team if they start to get that ball and their strategy working with Watson in that, like, four protect one type situation. Very scary team to go against. Yeah, very scary. I would not envy anybody who has to do that. And there is somebody who's going to be doing that in the panel. I'm sure it's going to bring that up. Let's head back to them. It's a 2-0 for Entity. They do knock out and eliminate the TI-11 champions. So the repeat for them, the dream is unfortunately dead, as well as the three-peat potential in Topson. They put up a very formidable fight in this game number two, but Dendi, even the belief in the Zeus Topson wasn't enough for them to get game two winning. Bro, he was on our side. He was, but uh, he, he liked the Zeus. No, I like the Zeus. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> which is why I asked him about the Zeus. Thompson didn't buy Phylactery. I don't know why. Like, for uh. me, this is like the best item. And uh, for me, Zeus, the hero changed itself because now it's like more of early game and mid game hero than it's uh, late game hero. In late game, it doesn't Watson, provide Watson. that much, especially for TB oh, illusions. It doesn't have that much damage anymore. And if enemy have one pipe, it's not so easy. So you really need to apply pressure early. And for this, Phylactery, in my head, at least, is like very good item. So, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure on that one. The, 
The other thing that I wanted to bring up was Venge being a support on the side of NCT. So she was super popular in groups. I think like contest rate uh, was pretty high. 46 games she appeared either picked or unbanned. And so far we hadn't seen her in playoffs. This was the first showing from her uh, Rezo. Yeah, it was the first one. And uh, I mean, she did a good job like just protecting her uh, you know, allies. But I, I do think that uh, Entity, they played this game very uh, methodical in a way that they, they took every ages, but they didn't rush to high ground to end the game with. Because, you know, you're going against high, uh, you're going against Doom and Zeus uh, on the high ground, there's uh, plenty of room of mistakes, right? But uh, they managed to just, like, slow the game down. Yes, they're farming, like, you know, Doom farming, Alchemist is farming, but they don't really care about that. They just took the, you know, the favorite fights on their own terms, and that's why they, this game was, like, very... Uh, I mean, it, it was very slow, but it was very one-sided uh, at the same time. Yeah, Entity just applied so much pressure, but without having to do it. And I think, you know, Fishman on his undying, just even in the early game, he was drawing the Zeus in, they were just kiting around, doing a lot of things. I think for Tundra, going on the point with Dendi in the flat three, they got to that awkward timing where they defaulted to old-school Tundra. The game's kind of weird, we're not able to actually pressure our opponents, so let's just keep skipping waves, keep farming and wait for maybe this big timing. But they just also, I think they missed some beats in the mid game. Like they weren't hitting that perfect five man fight, the doom starting and everyone following up. It was a little bit disjointed and that is credit to Entity and how annoying they were throughout this entire game, how defensive they were with Undying, Venge, Kunker. It was, you know, a treat to watch and fair play Entity, yeah, swift to work. Shiba, I do want to hear you about it, uh, Entity, yeah. but I actually want to hear from our winners themselves, Perian's down on the sidelines, and he's got Stormstormer. Hi, Nat, I do indeed have Stormstormer. Stormstormer, congratulations on the win, first of all. Uh, last time we were hanging out, it was Berlin Major. You were on the panel, I was hosting. This is what you want to be doing, though, right? For sure, for sure. I mean, uh, don't take it bad. Like, I want to panel with you, it's fucking fun, but uh, playing Dota is, is much more fun. <laughs> of course. So, Tundra, a team you guys have struggled with all year, obviously. What changed that you were able to 2-0 them in very convincing fashion? Um, honestly, like, I don't know, we just really tried to focus on ourselves as much as we could. And of course, like, we respect them a lot. As you said, like, I think they had the upper end against us almost the entire year. And this was also the first time that we ever played them on a stage. So it was definitely, like, a very important match for us. And of course, they're the TI champions from last year. So definitely also shout out to them. Like, I think it was a really, really crazy good series. Fantastic. That was great to watch. So as I understand it, the German equivalent of the BBC is here filming something. Is there anything you want to say to the, the, the Deutsche fans back home? Ja, an alle daran zu Hause. Ich hoffe, ihr habt das Match genossen. Leider geht es jetzt für einen von uns nach Hause, für Leon Kirillin, unser deutscher Kollege. Aber es war ein geiles Match und ich werde seine Ehre weitertragen und hoffentlich gibt es wieder einen deutschen TI-Champion dieses Jahr. Der nicht Tofu ist, sondern ich. Ja, sehr gut. Dankeschön. And uh, yeah, back to the panel. <laughs> Look, I don't know exactly what he said, but I'm going to assume at the end there is something hopefully that we have a, a German representative being the TI champs this year. Do you have a, the approximate translation on that one? Yeah, sounds about right. <laughs> said, maybe he said tofu as well. That's why I thought yeah. I was trying to connect those dots there. But it's nice. Storm Stormer got his wish. We saw that uh, interview about Entity, about their journey in the road to TI. And he wanted to be able to 2 0. -oh Tundra, he got that, he got the dream and sheep. You had faith in them in game one, you had even more faith in their game two draft. Uh, so let's sort of wrap it up, put it in a nice little bundle as to why Entity did come out on top here. Honestly, I think they just kind of knew their timings, they knew their strengths, and they understood their drafts. Like, it, it felt like they were comfortable in knowing when their drafts were good. And I think this game especially, it was so nice to see how many heroes they brought to engagements. Like, it takes a lot of confidence to kind of be like, we're not going to just try and split up and, and farm as much as possible. We're going to TP four heroes. Like, we're going to have five heroes mid for this dive. And make sure we kill these heroes. Do not give them an inch. Do not give them anything. They gave them nothing. And I think that was just such a beautiful way of playing. They always just brought the heroes and killed them. and took it home. Yeah, well, they're going to be playing again later today. They have a little bit of a break. And unfortunately, with this 2-0 for NC, it does mean Tundra are eliminated from TI-12. So we're going to have a little exit interview with them right now. Yeah, thanks, Nat. I'm here with Snake King. Snake King, commiserations, but that looked a rough series. Obviously, you guys go out, don't get a chance to defend your title. But you were playing where the stand-in. Obviously, you had Topson, had to move things around a bit. How much did that affect you guys? Um, obviously, having Topson introduce our team very last minute is a huge like change in our dynamic. Um, we tried the best to our ability to to make it work. Obviously, we didn't end up making it, it work that well. But I think there was uh, glimmers of hope and 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 brilliance for us. We did obviously topped our group, but I think afterwards um, things just didn't go our way. We didn't 
you know, improve as much as we needed to, while others improved a little bit more. And ultimately, we've just faltered in the end. So um, I know that before the match, there was a little bit of a chat that, that Skeeter was talking about something, something like battling against complacency or something like that. Was that something you felt at all during the season or in TI? Or did you just think, nah, we just didn't play our best? Um, I think it's different for everyone. Personally, for me, I, I didn't really feel a sense of complacency. I feel like the reason why we won last year is because we worked hard. We, we, we played very well. We worked well as a team and everything just, you no, know, the stars aligned. Every TI winner, like our team that wins TI requires everything to go right in their way. The patch, the teamwork, the synergy, and the individual gameplay. And this year, we, we just didn't have the, everything. So it sucks, but we'll bounce back. Of course you will. So, I know you've got a lot of fans. I'm one of them. Do you have any words for them? Obviously, the TI hasn't ended the way you wanted, but what would you like to say to the fans? Um, I just want to say thank you for supporting us, and we'll bounce back for our next season. And it's not over, just like Team Spirit. They defaulted last year just after winning TI. Happens to people, but it doesn't mean we can't do it again. Absolutely. Thank you, Snake. And good words. Back to the panel. There's still a lot of potential in Tundra, so it's very nice to hear from Snaking there. Uh, Dendi, time on your panel, on this panel, is coming to an end, so I know, I know you're having so much fun. Uh, but any words for Entity moving forward, how impressed you are, or even just uh, coming back and getting to be on a TI panel? Oh, I, I enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun. And for Entity, I wish them to keep going forward. For my boy Stormstormer, for my boys Watson and Fishman, I played with them on the same team, by the way. And uh, yeah, like f I hope Storm Stormer pick that hero and <laughs> do what I ask him, and uh, we will get some wins from that. That's some words for Entity. We're going to hear some words from Entity. We have a little video piece on them right now. So this year it started off pretty well for us with Lima Major. We had like some really crazy tiebreakers that had to go on until the next day against OG and, and Tundra. It was super, super contested. And we had to play the next day after and there we actually like barely qualified to the Lima Major. So that was already like a success in the beginning because we still started like into the year with, I guess, higher expectations than last year, but we were still like, I guess, considered underdogs. The way we dropped out of the tournament was a little bit like disappointing. We, we all thought that we could have gone further. Um, but yeah, it was still nonetheless like a great start. Following that strong start, Entity hit a rocky patch in the season. They missed out on the next two majors, and to add to their challenges, they were pushed into a tiebreaker just to retain their spot in Division 1. Didn't really know what was going wrong, but you could feel like uh, expectations were high. We played a super contested region and everybody like was getting sadder and sadder. In the end, of course, we also decided to like change things up and we had a small roster change. It was really like a roller coaster. Uh, it started really high, then it went super down. Like, holy moly, like uh, we were rock bottom. Like we actually were like, what's going on? What's going on? Over the course of this TI qualifier, we had to beat Enigma, we had to beat Secret, we had to beat Luna Galaxy, which also played incredibly well. And then when we in the end when we won, it was like a big relief, of course, but we all looked back at the year uh, and we were like, holy shit, we actually made it, you know? Like, <laughs> last year when we went to the TI, we went with a really try hard mood. We were all like super focused, super work mood. But I think the first TI you never forget. It was a big dream that we all wanted to, to, get, to get to. We dreamed of for, for a was forever. It was a really, really cool, like special feeling for sure. I think we are better prepared. Like we're already taking it a little bit more relaxed. Of course, still play very focused and try as hard as you can, but not like overthink it that you're playing for TI. Ideally, you just completely forget about this, uh, even though it is TI, but you just play like your any day game because then you're not stressed out. You just play in your comfort zone. You're not too scared, but also not too crazy. And I think we're definitely going to do better this year. Apparently we're doing one more. Yeah, they are on the right track of doing better this year for sure. We will see Entity again later today, but for now we're having a little bit of a change of pace, a change of panel as well. I'm Shiva, I'll take you to the second half of this day. And with me, of course, my wonderful panel. We got Fear, we got Effie, we got Lacoste, and special guest Moon. Hey, welcome on the panel. Hey, uh, Shiva, what's up? What's up to his chat? Hello. How you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Doing great. Just got limited last night, but uh, it is what it is. You know, we're just chilling. It's a fun TI so far. Always great to be back in Seattle. It's great to have you on the panel. I know bittersweet, but uh, you know, we 
we get like a little bit of extra value on the panel, so I won't complain here at all. And we, we got to start diving into the series that we're about to witness because Talon is about to face up against Bad Boom Fear, and that's, that's got to be a good one. It's definitely going to be a good one. There's a lot of things to look out in this series. Like, Bet Boom has been regarded, and I don't know if your team feels the same way, as like the best laning stage team in the oh, game. Yeah. They're just like so strong in the laning stage in town, you know, Southeast Asia. They're great in the late game, so we'll see if Talon can survive that early game onslaught. Yeah, that will be uh, one to witness. And when we're talking about Talon, I want to focus on them a little bit first because it has been a little while since we saw them. We saw Bet Boom earlier today. Uh, but I want to focus on Jabs here, Lacoste, because he is a staple of Southeast Asian teams. Pretty much. He's a very interesting player. He played every single role in the TI. The other guy who managed to do so is Misery, who is not here. But uh, Jabs, he's the type of a player that uh, tends to get a lot of farm, a lot of, uh, you know, he, he's one of the guys that uh, wants to make the game about himself as well. He's uh, very farm heavy. And uh, I think it's a good thing to be harm, farm heavy in this particular meta because, uh, you know, the map is bigger and everything. So you you know, carrying pretty much from the offlane and uh, some of the heroes that he does play, you know, he plays them really well, but some of the play that he does also play, he's not doing too hot. Yeah, either. we wanted to highlight both sides here, Effie. Yeah, so the thing about Jabs is he is probably the funnest player to root for out of all the SEA players because you really don't know what you're going to get. I mean, sometimes Talon feels like two teams in one. They feel like a hyper-aggressive, playing every single meta here nailing every timing type of team sometimes, but then other times they're just teams that play ultra greedy and go into the late game and they flip-flop. And the reason why Talon is like this is because of one man, okay? And that man is Jabs. <laughs> Which version of Jabs are you getting today? Are you getting the, the Aura Buyer? Are you getting the Blade Mail Heart Buyer? Or are you getting the Offlane Naga? So it, it's just interesting. I don't know what's in store for us today, but I mean, I hope we get the more aggressive jobs. I hope so too. That will definitely make for a good one. And when we're talking about this matchup, we have to realize that Talon hasn't played for two days while Bet Boom played this morning. And Moon, I would love to hear from you. Like, and I know it's probably a personal thing about which people prefer. Like, do you prefer to have to play? Like, you know, Bet Boom has the momentum here. Talon. Maybe not so much so. They come from the upper bracket. They got dropped down. What is the what is the better option here? In my opinion, uh, whenever a team wins a series early in the day, they got a lot of happiness, a lot of uh, momentum coming to the series. So, and uh, the way they tooled the Brazilians were like it was really clinical. Mm -hmm. uh, but now, at the same time, like Talon, I know they coach Sambi really well. Me and him uh, always me, and uh, this guy will hold his team down. I'm really sure like he figured out his players uh, and jabs and today we're going to see a strong jabs only because I think Sambi really locks the team down. So you think it doesn't matter for Talon, this one works purely because of the coach. And for Bedboom, this one works because the momentum is there as well. That means we have an even matchup on our hands, which also is uh, the same if we look at the history. We have got both of these teams facing twice this year. and. One time Bedboom won, and one time Talon won. So who is going to win this upcoming elimination series? We'll have to wait and find out. But first, let's get the players on stage. For the second time at all this 
weekend uh, ready to take the stage and show us what they've got. This is a series that a lot of Southeast Asian fans have been looking forward to because Tal and Effie, they are the hopes and dreams embodiment of the region. Yeah, they have definitely been carrying this region throughout the entire year, performing consistently well at LAN, showing so much personal improvement. So there's always a little bit of pressure when you are that team carrying the region's torch, but some teams thrive under that pressure, and I do think Talon is one of them. Talon is one of them. I, I do want to know who you think is the favorite, though, Lacoste, because I don't know. And I, normally I have a feeling with it, so I can only imagine that people at home are also like, you know, both of these teams, very entertaining teams to watch. But is there one that is in your mind sticking out a little bit? Uh, my mind is uh, saying Bed Boom because uh, this team, they're very explosive. They're really focused on the early stages of the game. And also, like, if we talk about the average time when they win the game, Bed Boom, they're sitting at 38 minutes. They know how to close out the games compared to some of the other teams coming up from the Eastern Europe that tend to, you know, play a bit of a, you know, different style maybe, but uh, their team fight, their spell casting, team fight execution is really on point. Uh, you know, everybody talks about Bed Boom when they're playing on stage, this pressure that tends to get to them. We've already, you know, seen that uh, it, it doesn't affect them that much when it comes down to, like, some later portions of the tournament. Sure, there is some tilt factor always when we talk about this team, but I feel like at this TI, they're going to get through this. I mean, I hope so, because that's really been the story of these players and this team and whichever org they're playing for, is that there's always this joke that they're just a, an internet team. They only perform on online tournaments. But this entire year has been about conquering that demon, so to speak, the nerves, the anxiety, that psychological hurdle that they've faced. And if you've talked or heard from these players recently in the last year, they've just been focused on the discipline aspect, on kind of tempering themselves. Toronto Tokyo thinks that They've conquered a lot of that already, so I'm just excited to see what it looks like today. What would your strategy be, Moon, to take down a team like Bedroom? And we saw them this morning, so a couple of extra lessons there to be learned for Talon maybe as well. My strategy against uh, Bedroom is always the same. Uh, take down Nightfall. This okay. guy, uh, I don't, I'm, when I say best hero in the world, people's first people think about Yadro, but I think people really should really put Nightfall up there with him. This guy in the safe lane is a monster to like deal with. He's gonna call all the correct amount of people to his lane and help his help him have a good game. And the reason why you need to shut this guy down because he is the team's hive mind. He makes all the calls in the early, in the mid game, in the late game. When to rush, what uh, where to go, everything. If you play pups with him, you know this guy just vlogs all day long. So if you shut down the <laughs> vlogger of the team, you win. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a solid strategy, but, but how do you do that? Because his hero, hero pool is quite big, you know? Do you just send extra people to his lane, or like, how do you do it? Uh, you gotta like, send extra people to his lane, yeah. pick like the sweatiest often you can think of, <laughs> like, try your best to make him have the worst laning phase, smoke your mid laner to his lane twice, like, do everything in your power. And it's not easy because, uh, and I feel like Talon might run into some issues doing that, because their four player likes to play a lot of melee heroes, uh, which is not really meta, because melee heroes usually mean that um, the carry gets free farm. Mm. And the only melee hero that you can pick in this meta is Tusk, and the only melee offlaner that can be paired in this meta of Tusk is Dawnbreaker. So if Dawnbreaker gets banned, and I know both teams are going to go for it, mm. I feel like Nightfall is going to have a good game. Yeah, and to be honest, Talon, they have been looking good, but we just saw them come off a loss fear. And we just mentioned, you just mentioned Talon really good in the late game. You know, Bed Boom is good in the, in, the, in the start of the game. Laning stage very solid. But how is Talon going to adapt to that, considering that's not where their focus lies? They got to make the magic happen. I think a lot of it comes from Makoto. Makoto is the type of player that opens up the map for them. And Jab seems to be 50-50 on like, what's going to happen. Moonmander mentioned the Tusk. Jab's likes playing the Dawnbreaker. That's one of the two heroes he's winning with, Dawnbreaker and Bristleback. Every other hero he's played at this event is a loss, right? So they're, you know that if you're going to this at Bet Boom, you shut down Jabs, you manage Makoto, then all of a sudden the game might get hard. But the reason why they're good in the late game as well is they like to play hard carries on 23 Savage. And he's an amazing hard carry player, so he normally shows up in the late game. But Bet Boom, it's their job to punish that. They have strong lanes, they have a strong mid game. Don't let 23 Savage get to a point where he can be a monstrous carry. And I also want to highlight like the transition of Toronto Tokyo, because 
like last TI, they got uh, 13 to 16th place. The team was not working out. I mean, you're parting ways with uh, four amazing players, and he made the Pretty tough decision, what it seems to be at the time. It took him a little bit more time to, you know, got into this position five. It's not a transition you see, you know, these mid laners going playing a five, completely different role. But he adjusted. At the start, he had pretty limited hero pool, expanded. In, like, in general, their hero pool is still relatively weak compared to some other teams, but he's doing a really good job. And one of the reasons why Nightfall a lot of the time gets free farm in the lane is because he does such a great job in securing that. Yeah, I'm really glad Lacoste brought that up because I think Toronto Tokyo is probably the most improved player on Bad Boom in the last year. I mean, he has upped his position 5 gameplay to the complete limit recently. I recall in the last Dream League, Season 21, that we just saw, it felt like every single win was coming off of his shoulders. He was doing it in a very subtle way, but he was getting every D ward. He was setting up for every single kill. And there are some heroes that if you give him, you're making the game so hard for yourself. I mean, the number one hero I can think of in this case is a Treant Protector. It feels like he's just playing that hero to its limit. It, scouting out every single enemy, setting up the team fights, securing the lane for Nightfall, like Lacoste mentioned. So Toronto Tokyo is definitely also a player that needs to have his hero pool shut down in the draft. But if we're talking about position fives, we have to talk about Oli. He is on the side of talent. I know, I know Jabs is very experienced as a player. This is his, his fifth time uh, as an international appearance. Oli's only had second, but Oli, he went very far. He came fourth at uh, TI-10, and uh, he was actually eliminated by Toronto Tokyo as well. I don't know, maybe some history there as well. Uh, but this is definitely a, a, a veteran in this squad fear to uh, maybe guide the, the guys to victory here as well. Oh, definitely. I think this team needs that as well. Whenever we talk about Southeast Asia, they've had a similar problem to like South America throughout the years of not having a big leadership, right? That big person who's going to make all the calls. Instead, it's been an individual effort, a lot of individual skills. So hopefully he can bring that to the table because he does have the experience. He definitely does have the experience. We got uh, all 10 players on the stage and the coaches as well with uh, with experience playing on the grandest of stages, no first timers here. A lot of second timers on the side of, of Bet Boom this time around. And we'll have to wait and see if the, the nerves are going to be playing a part here, especially for Bet Boom. They have played earlier today, and they should not feel any of that. The jitter should be gone the second time for these teams, both on the stage. Moon, who, who shoes would you rather be in at this point before the draft starts? You, you're going to coach one of these two teams. Mm -hmm. which, one, which one are you coaching? Who do you have more faith in? I like Bad Boom. No. I really think that uh, they have really uh, strong structure and very, very strong individual skill. Don't get me wrong. Talon's amazing as well. They got Mikoto, but I just respect Toronto Tokyo a lot. We'll find out what's going to happen as we're ready for the draft. Bad Boom teams turn to ban. Talon Esports e versus Bet Boom Team. Game one. One best of three, elimination on the line. And to be honest, I, I gotta address the elephant in the room here. And Moon, I think you might be the best one to weigh in, in on this before we start talking about some bands. Mm -hmm. It's been two O's, <laughs> loads of two O's. What causes that? Why? Uh, I feel like uh, the two O's TI is just a classic lower bracket thing. You okay. lose game one, and then now you're on the verge of elimination. The fear creeps, the fear starts creeping in game two. You start choking, and you hear the crowd and the stuff. So the ground is shaking. Kind of your, your mind gets muddy. That's how you get two O real quick. Oh, a lot then... of these guys here are young and inexperienced. Yeah. They know fear Doto. <laughs> That's why I'm up here. <laughs> yeah. I actually also want to pick your brain a little bit, uh, Moon, about the first pick versus second pick, Radiant versus Dyer. Mm -hmm. So the statistics for group stage, first pick had a 52% win rate and second pick had a 48% win rate. But when first pick was combined with Radiant during groups, it had a 74% win rate. So can you give us any bit of insight into why it seems like Radiant just snowballs up that win rate so high? So right now, the reason why, uh, reason why rating is broken, there's a couple of reasons. The first reason is top lane. The off lane is way easier for Radiant because it only takes one sentry to deward the enemy sentry to open up the hard camp. But for Dire, it's like 50-50. 
uh, that's the first reason. The second reason is because of the daytime when Roach is spawning. It favors Radiant. When, uh, so if Radiant's really winning the offlane and the momentum of the game, they get first Roach on their side of the map so they can TP from the top to the outpost to contest the Roshan compared to Dire. If you want to do Roche as Dire to contest Roche, you gotta like really like, it's really awkward. So it really favors Radiant in the first 20 minutes of the game. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, just, just to ask you, does it feel just overall better to play Radiant? Is it more natural attacking from left to right and from up to down, up from down to up? <laughs> mm -hmm. It is, because like, you, you want to stack the hard camp and uh, Ancients as a position four. You do it and you walk to the river, you're at the rune. But as Dire, you walk, you, do, you stack it, you walk to, after you stack it, to, to walk to the rune is so awkward, you get hit by the hard camp creeps. And yeah, it's more natural to play like towards the upper right then like play like down left just feels like better yeah it's just a natural feeling overall mm -hmm. there's a bit of a problem that we see on the screen right now uh, we earlier highlighted the heroes that jabs won with uh they're both out fear dawnbreaker bristle removed yeah i mean jabs is gonna have to find a new hero to win the game <laughs> yeah and they are in the verge of elimination here in this series not this game and now's the time. Now's the time for him to expand. We know he has a big hero pool. And as Effie was talking about, what type of jabs are we going to see today? Because he can bust out literally anything in Dota, I feel. Yeah. Yeah, we were talking about uh, this being strength meta. I see one, two, three, four, eight heroes strength being banned out right now. And most of them build into blade mail, octarine, heart, whatever is necessary. <laughs> I, I like the idea of jabs on a tempo hero. So the Dawn's taken out, the Centaur's taken out, but Brewmaster is still in the pool, and that could be a way to address the Dazzle with the constant graves that are going to be coming out throughout the game. So hopefully Talon are eyeing something like that and not more of a farm-oriented Wraith King type offlaner. But we'll, we'll have to see what happens in this next phase. So but right now, Dazzle is like a top, top, top tier hero because uh, he can go in the mid lane, off lane, and support. And he block picks a lot of the enemy off lanes. Uh, carries like Spectre, Luna, they don't really want to play in the Dazzle. But the one hero he's afraid of is Ancient Apparition. And I really think that they let it through. So Inten this, Intentionally. Yes, I'm not sure whether it's intentional or not because they ran the Bristle back into Dazzle. I guess they don't want to give them Bristle back, but however, AA is the best hero against Dazzle. It's like the only answer. Yeah. So it's going to be interesting to see what they go for next, these next uh, couple of picks, because usually you need stun with these kind of AAs and Dazzles, but like this Casino Knight's banned, Tusk is banned, Brist uh, Spirit Breaker's banned, Primal's banned, Centaur's banned, all the stuns are banned. So they're going to have to go down like to the next tier, <laughs> to like the Earth Spirit is what I'm looking at next, because uh, all the stuns are banned, so Earth Spirit's all going on top. Yeah. We also still have, uh, we, we saw it a couple of times, but the Sven's still in the pool as far as stuns from the, from the safe lane goes as well. And they will go for that Earth Spirit as Moon predicted. Yeah, I, I love Earth Spirit versus heroes like Dazzle, these long range backline type fighters. Earth Spirit's probably the best hero in Dota right now at controlling them because his cooldowns are so low and he can constantly be on top of them, constantly force Dazzle away from the grave target that he wants to do. So this is definitely the correct line of thinking here. Uh, I'd also like to see Ancient Apparition be enabled on lane by some kind of stun carry. You know, CK is out, stun's still in the pool, like you guys mentioned. Maybe even a PA, right, with the dagger slow. Just anything to take advantage of your AA and make him stronger on lane. We did mention that Bat Boom, that uh, they have a relatively limited hero pool. They did not play Dazzle yet, so I'm wondering where this hero is going to go. Whether he's going to go to the mid lane, go to the off lane, and uh, make some safe laner lives miserable. And also, when it comes to Muerta, they are also not playing it as position four. Most of the time, it's being played by Nightfall. They have played a lot of Dazzle, though, at the last Dream League. Yes. They didn't play it this uh, Road to TI, but they were one of the first teams to actually bring the Dazzle offlane into the meta at that Dream League. I remember when that pick came out and it shocked everybody, and they absolutely dumpstered that game. So I, w I would be excited to just see the throwback into the pure Dazzle. That would be a lot of fun, but I'm sure GBK can play it, too. With the pickup of Ancient Deferation, though, would we not like to see the Dazzle being dropped down in priority a little bit, Moon? Or is that still is Dazzle still just too good not to play as a core? Uh, I don't. I think Dazzle is just too good not to be played okay. as a core. <laughs> I, I feel like uh, it's better in the offlane, personally. I really like the build that uh, Moo Dota did with the uh, Midas, Bots, Travels, Axe, Arcane Bling. So you have mm -hmm. permanent uptime on Grave. So once you get there, 
A plus doesn't really matter anymore because Grave is 100% uptime for yeah. some reason. It's, <laughs> it's like a Tinker, but you're Dazzle. So you're strong in lane compared to Tinker. Yeah. And then when they click the Spectre into uh, the Dazzle anyway, even though it was a really weak lane against the uh, Dazzle, but I think it's correct because Spectre is a hero you click when you see a bunch of range heroes. You see three range heroes, so this is a giga Spectre pick. And yeah, it's also a hero that builds into Blade Mills and goes for the Earth Spirit. So you have, like, if this is Kerry Muerta, she's not going to have that good of a time. And we've seen throughout the main event, uh, throughout the, just how many good Spectre picks can be. You, all you need is some kind of a vision hero, and Earth Spirit can be that guy that rolls in. You have this global presence coming out from Ancient Apparition, and there's going to be the vision hero as well. We've seen in the previous series, uh, Position 4 Weaver, which looked really good when it comes down to some of these earlier engagements, how much she can actually deal, how much damage, and uh, like it uh, also causes enemy team in a spot where they don't want to take the fights because of the vision, because of these bugs, so it's going to be really good. They also have a tankiness coming up for Spectre and Earth Spirit, so really liking this pick. And it also gives Roshan, right? Because that's yes. something that Talon lacked, but now they have the minus armor coming out of the swarm, enabling them to be able to take Roshan later. Uh, it's also just another hero to make Dazzle's job very difficult. Like He's going to be chased away by the swarm insects. There's going to be the fear of the Spectre hunting on top of him, and of course the Earth Spirit. So I think that they've done a good job in addressing the threat of Dazzle. So what is the answer when you see Spectre? And I've been seeing this hero a lot. Like. As a carry, like if you're playing against a Spectre hero, what carries have you noticed to be favored against this hero? Because it seems pretty difficult. It's very hard to deal with this hero. I feel uh, you gotta do two strategies. Either have your own Spectre, which is, uh, in my opinion, is Chaos Knight. We call it Casino Knight because yep. uh, you just keep critting, it's 33% chance. And then the second hero is Luna, where you do a push strat against Luna, so you just five man ball and take all the towers and the game so Spectre can't haunt it to you. Okay. So I'm a little worried for them right now in Bad Boom because they have the four protect one strategy going, which means they have to play a split game against the Spectre. Yeah. However, they can win the game because the Tide can shut the Spectre down. But something tells me that this is not a position four Weaver. If knowing this team and knowing Japs, would be awful. I think yeah. that's a position three Weaver or a position four Earth Spirit because why would you throw Earth Spirit mid into Dazzle? That's a, one of the roughest matchups for Earth Spirit. But so, at the same time, I feel like Earth Spirit can still roll away from the Poison Touch. Like a lot of melee mid laners kind of get beat up, but he just has the ability to disengage from the Dazzle Poison Touch. I mean, you won't die yeah. in the lane, but you're just not going to see us, right? Yeah, you're not going to see us. And it's Mikoto. This guy is the overperforming player of this team. <laughs> this guy is so good at Dota. I would not want to throw my best star player into a Dazzle mid and, get, and uh, have his lane absolutely ruined. So I'm, I think that uh, they're saving his pick for last, and Q is also known to play melee force. Mm -hmm. So I think he's the Earth Spirit. I think Jeff is the Weaver. <laughs> that would be fun. How do you feel about the traditional break carries for Bat Boom? You know, maybe potentially PA or Sven with the Silver Edge? PA and Sven, um, they can be picked. Uh, however, they are a little bit slow in this meta where everything is so fast, because Ice Frog designed the game with the new patch to accelerate the game a lot to the point where if you don't uh, keep up with the meta, you kind of just uh, lose the game. Because uh, with the P and Seven, that means you lose first Roche, you lose first Tormentor, because the Bristol back is taking a Tormentor, or Spirit Bag is just taking over the whole map. Spectre's like level six, I'm online. Because think about it, Spectre's like a Dawnbreaker. Mm -hmm. But instead of having a three minute cooldown in the past, it's 60 seconds. So, and then you can even rift back to your lane. So the game just accelerates to such a pace that if you click these heroes, which you just did, you run the risk of getting run over. Yeah, so they're definitely at that risk now, but uh, just for those of you guys who don't know, traditionally Sven was considered the counter to Spectre just because he bursts her down so quickly. He buys Silver Edge and she never really out DPSs him, but Sven has been nerfed a lot recently and for the reasons Moon just mentioned, he does slow down the game and doesn't give you that ability to contest those early rush. But I think it can work because You've got this protection of the Tidehunter, right? This yes. Tidehunter gives you the team fight that you didn't have before. He gives you the ability to maybe take those uncomfortable Roche fights that the rest of your heroes can't do. And we've been in stacking meta for a really long time now. I see Tidehunter, I see Sven, and Vengeful Spirit is one of the better heroes that can stack those camps. And also, I don't see Talon invading those stacks by any means. So those stacks are going to get farmed pretty easily by Bed Boom. Last hero for Talon. Is this going to be Earth Spirit in the mid? Probably oh, not. So they need to figure something out, and they have 15 seconds left. Yeah. I mean, if they put Earth Spirit mid, I feel like the, that's the one way that this game can get out of control, because Spectre will be really good for spin in the late game. 
However, if you get really far behind, they'll be issue, and they're gonna address it right away. They're gonna pick a hero that doesn't deal, I mean, deals with the poison touch. You can just win, run away, you stay at range, you can CS, looks pretty good. So, uh, the, win, oh. the win on the pick is genius. Uh, we ran a scrim against Team Liquid, where uh, we dazzle mid, and Wind Ranger just counters you because you cannot uh, reapply poison touch. At any point you bring any four, uh, melee four mid to jump the dazzle, he just dies to one uh, ulti. Yeah. So I think I think this is what you want to do. You want to put Mikoto on last pick and uh, play around him. And how does she fare against Sven as the game progresses? Sven, uh, this game she fares really well because Sven already has to buy Silvage against the uh, Spectre, and then now he needs to buy a Nullify slash MKB against Mikoto. He just has too many items he needs to uh, carry the game. Plus, he's not gonna have a really strong lane against the Weaver because she kind of she has no kill threat on the Weaver of Sven Venture Spirit. But he's going to get free farm, he's going to dead lane. It's going to come down whether or not his tower dies early to some Mikoto rotation. That's why I feel like this game's going to... Well, you sold me. I mean, I'm convinced. Seems like Talon's got a very strong draft. Yeah, I like their draft a lot here. There is a lot of pressure, though, I think, on Mikoto and Q to get stuff done on the map because they're pretty low on stuns and silences this game. But their draft going to late game, it's a typical Talon draft. I think if it gets into late game, you've got this farmed Wind Ranger and Spectre going on the spin. They don't have a lot to protect them if the swap is there, but they can burst spin down really easily. Spectre in the late game has been a beast. As usual, the laning stage, I'm not really afraid for Talon in the laning stage either here, so it looks pretty good. Well rounded then, Lacoste. Yeah, I mean, we talked about uh, Bet Boom being able to close out some of these early games, it's like uh, compared to Talon, and that's what they're trying to do in this one. You know, try to close it out before Spectre and Wind Ranger get too big. Vera as well, Jabs is on his, you know, traditional farm heavy hero, so want to see that. But also, Bet Boom, they do have two new heroes that they haven't played yet uh, in the first game, so trying to experiment a little bit more. Yeah, there's uh, Elimination on the line. We saw all the faces in the booth, though. They didn't look too stressed. But let's uh, find out what the vibe's like as we are heading over to the game. But before that, first, a couple of words coming out from Sunbi, the coach of Talon. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm standing by with Sunbi of Talon, which, Sunbi, I feel like every time I talk to you, your team always has to do the hard journey. Lima, lower bracket run. Riyadh, lower bracket run. How do you pace your players to make sure they don't run out of stamina for these marathon tournaments? Well, luckily for this tournament, I think there has been a, a lot of downtime, so that's good. Although I don't know if downtime really works for us. I think they just want to grind out games. But yeah, this is, I mean, they're ready to play. I don't know. I don't know if I do much. They just want to play. They just want to keep playing. Born and bred Dota players. They just want to play Dota. I'm curious about the last pick, this Wind Ranger that you gave to Makoto. How late into the draft did you decide that this Earth Spirit, it's not going to go mid? Let's in fact give everyone a Wind Ranger instead. Uh, I mean, Earth Spirit certainly cannot go against Dazzle. We didn't know what, where Dazzle was headed until they revealed the Tidehunter, at which point that was 18th pick. So then they went ahead and bent like all the mids. So. I think the only hero that was left was Windrunner. And he likes Windrunner, so hopefully we'll own. Hopefully you own. Seattle, you ready for some Southeast Asian Dota? <laughs> then let's get ready for game number one. Thank you so much, Tsunami. Unfortunately, Suns fan is out sick for right now, but I have been studying Cinder, and I'm ready to go. Okay. We got Tormi the Tormentor. We got In Bruges. We got What the Horse. We got <laughs> Insert Random Movie. Um, in My Time as a Pro CS Go Player. That's another pretty good one. 60-minute uh, items. NBA segment. Uh, shout out to Perry and Flax. Oh, That's good. another classic. Good. And of course, this event yet. Trivia Time, oh. the classic. Um, so hopefully he uh, is able to come on back soon. But we're into the game right now. Wow, I'm impressed. Thank you. That was a... Uh... You know, you know your Suns fan better than I do. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, uh, this is uh, this is definitely going to be a bit of a bit of a different game, I want to say, because like uh, like the panel pointed out, this Wind Ranger is a pretty rare occurrence. This TI, I don't even know if it's bare. Has it been played more or less? I haven't any seen game? I, I think this is the first game I personally see it. It might have had a game or two, but it's pretty uncommon. Uh, Jabs is playing an offlane Weaver. I think this may be the first time on the main stage we see that as well, or in the, in this stage of the tournament anyway. Um, so yeah, I think Talon are really coming in with something special here uh, for Bet Boom. Maybe it's a little bit more, you know, tried and true for them, standard stuff. Pure on Tidehunter, I think this hero has fallen off a bit, but he's really good at this one. Uh, one of his favorites, and always happy to see Save play Muerta. That's a, that's a treat for me. 
Yeah, I think that that's going to be one of the things to watch for here. And, and of course, as you're sort of talking about, how much can GPK get done on this Dazzle in the mid lane? Uh, we heard Moon already talk about the fact that this Windrunner is going to be a nice answer of, you know, you pop the Windrun, then you can't reapply the Poison Touch. But already a little bit of a battle of Ruin as they sneak oh. on in and get the Bounty Rune. Nicely done, Jabs. I pulled one on him. I guess this is going to result in this. Is this a two for two trade now? Yeah, so without that steal, that would have been a three for one. Some decent pressure on the Nightfall here. Put it back on. Does have to take the long walk around or just going to TP back over. That makes a lot more sense there. Uh, already three heroes up on the top side of the map that will set up for just poor old 23 Savage alone down bottom. Um, who did change it over to 23savage.cringe. Uh, oh. Should point that one out, too. Uh, isn't that just the... Isn't that everyone's sponsor, <laughs> though, when you think about it? Isn't everybody just sponsored by Cringe to one or... To a smaller... <laughs> to some small extent, at the very least. I don't know. I feel like these these uh, nicknames that the players have as their, as their sponsorships when they're not putting sponsors in there... Sometimes I just wonder, you know, you put it in there and it's like there's two people in the world that understand this and there's like a million people that get to see it. Like, okay, this is like the most internal joke you can possibly have. But That's what Dota players like. At least I know what cringe is, okay? But some of the other things that people have at the end of their names, I have no idea what it means, but, you know. Perfectly fine here. Uh, I, I, I'm curious a little bit. You're talking about this this Jabs Weaver pairing together with the Earth Spirit. Is this going to be a situation where like he's going to be rolling around a lot towards mid, trying to make some moves happen? Uh, how, what do you see his Q's role in this game being? Yeah, I think he has a decent amount of freedom because the lane matchup Weaver has here and the Sven Venge aren't exactly a kill threat as long as he's playing on, on full health. Um, first of all, they're going to have to spend gold on detection to even connect on him in the first place, but even if they do, he should be able to stay alive and poke and prod and get some CS here or there. And that's the kind of hero you want to lane with when you're Earth Spirit. You want to have the option of rotating. I think the worst thing for this hero as a position four is it's not a very strong laner, but Weaker, Weaver kind of compensates for that quite well. Okay. Um, but the worst thing is when you're pinned as this hero. Mm. If you're stuck top because your offlaner is so dependent on having a second hero in lane, I think it feels very bad a lot of the time. Not the case either. So I would agree. Q is free to roam mid. Uh, Moonmeander was talking about that as a possible play for the Wind Ranger to get kills. But he could also look for a gate play bottom where uh, a connection together with Cold Feet could be an interesting move. He sees that opportunity. Definitely something to watch for there. Already seen a ton of those rotations through those twin gates. And of course, you know, Spectre thought of as a hero that definitely can get roamed on at those early goings, but also uh, can make some moves happen around that level six. We'll see how much they're going to be able uh, to sort of deny out some of this experience. Pure already on this Tide Hunter, trying to gain a little bit of momentum as 11 and 3 versus the 8 and 2. Yeah, this is a totally free tide lane, I would say. There's absolutely nothing stopping him. You can see they're even playing aggressive here. Right on top of 23 and standing still with a couple of right clicks coming from save, not quite enough to get the kill. You can see that pressure, it hurts. It's, it, it really is a kind of interesting setup that we have in the sidelines because both offlaners have such a good time here that I, I think as much as we talked about Earth Spirit's ability to rotate, I think save has the same luxury here because Tide is never going to die to Spectre AA, right? Like this lane is, it's not powerful. It wasn't picked to win the lane. It was picked for a, in more of a macro sense. So Pure will be happy to be left alone if it's ever, if there's ever the right opportunity for save. Um, I guess he can't really gank mid at the very least for talent, right? Like if save disappears, you feel very safe as the Wind Ranger. You can also just always just went run away. But the top lane, you know, coming in with a silence, all of a sudden jabs could be vulnerable. Definitely. That's something that they've got to watch for as Nightfall throws out a stun, just secures that CS for himself. They're already starting to do a little bit of pressure onto this and in fact, okay. a roll onto Toronto, Tokyo. Well, does not quite connect? All right, that was cool. That was 0% spell accuracy from both teams. <laughs> I, I guess the great cleave from Sven did hit. <laughs> so if you want to call count that, it was a little bit of a connection, but... Well, down bottom, a little bit better spell accuracy as Ollie maybe going to give it up. And yes, indeed, first blood drawn by save on that Muerta. It was just a matter of time, right? I think playing AA in this lane is exceptionally difficult. You need to always keep your distance. But if you ever get caught by a dead shot into calling combo, I actually don't even know if dead shot was a part of that play, but you get gushed, just overwhelmed, and Spectre offers absolutely no line of defense for you. So only quite the challenge here for them to stay afloat in that bottom lane. And overall, all three lanes 
going quite well for Bet Boom. You even we talked about that counter pick mid with the Wind Ranger. Sure, she's not being pressured by the Dazzle, but she's not stopping him either. So oh, GPK's be. game's going great. They can turn it back around. Nightfall, he's out too far, pops the fairy fire, able to get some separation and now secure himself back up there to the top side. But the region they I mean they have nothing. They're yeah. just chilling here. Honestly, this is one of those situations where it might have almost... Oh, here he goes. Okay, he has a salve on the way. If he didn't have a salve connecting at that time, I think it might have almost been better off dying, you know? So you just come back and have your resources and you can play lane. Because effectively, right now, he's not a hero either, right? He's just sitting there uh, with nothing to offer. But now, healing up. Should be able to get a little bit of a foothold here again. And I suppose he's doing slightly better than 23, but I don't think there's any meaningful difference here between any of the lanes, really, except yeah. that one kill. It does sort of have that feeling, though, that Sven, much more of the hero that wants to sit back and try and farm, whereas these more recent Spectres going for the urn builds want to get active. Yeah. It's nice to see. It's, it's a bit of a blast from the past, honestly. This urn build used to be really popular many years ago. Uh, and now with that Shadow Step change, it's becoming more popular again. Back then, obviously, Spectre only had the Haunt ability as her ult, which was a long cooldown. But despite that, people were still buying her. Oh. So now that you're available, I want to say more than twice as often, it's just a, it's just a, an absolute no-brainer to pick this up on that hero. Makoto is going to spot save. Goes in for the Focus Fire. There's still a DD on save. Couple more hits. The Poison Touch. Can they bring him down? Save is going to die, and Makoto even gets away with that one. Yeah. No Grave available. You don't skill that at this point for a mid-dazzle, so not surprising. And Save definitely wasn't counting on it either, but just nice rotation, nice reaction there from Q to be in the right place at the right time, and getting themselves on the board. I want to say a relatively quiet start overall, right? We've got two kills, minute seven, but this is probably a game that is going to be relatively slow from the side of Bed Boom. And Talon, all right. Well, they're trying to poke at Pure. Says that's really cute, guys. Just keep trying. <laughs> he literally just walks it off, taking no damage. The Perseverance still at Healing Lotus, pops the stick charges, and yeah, he's perfectly fine. I mean, this is the thing, really, is that it feels like this giant watermelon down here is just going to be chilling the entire game, and it's going to be up to a bunch of other heroes to make moves to get anything done. A few stacks, Wisdom Runes traded off one apiece. And as you mentioned, a slow start, um, but likely these level sixes that they come around either from the specter um, or, you know, eventually also the earth spirit coming out. It's going to be a lot of damage thrown. Yeah, and this this radiant lineup is kind of a classic combination, I want to say, where you have AA plus one global hero um, because any sort of connection from a shackle shot or from a, a rolling boulder can suddenly turn into an overwhelming amount of damage for any of the cores of Bed Boom. As safe as Tide is now, I don't think Cure is just going to have a clean game. Oh, Q. Okay. Uh, interesting setup. <laughs> Kicks one back into the focus fire and then going to TP away. Q recognizes he's not going to live if he doesn't get out, so they find one. Can they get another? On to GPK, but save comes in with the calling, and that's enough to make sure that this Dazzle does not get brought down. Makoto, uh, another rune that's going to be denied from GPK. But this is probably going to be the state of this game for quite a while. I think Bet Boom's best play in the game right now is to just focus a lot on stacking. I think you have both Tide and Sven that really want uh, big stacks whenever possible, and Playing aggressive with your heroes is really difficult because of the massive counterplay potential. You always need to account for an extra shadow step. You're always going to need to account for the massive mobility that both Earth Spirit and Wind Ranger have. So probably just better off taking it easy a little bit and, and let a Cure do this, right? Have the support stacking. Pure can push the tower with Meteor Hammer. He's the safest hero on the map. And then keep building up that nice last hit differential that you're starting to, to create here. I'm really surprised they're not stacking anything, actually. That's... It feels like they're really putting control. more emphasis right there. You saw the rotation over um, to try and pressure the Spectre a little bit. But as you're saying, I mean, Spectre's still going to get her farm. Although this could be good. Not going to get it. Nightfall not there with the stun. They had the follow-up. And so easily getting... Okay. Oh. Well, a lot more people show up. And Spectre is suddenly there right on top of Nightfall. But look at the turn! Destroys him. Makoto shows up a bit late. Still manages to find one kill. Pure chasing in. Has Ravage at the ready. Bet Boom brought everybody. Yep. And Talon also trying brought to get out with jabs. <laughs> doesn't quite have the mana. Sakuchi to escape. Oh! Connection. Save finds him from downtown. And 
Well, Bet Boom, they brought more. Damn, what a nice shot. Especially against Weaver, right? He, it was after Shikuchi went off, he still just barely clipped them there. And that's honestly kind of a big, uh, important kill for Bet Boom to get on the way out, because this it, this was starting to look like a, a nice moment for Talon, you know? like. It's not. It's hardly surprising that Talon seem to be pulling a little bit ahead in these fights if Tai shows up late and doesn't get the Ravage off, which was the case there. It's just easier for them to connect their heroes and, and land some easy snipes, but... Yeah, getting that one on the way out for save, really nice. Gonna close him in on level 6. Gonna see if he will choose to skill pierce the Veil. We've seen Muertas take different approaches uh, as position 4 is, whether they take that or not. Obviously, one of the big parts of Pierce the Veil is also the fact that it's a basic dispel, which yeah. has a little bit of a use here against the Urn, but that's how it slows. This is going to be the nice turnaround. Does he get the time ups off, though? Oh, Jabs. And a one second cooldown. That was really unfortunate. Oh, literally. He played that really well, too, running back outside of the silence range of the ghosts. But couldn't quite get it. And yeah, you know, you talk about that holding on to the Ravage, too. You would think at this point you would want to make some type of a move with Talon, uh, but with Ravage up, you just can't really do it. They've already lost their tower. It's not easy to take any of these tier ones. And Pure is just going to keep doing this, right? Yeah. I, I think this is what you do as Tide in this game. And if you get killed, so be it. Because I think a rotation to kill Tide right now probably takes three to four heroes, and it will free up the rest of the map. It will give you a lot of options for your Sven, maybe farms a little bit more aggressively, get some extra camps, and just offset the little bit of a cost it is to have you die. So, yeah, again, I'm, I'm, I keep keeping my eyes on these uh, on these missing stacks. I find this to be very unusual. Uh, I know Bet Boom as a team are very aggressive and focus a lot more on being oppressive to the opponent, but it, it does feel like a little bit of an oversight to not at least take some advantage of the fact that... <laughs> Makoto is not afraid, apparently, of GPK there. But, I mean, this is the thing, is that if you're not making stacks, you have to make moves like this yeah. as Bet Boom. And we'll see if it ends up paying off, because it looks like Talon want to contest this tower. The roll through, kick back. They already get the Ice Blast on him. And, well, that is the problem. You think you're tanky until you get kicked back in the face. Yeah, I said it's going to take a three or four hero rotation to kill Tide. Well, if he's next to your tower, it's hardly a rotation. And that is how you kill him. You just land all these spells. Pure obviously has no magic resistance right now. He will probably be building a pipe, I would imagine, after this soul ring. Uh, there's just so much random magic damage you can block from your teammates. You know, dagger, some spectre, all of Earth Spirit spells, Ice Blast, Power Shot, even Shikuchi, honestly. Like the whole, everyone in the enemy team has meaningful magic damage. All right. So I, I think it's just a gimme here. Well, um, and I feel like Pure after that kill is probably not going to be right-clicking towers and instead going to be using the Meteor Hammer. Yeah. A little bit of an overextension by him, not respecting the magic damage coming out from Talon. And Jab's going straight into a Lincoln Sphere. So he's trying to continue to play this pesky hero that's not easy to catch. I'm trying to wrap my head around how good this build actually is in this game. Like, this, So what can you block? You can block Sven Stun, you can block Sven Swap. swap. Uh, you can't block Deadshot or the Silence. So Muerta is actually very good against you regardless of which items you buy except BKB mm. for the catch. Uh, you can block Gush, which you don't want to. <laughs> You'd yeah. rather block something else. And of course, the Poison Touch. So, I mean, maybe it's just a matter of feeling free on the map. Obviously, we know Talon, they like taking games late game. They like having jab scale. And obviously, this is a feels good item on Weaver for a couple of reasons. The mono region is really nice. You can use Shikuchi to farm. And Another one. They find him. Pure that time did get the ice blast on him. Can they chase him down? It looks like oh. it. Power shot. Is that enough? Not he's quite. tickling down. And no, he's going to be able to survive through it. Was that power shot max charged? It felt like that could have been a was. little bit more, but. Still a 2k lead for Bet Boom. They're just getting more out of the map right now. Obviously, we've been talking a decent amount about the Sven and the Tide, but Dazzle is always this hidden hero, I want to say almost, where it's like, you know, he's just minding his own business. He's got <laughs> one assist. Slowly but steadily. Oh, Sven is really farmed. Well, guess what? Dazzle has almost the same CS. Just spamming out with the Shadow Wave to farm effectively. He's almost going to have the Ags now. That's disgusting. Away. It's going to do so much in these fights, I feel like. Yeah. The good news for Talon is they have Ice Blast, right? So it's one way of preventing Dazzle from getting this major burst heal that he can get with Shallow Grave on the targets. We've seen a couple of games this tournament where it's just like, okay, Dazzle just burst healed someone 800. Mm. Um, not going to be the case with Ice Blast on you, of course. The Grave can delay your death, but you're most of the time not going to fully survive, at the very least. Oh. 
and Makoto now picking up a wisdom room for himself, trying to build up those ancients. It feels like it's going to be on him to find that dazzle after like a haunt or something, right? Because Spectre's not going to be able to get it alone. Although oh, this pure. is too easy. They move in, they find pure. Are they going to be able to bring him down? He's really close to the angle. Q gets up close to him, but it's not enough. Pure walks it off. Only level one ice blast. That actually looked like Talon were not fully committing to that with what they had. I think maybe they were expecting him to die a little bit easier, but yeah, just narrowly surviving that one, pure getting away with murder, and he's now going to get a cloak. So next time it's going to be way harder. Yeah. Uh, he's just a three gold away from that. And the good news for Tide as well, you know, you take barely any damage when you're farming, so he can actually just go and <laughs> play jungle. He doesn't even need to go back to base despite having 200 health. He's even going top to clear out a little bit here. Uh, with the Ring of Health as well as the Meteor Hammer. That HP region of 20 next to this tower, very quick. And now he's going to go to the Mighty Mind. Oh, it's Get so some nice good. extra region there. Look at how strong he is. He's so mighty. Yeah, 26 HP region up here. I mean, the other thing that I'm just thinking about is that you've got this Aghanim Scepter now done on Dazzle. It feels as if Talon are just comfortable sitting back, getting their farm on a little bit, but at some point, I mean, this is the type of play that's going to be scary. GPK rolled upon, silence, oh, that's... back into the Ice Blast. That oh, is not no. the way they wanted it. GPK will get the Grave off with the DOT coming through. They're going to end up losing at least Q, but with everybody else falling, I mean, it's way too much magic damage. I think Ollie did have vision of the Venge in that whole situation, right? Yeah. It's kind of next level if he actually overshot the Ice Blast on purpose to hit on the swap, right? Because that's what ended up happening was Venge was trying, trying to reposition the Dazzle away, and if they dodge the Ice Blast, Dazzle does not die there, but... That was pretty sick. That was a really nice execution from Talon, and... Yeah, Betboom also expended Ravage there, right? It's one thing to lose the fight 3-1, to one, but now you're one of your key abilities on cooldown for two minutes. In the past, you'd be like, oh, okay, you know, Spectre doesn't have haunts. So what's really going to happen? Well, guess what? Spectre is ready again to go in five seconds. So, it's so silly. Um, <laughs> really got to be careful around the map here if you're Bed Boom and position your heroes well. Uh, well. Venge has a key role to play here. And you saw that too, right? Like they're running down. They see that 23 Savage is down there at that point at like 800 health, and they just can't get onto him. You don't have this global presence. Jabs. Runs into Toronto, Tokyo. They come through the gate. Suddenly, Spectre is back in the midst of all of them. Haunts away, gets out of trouble. Save, gonna pop Pierce the Veil, looking for a few more hits. After already losing the Venge, they're gonna lose the Muerta too. Talon are all over Bet Boom right now, one step ahead. Yeah, I, I just, I love the way Talon are playing this. Just recognizing that as long as they, as long as it doesn't turn into a full on team fight, right? Yeah. What they don't want is this. Five on five engagement where everybody's in a good position to chain their spells together and take advantage of the Ravage. As long as it skirmishes, you just have such an insane lineup for this Ooh. style of play. Jump in, caught though. And that's that is what one. they needed. That, that's Blink Dagger on Nightfall, so yeah. well played. That is a huge kill. Gives them a little bit of breathing room too. Now 30 seconds without Shadow Step. Gives them an opportunity to maybe push out the lanes a little bit more. Obviously, heroes that usually Especially the Tide, as we've seen in this game, that want to push out a little bit further. Oh, well, he, at least he got the Blade Mail off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, silver linings, right? <laughs> he knows how to push his buttons. No, it's, uh, it's definitely been a little bit back and forth now. So in your estimation, there's been a lot of talk about how strong Spectre is. What do you think of that matchup against the Sven as we get later and later? Because there is eventually Silver Edge and all the rest of it, but right. it always just feels like the pace that Spectre plays at is too much. Yeah, I think, I think it's a very unique matchup to really look at from the carry versus carry matchup, because I think the determining factor in this more so than many carry matchups is the supporting cast. It's okay. about... Uh, Sven obviously falls victim to being kited, right? So if you have the right defensive items or the right defensive heroes protecting the Spectre, she can just kite out his BKB and then overwhelm him, right? Um, on the other side, for the Sven, you want to have teammates that set you up for that quick burst, and that's where someone like Tide is actually really good because he can blink in, lock down the back line, and Sven gets to isolate his target and get that quick burst. Also, Venge is nice for this, right? You swap out one hero, you blast them with the Sven burst without the enemy heroes being able to connect. So. I don't know. I, I think in this case, both teams have what you would like in that late game situation. Um, 
maybe a little bit of a wild card could come out from a Weaver next. Do we dare say it later? Uh, that would be a sick save for Spectre because that's one hero Sven cannot, you know, kill in two hits. Spectre right. will eventually be too big for that. So Weaver might have a good shot at, at getting a save. But I don't think Jeff's gonna buy it. He's, he just wants to get it for free from Roche like every greedy core player ever. Um, you know. <laughs> it's a classic, oh, for sure. I mean, and the way Talon play too, right? Like waiting for third, fourth Roche, why not? You know they're gonna get there. And speaking of which, we do get the Midas completed now on Q. Oh. 20 minutes, you're ready. I, I think I saw a little part of your soul just leave your body there. <laughs> Hope you're okay. No. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> Everyone gets to be a core nowadays. Yeah. Oh. Except Toronto Tokyo. He does not get to be a core. Mm. Uh, I mean, maybe he'll get it. You know. For now, at least, a little bit broke as a joke. 23 Savage underneath the tower. Can they get there to help in time? Jump forward, half HP, blade mail out. Nightfall oh dying to the blade mail. And now the Ravage, that will be enough to get the kill. Beard, jabs, backing out Toronto, Tokyo. He's going to be the first one dead on Bet Boom. Can they find any more? Makoto onto Pure. Still looking for the turn, though. The jump in, Nightfall destroys him. Just like that, he falls. They did not anticipate Nightfall coming back into this fight. Ooh, boy, they're strong. Yeah, and you could, it, okay, hang on. Is this even over? Pure? I mean, Ollie, stay still. It's fine. They won't see. Oh, no. Okay. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, Jabs got involved, too. Wait, he went back in? Jabs caught in trouble trying to escape. They know he's up here. Now, being invisible is really good, though. It is very strong, but the oh. dead shot fear DOT, it's not there. Jabs barely surviving. Any sentry or any dust there, and they also lose jabs, but he managed to get out there. Sometimes invisibility is invincibility. It, it was pretty close to not being in invincibility there, though. But yeah, I think Talon maybe need to keep in mind here that they have 4,000 dead gold, right? Oh, yeah. Their Earth Spirit has a Midas, and their AA has a Midas. So when this Spectre gets jumped and you're TPing in to help, you don't have that Glimmer Cave. You don't have that Horse Staff that a lot of the time supports will be able to bring to the table and swing things around. Us. It's one man torming time for GPK. Come on, Ice Blast him, please. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that biased casting? I don't know if I'm allowed to do that or not. It's not biased if you don't want it for the team to win. You just want it for fun. Oh, okay. All right. That's that makes fine. sense. If it's a good time, everybody will be cheering for it. That's always a good time with Tormy time. Oh, yeah. Q. Oh, Q. Okay. Gets stunned, but 23 Savage shows up. Nightfall swaps in his carry. Oh, and then, uh, it's fine. Don't worry. He's yeah. perfectly okay. Backs out of there, just in time. All right, that looked like that could have potentially got scary after the Shackle shot landed, but didn't really have enough damage in the tank. Oh, Tokyo gets hit by that dagger, and I think they still had vision from the Spectral Dagger uh, as that smoke came out. So Talon, understanding that Bet Boom are going for a move, are going to back away, spread out to the other side of the map, and just get themselves a little bit of a, a wisdom rune as they head away. Almost completed Radiance plus level 15 here for uh, 23, so that's a huge upgrade for him. Let's see who gets the shard on the Radiant side. Moving it down, and Ollie. That is probably the best one they could have got. I think the Earth Spirit, I mean, the Earth Spirit one's kind of cool here too, right? If you get jumped on a hero and you get to have that secondary save, Spectre can get pulled away a little bit by Geomagnetic Grip, but the AA one's really nice. Just getting that stun when you connect your combos, it gives you that little bit of extra time to just stick on your target that you're connecting with. And All right, Bet Boom have bigger plans. This is, Dazzle is so good for this too. Yeah, very, very nice. Ollie not opting to throw any Ice Blast down that direction. But yeah, this was always going to be a, uh, Aegis that they gave away. Can they get the timing right? Oh, oh! 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 you're crazy! You're crazy! What are you doing? But they gave oh, the got out. reality out. Oh, wow. I love that they tried that, though. I think that's such a cool play. He went a little bit early, though. He has the vision from the Ice Blast lingering there, and he knows, obviously, maybe he was hoping that he could just jump in and steal it, didn't account for the stun, right? Oh, yeah. He might not have accounted for the stun from the Ice Blast, so he actually had to wait a little bit longer. If that was no shard on AA, he might have just stolen the Aegis, so really unfortunate for Talon that they got a shard <laughs> on their AA. I don't know. It would have been a sick steal.
Well, he'll, I'm sure he'll try again. Uh, there's, I feel like this is one of those games that, like, a thousand goal lead, 24 minutes in, everybody's kind of just sitting back by my, like, look, look, saves queuing up a minus two. This one might be going the distance. Yeah. If you're buying, if you start buying Midas's on your supports against Talon, aren't you just playing Talon's game though? <laughs> Is any team in the world more experienced in 90-minute games than this team? That's a fair point. I don't know. That boom, not ones to go back from a challenge though. And the, the thing that I think there's still a little bit uncertainty about is Dazzle. Um, obviously, you want to say that the hero falls off, right? Because you have this old mindset of how the hero used to work. Right. But I don't know what the hero's true ceiling is in like an 80-minute game. Like, is he still going to feel as powerful as a six-slotted Windranger or a six-slotted Weaver? Like, is he going to... Is the pacing eventually going to be a problem? Okay, hang on. Well, they find another. They get the grave off. Toronto, Tokyo Big not going to be stunned. Ice Blast going to connect onto a couple. Can they bring him down? Q in. Magnetize out. Jabs trying to buy some extra space. They pop the dust. He backs away. So no more reapplying Magnetize, and Jabs going to have to time lapse and run out. At the end of the day, it's only going to be a one-for-one one on these supports. Yeah, and pure... With well, a good call there to just hold the Ravage. There were multiple BKB heroes. He couldn't really have gotten much out of that. A very defensive build from Jabs, right? He has Lincolns and BKB, but I think it's understandable. There's just too many problems in fights. If you if your mindset is that you want to get involved, uh, and he wanted the Lincolns anyway, then BKB was probably the obvious choice afterwards. And that obviously means his, he's not that big of a threat yet. And now he gets to just fully itemize damage for the rest of the game, because he has the defensive items that you would want in 20 minutes too. Yeah, that part is really nice. I, I think the thing that's interesting about the way Talon are playing this too is you've got this Sven that kind of has to play around this God Strength. So yeah. while this window is out where they win a fight sort of, they force out a bunch of abilities, they can't punish afterwards on Bet though. Very true. And they just, yeah, Talon are just going to do their usual stuff. All right, interesting. 23 queuing up a Wraith Band here. Obviously we're past the 25 minute mark, so this becomes the most value for money item in all of Dota probably Wait, what the hell? right now, but <laughs> it's we've seen a couple of players do this a little bit and he bought it. Yeah, I, I, don't know. I don't know. It's it's probably good. It's a relatively I mean you can sell it for half, right? So how much gold are you really investing? I that I mean that's the first time that I feel like I've seen that on a carry before. It's pretty cool. Oh I'm, I'm stoked to see it. Another one of those builds that's like either Herald or Pro Player, you never know. <laughs> Then you watch the rest of the replay, and then you have a pretty good idea. <laughs> Pure throws out the dead in the water. Will get hit by Spectral Dagger, backs out. Throws another dagger on the Nightfall and GPK. <laughs> he was just paying the anchor like, 23, what the fuck, man? Just help me out. <laughs> it's just walking with the anchor behind him. The Spectral was just looking at the anchor for like Listen, three seconds before he reality to away. There is a creep camp there, Sindarin, <laughs> okay? I know that you're a support player. You don't uh, understand farming, but... <laughs> I, I get it, but then reality away right away. You know, he was literally just sitting behind him, just chilling, you know? Well, that's pretty Cute. funny. 11 to 10. Are they setting up for something here? GPK. Yeah, bounty or uh, Wisdom Rune in 10 seconds, so. Right on top of this Dazzle, waiting for him to step a little bit out of position. Do need to be careful. They don't have jabs. Pure is here too. 23 Savage gets hit. The Blade Mail, look at the damage out onto him, but he's surviving. Immediately turns. He's still down low. That's going to be one dead. Can they find any more? Silence for a long time on the queue. He's hexed after. GP Cave down to about half HP as Weaver continues the chase. So will Q. Continue to throw out the Magnetize, the Force Forward, and he goes down one time. Could not manage to get off the Shallow Grave, but Nightfall is just slapping away at the rest of these heroes. Three dead for only one. Picked the wrong fight. It's relatively even, though, because Talon did get both Wisdom Runes, right? Oh, okay. The reason Jabs was late was that he was stealing the one on the Dire side, but yeah, I... And you lost Aegis too. So essentially, it kind of was two for three, but obviously GPK doesn't truly die there. Um, a pretty close fight. I'm, I'm really surprised that 23 didn't just get blown up there. Right, oh, the way yeah. that fight started, it looked like he wasn't even going to press a button. But. Makoto, dead in the water. Nightfall waiting. Jumps, stun, and more than enough for the finish. That's a minute gone without a buyback. Yeah, that's a good kill. Probably not getting the tier two off of it, though, with the glyph coming out and heroes respawning, but... It's a very nice extra bit to get out of that. And with that kill, they obviously the, the big winners of the, the last two minute engagement we've seen here. So, yeah. 
Let's see what Back they're going to do with it now. Obviously, <laughs> I guess something we need to talk about a little bit here is BKB duration, right? Because, okay. Because uh, they've been picked up early this game. The Sven has an early BKB, the Wind Ranger has an early one, and obviously we saw the early one on Weaver as well. Once these start going down to six seconds, I'm trying to wrap my head around who this really favors more, right? Because one side has Tide, who yes. loves when BKBs are short, because then he can pump fake his Ravage, and then he only needs to survive for a few seconds before he gets ma massive value out of it. On the other side, Earth Spirit, Shackle Shot, you know, everything, basically everything all your heroes have is just really good against uh, heroes that aren't BKB'd. So, the fact that, I guess the fact that Talon have two versus just the one of Bet Boom is a little bit of a Bet Boom favorite thing here. Because right. the, the, the net worth value, so to speak, of the item is, is dropping significantly on the side of Talon. Whereas for the Sven, you know, he has to buy it. He ultimately, this hero in late game, it kind of is a one and done, right? You jump in, you kill someone, you reset, and then you won't have BKB anyway. Mm. Uh, but for Weaver and Windranger, who are more about the staying power, uh, having these drop to six is is going to be quite meaningful. I mean, I think that this also is one of those situations where late game can get strange too, right? You've got Mjolnir Prox. The vision, I feel like, from all these Ice Vortexes, if they can kind of set up in an area and breaking Blink Daggers randomly, it could be yep. really frustrating to play against. But we'll have to see what the setups are and what the vision's like. Of course, always really important in these fights. Aghanim Scepter done on Windranger. As we're hitting that 30 minute mark, Neck Roche capable of respawning in 50 seconds. Waiting for the timer on that as Spectre almost done with the Manta. Yeah, and when does 23 start to hit critical mass is the question here. Because we've seen he definitely is very killable for now for the Bedroom side, but once he gets this Manta plus one more item, maybe it'll be a bit tricky. Obviously, also looking at the level 20 talent, which is going to be a big help getting that 350 health there. Definitely going to be the choice in this game against such a burst-heavy lineup. So, I wonder if this Orchid that he's eyeing up now is the right choice. I, I think he specifically wants to get it because he's playing against two saves, right? Mm. The Venge as well as the Dazzle, especially Shallow Grave, is super annoying. Uh, but I'm a little bit worried it might be too offensive of an approach and that he needs more health, either a Scotty or a Heart to, or even a Butterfly, right? Because Sven does not want to buy MKB this game. Or, well, he he should against right. Night Ranger, but the hero genuinely doesn't want to buy it. And Nightfall isn't even eyeing it up, right? So he might get Nullifier instead if there's no Butter yeah. on spec. You know, that's, we'll see. An interesting last couple of minutes here. You can see both teams smoked up. We're waiting for somebody to step a bit too far forward. Talon opted to place that ward up on the high ground as Roche respawns, and now we're going to re-smoke. So their movement as Roche was a relatively quick one. We'll see what this ends up looking like. Jabs nearby the rest of his team can gather in together with the smoke if they want, but you got to imagine. Oh, they're getting this quick. This is going rather rapidly. Talon, are they going to realize what's happening? Roche is about to fall, and they are going to get it for themselves. Do they take the fight after? Oh, yeah. Sven TP's top. He's actually going to show here. So when Nightfall shows top, if they in any way could connect... Okay, it's just a full-on evacuate. Yeah, they're all... Five gone. TP's out from Bed Boom. They are not going to give them any opportunity to find a pick. So nicely done. They just snipe that out, giving the Aegis to the Dazzle here, which makes the... It makes the next fight for Talon that much trickier because usually the way they would like to engage fights is to kill that shallow grave, but now you can't even take that out. So, a few I tricky minutes ahead for, for the South East, South East, Southeast Asians here. Wow, that was really hard to say. That's a tongue You got there, though. It's very good. Thank you so I much. Like <laughs> <laughs> I, I was thinking, um, you're talking about like other items that we could see for Spectre. I also like the idea of maybe even going for the Aghanims later. We've seen sometimes where that hasn't worked out. But getting a haunt, so that way you can like pick and choose your targets, feels like it'd be really nice for Talon eventually. Yeah, Axe might kind of be a best of both worlds thing here, also because of the health, right? Like, yeah. As we talked about, a little bit of extra tankability on Spectre goes quite a long way here. So I, I, I do like that idea, because ultimately this game is going to boil down to, can you kill the saves on Bedroom for Talon? I don't think you're going to start the fight by killing Tide or by killing Sven, and right. that's how you break it open. I think you have to play angles, you have to find support kills, you have to find the Dazzle, and that haunt will indeed be a really nice tool for it. Uh, especially because you have so insane follow-through, right? Uh, if Windranger ultimately gets a Blink Dagger of some kind, or maybe you get a Dagger on... We've even seen Daggers on AAs, right? Mm. Just connect and just blast this one person. Um, that could be, could be an idea. 
That's kind of a crazy play. I like seeing that. It would be neat. Um, Ollie's needing to get away from this before it kills him. Uh, and it will be Makoto. Okay. So, Gale Force. It's actually quite quite interesting synergy between that and Ice Vortex, right? Like, you're trying to walk out of the Vortex, and you keep getting pulled in and slow. That sounds horrible. <laughs> it's actually very strong if you place these spells well relative to each other. Um, yeah. Feel, a, a true feels good shard. You don't really want to buy it on a core wind ranger most of the time, but you definitely are going to be happy to find it. And I think with the options available there, I think the wind ranger one is better than the earth spirit one this game. So Talon should probably be pretty happy with, with what they found there. Well, Bet Boom, even though they have only managed to blow up a 5k gold lead, it does kind of feel like they're giving Talon the hug of death right now. All of those outer towers are down. Yeah. It's a little bit scary to leave the base. And now with the smoke up as four, they're going to try and find Spectre. Radiant scan is just a little bit early from where the movement is on Bet Boom. As they go for the wrap, Makoto is up there also, underneath his own ward, feeling somewhat safe. Yeah, Talon have a pretty good understanding of what's happening right now, though. They evacuate and go down bottom. They have Q out here to break a smoke potentially on the Earth Spirit. He could just BKB roll away, possibly. Um, so yeah, bad boom not going to find what they were looking for. Is Makoto going for a snipe? I think he's going to try and snipe. There's no way he can go for that Sven. Surely. Ah, the Sven is just completely off the table. Yeah. He has 4,000 health and Warcry. He cannot kill him. But, I mean... Honestly, that's kind of an interesting thing to talk about as well, is who can Makoto kill? Yeah. Because <laughs> Wind Ranger is one of these awkward heroes that it's like a single target assassin ranged hero from mid that really needs to get value out of focus fire. It feels so bad when there's no... Uh, okay. Listen, that creep camp had it coming, okay? <laughs> <laughs> they are, uh, they're feeling pretty good about themselves. Um, pure, just making sure it's working. Pure is just farming kick Ws, <laughs> I think. So this game was getting a little bit too too calm for him. Yeah, so. absolutely. <laughs> I mean, let's be real. He's not going to be doing anything with it for a little while anyways. Like, Bet Boom are just kind of chilling at the moment. Yeah, I mean, as far as wasting Ravage goes, that's one of the more harmless ones, right? And the good news is now that he's done it once, he's not going to do it again. So Surely. it will not happen later mm. when it matters the most. Later on when he misses it, it was deliberate. <laughs> Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, the Midas is starting to kick in level 18 on Q. Um, our Ancient Apparition also level 18 and almost at a hex. I, it doesn't seem fair. And like poor old Venge here, just sitting at 8,000 net worth, hoping to get towards an Aghanim Scepter at some point. Toronto Tokyo is broke as a joke. Yeah, the good news for him is Venge, I think, Overall late game impact per net worth as a support, it doesn't get much. You don't get much more value than this hero. You have a great aura. You have minus armor and damage. You have swap, which is one of the best utility spells in the whole game. So if he manages to get to this eggs, even if he's like 4,000 net worth behind an Earth Spirit on AA, I think you have still insane impact. Now you could argue that with how this map has been played for the last 15 minutes, he could have farmed more. And I think yeah. it's something I've seen multiple teams where that would be my main critique is that when the game is in this awkward lull, you really want to farm out multiple heroes, and perhaps Toronto Tokyo could have identified this a little bit earlier and mm. had another thousand gold to his name, and then, you know, then you almost have that axe. Uh, instead, now you have to wait quite a bit. Um, so you're saying you should have bought Midas? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one of the options is to buy Midas. Yeah. Uh, the other option is to play a little more greedy. And I understand that, you know, you, you saw how the first 15, 20 minutes went, right? Talon are very active with their heroes, and they can do a lot, but the, just the trajectory in the last 10 to 15, at some point you must just be like, okay, you know, I'm probably safe to farm for a bit. I don't have to sit behind my course to save them all the time. Uh, especially when you had the Aegis on Dazzle that you did not want to use offensively. You didn't even need to protect him, right? So you could have probably farmed close, close to something else. But anyway. We'll see now if they decide to make a move as oh. Talon hit a lot of big item timings. Now this is a good one. The Enchant Remnant for Earth Spirit. Obviously pretty short cast range. Uh, doesn't have the Aether Lens. It's 500 on allies. Oh, they're going to be right next to him, though. As they step forward, they see that Dazzle is there, but that boom, they back away to their safe spot. And yeah, apparently 11 minutes fastest than the faster uh, record for the AA Sheepstick. Don't, don't you make fun of my tongue twister error. 
Oh no. <laughs> oh no, what did I say now? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's an early hex for sure. Um, the challenge for Ollie is still, you know, it's one of those things where AA is kind of in an awkward spot in some fights where you want to stand far enough back that you get a big ice blast mm. if you don't have the dagger build, right? You want to make sure your ice blast connects, but in that case, how do you hit your other spells? Because you want the range. And then yeah. when you get closer and you can use your Hex, that's when you're vulnerable to just getting blasted one hit. Because you don't have... You, the only save you have is the glim, the glimmer cape, right? So, yeah. I, it's obviously a great Hex timing. Uh, I wonder how he's going to use it. Like, who's your Hex target? You don't, you're not going to Hex Tide. You are probably not going to Hex the Dazzle his Lincoln's and Avenge behind. And Sven, maybe? I mean... Maybe post BKB. That, that's going to be Ollie's best chance at it. But you might yeah. die before then anyways the way that this fight's going. He needs to stay really far back. We've definitely seen some other builds from AAs, right, to try to, to find that impact. I, I mentioned the dagger, but you could all, we, I think we saw yesterday somebody almost reaching a refresher, which I also mm. think would be really interesting this game. Yeah. Um, could have bought an Aeon Disc if he was worried about getting jumped, but obviously he's really trusting in his own positioning, which has been stellar so far this game. Well, it's easy to have good positioning if you never fight anybody. That's true. <laughs> I mean, you say away. that, you say that, but you also need to not get caught around them. Yeah, that's a good point. Fair enough. Well, next Roche is going to spawn, and this one has a relatively quick timer again. It's going to be down bottom for a while. We'll see if Talon are going to be in a position to come and contest that. As Aghanim Scepter in Roche's hand. And with the butter on 23, this Sven MKB obviously important. We were talking about this is a potential build path for spec. Uh, allows Nightfall to get that double dip value from the MKB against the Spectre as well as the Wind Ranger. So as long as Nightfall can get on a target, I think he can kill them pretty fast, even the cores. Uh, and Talon needs to be very wary of, of Sven's initiation angles. Ooh, and they're backing out Talon in a position. I, I don't this is bad boom know they're here. Do they, if they see that Roche is up, you kind of wonder if they might just try and sneak it away. I mean, it's a crazy move to do that. They see that it's in there. What if you, what if you bait your Weaver? Oh. And then you enchant Remnant him, kick him away, and then he can, you know, play the fight. Chance. Nightfall walks high ground. They see him right at the start. They're going to blow him up. They get everything off. The grave is going to be there. But can they break the TP? Nightfall manages, no, to get out. He is gone. Well, we said he couldn't kill the Sven if he just stands there, you do. A run through, triple kill for 23. Waiting the whole fight and it was perfect. Sometimes you just wait 10 minutes and then you just get it just right, you know? <laughs> uh, just perfect. And this is the problem that Sven will always have against me. It's a satanic carry that in a lot of situations there, you get graved by Dazzle, you pop all your stuff and you heal to full. It's just not an option. Uh, tries to panic TP out. This is genuinely an impossible play, but yeah, they were not expecting this vision. Oh, yeah. The wards win games, and that's definitely an instance where it happened. Nightfall even trying to TP out, but was just not meant to be. Ooh, man, that, that really opens things up now. Um, Talon, this is where they thrive. 40 minutes, you don't stand a chance. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is a bit of a... This was a first pick AA, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, they after the it. Dazzle. So, so Bedboom willingly picked their Sven into this, and you always need to consider, if you're playing Satanic carries that are very much reliant on that, you either need to have a reliable way of finding and killing the AA, or maybe you would have been better off picking, say, an illusion-based carry or something mm. like this, right? So Sven really has this... There's this one asterisk to him, despite being so strong. Sometimes he's susceptibly like he's just surprisingly weak you're just susceptible to specific things in this late game and ice blast is one of those okay shackle and gpk he's oh, found he's... the mind breaker it is oh, devastating boy. marvelous play from 23 and makoto it's just too easy yeah this is going south really fast for Betboom. they lost like 15,000 gold in three minutes so and that's against the late game talent team we know how that one usually ends and except against team liquid um <laughs> Yeah, this, is, this is looking really, really good for them all of a sudden. That mentor will be taken. They have to lick their wounds somehow. Nightfall will get himself a shard. But yeah, I mean, now getting the Aghanim Scepter for free onto Spectre. So you have Haunt available. You can play around that. 
it makes all of these fights that much more difficult, like we were talking about. Like, you can find save now in these instances. Yeah, the, the fights are actually just exceptionally difficult for Bet Boom because if you look at the composition that they have, Dazzle has... Dazzle's a hero that doesn't burst, right? This hero just doesn't do that. So it takes time to build up a fight that Dazzle can win, and that is the direct opposite story of how Sven plays fights. He wants to jump and kill someone fast and go from there. Essentially what this means is if Talon get vision and they have any idea what Sven is doing, they're actually just probably not dying, right? Yeah. If his dagger gets cancelled by a haunt or if they connect anything on him that can lead into an ice blast, it's just such a... It always feels nice to play late game Dota when you have a clear path to victory. Like when you have this... You can make this game plan for your team where you know, okay, these are the conditions that need to be met. Because uh, late game Dota, a lot of the time, it's really, really hard, right? Mm. So being able to simplify a strategy like this it has got to be so nice for 23. I'm sure their communication is just, all right, if we see Sven, we're, we're good. You know? Well, and I, I think back, you know, you're talking about how easy and simple this is for Talon. Earlier today, we saw Bedboom play very simple drafts around Lunas against Vivo Keed Stars, trying to be aggressive with Terra Blades, pushing objectives when they could. And in this game, it didn't feel like it was the same sense of urgency. There was that willingness to go late game. And yeah. uh, Bedboom now, in the rewards of that, we'll see how they're able to deal with the next couple of minutes as Pure. I was wondering if they're going to go on. I guess that's what you're talking about. Again, they got to wait for the Sven. Yeah, I I think the, the worst possible entry into a fight for Talon is going on Tide, who then gets swamped. I think that is the worst possible thing that can happen. <laughs> so just don't. Don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> just uh, If Tide is the only one offering himself up, no. Play the rest of the map, that, chill. That was, that was the pub side of me coming out. It's like, Tide's there, we can kill him, right? Let's go, guys. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but not opting to go for it. And instead, Makoto going to take the tier two tower down bottom. Yeah, that's gone. Some serious damage starting to come out of Wind Ranger, too. We talked about earlier, okay, who can you really kill? But this hero does reach critical mass at some point where the shackle shot is enough time to find kills on a hero like Dazzle, potentially, or at least the Vanish or the, the Save Muerta. Who has been very quiet the yeah. last 15 minutes, right? Some sick shots early on, but this town hasn't really been bringing that much to the table as of late. He is trying to become a core, though, right? Right. So I mean, That's kind of the question mark here, is if, if Muerta can just be left free to get towards those items, you've already got Mjolnir, you got BKB, trying to get towards MKB next. That, that could be a problem here to deal with, particularly if you know everything is used and expended to try and kill off the Sven. Yeah, you are still, as this Muerta, very much dependent on your BKB because the amount of just random magical damage in the fight is going to be too much during your ult. I don't think you're safe to fight if you ulti because there's just too many things that can kill you off. But during BKB, you can have some serious impact. Uh, I think the dream for him is obviously to try to kill supports. Um, open up the fight, kind of the name of the game for both teams here. As the items keep... That's the Hex reveal. Again. Jumps. How much can they do to Q? He pops the BKB, rolls away, and now 23 Savage, he decides to go in. He sees okay. the Sven, so you know what the drill is. Nightfall, Ice Blast, it's a good one! No, not quite gonna connect, and now they have to back out. That is Castle's Curse Fire. Gale Force, Ravage, got him! They have an Enchant Remnant still if they want to get in range, and they do oh. it! Nice play by Q, but it's not, not gonna matter. He does not have enough to kick him out after. Makoto tries to TP, but they got way too much damage. The fight was not the way Talon wanted it, and they're gonna end up losing three. Yeah, they get the vision on the Sven. They open with the Spectre, but there's no follow through, right? Nobody was close except Earth Spirit, who could not re-engage after the DTB was wearing off. So 23 essentially just offering up himself and giving Betboom a nice opportunity to, to punish. When when that Ice Blast misses, Sven's just like, all right, it's go time, you know? That's oh, what yeah. Nightfall's waiting for. If that does not connect, as much as we've talked about this hero having problems against it, well, what if it doesn't hit? Oh, no, and what this if they is... go high ground and you don't have any answers on the side of Talon? I mean, this is going to be a glyph use, but you can see already Jabs trying to cut the creep wave. But Meteor Hammer down, GPK stepping up front and center. They don't have Spectre for 50 seconds. Betboom, they've already taken all the Tier 2s. They're thinking about going for the Tier 4s. Betboom, off of one good fight. What's going to be the answer here? Talon... They're not buying back on any of their heroes yet. Still 30 seconds until Spectre. The other two have a buyback on one. That's the Earth Spirit. Jab's going to time lapse back to get away. 
Now going for some more right clicks. Bet Boom, you have to make a decision. Are you in? Are you out? Going to risk it? Are you going for the all-in play? They have not ball back on the rest of them. That's another tier four tower going down. The jump for it. The stun, he's gone. Weaver already out, but now focusing. They don't have creeps. Jabs cut the creep wave. They're hitting it, but there's nothing happening. Bet Boom, where are you, creeps? As they chase, they hunt. Nightfall is going to fall. And now looking for more. Spectre is about to come back up. Bedboom have to get away. The hunt is there. If Bedboom knew about the creeps, they could have done it. But instead, it's Talon that stand tall. Man, that is such, such a crucial little detail from Jabs there, right? As you pointed out, he went in, did some damage, and time lapsed out. He killed the last two melee creeps in the base. Oh. From range creep. So he went all out. He knew, okay, I've already cut the next mid wave. So if I kill these two creeps, we buy enough time that the backdoor protection will kick in on the ancient. So yeah, Talon, hang on. But now, how much can you get the other way, right? Right. You spent two buybacks on cores here for Talon, and Bedroom have all theirs. Well, 50 seconds without the Sven, and they're hitting this he tier three tower. He just nothing. Uh, that? He wanted to Manta, a little bit of a missed click there. Yeah, Fat Fingers coming out from 23 Savage. But, I mean, here's the problem, too, now. Pet Boom, they have a clear path to the Ancient. There is no Glyph. Yep. This is scary territory for Talon. I mean, and for Pet Boom, oh my yeah. god. I mean, this is just some scary late game Dota now, but one of the most important things when you get to this state is who has buyback. Right. Always got to look at that situation. The Tide one was used on Pure, but if he is the one being offered up in these situations, as we've talked about with the saves behind, I think he's relatively clear to survive the initial burst of the fight. And as far as Talon go, both Makoto and Jabs without buybacks is huge, but at the very least, one of them will get a second life here. Looks like that will be gifted to Makoto. I suppose Jabs might take the cheese. The Aghanim Scepter isn't going to be the Weaver one. We talked about it as an option. He must be mulling it over right now. He will. He's going to take it. Okay. I mean, That's... think about that last fight mid where they lost 23 Savage. If he gets time lapse there, yep. great. They're good to go. They have the most insane saves in Dota, right? They have Enchant yes. Remnant and Weaver Axe. And this is a Weaver Axe also that has a Swift Blink, because why not? Yep. Look at this. They, they scan. They know that they're coming in. They're trying to bait him out. They got him hexed. They got him controlled. But the time lapse, he didn't get it. He didn't get it off in time. He has buyback, though. The haunt comes back in. Q trying to roll away. The control there on the Nightfall. Can they bring him down? They will. Makoto focus fires one. Now on to save. Trying to find the back lines. They get GPK. Didn't get anything off. Toronto Tokyo is dead. They're going to also lose the Muerta. That is four dead. Muerta, the only one without buyback, and back down the lanes they go. Pure. <laughs> Just please leave me alone. I don't want to be here anymore. All right. If he stays here for another 4 minutes 30, he will get an abandon. Okay. All right. We're good. He got out in time. Thank goodness for that one. Well. Oh, boy. Well, Sven does have the buyback. They don't have it on Muerta, and this will be forced out, but... Again, now another key buyback for Bedboom was forced out on the Spectre, right? So now there's another hero that they could potentially kill. And a lot of the time in, in old school Dota, late game Spectre was so good because of this exact play. You, you're you so hard to kill, you die on essentially on purpose to just yeah. give yourselves a really good fight. Because if Bedboom wants to kill 23, they have to pop all their stuff to get the first kill. He buybacks haunts in his vision of everyone. The team collapse on them and you can't kill him a second time. But that's not going to be the case anymore if that boom stay in this, which it looks like they will. Just thinking about what could have been again for Bet Boom, that opportunity that they had, and Jabs playing a clutch role to make sure that he was able to get there in time to kill off the creeps. Oh, this is a big item now, too, on 23. He gets the refresher orb, so can just haunt back to back without committing, can just force cooldowns defensively out of Bet Boom, gives so much vision. This is looking really good for Talon now. Honestly, the only thing that could truly go wrong for them right now is if Bet Boom pull off a smoke play before buybacks come back. If buybacks return to the side of Talon, it is so stupidly difficult for Bet Boom to still win this game. So I think their mindset right now should be, all right, we know what heroes don't have buyback. It's kind of a YOLO moment at this point. I think if you play not to lose this game, you will lose. You got to play for On Bet Boom, you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, they, they have to take a risk here. I don't think slowing the game down now and being like, okay, we'll let both teams wait for buybacks. I think you're giving Talon way too much of an opportunity, and they will go. Think about it. 
No, they won't. Just kidding. Well, it was just a to. shadow step. <laughs> and of course, that is back up in 12 seconds. Um, a little bit more than that, but very, very soon. I mean, they're, they're sitting back. They're sitting pretty on Bet Boom. They only have that one more Rax along the top side of the map. And I, I guess there is some logic also to the idea. You can understand the temptation to be like, all we need to do is one, one big fight, so let's take the perfect fight, and then we can win the game by running down mid. The problem, as you pointed out, is, is the buyback status. When the buybacks come back, I think the perfect fight doesn't really exist anymore. That's yeah. the problem. Because your lineup, the way it's tailored, it's really good at killing heroes the first time, but they can't do it the second time. Tide is far away from Refresher. When Sven has used all his stuff, what are you really bringing to the table? Sure, he has a Refresher for a second round, but he has to be able to inventory manage and not get caught so he's able to get it off after he pops everything and jumps in. If there's any sort of counterplay that messes him up, that's going to be a problem. Dead in the water. Yeah, so... And even if you do get the Refresher off, that doesn't guarantee a good fight. If you're Ice Blasted, you're still going to die. So, so many maybes here for Bet Boom. Talon wants to try to lead the charge. Ages for another 50 seconds. That might be what Bet Boom are waiting for. When that runs out, perhaps you're looking at initiating the fight. The problem is the sweet spot here. Wind Ranger's buyback is two minutes, and the Aegis is 45 seconds. So your window of opportunity is extremely small. It's coming up right now, though, and already they jump. The Venge is there to swap it, now throw out the stun, but dead for 100 seconds. Still has that illusion playing around. Oh, that's a good shackle! Caught, but they connect! They got him caught! Nightfall has to back out. Don't have another Ice Blast yet. Nightfall retreats. They're able to hold out. I mean, again, losing the Venge is devastating, but they could have lost so much more there. Yeah has to swap instantly. The Tide is not completely safe. As we talked about, he's not going to die in the burst. He will be able to be saved by the swap, but obviously you're offering yourself up at that point. Venge well, has no escape plan. And this is that window that you're talking about. The Aegis is about to expire. Venge is dead for it now. Yeah, you can't. Now, now you can't go for the aggressive play anyway. Venge is too important for this to be an option. So Talon effectively have bought themselves buyback on Wind Ranger with this aggressive move. Uh, and that should also mean that the Weaver will have his. They have basically on the same timer. Uh, not enough gold right now, but actually, never mind. He'll get it in a second on the Weaver. So jabs as well as Mikoto with those second lives. Only 23 now. Three minute cooldown on his. Well, you know, on the, the side of Bet Boom, right. Pure will have it in a minute and a half. And three minutes on GPK. So, yeah, I'll gotta say it again advantage Talon right now. Uh, Pure has Refresher now done. So, a big other item. Oh, it's waiting there. Yeah, it's it's off to the side. Okay, he's flying it through them now with the barrier. Actually, oh, oh. that was close. 23 jumps on pure, backs away. Grave is there. Blink back. GPK. He's fine. They're able to reset. Haunt down. That was very close. Yeah, maybe his mindset was that we can jump on the tide because there's no bench to save, but. Not I, case. I feel like you got to go now if you're Bet Boom. You, you just saw Haunt. There's Refresher used BKBs. This is a good moment opportunity. Absolutely. There's also a ward in their base, though. Scouting out a lot of these movements. And they will get together. Calling pushes out a wave, and there's the smoke up as five. Weaver running in. One of the better heroes to break a smoke. Steps forward. Weaver's still running through a dangerous area. God, he's so hard to kill. He's just blinking away after Sakuchi. Yeah. Honestly, all of Talon's heroes are hard to kill. There's no easy target in this game anymore. AA has Lincoln's Aeon Disc. <laughs> what the you know? So that's the five has that. Earth Spirit has 4,000 health and a Trickster Cloak. Windranger has 3,000 health on the Lincolns. Weaver has 3,000 health, Lincolns, and BKB. I mean, they're terrified right now on Bet Boom. It's with, hard, man. With, with good reason, right? I mean, th this again was a smoke as five to go to the Ancients on the side of the map, and now we yeah. take a little bit of vision. They are going to take over this area as we get close to 60 minute items. So at least should be able to farm some of those. Uh, potentially. Yeah, that's a big question mark here. Is Talon going to let them? I think yeah. for, from Talon's perspective with their buyback status, the Spectre one is coming up basically at the perfect time. He's 50 seconds away from having his, and then, then you could just smoke in and contest all the ancient camps. Well, they are definitely in position to do just that.
Venge is the furthest one out. They do have vision up on that high ground, at least for now. And they're going to retake over their own base, it looks like, push out the top wave if they can. Yeah, it's not easy. I mean, this game is so hard at this point for Bepboom. And if you separate for a moment, you know, a random haunt, if anybody's on top of you, you're just dead. Ice Blast is there too, has the level 25 talent for the kill threshold. So as we eclipse 60 minutes, a Radiant scan on the Ancients reveals that nobody is there. 23 Savage is going to go farm up some himself. Yeah, this is very, very clearly tailored by Talon, right? They're going to make this smoke so they connect there at around 60 minutes in. Spectre is covering their side, so they just want to grab all the tier fives. And then maybe they're just going to push, you know? Yeah. Like that advantage, if you convert that to net worth, is pretty ridiculous. At the very least for Bed Boom, they find one token here for their Sven, but that's the only camp they have access to is that one. He's not by selecting just yet. Where are the Midas is at? Oh no, Muerta got rid of hers! Oh, that's so sad. This would have been the perfect time. Yep. Oh, man. 23 Savage actually choosing the Book of Shadows on Whoa. Spectre. That is quite unusual. Mostly we see support and utility heroes selecting this one. Uh, but gives him an extra line of defense for himself, of course. Yeah, what else did we see come out? So we have the Ex Machina on Weaver. Seer Stone on Earth Spirit. And, yep, the Sven has opted for Mirror Shield here. Okay. For Nightfall. They're going to claim the rest of them. Meanwhile, Spectre, Nullifier is the option, so these Aeon Discs not working uh, the way they would hope as the next Roche is up, and Talon coming down south to claim that one for themselves. Uh, in terms of Aghanim Scepters, it's only the AA, actually. Yeah, so that's an easy choice. It's going to give him an axe that he probably isn't going to use for anything. But hey, I mean, actually, oh, I think, yeah, I was just going to say, his okay. axe is so unimportant in this game <laughs> that you use it on Earth Spirit and you sell the one you have. Oh, my God. So Earth Spirit just got either 2K gold or he just has the stats from his axe. I think it's just going to sell it, yeah. Okay. Oh, there you go. That's a rare sight. When's the last time you've seen someone sell Aghanim Scepter? That is the saddest that, support. That is so sad. I mean, it's just this AA Aghanims is, in reality, is only good on core, yeah. right? It's just, he's not using Chilling Touch in the fight. He's casting his spells and backing off, so it's kind of more or less useless. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. Well, in the meantime, we did get more Tier 5 items for Bet Boom. Talon did not make that big push that we were anticipating. Yep. They got a Pirate Hat on save, which is pretty freaking good. Digging up those bounty runes to try and equalize the net worth a little bit. It's going to take a while. Um, and of course, as we can see, a tier 5 item, Giant's Ring for Pure. Oh, that's a big tie. Oh my god, he's big in mid. Look at that. I feel like it's deceiving, though, because he's not that tanky. He yeah, still die very quickly. The Ice Blast is more likely to hit him now. Yeah, if only. <laughs> well, waiting on Toronto Tokyo's item choice. Uh, and in the meantime, too, we did see AA go for the Book of the Dead. Yep. And a Book of the Dead for Venge, too. Yeah. The, should not underestimate, by the way, in this game, Talon are running double Ex Machina, and everybody obviously on that item focuses on the cooldown refreshing aspect of it, but 20 armor yeah. against these dire heroes is no joke. And that's all the plus armor that Windranger has. Yep. So it's like a huge EHP increase against Sven, against the Venge minus armor, against Dazzle's spam. It really makes a big difference. All buybacks available. Okay. Well, we're going to see some shit here, man. Yep. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't think either team does either. But, oh, okay. Bit of damage. Yeah, Book of the Dead. Emphasis on bit. Okay, here we get a little bit of commitment. Makoto stun. No! The kill force! You can't hit him! Oh, that's a oh, good one. 23 Savage! Excuse me? What? Not how they drew it up. I'll say that. Not how they drew it up. Well, he has buyback. Well, you did say 23 Savage fat fingered earlier. Yes. Maybe that time it was the whole face across the keyboard <laughs> and not the hand. That 
I don't know, man. He just jumped in 1v5. And it, maybe he misclicked and wanted to just get vision and then jump out. Like he was trying to either right. break smokes or just cause confusion. But I think the only one he confused was himself. Maybe his teammates, too, actually were a little bit lost in that one. But That was a tough one. That was a very tough one. And fortunately for Talon, they cannot push. Right? So, uh, well, right. Just a death. I mean, it's a level 30 Spectre death. I'm not going to pretend it's nothing, but... About 4,000 gold, a lot of experience, and yeah. if they can manage to force out a buyback, it would be huge. As Bed Boom is smoked together, keep in mind, pure at the ready with that refresher. ED, Nightfall. Who needs God's strength? Oh, he is strong. All it would take was a swipe or two, and whoever he's hitting is going to be in the dirt. They jump in, they find one, Ollie, they got him caught, but the Hex, the turn, got him under control, finding Q, the jump through, Toronto Tokyo starts the ball, 23 Savage is in. After that buyback, he's gonna try and retreat. Pure is absolutely ripped through, Dazzle gone, and Nightfall just trying to back out, doesn't have anywhere to go at all. Q right on top of him, swapped to try and escape. Nightfall still managing to just barely get out of there, the silence running, hiding, get out of there, buddy, Nightfall, but right on top of his jabs. They bring down the Sven, and in the end, Talon just a bit too strong. Yeah, I think Betboom were not expecting Talon to try to make an aggressive move with their Spectre dead, right? They know Spectre has buyback. They probably know it's a possibility, but might have just thought, like, why would they do this, right? Why not just wait until Spectre is alive and then go? But Talon go for this play that, in reality, if 23 somehow would have died there, that could have been game losing, right? Oh, that, yeah. That was a, not a risk they had to take, but they felt very confident that they had the information that they needed. And... Well. Oh, it's, still, out of it. it still could be game losing, depending upon what happens in the True. next couple of minutes. Looking for Makoto. Oh, the Lincoln Sphere popped. Was looking for the swap. Didn't quite get it, though. They reapplied with a little bit of help from their friends, throwing out these Books of the Dead. Pure steps in. BKB, focus fire one. Do they have enough to take him down? Makoto not quite going to get it, but the jump in, they find this Earth, Earth Spirit. Ravage out, now trying to hit him. Aeon Disc proc, the swap back, gets him in. Jabs, finding the back line on a GPK, tries to run away. Time lapse to get out of there. They got the Sven buyback, that's what they wanted. And now they get out. Talon, perfectly executed. They poke and prod, and eventually, under so high pressure, it is so difficult to just keep holding the buyback on Sven, right? And eventually he does cave in and go for it, but gets nothing out of it. Pops his ult, has nobody to hit. Now, well, we've talked about the Spectre being a potential ah. risk here for Talon if he does die. There's a lot of risks on the die right now. The buybacks are not looking healthy no. on the side of Bet Boom. You have none. And so this is the question that I have in like these late game scenarios. It, you're sort of in a dual situation with Talon, where on the one hand, if you push and you take advantage and you win a fight, obviously you just win the game. But also, they're under no pressure to try and end either, right? Right. Do you think it's worth it to attempt, like, a smoke play running in there finding kills, or is it better just to sit back? Uh, I think considering the buyback advantage that you have right now, yeah. you can try to go for skirmishes that don't in immediately involve the Spectre. Like, see if you can get good conditions for a fight, and then you... Then you pounce on it if you see it, and if you don't, you just poke and prod, and if nothing comes out of it, that's okay, right? Yeah. I think just sitting back and farming isn't... I mean, there's nothing more to farm for. <laughs> bad, necessarily, but it's not really improving your chances of winning by a meaningful amount. I think poking these barracks with Ex Machina, BKB, and Focus Fire is probably the way to go. There's no glyph. Pop one. Oh, they kicked and him out. out. That's a big statue. That's what they needed. Catching on to Pure. Down low with the swap. Long range. Pure tries to back out. Does he have anything else left in the tank? The Ice Blast is there, but Pure lives through it all. It is going to be Toronto Tokyo going down, but no! Makoto jumps in, takes down the big old watermelon, and Bet Boom now on the back foot. No heroes really left with buybacks at this stage of the game. Magnetize is gonna do some damage, but this is Mega Creeps. Talon take dominant control up 50,000 net worth at 68 minutes. And they know for a fact there's no buybacks here. So they know they just need to keep calm. It's a five on three. Wait for the right opportunity to get a jump with Earth Spirit probably here. Q is being glimmered up. He's trying to find an angle. And he might just go for this one. 
23 Savage just sitting in fountain, jump forward, jabs, can't hit onto a target at all, save, jumps in, pierce the veil, tries to bring him down, but Aeon Disc, there's nothing there. 23 Savage throws out one salvo of abilities, and as they are not able to grant purchase, it is just going to be waiting for God's strength to wear out. Actually surprised they didn't commit their talent, given the circumstances. I feel like that was game over. Sven popped everything, didn't really connect on anyone. Uh, you had the Ice Blast fly over two heroes, including the Sven, so he was clip by so he couldn't heal. They did not fancy their chances there to just finish it off. Looks like they're still just going to go now, round two though, with the bigger creeps coming in. They're doing Looks it. The dead. This is really hard to deal with. Tier four towers are falling. GPK, he gets jumped on. Can he survive through this? No, they take down the Dazzle. They're gonna take down more. Nightfall, nowhere left to go. And GG is called Talon. They managed to just one away. What a performance. And it, I mean, obviously this game was full of all sorts of you know, moments that could have gone differently or whatnot. But what it really boils down to when you look at it, right, is do you want to play like this against talent? Right. <laughs> it, I, I don't know when I look at Bedboom's draft is if their mindset was we are going to hit a mid-game power spike and we're just going to go and end it against the Spectra and not get to this point. But whatever their plan was, they didn't manage. And once we got to this super late game, talent, they're feeling themselves. They have a lineup that thrives under these circumstances. Bedboom, it was so hard post that 40-minute mark to string together anything. Well, and I think back to, I don't remember if it was this morning when we were talking about Bet Boom on the panel or it was just recently, but there was this talk about like feeling as if this team is most comfortable when they can just sit back and farm on Bet Boom. But to me, they look the most effective when they're on these carries that want to hit buildings, when they're on the Lunas, the Terra Blades, that type of hero that wants to play a little bit faster. Um, and Talon, of course. I mean, they're comfortable any time that they get to the 60-minute mark. Um, what a freaking game, though. Yeah, that was, that? that was a lot of fun. And I think it was very interesting to see because of the clash of styles, right, in terms of the lineups, what, they, what strengths and weaknesses they had. It was a very strategic late game, uh, full of surprises. <laughs> I, I, I think it's fair to say there were some pretty major mistakes from individual players in this, but that's, that's the beauty of late game Dota. It's very hard to play the perfect game once you get this far in. And ultimately, for Talon, Probably a little bit of breath of relief. They still still got it done. Uh, so, yeah, can't wait to see what game two holds. Taking care of business, and we'll find out in just a few. But first, let's head on back to the panel. Let them break down the insanity of another 60-70 minute game. Hey, Talon and 60-70 games, uh, name more iconic duo. I need to take a breath after a game like that. That was especially the end, very nail-biting. I'm joined by my panel. We got Fear, Lacoste, Effie, and Musa with us. We're going to attempt to break this madness down. Uh, there's a lot to break down. And we here at Cinder and say there's uh, massive mistakes. We'll break those down too. But uh, Lacoste, let's just start with something positive. Talon taking this first game. Uh, they came in with the plan. They came in prepared. Yeah, this is the big fight for them, where they're fighting underneath the vision. And I feel like every single time Ancient Apparition managed to get the ulti on Sven, this is the fight that they're going to win. Bed Boom, they were definitely on the clock here, putting all eggs in one basket. Because your Sven, if he gets six slotted, he's like relatively weak uh, when he goes into like these 55, 60 plus minute games because his Aghanim Scepter doesn't uh, do much and uh, we can see Bulk, he's like, man, what am I watching? I told him exactly what to do in this game and it, it feels difficult because you have like six, you have gold that you can spend on an item because your Aghanim Scepter, you don't want to have that and uh, again, Talon bringing it to, to a 60 plus minute game and beating them with the experience because if you look at how this team, you know, is playing in their own region, uh, this region has by far far the like average game time is like i don't know like 50 minutes in their region <laughs> so they know how to beat it in the late game yeah, for sure. I mean, I want to highlight a couple of the things that Talon did very well this game. I, mean, I think both teams played very well, if I'm being honest, because Bad Boom had to play a really perfect early game to take them to the point that they did, and they did do that, but Talon did abuse the reach of their supports in that minute 10 to minute 20 mark. While Spectre was being pressured on one side of the map, they were able to get these kills with the Air Spirit into the Ice Blast, playing around Nakoto, maybe getting an objective or two. The second thing that I think they did really great was that Roche fight that turned the game for them. They they played on the top side of the map for the five minutes beforehand. And around the time that Rose spun, they spoke they smoked at the same time that Bed Boom smoked. So that was just a matter of who got there first and who managed to plant the word first. And they beat Bed Boom to that 
twin gate to that ward area by five seconds. They were able to set up there five seconds earlier. Had that boom made it there five seconds earlier than Talon, we might have seen a different outcome to this game. But they, they just did everything in the very split second and I think Q played an excellent game. He saw this vent, he went there, and again, the Ice Blast, the supports just played incredibly well. Yeah, we got here on the screen our, our mid matchup, Moon. We had the overall first pick, Dazzle, versus the overall last pick, uh, Wind Ranger. That, uh, that was a little bit of a surprise hero coming out for us, but it uh, worked out well. The Wind Ranger uh, made the Savant's itemization really hard that game, but I really think what really broke the game for. Bedboom was the Ancient Apparition. Because mm -hmm. uh, Savan, I know how Nightfall thinks about Dota. He thinks his Dota is like, I have this many moves with this hero. So Refresher gives him two moves where if they, I get Refresher BKB, I kill one person, I refresh, I can kill another person. I get a second Satanic so I can never die. Or when he got A, blasted and engraved, what usually happens is he just like Satanics and kills them all. But the A blast made sure that he only had one turn. So each team fight, once he gets jumped, he's out of the entire team fight. And since Nightfall couldn't be the hard carry in this game that just killed everyone within like 10 seconds, reset, and kill people again, they couldn't win this game once they got late game. It was a very, very hard ask to afford Bad Boom to win. They came very close. Some of them came very close. A couple of creeps close, actually. Uh, but that mid lane is something that we want to continue talking about. And that's not going to be us, but it's going to be Purge. Thank you, Shiver. Yeah, uh, we just saw Makoto's Wind Ranger in the last game. Uh, he's talked about a lot as an excellent player, but we're going to dive a little bit deeper into some interesting facts about him as a player. Uh, in fact, uh, he started playing professionally since 2017, joined Talon in 2021, but didn't really have a super successful year until this year. Well, at least as good as you can do when Gaming Gladiators and Team Liquid wins every single tournament. Um, and other than that, he got third place in Lima Major. Uh, they got fourth place in Dream League Season 20, which was a great result, but their best was definitely Riyadh Masters. Placing third place broke them out of uh, Team Liquid currently, or, or Gaming Gladiators previously gatekeeping them, and they did so good at that tournament that Makoto managed to win the MVP uh, prize despite getting third place overall, which was excellent for him. Um, but uh, when I was at Riyadh, I asked him what hero did he want in the meta that wasn't currently popular, and he told me Invoker. Uh, to say it's been buffed since then is an understatement. It's very powerful right now, and he's played it three times so far in their matches. Uh, he's 2-1, and one, his GPM's excellent, and he had a really good series against Vivo Keed Stars, especially. Um, he's very able to take advantage, pressure the map, get things done with his team, and he's not greedy at all. Very good at getting things done. But it doesn't just have to be Invoker. I mean, he's played uh, 11 different heroes in 14 games, so he's got huge variety. Um, he outlaned Nisha in this Kunkka game when uh, Nisha was Primal Beast. A lot of people say Nisha is the best player in the world, so that was an excellent performance. But it's not just him. His team does play around him very effectively. Here's a game he was playing Zeus. Look at this early TP, four minutes in to guarantee a kill on Nisha. It's not just Makoto, but he is a huge threat and a part of a big reason that they won game number one. Thank you very much, Purge. Uh, a lot of interesting th stuff about Mikoto and definitely a player to watch, uh, not just uh, the series, but in the future as well. And that game was, uh, was an incredibly crazy match. And we heard Sindarin talk about some major mistakes happening on both sides. What do you think, Fear? Was uh, trying to not defend the, the creeps that were there? Was that one of Bad Boom's ones? Yeah, I mean, we talked about how Talon was like better in the late game, but they still had a couple windows where they could have won this game. And that last fight, like they kill 23. He did not have buyback. They go down mid, they take the barracks, right? They go for two tier fours. And then I think what they're gonna go back to the replay and really regret there is the fact that they stuck around. They pop the BKB, they pop the God Shrink, they try to throne, but all of a sudden that doesn't work. They die while Spectre's still dead. If they would have just backed out there and been a little more patient, this could have been their game. So even though the draft was good for Talon, they still had at least one chance in that game. Do you think that when we saw Bulg, you know, he, he was he was not happy with him, was that that moment, you think? Probably, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, we're gonna What's win, just please, doing? just back, guys, just back. We can win this game, but that's TI for you. Sometimes, like, you're hitting the throne, we're doing it, we're gonna win, we're gonna win, but, like, you're a little too far ahead of yourself. A little too far ahead of themselves. I mean, Bedroom is, uh, is an explosive team, and what's in a name as well, but uh, but also emotionally, and there's a, there's a lot to learn from, from games like these. And speaking of learning from Bedroom, we are gonna learn a little bit more about Bedroom. Последний матч с Nightbanas is very important. Мое мнение, мы взяли немножко не тех героев, которые должны были, поэтому как-то все пошло максимально не по нашему плану. 
So what happened? Uh, I mean, we, want, we basically wanted to kill Tormentor like before they go to our base. I mean, I kind of knew like we can't do it. Like Toronto said, like let's do it. And I am me like okay, like fuck it, let's go. And uh, and then we just died us too. Uh, oh, are you serious? Uh, like uh, Tormentor is way too strong. No, the игру уже было в принципе сложно выиграть, но завершилась она очень забавно. Мы уже все хахавали в конце. What can you say after a moment like that? That's uh, all you can do is smile and just accept reality, Effie. <laughs> That's yeah. all you can do. I mean, seeing them say that they were laughing about it and they're talking about it already as a joke, a joke that's running in their team is really good to see because, I mean, maybe the Bat Boom in the days of old, Bat Boom earlier in the year would have taken that incredibly seriously and not been able to bounce back from it. And TI is all about bouncing back from games that you could have won because if you look at any game from an objective perspective, any team could say, we could have won at this point, we could have done this better, and it just doesn't happen. You need to have the men mental fac faculties able to forget about moments like that. So the laughs are good. The funniest thing about that Tormentor death is that was his only death on Nightfall <laughs> in the game, in the game that they lost, which makes it even funnier. But the, the way that they, that they deal with the Moon, I mean, I, I guess as a coach especially, you want to see that kind of camaraderie after a moment like that, right? All you can do is, you know, guys, yeah. at least you know it's never going to happen again. Yeah, you just like meme about it when you lose, try not to be too emotional after each loss. Like Dota 2 is uh, evolved in such a way that it's such a strong mental game that if you take it each loss too hard and you get stuff gets toxic, the environment gets really bad, 100p losing game two. <laughs> Now, we all know, speaking of emotional teams, Bad Boom is considered one of the more emotional teams out there. Can they recover from something like this? From th this game loss, I mean. Hmm. GPK does have a very good reputation for not giving up, so uh, I think they'll be fine game two. Uh, they, are, uh, they are definitely <laughs> having a rough time. One game down, he's obviously, there's a little bit of sarcasm in that, guys. Um, but yeah, Bad Boom is on the edge of elimination. Let's hear what they have to say to themselves. If we were one game of elimination and before we go back to the stage, I would say to my team, guys, it's okay. Uh, even if we lose, it's not end of the life. Like, just just remember the basic things we do every game and uh, do not try to do more than you can. Yeah, in the game, try it. Like, be more calm. Calm. Oh, it sounds so simple. Be more calm. Everybody should be more calm. It's good for your heart. It's good for the Dota, apparently, as well. Uh, I wanted to do a thing when I have both Fear and Moon on, on the panel here. We got a little bit of time before the next game because I want to have a, a coach off. We got two teams, one on the winning team, one on the losing team, of course, at the moment. Uh, since Moon is the guest, uh, Moon, which team would you like to coach here for, for going forward into game two? I will have Fear take the other one. Game you already two, asked uh, this question. He already made his choice. Yeah, I was gonna say I said Bad Boom game one, but now I want to go game <laughs> I two. I know you want uh, <laughs> you, 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 talent what? game two because I feel like the Bad Boom move might be a little heated right now yeah, after losing the game. Oh, you're, gonna flip -flop? Yes. you're gonna flip flop? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I, I'm gonna go to the talent. The winning move is always fun to be like, woo, game one, no more elimination. We got extra life now. Let's go game two. It's gonna be fun and three three Savage gonna crack some jokes. So yeah. It's good, just ride the vibes that the team has. Basically, low effort coaching right there. Fear, you can do better if <laughs> you're Bad Boom's coach. I mean, for sure. Like, I'm going to be Bad Boom's coach here, and I think I'm just going to start at the draft first. I'm not going to first pick a dazzle for them. It's not really their style. I'm going to give GPK a hero that he can rotate on and be like, you know, GPK, I know you're a very positive guy. Let's keep the positivity. We're going to go into this game here. We're going to give you a hero that can make rotations on. Pure is going to do his thing, be high net worth. And, you know, as Nightfall, same thing as always. Just go back to what wins you games because you are the best team in the world. You just got to stick to what you do. Yeah, this is a, it's a, it's a painful moment potentially for Bad Boom. This is the first ever uh, international appearance for four teams from the region, four Eastern European teams. And yesterday we already saw Nine Pandas going home. 
And we, we of course, have Team Spirit uh, in the upper bracket. We got Virtus Pro playing later today as well. But it would be a shame if it's only Team Spirit making it to the top eight. I think, Effie, there's a lot of pride about being considered the top dog in the region. And I think Bad Boom always considered themselves. And on the records, they show that they should be up there. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you hear from any of these players, they always think that they should be performing better than their results speak for. And if you look at terms of pure skill, every single one of these players is probably top three in the world mechanically at what they do. And I feel like they definitely have set a very high standard for themselves. And when they don't meet that standard, that's where a lot of the anxiety comes in, I think, for these superstar teams when we see them crumble on stages. But I will say that they've done very well this year in terms of you know, shaping up their discipline. You, you saw the progress. You saw the evolution throughout the year. It started off really rocky at Lima, and then you know, Berlin was a little bit better. And then in the Dream Leagues, they've done really well. So I'm going to believe in the constant evolution. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say they can bounce back. But Lacoste, Talon, one game up. Speaking of momentum, this is a team that thrives on it. Absolutely. I mean, this is also a team that did manage to make a great comeback at Riyadh Masters when, you know, after what happened uh, with the 23 Savage, hands off keyboard, they're, they're already like, yeah, we, we won that game. And still, I thought they were going to be mentally, like, checked out completely, but they still managed to knock out the Nine Pandas and also Gaming Gladiators after the tournament, still lost the Liquid, but they're in a really good spot. I'm a little worried, not little, more worried about uh, Betboom because none of the teams so far in the lower bracket of TI hasn't managed to win a second game. If you lose game one, it's going to be a 2-0. This is the seventh series in the lower bracket. That is true. It's a painful stat, but you know, there's, there's always one team that's going to have to make the difference. There's one team that's going to have to be the one to force out a third game. Can Bet Boom do it? That's a question we're going to have answered in game two. Talon Esports versus Bet Boom Team, game two. Now, there's always a lot of adaptation to think about when you are on the losing side, Fear, but we've got Talon sitting on the winning side. Uh, I know that they thrive on, on you know, 70-minute games or so, and um, that surely is not part of the plan, though. Maybe it is. I, I'm not sure it's not part of the plan. Do you see how their supports are itemizing? They're both going Midas's really early on. I think they're playing for that late game. Okay, so you're like, this is everything according to plan. We, we aimed to, you know, win at minute 60. You would not buy two Midas's on both your supports if you didn't want to scale into the late game. So they have a very clear idea of how they want to play the game. And I think it's a pretty correct idea, too, for the most part. It's more of like... It's greed versus aggression, and we saw in the earlier series where Gaiman completely exposed Nine Pandas for the greed, and can Betboom do that to Talon? Because if you do play for this late the game, you do buy the Midas's, then you're going to be in a situation where it's going to be very hard to lose the games if their opponent is not also doing that, or they're not pressuring you. Mm -hmm. Well, we are in the draft here. Oh, sorry, Effie, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to comment on what Fear said in his impromptu coaching session about <laughs> PK's hero. Yeah. But the last fight really did come down to towards that late game. Uh, who could take the fight better? Who had more reach? Who could initiate? And Talon had so much of it, whereas Betboom were very dependent on Sven's initiation and with the follow-up with the Ravage. And normally you have GPK on these high-reach heroes like Storm Spirit or Lina with the Yules, anything like that that can help take the fight. And I think that if that's a pivot that Betboom can make here in this draft, maybe play their Caudal Storm or their Io Storm, then this, this could be the thing that tips them out of their, their mental tilt or their supposed present mental tilt. I love the, the Weaver Band Moon. That's a unusual first phase ban. That's a lot of respect towards Jabs. That, I mean, surely that is the reason why they ban it out. I feel like they ban it just because they were tilted from last game. <laughs> okay. uh, it's just like... You lost an hour-long game against Talon, where they have two Midas's. They dodge you for 50 minutes with your tights event. You're trying to take any fight, they wouldn't give it to you. Then you have you can't go high ground. So this time, this time they banned the Dazzle because they don't want to play that game anymore. If I'm Bed Boom, what I've been thinking about is, let's play. They want to play a long game. Let's play a long game as well and try to outskill them. Let's not try to do like some Dazzle tight death ball against this team because this is not how you want to beat Talon. I feel like I think you want to beat Talon by having three stronger late game cores. So that if they took in turtle all they want, they're not going to win late game. So what you're saying is, get your snacks ready, it's going to be a long one. 
That's why I'm feeling like... <laughs> I want to add to that. I actually asked Moon a question about the new drafting stage. What goes through like the team's preparation now that the drafting stage has changed so much? You have these four bands in segment, three bands. Is it like just a chess match with each single band, or do you still prepare where you just know what you're going to ban ahead of time? So there's a couple of strategies going into uh, drafting on first pick and second pick. There's, uh, for first pick, you, uh, you kind of want to just like make sure that the second pick doesn't get a trade. You usually get three free bands. You can ban whatever you want. And on the second pick, you have two choices. Either A, ban all the OPs, or B, uh, get a trade. Like, in this case, I think they're going to get a Spirit Breaker trade. Oh, no, they don't have a Spirit Breaker trade. So they get Jab, Stormbreaker for probably Morta, stuff like that. Yep. I love this Dawnbreaker, especially when Jabs plays it, because he's also a farm-heavy player, and with, with Dawnbreaker, you can have something to join a team fight. You don't necessarily need to be there. Again, on the greedier side, and also when we talk about scaling, Dawnbreaker is insane hero when it comes down to scaling, dealing damage. Uh, we talked about uh, this Tusk combo. I think uh, he needs to go. We also talked about uh, how Q, he plays these melee position fours that synergize really well. Tusk, definitely that hero. Yeah, this Tusk Dawn lane is uh, really, really strong. Not only that, but you have the ability to snowball your mid lane with the Tusk. You have the ability to gank mid and snowball Mikolo's lane. So I'm pretty sure it has to be taken out. And if I'm Talon, I'm looking to ban Silencer. So that uh, the reason why Silencer counters Dawn is Dawnbreaker now has to play with his team. You just trade Silencer ulti for every Dawn ulti, and now you, Dawnbreaker will never ever uh, yeah. skill. By the much. way, we don't call it Dawn ulti, we call it Donald. Don? Donald, yeah. It's, Donald, it's the I theme. see. <laughs> So Invoker actually still in the pool. This is a really popular hero for both GPK and Mikoto, and it could give that early game aggression that we were talking about, that ability to rotate, something that they're looking at here. I would be surprised if Ign Invoker goes unignored. Well, so far, the, the Phoenix has been banned on the side of Talon, and also I want to say Talon has already used a lot of their bonus time in this, in this phase, in considering their first pick. Uh, maybe maybe slightly unusual there as well. Yeah, I think they're thinking of banning like Luna or Spectre because mm -hmm. those heroes are also very strong against Dawn, and um, they can't really decide which one. Like Shadow, like Shadow Demon. Demon. So they left Silencer, which is interesting because now Bebu has the option to remove uh, Dawnbreaker's global, which I feel like is uh, the reason why Japs really shines on this hero. So you can just farm in like the carry and stuff. So, but we'll then see. you do have a silencer, and other than the cancellation of the Don, sorry, the Donald, <laughs> is is that is that is that good to have? I guess infinite scaling if you're going late. Mm -hmm. Sure. I think Toronto Tokyo has a hero pool that he's shown that he prefers to play. Right, the train protectors, the vengeful spirits, the undyings. He wants to have laning presence, and maybe the silencer takes that away from them, which is why they're not looking at it too much. I mean, Undying is a very in-your-face hero, right? Undying versus a melee hero on the offlane is always going to be difficult. You have to pair it up with a really strong four, and the way that, you know, Q's been playing all of these melee fours, maybe it's going to be a lot more difficult to do that with an Undying. So I, I do think the Undying is probably one of the best things they could have picked up here. Yeah, hmm. uh, they picked the Undying there because they didn't want to take Silencer because they wanted to commit Murta to the core. Mm. So by picking the Silencer, that means Murta has to be a four because you don't only want Silencer Murta laying against Dawnbreaker. So now with the Undying pick of the Murta, they should know it's a Murta core now. So what Talon is thinking is, do we click the Spectre on 18 or do we click it here? Because I think this, they want to remove that option. Is it still in your head uh, flexible Murta or you're like, they Theor should put it on the Theoretically, it's flexible. That's why they probably should spec the 18. Rather yeah. than pick the Spectre here, should probably just pick a casual support. Whatever Q wants to play is Earthshaker, Tiny, Dark Willow. Willow. Yeah, they yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I like this. I, I just have to say, if you're laning versus Undying and you have two melee heroes on that lane, it is so difficult. You're making the game harder for yourself for no reason. So you bust out the Enchantress that can be flexed to either, and the Willow that has surprisingly been a carry flex these days, but yes. if you pair, pair this Willow with the Dawnbreaker, that is a very strong lane in and of itself, and you're also taking away one of Save's best heroes, which is... Oh, excuse me. Hello. Um, well, Moon. There's a Whoa, Please talk to me about here? Pudge. Okay, so this, this Batboom team. Yes. We scream them a lot. 
we cannot beat their pudge. It's safe on the pudge normally, right? It's either safe on the pudge or uh, pure on the pudge. We okay. don't know what it is, but it was just really cancer to deal with. And it can be safe on an invoker with the pudge off lane. It can be the pudge off lane with the invoker mid. You don't with the or you can be the pudge off lane with the murder four of the invoker mid. You don't know what's going on. You just look at those four heroes. It's kind of scary. Wow, we're getting a lot of surprise picks here. Yeah, we oh, are. Ricky is now coming out. Yeah. We saw you guys were running the Ricky yeah. mid versus like Puck, we, right? Similar. We are one of the Ricky teams in this tournament because this hero um, counters Invoker really hard because Invoker will never be able to get a cold snap EMP combination or tornado EMP yeah. combination against Ricky because of his third spell. On top of that, Ricky the stacks Wraith Bands, has high HP ar uh, regeneration and armor to get every single last hit and deny against Invoker. So he gets an early defusal blade and just takes over the whole map. And the silence is really annoying too, right? If you're Invoker, you're forced to buy BKB or forced off early on just so you can play into the Ricky silence. Sounds pretty difficult. But also, I, I want to talk about this Pudge just a tiny bit because a lot of players have been experimenting with flexing Willow to position one, but one of the heroes that completely dominates Willow position one would be a Pudge with the Aghanim Scepter. He's just way too tanky when he gets that Ags on that heart and he's just on top of her. She can't do anything, so I, I'm pretty sure this is just a support Willow at this point. But it's Talon, who knows? I, I don't want to say anything too early. And also Ricky Shard, I mean, this is a bit of an undervalued one where you cannot be saved. Sure, you have Hook in this one, but these four staffs, they're not working. So you need to be able to take care of yourself, pop a BKB. It's a very interesting pick, and uh, I, I might be a little worried for the damage output coming out from Talon early on until, like, Ricky gets online. But uh, they do have uh, relatively strong lanes. This Dawnbreaker plus Dark Willow, if they're going to run it as a position four, which I think they should, it looks really strong. Like, yeah. this is a killer lane for them. I mean, I wouldn't be too worried about Talon's damage output because you do have, a, you know, Dark Willow, Enchantress. They might buy some Midas's here and there, and eventually these heroes can do a lot of damage scaling if they want to go that route. And it comes down to, is it a 23 hero? Okay. Oh, this is, like, just surprises everywhere. All right. I know what, <laughs> I know what Talon's doing, guys. All right. What so are they doing? They switched up their game plan completely. From turtling late game, they want to just run at Bet Boom now. Oh. They want to destroy yeah. him Ricky from against Invoker mid. Uh, Ench, Marcy, uh, Ench, Marcy, Sable, and the Marcy carry with the Ench pushing Temple with the, to the mid lane. With the Dark Willow Dawnbreaker with the Dawnbreakers connecting to every team fight, every LTG snowballing the whole game out of control. So who did you say was going to be mid for Talon? Ricky. Ricky mid. Ricky sure. mid. Marcy carry with the Ench. Marcy carry is very strong because she gets she gets Battle Fury. Yep. Then she gets her Aghanims and she's a universal hero. So she gets universal hero scaling. What and a very strong laner. Here? Marcy lost a lot of damage from her sidekick though. Like I, I feel like Marcy carry used to be a lot better when the sidekick was a reliable amount of in, insane damage outputs. But now it's it's mild. It's mild. You, you have to compensate for that with items, but I mean, if you're playing super aggressive with your Ricky and you've got the tempo, you're gonna have the farm to get those items. If this is gonna be Marcy Carey, she has one weakness. If this hero is pushed out of the lane early on, you can't really farm the jungle. Compared to some other carries, you know, these Sven's, it's uh, almost impossible to keep up. So he needs to have a good laning stage. What you wanna do is get those skills, get level six, uh, keep that damage going and uh, keep fighting. Because if you're not fighting, you can't farm the jungle. And on the side of Betboom, I see Pudge, Invoker, Muerta. These heroes are really good at rotating and finding Muerta, sorry, finding Marcy in the jungle and getting the kills on her. I am incredibly curious to see what Bethlehem moves, because you mentioned yeah. this could be Pudge and Boker technically awfully, right? Yeah. Which means they could pick a mid that dumpsters Ricky, like, I don't know, some Necro or something, and does that just ruin the game plan of Talon if you have, like, a mid laner who just can't do much? Well, it's a good thing for Bedboom that they had some bonus time left to eat into, because there is indeed a lot of things to talk about for sure. and to think about after the last trick coming out for Talon. It will be an IO! All right, riddle me that, please. All right, so I'm we got lost. the pure. I, I, all, all right, moon. we got the pure off lane pudge. We got the mid invoker. Save position four will be the IO. So we got the IO pudge lane. They changed it and put the dark willow carry of the Marcy five. Oh yeah. Yeah. Ooh. So and it's Q enchanted to the downbreaker. So they wanted to put dark willow carry against the Morta. And the reason why Dark Willow carries against Morta is because every time Morta alties and Dark Willow Ws, the Morta can shoot the Dark Willow. Yeah, but I feel like there's so much AoE damage for this Willow carry. I mean, it's not 
a great Willow game on paper. You've got this Pudge who has an IO to completely buff him the entire game with the shard, and then you've got all the ground damage coming from Invoker. And this Willow is very susceptible to dying in this game, so it's very scary. It does seem very scary. I mean, we also have only seen Shiro be successful with the Willow on the carry role, so... And he had a Broodmother opening up the entire map yeah. for him so that he went untouched the entirety of this game. And it doesn't look like the same formula is here for Talon for yeah. the Willow carry. You already suit. said that the Pudge can deal with it. Later yeah. on in the game, yeah, And absolutely. infinite scaling Lacoste. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is going to be... I mean, who's going to buy time for Dark Willow? That's my... Concerned, Ricky. He need like it has to be Mikoto again with his uh, early defusal timing going around the map because this RC5, I haven't been really impressed by the hero. So they need to snowball out of the laning stage really hard if they want to win this one. Now we have been saying there's been majority of two O's coming out from this lower bracket, but one series that didn't was of course the other Eastern European matchup with uh, Virtus Pro and Team Spirit. Maybe Bedboom can also be one that can break the curse and force out a game three. Definitely is looking good for them in the draft. Let's find out what the coach has to say before we head into the game. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm standing by with Bulk and Maelstrom will be helping me to translate. Game number one, plus 68 minutes. How do you get your team to recover after a game like that? It seemed even uh, we got a shot of the couch cam in the coach area. You were stressed out yourself. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Come on, guys. He was stressed. Let's help him out a little bit. Я даже не знаю, что сказать, потому что я видел, как моя команда играет. Я слышал voice и Ребята сильно стрессовали в игре. Я, соответственно, тоже поймал этот вайб. И было очень тяжело смотреть на эту игру, потому что мы допускали очень глупые ошибки. Сильно расстраивались от них. Как бы игра была, вышла очень не по нашему сценарию. А после игры мы просто обсудили, что сделали банальные ошибки, которые, если бы мы не допускали, то игра была бы намного проще. So it's really hard to say. We just, I just saw that uh, my team uh, made a lot of mistakes and uh, they uh, were stressed out and uh, we just discussed a little bit about our uh, mistakes and now we're ready to play. And then you picked a crowd pleaser of Pudge. Of course we're going to be excited about this, right guys? Set for game number two! Set it to our casters! The crowd pleaser always there. Pudge, Marcy, Ricky, we fell into a different patch. I don't know what's yeah. going on. I uh, I have never felt more like a, a pub game draft than this one. Oh, that got really red. Somebody must have. Oh, no. <laughs> First blood given up. Bet boom, lose their muerta. Well, uh, that was a bit of a spoiler. That happens. <laughs> oh, I, I like the aesthetic, though. That is just, you're just on camera, like, everything just went red while we're talking to you guys. I feel like that's what happens in your brain every time it's you and Suns fan, and he, like, says something Oh, crazy. yeah, I mean, the, light, the lights are red all the time when I'm casting with him, but, you know, <laughs> with you, it's only situational. Yeah, okay, so to, to elaborate a little bit on what I was saying, there's a lot of pub favorite heroes here, right? As we are going to see the replay at this point of what just transpired. Yeah, a lot of pub favorites and one of them right there. Ollie able to get the pullback uh, onto and through the Brambles. Okay, it's one thing to get a Pudge pick and you're like, oh, wow, they picked Pudge. And then the immediate response is Ricky. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's the other thing for me. It's not just that there was a Pudge. It's that both teams are really going off script here and trying something completely different. And it's always fun to see. It's It feels like when, when you see a draft like this, you're always... It's really high risk, high reward for both. Teams. Right, right. So it's oh, nice hook. Man, oh. That's one that you want to see right away. Finding 23, but can't quite do enough. And exposed from Ollie forces him back. Still a lot of damage onto that Dark Willow. You know, it's interesting because when we saw the Pudge pick, uh, save for a moment, you could see he looked pretty happy. But then the Ricky pick came out, and then immediately looked pretty crushed. Um, <laughs> I, I'm wondering if they had this intention of picking the IO for a while, and Makoto is kind of an answer to that in a, in a way. It, it seems like it's going to be a really uh, tough matchup. Oh! Sometimes you just stand still, and then he can TP out. I think Save just wanted to play Ricky himself. OK. And it got picked by the enemy team, and it was like, oh. That's all I wanted in my TI main stage. <laughs> I just wanted to play Ricky Punch. <laughs> oh, man. 
Yeah, that's going to be interesting to see. So to unpack a little bit about the laning stage here, um, Pior, hang on. Is he going to go down? A couple more hits in Dead. trouble and 23 Savage off to a hot start. So I would say this is one of Dawnbreaker's absolute worst lane matchups down bottom. The Undying is really hard to play against. Uh, and Talon identified how important that is going to be, and they actually ended up putting Q on Ench to solve this. So specifically, one team counterpicked a lane core with a support, and then the other team countered the five with a four. Mm. So it's a pretty interesting dynamic that we see very rarely right now, but it shows a very good understanding on both sides of they know how important this Dawnbreaker is from the way Talon is going to play, and therefore both teams are really trying to protect it a lot with the draft. Um, what happened after that, I cannot really explain how that plays into the whole thing with the whole Pudge and the Ricky. I think there's a lot of surprise going on here for both teams. I think Pudge is good against Willow, um, so perhaps that is a part of the logic here was that they were expecting a core Willow. Um, but I mean, you say that, they're off to a good start top on the Willow Marcy lane, so absolutely. And I like this little play that we've been seeing. The the dispose into Bramble. Oh my He's God. really fat, so he walked through another one. And they managed to get another kill onto Pure. That is not the way he wanted this to go. It is a really cool pairing with Willow. Any hero that has displacement abilities is so interesting because you can get people to hit multiple Brambles, right? That's Bramble Maze is kind of balanced around you getting hit by it once and how much yeah. damage it does. So if you have a hero that can force the enemy team to get hit by two or even three, suddenly this hero is just one of the strongest laners in all of Dota, right? Because Bramble Maze level one does how much damage is it on one? Like, I want to say, let's say 150 or whatever. You get yeah. three of those. No, oh, it's, it's kind of a done deal. No, it's dangerous for sure. Um, and the other thing that we can sort of keep in mind, uh, it was talked about, and I think that they showed this little graphic too at the beginning. Um, this is the first time that they're playing Undying on Bet Boom this entire tournament as well. So yeah. a little bit of a change just in style in general for them. We'll see if they're going to be able to contend with that Enchantress on Q and all the creeps that they're going to be throwing his way. And he's definitely going to feel comfortable with the hero itself. I would say this was probably Toronto Tokyo's single best hero last patch uh, before some of the changes came uh -oh. through. Again, so, they cat him. Another he's strong this time, though. But all, oh, yeah. Save pops the salve, and that does crying. create some issues. Two bracers, overcharge. It's hard to kill. Big boy. Okay. Big and boy I finds a hook. Nothing else. Yeah. A 3 0 start, but going to be an interesting match as it does feel like Things after. On bottom. Oh, can they go on him? Toronto Tokyo wants to chase. The pushback, that's a good one with Deadshot, but Celestial Hammer means Jabs gets away. And of course, this is going to happen if Enchantress leaves the lane for any amount of time. It did cost them the Tombstone, though. So Jabs is going to have a little moment of opportunity here. Maybe they'll make an aggressive move with the Ench coming in. Oh, and he's found the Mana Burn Creep. Just going to make Toronto Tokyo basically useless until he goes back to base here. Has burned him down to 50 mana. Undying with no mana is just nothing, you know? <laughs> it, it's a melee support that's kind of kind of slow. Dude so. has Wind Lace. <laughs> yeah. It's real bad. So going to be curious to see what he chooses to do now on the Undying if he's going to go back to base. He's sending out one Clarity, a Raindrop, and a Blood Grenade. So it's going to take him quite a bit of time to get his mana back up with just a Clarity, no Mangoes. And in the meantime, the movement in towards mid to try and see if they can hunt a GPK. They brought three heroes total with Makoto in tow. Yeah, they have the Purge Creep. And a good can one. they get an angle? G I mean, GPK knows that this is happening. It's the six minute mark, runes are coming out. It does look like it's gonna spawn top with an illusion. And a good job by the invoker to stay pretty far back. Yeah, he played it very safe there as he should. So nothing gained out of that movement yet. They are still hanging around that area though. And instead the wraparound is going up top. Makoto, yeah, this one's going to be less expected, I think. Diving this tier one tower this early. Oh, and then pulls him back into the cloud. That's really nice. Didn't quite get the Bramble connection, but save, trying to escape, needs another hit. Point three Savage in very far, and now Pure right on top of him. They're trying to buy some time. The hook, it does land. 23 gets lifted up. Nice tornado, and Ollie also going to fall. GPK with the clutch rotation is down bottom. They're chasing jabs. Tombstone on him. Starbreaker hits. Jabs wanting to make his way through the gate to escape. Still has stick charges as they pull him back in with the fear. Jabs hammer jumps away. Does he get out of there? 18 HP and he's out. Oh no. Never mind. <laughs> he got passed. 
Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not quite sure what Nightfall was going for, dead shotting him there. Uh, maybe he feels like it's the last opportunity he's going to get to reliably hit it before the Celestial Hammer gets him away. But ideally, you want to hit that afterwards, right? So you can just fear him back into you when he's jumping out. Yeah. It ended up working with the decay, but that was pretty close. Um, still, it's a big kill for them, and I want to say overall in quite a few of Bedboom's games as of as of late, GPK has not necessarily been off to the hottest of starts. This is a good one for him. So the oh, Invoker no, no. having a great start here. He shows up and Pure didn't stand a chance. They brought in a lot of people for that kill and save trying to escape. They throw out the Terrorize. He's still running that direction. So that won't actually help, but uh, okay. <laughs> Makoto tricks the trade. No, good cold snap there to ensure that he couldn't dodge it. No mana now on the Ricky. I think he wanted to show them that he can hit it if he needs to. Okay. It's a mental play for later. Yeah. If they're ever like, oh, I'm hearing terrorize, they know it's coming and they know it's a hit. And it's about whether it matters or not. That's a different story. That one did not matter. Oh. Oh. It's a similar idea for the hooks as pure. <laughs> one out there on the now, this doesn't send the same message. If you no. throw out a hook and miss that, that okay. does not work the same as throwing out a terrorize that hits and doesn't kill him. To be fair, is playing around this ward, which has gotten them a lot of value. I think that's two hooks now that have been dodged because of it. Yeah, it's a very standard thing to do against uh, side lane fudge is to get that vision. Uh, you could argue that Bet Boom should be checking for this with a sentry. I think that would be a, a quite decent investment with the side lane and how this has been played so far. But if nothing else, the farm is still looking okay for pure. He has three deaths, but his net worth is still looking relatively healthy. He's still ahead of the Dawnbreaker, right? Uh, to start, and as we mentioned, the Invoker mid is the big breadwinner right now. Rushing a vessel is going to be GPK. He has it in 100 gold. And there's some decent vessel kill targets here, right? You're countering the lifesteal of Marcy's sidekick, you're countering the heal of Ench, and you're countering the heal of Luminosity from the Dawnbreaker. So all of these little things that sometimes make a bigger difference than you would think are going to make a very small one now. Make them that much less strong uh, against the the fighting that's coming his direction. Um, there was a courier kill a while ago on save, which is why he wasn't able to do too much there as far as bringing out wards, I think. But Pure is making the move through after stacking up and taking that other hard camp. Um, already has phase boots done and looking for an opening. Makoto is down bottom, does see all of this play and all well, four heroes. Do they decide to bring numbers? They're going to TP in one. The Cloud down, interrupting their fight. Now the Dawnbreaker ult coming in. Jabs wanting to get on to Nightfall, but there's no follow-up. Still good AoE damage. The dead shot, ooh, almost into the hook. Instead, it's Toronto Tokyo that's held behind. That is honestly a really good result for Bet Boom because when Ricky has that good of a placement, he gets all the information possible and starts off with the smoke screen. The Brambles just have to hit there, right? Yeah. From 23, and he missed on all of the potential targets, so they got to disengage. That could have got really, really scary for Bet Boom. So I would say, given the circumstances, I would count that as a win, only losing your five there. Well, the Midas tracker, at least in this game so far, is only going to be at one for the Willow, which does feel like it fits pretty well with what you want to be doing. Yeah. Ollie, in the meantime, does need to back out. Uh, no mana and, and had rebound on cooldown. <laughs> it's funny because usually, you know, at a tournament like TI, when the meta develops and teams get used to certain things, when you throw a complete curveball like this, I'm very curious to see how Bedboom just adjusts to playing against just Ricky in general. Like, yeah. let's say everything in the game is the same as always, but now there's a Ricky. The style of play is just so different. And when Mikoto is off the map on this hero compared to what he usually plays, the dynamic is just, yeah. You know, you're kind of getting paranoid. You know, how are you going to place your heroes? Are you going to over-rotate for protection? And there's, you know, you start seeing ghosts when there's nobody even there. Makoto's just farming jungle, you know? Um, it's a very unique hero in that regard. And the Dawnbreaker combo is just super scary. When Ricky gets Diffusal Blade, he can just go on any hero, diffuse them in smoke screen, and they use Dawnbreaker ulti. And with that Solar Guardian connecting, you're killing, I think, any hero in the game. Well, and right now, too, there's no Force Staffs, but eventually it's a nice dodge by Jabs. There's also the, the threat of the Ricky Shard. Yep, absolutely. Which we have not even talked about or seen that much in competitive play. This hero's yeah. been super dead. And even if you play this hero as mid, I think Ricky has a tendency to not be that high on net worth because he doesn't have the best way of farming. So he's more likely to receive the Shard, I guess. That is a very dead Toronto Tokyo. Didn't stand a chance. Got Marseed. There's just something about Marcy's face after she punches you 
<laughs> that hard. Like, this she's girl just smiling. absolutely obliterates you. You just look at her, she's just smiling, you know? <laughs> it's like a Tarantino movie. It's like this nice, happy music playing while somebody's getting killed. That's what this reminds me of. It is a little like, bit oh, that's horrific. Nice, you know? <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, your, your uncanny valley. Something about it. Yeah. And the, I mean, Don't judge a book by its cover. To be honest, it's similar from Enchantress. They they kind of have it going with both of them. True. Makoto sees the stack being made. He is in a. The, this is a precarious spot. He's under a Sentry Ward. But I mean, this is the problem. How do you kill this guy? He's just sitting here, and they can't do anything about it. He's gathering a lot of information. Mid Tower will be almost taken out by Enchantress on her own. So. Oh, Bedlam Ricky. I hadn't even thought of that. True. Bedlam is also nice here. Uh, I don't know how this works. With Tricks of the Trade? Yeah. I would imagine it stays right on top, but we'll so see. So if I'm you sure. Bedlam Ricky and he jumps into Dawn and Dawn ults globally <laughs> onto an Ench Creep. <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, right. <laughs> well, for now, uh, Bet Boom, they're going to relocate and set up for the kill on the jabs. Nice but stack of flesh heap there for sure. That should set up for the mid tower going down, though, yeah. Q takes that one away. So. Here, is that a full axe? No. It's, uh, I was like, he got really far. So he has half the axe. Okay. And break his way up. Full defusal. Uh, Dawn does have Solar Guardian back up again, and Makoto, he, they see this, he jumps, and there it is, Dawnbreaker ultimate right away. Do they have enough to keep him alive? No. It is so difficult to protect against this. In theory, I always one of the best heroes for this, right? But Relocate, they knew it was on cooldown, so a nice little snipe here coming in from Talon, who now ever so quietly have amassed a 3,000 net worth lead in this game. The mid tower obviously plays a part in that, but more than anything, 23 is just completely uncontested on his Dark Willow with Midas, and just clearly out farming the yeah. Muerta. Very close towards that Aghanim Scepter, and again, as Bet Boom, you gotta start thinking like, oh, the smoke there is gonna break onto GPK. They're gonna walk right up the high ground, not that afraid. Makoto is there. <laughs> Get away from me, Hurricane. But you, you got to start to wonder if you're feeling the nerves of recognizing you're one game away from being eliminated from this tournament. You got to get something happening, but you're just losing hero after hero. Makoto thought about going in for more, but doesn't need to. I just realized Dawnbreaker kind of fits the bill, too, for the smiley face that we just talked about. They have three of them. <laughs> Imagine you get ganked by these three heroes. They're just walking away smiling, you know? It's a murderous rampage. <laughs> with a smile on their face. Yep. Oh, that's a dead on dying again. Toronto Tokyo is going to have a rough one. They picked it to win the lane. They kind of didn't. Mm. They, they did fine. I mean, Muerta is definitely enabled here, but this is a s very steep recovery curve for an Undying who has, like, no net worth, right? He has 2k net worth, so does the Wisp. Look at the other side. The net worth differential on the supports is really crucial in yeah. this game. That extra utility item, pure. It's gets the hook. It's get worse. But that is not the hook that they wanted. Makoto's there, too. But they do get the relocate away, and that means Ayo's going to be dead. Yeah. Well. Tough stuff, Cinder, and this is this is looking more and more desperate for Betboom. Is, is there a case where they start to get stronger eventually? Like, is it you see to play around the the Pudge Ags? What's the what's the call now for Betboom? Well, their lineup in essence has one catch that is reliable, and that's Tornado. Right? You can try to play off a hook, but the problem with this Ricky matchup for the Pudge is that you're just scouted a lot of the time, so it's hard to get these surprise plays going. Even if you smoke and you break on the Ricky, Ricky can maybe just escape with Tricks of the Trade smoke screen and get away from you even. So that won't work. I think we're looking at something like, yeah, get the Pudge Ags and look for a smoke move collapsing on the mid tower perhaps. Get something going where Tombstone starts playing a role. Uh, get your Invoker to, to have more of an impact because as we mentioned, GPK was off to a hot start in this game. And since then it really quieted down. He's 2-0 on one. Two of those kills happened at the top tower when Talon dove, minute six. Mm. So there hasn't really been much initiative taken by Bet Boom. And he's about to show on the mid wave with the rest of Talon heading over this direction. Just, oh no. Q. Smoke, save, they're on him right away. Toronto Tokyo already drops down the tombstone. Maybe this could actually work for them with the Dawnbreaker ultimate. Now the tornado comes out. Q, they explode! 
That was the fight that Bet Boom needed, and the hook back in finds jabs. Perfect for that Bet Boom. That is so huge for Bet Boom. That's a 3,000 net worth swing right there. They activate their lineup a lot. This is going to be Pudge Ags. I. I don't know if Jabs had ulti on cooldown or, or if he thought they were going to kill the IO without it, but essentially he waited too long. Ooh. That ended up costing him. That's another one here. Finding 23 Savage. Terrorize, it's not happening. Bet boom. They turn something into nothing, or rather flip that around. <laughs> <laughs> it's Talon that's doing the other one. 2,600 gold swing throughout the course of these couple of minutes here. Wait, save dead? Uh, suddenly, all he shows up and it's gonna find the finish on the save. Wait, Makoto's here too. Hold on, GPK, maybe gonna try and turn this. They get the disarm, but it's not enough. Now he has to run. Maybe it was something and nothing. I don't know. I mean, I guess it's not really surprising that Pudge versus Ricky is making for a chaotic game. I think that's that's just a given, you know? It's gonna be crazy. It's gonna be surprising the way the teams catch each other off guard. And. Now that we've seen this last fight unfold from Talon, I don't think they're going to make the same mistake again. I think if Ricky gets on top of Io, they're going, next time they're going to instantly use Solar Guardian. You just need to get this Wisp out of play so that you can snowball the fight. What ended up happening last time around was that save got to reset and get out, got, sa yeah, got saved by his team, um, and they got those nice three kills out of it. So definitely a little bit of a learning experience there for Talon. Fortunately, these two recovery kills for them kind of salvaged the deal decently. So they're now back up 3k again. Right. I mean, that that like 5k mark of net worth lead is one that really is like a turning point. You get one kill and you're already in the lead. Suddenly the game feels out of hand. Now they're kind of still in that back and forth situation and starting to get into some of these defensive items to help against the Ricky. Muerta has four staff coming out right now. Invoker's trying to build into it too. Yeah. Or rather into the full Hurricane Pike because he already has force. But that's a... That's a really good point about the Ricky Shard, right? Now it's just getting better and better. Yeah. We'll see if Makoto actually chooses to buy it this game instead of hoping to get it from the Tormentor, just because it feels like the way these games or these fights are going to transpire is that he wants to jump somebody, start off the fight and isolate and kill that target and then jump to the next to the next, right? There's no other reliable catch in their team that's going to set him up like a targeted stun or whatever. So there's a lot of the initiative that is on his shoulders. And if he's playing against three, four staffs and they just keep repositioning, he's not really going to get the job done. And it also, in turn, getting that shard makes Dawn's game so much better, right? So you want to enable your teammates like like that. And it's a, it's a relatively small price to pay to pull that off. He'll finish the BKB first, though. 400 to go. Um, and yeah, the, I guess worth mentioning as well, while all this stuff has been happening, Nightfall has quietly taken over the top net worth spot, right? With this death on the Willow. Muerta is starting to get really big. A strong Muerta steps forward, and GPK Invis will find Makoto. Can they do much to him there? Good oh, style. This way didn't hit. Just off the mark with that dead shot. That would have been it. Oh, Sunstrike not quite going to connect, but the Spirit Vessel still burning Makoto down. That was yeah. so close to a clutch kill. That is 100% a kill with a connected dead shot. So. Big escape from Makoto there getting out. I like the way they set it up with the tornado into the calling. Placed really nicely, so Makoto had no chance of getting off. Tricks up the trade, but that was the last time in this game that they're going to be able to pull this combo off because he's going to BKB in 100 gold, and then this play doesn't exist anymore. Up top, finding jabs, relocate in. Got him there, gets bit. Do they have enough? Terrorize out, jabs! He lives for a moment, Solar Guardian, but the tornado for the lift up. That's enough for the kill. Makoto plays cleanup. That's two dead for the price of one. GPK able to escape. Yeah, if you want to, that's that's something Bed Boom's lineup doesn't really do particularly well without Muerta being involved. They don't kill quickly, no. right? They, they don't have any sort of significant burst damage until Invoker maxes out Exhort. So if you're killing someone next to a tower, you bet the rotations are going to come in and, and help out there. So while Jabs does die, he's a very tanky strength hero. It's going to take a while. And the numbers just weren't enough. So two for one for them. And Talon trying to get set up for their late game scenario now. They have a Hand of Midas done on the Enchantress as well as the Willow. Oh boy. So they're at the very least eyeing that future that could come out. And Ricky queuing up the shards, so yeah. Makoto recognizing the value of it. That's going to be so big for them, getting this shard up. It, it, it effectively is, I, I love that Save is already queuing up the Ghost Scepter. He knows what's going on here. Like, yeah. that's this type of game. When Ricky gets Nullifier, Io is going to be 
just terrified the rest of the game, but it's quite a big expense to get that item first, so there will be a nice timing that he feels relatively safe. Makoto hunting for save. They've already dropped the Tombstone down now to secure themselves the Aegis. And with Pierce the Veil, this will happen. Pierce the Veil on that pretty. Yeah, there, there's oh, okay, no way, answer. Buddy. I mean, Nightfall is going to be a problem. That That is something to be pretty concerned about for Talon as Bedboom now maybe starting to eye up a couple more of these towers. Dota really has changed, hasn't it? Ursa is no longer the Roche King. No. Yeah, there's a new queen in town here. Muerta is so fast at killing Roche with a little bit of an amplify there coming in from the Invoker. It is interesting, though, because after you get that Roche kill with Muerta, you have to run away. Yeah. Because you need Pierce the Veil to fight. Yep. Absolutely. There's with Ursa, you can kind of just keep going. Shard going the way here of Q. A really nice one for him to get for free. Getting that Sproink with Pike is very, very nice. He has so much damage. We've talked a lot about the cores. Look at Edge's net worth. Yeah. What in the world, dude? He has the same net worth as the mid invoker <laughs> almost. Edge is a problem. Uh, he Q is huge. He was going to start dealing out a lot of damage, all with the smile on her face. Yep. It's actually. It's really important because Ench has such a good matchup against Pudge, right? So you're running this tanky frontline boy that's meant to tank up the whole thing, but your Flesh Heap isn't particularly useful against Enchantress because her individual damage instances are extremely high, so you're not blocking that much. Uh, it's way more useful against, say, something like some small hits from Dark Willow ulti, for example. Jix right. doesn't do much damage with the Bedlam, but man, this Enchantress is the hero to watch right now for me. This game Q could come up big as he has for Talon minigames this tournament. Uh, we've had analysts singing his praises, saying that when Talon does well, it's Q playmaking super hard on heroes like the Earth Spirit we saw last game. This is a less characteristic playmaking hero in a way, but at the same time, from an early game perspective, it makes a lot of sense that he would love this one, right? It's right. very dominant, pressuring lanes. Well, and I think for a lot of people, you think about what Sproink is, and people are just like, well, you still run into the same problems with Enchantress. You run out of mana, you can't able to do that much, but not really the case in this one. Well, that's a good way to deal with her, though. The Hurricane Pike gets away, and then the Sproink, the jump out, jabs on top of save, hits the stun on a GPK. Now 23 oh, Savage definite. from deep trying to bring down Pure. They relocate him out. Oh, that's a okay. Good, that's a good call, honestly. But Nightfall is now all alone. Okay. They want to chase anymore? No, they're going to get him out. Okay. Yeah, so they have to reload him out. I, I think the Deafening Blast from GPK there kind of saved the whole situation. If that does not fly in when it does, Ollie would have connected the rebound and they might have just killed them off. But at the very least, they reset the fight, get their Pudge out of trouble. And yeah, Muerta coming in for a bit of an ult doesn't really help when there's no lockdown in play. Everybody just kind of runs away. But still, they stabilize the situation, Bet Boom do. And Probably the reward for this might be a top tier two tower. Nightfall really wants to put some pressure here. He still has the Aegis for a while. And it looks like Talon are not particularly interested in holding this one. So we'll go their way. Well, and I, I'm thinking back to what uh, Moon was talking about a little bit during the draft, this matchup that eventually happens of the Dark Willow and the Muerta, and, you know, neither hero really being targetable when they're <laughs> yeah. in their abilities. Um, so it's maybe going to come down to some of these other heroes and see how it works. If Pure can actually stay on top of a target and, uh, you know, shut down this Willow, it'll be something to watch for. But they're smoked up as five. GPK leading the charge, runs right near Jabs. Q all alone. And with the Tornado lift up, Pure there to follow up. Gets the four staff away, but more than enough. That's a pretty big kill. It's a lot of gold for just killing a support. I, I will say the support with Asterisk because he's actually got more net worth than his offlaner. So thinking of the Enchantress as a support is probably wrong in this game. It is a, it's a flat out core kill. They also get the tower. So a nice little sequence here from Betboom. Top tier two, bottom tier one, core kill. Let's see if they can get more out of this Aegis now. 50 seconds left. The wave is coming. No alacrity available though. Invoker is showing mid. There's a TP coming in from 23. And Ricky being on the other side of the map makes this a hard fight for Talon. But we'll throw down the Brambles and start to do some damage. Four staff gets Nightfall away from trouble after the calling. Still no Ricky, still no Invoker. Yeah, Makoto's going to get to work on the Nullifier as expected. GPK spots him. 
now the relocate. BKB, Makoto tries to jump away. Blink strike, but still in vision just to the side. The hunt's there. Can they chase him down? Does not look like it as Makoto gets some separation. Oh, oh, save almost got found on the reload back there, but they weren't quite in position yet. I think they didn't know where the reload kit came from. Pure. He's caught there. Now, hammer, jump, BKB, Pure gets out. Toronto Tokyo, Tombstone down, it's already dead. Makoto will jump before the EMP comes out. Not a ton of mana, good calling. To silence onto two. It's more of this cat and mouse game going on between these two sides. Yeah. Bramble accuracy, again, leaves a lot to be desired here. I feel like 23 has not exactly been on point with them this game. It's it's also, you know, you don't have the most obvious setup. You don't have, like, a clear stun that's just going to make you hit the Brambles. But these moments, if they do connect, it's a very different story. So perhaps needs to be a, just a little bit closer. It is a bit of a range issue some of the times. Yeah. All right, let's see. Bet Boom versus Tormentor. A tale as old as time. Save Will they survive? Time. Oh, save. Oh, no. They survive. All right, he's good. And that... <laughs> Crowd's excited about that one. That will be <laughs> your favorite shard in the game. Grab ally. Oh, is that my call? Okay, yeah. yeah. I, I I can't say it like him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ruin my voice. Grab uh, ally. <laughs> that sounded pretty dumb. So that was a good impersonation. Oh, oh, no. Very good. 28 and a half minutes in. And that nullifier, a little ways away from Makoto. Uh, but yeah, in, in a couple minutes here, we've still got Roche, a minute 30 till it's capable of respawning. Holding on to this area, do they want to test pure? I mean, it really kind of feels like there's not great targets to go on unless you can get that IO. Even like Undying doesn't feel great now that he can yeah, grab himself. For sure. It, it is definitely a matter of uh, the Ricky item coming out. I think the Nullifier is just too crucial here. You don't have to take fights if you if you don't want to. I think your lineup just becomes so much easier to play in 1500 gold. Um, you're also 1500 away from an Ench BKB, which will also be huge. I will be looking at her as a potential game winning hero here. Jabs closing in on Adesso as well. There's a lot of damage available very soon for them. Uh, on the side of Bet Boom, you're not getting much more new survivability anytime soon. So the equation, so to speak, is very much favoring them right now with the items that they have just completed, and they will try to make use of that by popping a smoke here. Sending in Pure in front. Hunt, hunt. Breaking. Ollie spots it. Oh, quick fingers on Pure. It is the least valuable hero they could have killed, but they yeah. did get her. Yeah. Get a ward. Nothing like some fleshy. Yep. How many stacks is he up at now? Every kill, two strength. Only at eight. It adds up. And they're going to head on through as Roche. Uh, how long is it going to be now? It's actually 10 seconds. Jabs. GPK is there again. Another relocate move. Jabs wants to get out, but the hook. Nicely done by Pure. Another very important kill that time. GPK liking what he's seeing. This is yeah. their window that you called out. GPK is like, this is not like the pudges I play with in my pub games. This is... <laughs> I wish I had this pudge on my team every game. Positivity. Yep. Flowing in the pod. That's Makoto. Still just looking to AFK farm a bit here. Along with the rest of Talon. Do not want to go into these fights. And they are going to start heading down this direction, though. Almost BKB done on Q. Guy's a monster. Yeah, again, their Midas's are just slowly but steadily starting to build toward these key items. That's the nullifier. That's a big one. So Mikoto now effectively can just kill Io, and there's no solution. Except grab ally. Oh, there you go. I think Toronto. Wait, can you target it? Should be able to, I think. Okay, or he can hop in, but we'll see. As I'd be very surprised if he can't just save him there, actually. Pure. Hunting, waiting. The Warpine Raider got him. Oh. <laughs> He's just practicing. He's just standing still. He knows they're over here, and now a smoke coming from Bed Boom. Okay, big moment. Both teams looking for an angle. Obviously, we've already established which items are and aren't there. The Ench BKB you were talking about, not quite ready 
400 gold away could be a big factor in this fight if they find and kill Q. Very well worth targeting the Ench, in my opinion. So. That boom, they saw that Roche was up. I'm not quite sure if Talon spotted it themselves. Dead shot goes out. They know they're over there. Getting some good vision. Sunstrike hits them, but does not know it as there's still smoke. Now smoke breaks. GPK's there. He reveals them. Pure walks up there. The hook, it's going to connect. On to 23. Jab runs right into the midst of all of them. But then the jump from Ollie turns, wants to do what damage they can. Makoto finds one, but it's not on the IO. Nonetheless, they did manage to kill off the Pudge. Dead for a minute. Bet Boom, what do you have left in the tank? And they even did a pretty good save there. That was a very quick Tombstone save onto the onto the Pudge, but they're just destroying the Tombstone with the support Marcial. Makoto away from the rest of his team. The Dawn oh, 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 it comes down. He's able to jump away. And three shot! Nightfall just evaporated one. Now feared in trouble. Has to back out of there, even disposing to try and get a little bit of extra separation. All right, Nightfall hits hard. 23 Savage, gonna get caught by the Decay, low on mana. They get some vision, Makoto trying to find the back right. Get the kill off, yes! They take down the Muerta. Can they get any more? Toronto, Tokyo, they run the 23 Savage and the relocate gets them out. GPK found, they run right into him, but nothing left in the tank to break the TP. That is such an unexpected kill for Nightfall, though. It was Ench and Ricky just combining. He was next to his IO and still couldn't be saved. What a fight. It's really well done with the Ench. Massive burst of damage together with Ricky is enough to take out Muerta. With no ulti in the tank and no BKB, you are a very vulnerable hero in situations like these. And I don't really blame him for feeling relatively confident there. He's next to his IO, thinks he can probably get reload out, but the kill's just too quick. I mean, it does show, as you're going to see in a moment, 2,600 damage done in just a second onto jabs. Bang, 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 bang. <laughs> it's just gone. I, I mean, that's got to worry you a little bit if you're Talon, right? Or do you think that they're still okay after getting the Aegis? I mean, it's definitely worrisome if Muerta gets to just lay into them. But the good news is they have relatively good mobility, right? Yeah. Talked about how it's hard for Muerta to target the Willow. Willow now has level 20 talent, which is the big one, and Octarine, as we're going to see the end of this kill here. Um, yeah, if they had anything with GPK here, they would have been huge. But yeah, Willow is going to be a hard target for Muer Muerta. Ricky is going to be a hard target for Muerta. So yeah, she's going to obliterate jabs. There's no doubt about that. But what about the secondaries? Can you kill the Ench is the other question. Right. Ench has pretty good repositioning with the Sprank, with the Pike. She can get out of trouble. The other thing to watch for, I'm thinking about here, is going to be this blade mill. Only one in the game, believe it or not. Uh, currently on the Dawnbreaker. And you think about what happened earlier. If that goes on again, where does might just blow herself up? Very yeah. little survivability on this hero. You've got to be careful with how you interact with that. Obviously, you're going to have some extra layer of protection with the healing and BKB. But definitely still could be a bit of an X factor if things play out the way that they... I mean, we've seen a couple of previous Dawnbreaker kills where Muerta did drop to like half, yeah. right? So it is definitely a concern if the BKB and uh, protection isn't there from the supports. 4k lead. And it, it has a sort of similar feeling to last game, doesn't it? That you get yeah. these big fights, you, the only objective that's being secured is Roche. I have this classic talent late game feeling. Guys, we're just going to go super late with our classic core combination of Ricky and Willow. <laughs> when I think talent late game, I think Spectre. Right. You know? Not this. So I also wonder how experienced they are themselves at playing these heroes at the 60 minute mark, which don't want to get ahead of ourselves. But, you know, just judging from how these games have been so far, I think it's relatively likely we'll get there. I think for both teams, it's kind of uncharted territory, right? Like playing against a Ricky an hour into the game. How often do you do that? Oh, GPK just barely getting off the ghost walk there. Oh, man. That was, uh, that would have been a little bit scary had they been able to quite connect onto that one. The artillery has arrived. So it begins. Dark Willow with a bajillion attack range with sidekick. And with a very low downtime on Shadow Realm, cooldown nine seconds, duration seven. So 
I decided to look it up while you were asking. Five competitive games on Ricky, from what I can see on Makoto. Last one in 2021, unless there's something I'm missing here. But Pure jumps in and finds jabs right away. With Nightfall in tow and now turning on to Makoto. Heal coming out, trying to keep save alive. It's not going to happen. And Nightfall just going to go for the BKB TP out. Good trade for Vetboom. They kill a core for support, and they force a full-on rotation from all of Talent's heroes. So, going to give them some time to push out the waves and get the map back under control. GPK will spend this time trying to complete his Hex, but... Okay, he does use the gem here, so we'll be aware of the circumstances. Yeah, it needs to be... I mean, that's the thing, is, like, obviously, late-game Dota becomes also just this battle of vision, and... Mm -hmm. Securing the gem, making sure you're not underneath a ward. All the more important when there's a Ricky in the game. <laughs> 23. <laughs> he may have uh, gotten himself stuck somewhere. He piked himself up to the high ground, but fortunately his hero can just bramble maze the camp, and then it runs over nice. and he can hit it from a thousand range. Very good. So the new generation of Nature's Prophet cliff farming is in town. Take notes, everybody. And the difference is you can't do it from level one on Dark Will. You do need 20,000 net worth. But then... Right. Then it's great. Actually, maybe you can do it. No. You need, you need a way to get on the cliff. Right, then exactly. you can actually farm from it. Well, it's really good as Nature's Prophet. Uh, level one cliff jungle, I'm sure. Is there yeah. anywhere you can do it anymore? I guess over on, like, the, the I don't radiant think. side off lane. Uh, oh, wait. This, this, somewhere over there. Yeah, I suppose maybe... Uh, don't give the mic. <laughs> Sorry, my bad. Well, 38 minutes in. That tier 4 neutral items are coming out. That boom. Having already got a trickster cloak for Toronto Tokyo. That'll be pretty nifty. Helpful. But, I mean, it, it really does feel like if anybody wants to push the tempo right now, it's going to have to be Bet Boom. Talon are very happy sitting back farming. He'll go on the cliff again. Don't think he won't. <laughs> dance and you can see still very even in terms of the dota plus win oh. probability lincoln's huh it was eyeing up the deso for a while changed his build completely went a defensive route rather than the offensive one tired of getting dismembered is what yeah. i'm getting at here um but he can still get dismembered because pure has an e-blade so he can break the lincoln's <laughs> so anyway when he goes in yeah, no. But I guess when you're already bought the recipe for the Lincolns, you're not really going to change your mind, right? No, then not even a little. You're bit. committed. That's pretty helpful. I mean, I think that again, anything to make the fights more complicated for Bet Boom, because there's you know three different heroes that deal massive amounts of damage really quickly in the Ench, the Willow, and the Ricky. Um, having somebody that can just kind of stand there and nothing can deal with them, I think that's really yeah. helpful for Jabs. That front line. The Shiva's guard is now completed. I actually wonder if he should buy a heart. I, I don't even think that's a bad idea here on the Dawn, because, yeah, usually Dawn wants to scale in terms of physical damage output, right, become a real threat late game, but since you have the Ench doing so much damage from the support position, maybe you can just become, like you said, just a full-on frontline tank. Just Blade Mill Heart Take good. all that damage. It's crazy. Yeah, it's just not a classic Dawn build. That's the thing. I mean, there's a lot of other heroes, so it's just a no-brainer. Oh, you're playing Primal. Oh, wow, we went Blade No Heart. How right. innovative. But on this hero, it's actually pretty rare because you want to get value out of the Starbreaker. But at the very least with a heart, it also does give you some damage, right? The strength is still valuable. Well, we'll see. I'm also seeing here, you know, something that you don't often notice is the, the Undyne at 10k net worth. So he's already got the Boots of Bering and the Solar Crest. Yeah, I don't know he if he's getting there. He's going to be able to accelerate into that much more. Could be something to watch for. But it literally has just been hanging out mid, the, you know, farming out the entire side of the map that they're on. There is a refresher that's now completed on Muerta. So a second salvo in these fights could cause some issues for Talon if they can get to that moment. Yeah, Nightfall's actually relatively close to being maxed out here, right? There's not that much more he wants to replace. Maybe the treads for a swift blink or something like that, but he definitely has what he wants to fight. Grouping together. Everybody heading to the same area where they know Roche could respawn soon. Oh, they're moving right into position. Q is going to be the first point of contact. Oh, jump hook! Oh, I didn't Got him. be in time! Wow. Caught him immediately. completely off guard. 23 Savage is kind of in no man's land here, too. The tornado is actually going to hit him. 
Makoto looking for a back line to jump at, and BKB, they chase forward, want to find the kill onto him, and meanwhile, they go for the Dawnbreaker ultimate. Ends up pulling himself away. Dying is gone. Can they get any more? Ollie's starting to fall. Nightfall chasing a couple more hits. It's enough. Sunstrike follow-up. 23 Savage is in trouble. Pure caught him with that one. Makoto trying to find another target, but he's not able to bring down GPK. The Sprank away. 23 Savage still living through this. Goes back into the Shadow Realm and is actually living through it. The Hurricane Pike in the separation. Gets out of there. Talon are somehow making this fight work for themselves. As save is chased, save is gone. There will be no relocate out of this. Can they find any more? Doesn't quite look like it. How did that go so well for Talon? Well, as soon as Pierce the Veil is down, I don't know if they have the burst damage to kill this Willow in the two second windows that they're getting. Yeah. Which it isn't even anymore because he got Spell Prism. So he is in Shadow Realm 90% of the fight. Shadow Realm is seven seconds duration and 7.9 second cooldown. So the moments of opportunity are just so small. You're going to see it here, right? So just notice how little time they have. Yeah. I, it's, <laughs> it's, it's okay. And I mean, I, I do kind of wonder, it, like, what's the what's the job here of does Pure just need to jump onto her and just sort of stay on target? Because uh, it feels like there needs to be some way to, to sort of force 23 Savage into a weird position. And I mean, he's trying. Hand. I know, it's true. It's tough, though. Man. He somehow got Shadow Realm off while dismembered there, right? That yeah. must have happened at the exact same time. I've never seen that before. Crazy. Crazy scenes. As Roche will be claimed. Now, who do you give the axe to? Makoto is a candidate here. He will not get it. They will put it on jabs, it looks like. So that will be the improved Solar Guardian that gives evasion. Wow. And that is a pretty strong axe in this game, right? It's a lot of just that additional duration. First of all, you can. there's a couple of things happening when you have this. You give the targets in the ring 60% evasion for the entirety of the time you're flying. You get to fly for three and a half seconds extra, and you can stop it whenever you want. So if you ever need a BKB piercing stun on demand, there it is. And if you ever need to save cores or supports against right clicks, there it is. So that's a bit of a problem for Bet Boom that they're going to have to deal with now. Ricky almost finishing off the Disperser here. And do we have anything big coming on the side of Bet Boom? Invoker will finish Octarine Core, so that's obviously a good one. Refresher is being built by Pure. Yeah, I, I honestly think you're right. I think Pure's primary job in the game right now is to just sit in front of Moira to all it, fight. It is like, so hard, though, like you're saying. Like, how how do you even get there? I, I mean, to, to actually find 23 Savage. Because um, if they don't get on him, I mean, we've seen what will happen. Even when Q died at the start of that fight, what felt like it should have been a solid one, it just did not work out. And, well, he might run into some people here. They have the vision. Spot him. Do you want to go on the pudge oh, right to nice start? Reaction. Good reactions to get away. Another situation and moment where it feels like we're on a knife's edge. It, it could go either team's direction. Um, Dota Plus, very little separating these two teams at 45 minutes, and oftentimes what can end up making the difference is just one fight. Of course, the buyback status that comes out after. The big the big hero of this game is Muerta. She's either going to make the game-winning fight, or she's going to get caught off guard one time, die, and the fight collapses. Right. Bet Boom do not have enough damage with Nightfall out of ulti or dead. So. There's so much riding on them getting value out of this Refresher Orb and these two back-to-back -back Pierce the Veils, which is, you know, a grand total of 16 seconds of damage. It's quite a long time, but we've seen from Talon that they've got this really good lineup for just kiting. The Ricky kites away, the Marcy can jump away, the Willow is... Now Willow also has Wind Waker, so she can save another target yeah. at this point. Or herself, I yeah, mean, either I, way. Not sure she's going to need it on herself, That's to be fair. honest, with how it's gone so far. Here comes the artillery, long range, nice hook! What? They get it, a freebie! Oh, that's the Aegis out the window for nothing! Did they get anything else? Terrorize waiting for the right moment, BKB finds him, immediately bitten, but the Dawnbreaker ultimate, it's healing Makoto so much! They just get away for free, but oh. the jab's not gonna be so lucky! So they managed to get one out of that along with the Aegis, 
And Talon learned the mantra just another time, never go high ground, <laughs> ever. It's not a good thing to do. It's not a good place to be. I think they learn a second mantra too. Ricky is not a frontline. <laughs> no. Did you know? <laughs> he died very quickly. Uh, that just that's just honestly just a bit of a blunder there for Makoto. Like he does not need to be in front of the tower for any reason there. They're safely sieging it from very far away with the willow. If 23 somehow gets hooked, he can instantly wind waker and fly out of the base and then have his shadow roam again. So risk reward, I don't think Ricky had a reason to be there. And pure, he's not gonna He's not going to let that one slip away. Immediately identifies the, the blunder and maximum punish, right? Aegis down, secondary kill on the Dawn. So very, very good defense from him. Hook on Creeps in Toronto, Tokyo. Oh, is he actually? Is he like my farm? And then he missed. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to let people know. Yeah, Marcia has attack speed, let me tell you. She's getting very stacked up, and now the evasion not even going to be as effective with MKB completed. Yep. Still a nice reason for the axe, right? Like, just putting that on, on Dawn kind of forced Nightfall's hand. This is an item he didn't want to have. Yeah. So it means there's a, another value item in his inventory now that is not a possibility. Just from that axe pickup. Marcy has Basher completed, almost level 20. Again, we have to keep our eyes on these uh, supports, quote unquote. Absolutely. And the Enchantress at 20,000 net worth right now. It's worth noting that Makoto has, in a way, fallen off a little bit relative to where he was, and, you know, Q has taken up that space. Yeah. But still both very dangerous heroes as the refreshers completed for Pudge. Yeah. The level 20 talent on Marcy will be the 15% unleash move speed, so it will be a lot stickier. The fights. Tornado goes down mid. Makoto maybe looking to eye somebody up there, but it's Nightfall with save behind him. Very difficult to get any type of meaningful kill. But now wards drop down. They see everything. Talon, do they want to go for the all-in play? Jump, finds him immediately. BKB four staff gets out of trouble. That was the reaction they needed, and you can see Jabs immediately gets out of trouble. If Makoto has an Abyssal there, that's a kill, right? Yeah. It's it's the fact that Talon don't have any instant stun, so you're actually relatively safe as long as you, your, your reactions are in order um, to just get out of there. So Nightfall, not gonna, not gonna panic. He's just gonna press the buttons he needs to, get away and reset. If Ricky does go the Basher route, that becomes really interesting with his ability to lock down the initial target, but doesn't seem like that's the plan. Currently eyeing up a Lincolns. Again, another hero wanting to buy Lincolns against Pierce Pudge. Yeah. He's doing so much work this game on that very uncharacteristic hero. Not for him, but for the tournament. Well, and the other thing that we might end up seeing eventually is 23 Savage throwing out one of those terrorizes on the Muerta right away, because if she doesn't have her way to get out of there, you've still got to deal with the Ricky yeah. shenanigans. So that could be something to watch for also. Um, not easy to get all those things together in perfect concerts. Really rough. As we are now eclipsing the 50-minute mark. And next yeah. Roche. Jabs could buy a Hex. He has the gold for it. That would be nice. Um, but is holding on to it for now. I don't know if this is a commitment from him or if he's still judging whether this is the right idea. Because you could also look at it from the perspective of, okay, like we said, there's the option of the frontline build, there's an option for, you know, a standard, like, let's say, AC or whatever, but it doesn't feel that great against Muerta, right? So you're probably not buying that one. So maybe the utility path is just what he's going to go for. I think Refresher is honestly a kind of interesting idea too, right? When you think okay. of how this game is played, he ulties in, the enemy team has to reset away. He can then immediately upon landing, he can blink out and just ulti <laughs> again. And you're effectively negating a lot of the presence of the Muerta in the fight. Despite having MKB, you always have to thread this. You have to tread carefully because you could get BKB stunned, right? Yeah. By the Donald at any point. So if that ring is just over you, it's kind of difficult to deal with, but he will he will up for the hex first and foremost. But now refresher feels really nice too. You don't have mana problems for the rest of the game with this scythe and link as your mana reaches through the roof. I don't know if you ever get rid of blade mail there either, but maybe eventually if you get our best armor, I think you probably something. do now. Yeah, as the next item, get rid of that blade mail, get the refresher, or sure. yeah. No, nope, not going to go for it. <laughs> All right, so check it out. He's also covering his Shadow Realm now with the Wind Waker. Yep. 
if toward the end of your Shadow Realm you Wind Waker yourself, you can Shadow Realm again. So effectively untargetable for 17 seconds straight. And Wind Waker is an 8.6 second cooldown. Oh, Yor finds one. He gets onto him, but I don't think you're doing anything to this Dark Willow who's hitting Ancients at the moment. The rest of Bet Boom trying back away. Honestly, what the hell do you do against this Dark Will? This is insanity. I, I don't know what you're supposed to do. I guess just stay on top of her, but like you got this thing too. The Wind Waker gets her out of there. I mean, eventually a hero like Invoker can be pretty good because he has, you know, all this ground damage that he can land with a full combo. If he catches her in a hex and he just blasts everything, maybe you get Ags plus Refresher as well for that Cataclysm combo next to Pudge. You know, there's going to be options. It's obviously super annoying to deal with, and there's a reason this hero has become popular in the latest stage of the tournament after, I want to say primarily Shiro has had the success with it at this stage of the tournament, but it's not a... It's not a new idea per se for these teams this, that it just came out of nowhere. They knew it from pubs that this was a thing. Yeah. But... Sending out the Forge Spirits. And yeah. jab the Forge Spirits. Up front and center. They also send in the little creeps from the Enchantress. And at least for now, it's a stare down across the Roche Pit area. Interestingly enough, we're going to get pretty close to Roche switching sides in the midst of this fight. True. Something Bet will need to be wary of. And then, honestly, something really important for Talon this game is that they have the only global hero, right? I say that there is an IO, so I guess you can ha consider relocate. The problem is, if you're, let's say you're split pushing a lane with Invoker and IO, right? And yeah. they relocate to the fight. You're on a timer to win that fight or Io will have to be forced to leave and it can get really awkward. The Dawn ulti is always just going to, you know, just farm wherever he wants. He can take care of the dangerous lane, just throw a hammer and go to fog. So this in this standoff, Bet Boom are never going to threaten high ground because Dawn right. will always solve it. So you're not, you don't have to worry about that aspect. Roche will spawn in 40 seconds. That shot pushes out. You know, in, in all of the craziness that we've been seeing, this is still no Aghanim Scepter on GPK. He's been waiting the entire time to try and get it from Roche. Yeah. It's queued up the Refresher. Steps forward, Bedlam out. Seeing if they run into anybody. Pure is in deep. He's in an interesting position right there. Has Forge Spirit on Enchantress Creep. And Q is actually TPing top. They're anticipating that it's going to be up on the top side. It's actually going to spawn here early. If Bed Boom realize this, they can take Roche very quickly with Muerta. They might actually kill it in time. But no, instead, they're going top. Okay, they're trying to preempt it. Getting in position. They have vision down. Makoto, does he step within sentry range? He's right there. They see him. Ooh, just a little difference away from there. But not quite going to fall into range. Bet Boom with a clear positional advantage here, though. Getting through the gate gives them the they high ground. Makoto, they got him! Disarm! Chase him! Can they get any more? The Hex already can join! Roach runs through two! Nightfall now wants to chase Pure. Looking right on top of one. 23 Savage. He's going for the Wind Waker. Walk away. Now refresh onto Nightfall. Wants to chase. Jabs is there. That's the buyback and the run into the fight. Oh, huh. oh. That would have been a nice one to get, but... I don't know if that would have been good for him. <laughs> I'm not point. sure. I mean, Nightfall still does have the reinitiation if he wants it. Has Pierce the Veil and BKB ready. Toronto Tokyo gets hit. Still backs away. He's rooted. The jump forward, they oh, fly on him! Where's oh, the oh, of ally? There's nothing! The buyback, it comes out. They got a retreat though. Bet Boom need to wait and buy time for the rest of their team to get up close and personal. They blink back after eating one. Toronto Tokyo gonna TP to the outpost. It's a long outpost TP though! Toronto Tokyo! Is gonna get caught. He couldn't grab his ally. Oh man. Oh geez. And yeah, yeah they're, they're gonna, gonna give, give it, up. it up. Yeah, absolutely. They don't have the positional advantage anymore. They don't have where to buy back. Dying up there is the end of the game. And they will give Talon an advantage here. Refresher shard now. Do you put it on the Dawn or do you put it on the Ricky? Is the question. Ricky having his items twice over is really powerful here. It's like they're playing on jabs. I, I just think back to what could have been in that moment. Again, obviously, no way to know, but if Bet Boom had been in the Roche pit, they could have taken that Roche in time. Yeah. But it's understandable, right? You just, of course. Just, from the, from, strictly from an odds perspective, right? 
even if they go on the Roche there, they don't know for a fact that Talon have left. So yeah. it's like, it's a 20 second window. You could have gone and Muerta ulted it and killed it. But in case you do get jumped in there when Muerta's ulting, it's really bad news. So just such a difficult decision to make just off the nature of the clock. Like if that was 20 seconds longer, yeah. that would have been so easy for Bedboom to make the right call. Here couldn't quite catch Q. <laughs> I mean, the ironic thing is that, you know, it's Talon stepping up high ground again. Do they really want to push or do they want to wait for their 60 minute items? They're going to start to hit, but it's not easy going high ground against this. And yeah, the Wind Waker away. The first tier three tower taken in the game. 57 and a half minutes. Building damage, fairly sparse. Here just fishing, yeah. Backs away, Tornado. And another hook, not quite on the mark. Again, it feels like they should be around here to push, but it really is not easy to push at all. Nope. Hitting the rain tracks from very far. Almost and got it there. <laughs> with Waker to walk away, and now the hook. Oh. They find Makoto. That's what they needed right away. He's dropping low, but gets out with the cheese. Nicely played. Dawnbreaker ultimate comes through. Jabs, he's in far, and this is going to be Brock. Pure looking for his moment. Dodges from that terrorize. Willow still hidden. Ah, hard to hit in the midst of all of this. The hook, it's not going to connect. And yeah, the tombstone isn't going to help either. No. When you put down the tombstone, you effectively make Pure jo Pure's job a lot harder. They defend, though. They forced out. So what did they get out of that? A cheese and a an A on this prong. Okay. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <right. laughs> well, the cheese. And they stall. Absolutely. Whittling away at the Aegis timer. Two and a half minutes left. Talon will technically have a little moment of opportunity here with their Midas's, where they can immediately Midas two tier five neutral items and then push high ground while still having Aegis for a minute 20. If they do want to try to get that little advantage there, those items it is a possibility oh no sin they use the cheese they can't make the block of cheese now oh i know i hear you crowd not happy about that one how dare yeah. how, it actually have enough lotuses almost you're right <laughs> no they're kind of close well there might be another roast you know there's a chance pure pulls in one tornado all right wind waker away i see how this is going and yeah, now he just throws out some more in the Shadow Realm. Even when you get him, you didn't really get him. So somehow you have to time the hook with Shadow Realm wearing out, and you can get the Dismember after you break the Lincolns as he's flying through. Did I get that right? I love rocket science, <laughs> my favorite subject. So 60 minutes come out. Let's see what Talon managed to claim for themselves. Yep. Let's go. All right, already a stacked Ancient Camp for Jab, so should get at least one item here unless he's very unlucky. We'll get one there. And he will take it for himself. Q also claims one. Uh, that boom. Out on the side of the map, trying to yeah. get themselves a couple of items. No Midas is in hand. GPK grabs one. Oh, Book of Shadows for the Ench. Mirror Shield is so good against Pudge, too, on jabs, right? Like, you have so much freedom when you jump in on this Dawn. 23. This one melee creep trying to get vision. Oh, oh, they got him again. Do they have anything to follow it up? Does not appear so. A dead shot. Still sitting with the Lincolns right on top. Maybe go for the easier target. Q is there. Could jump if they want. Hook not nearly where they needed it to be. Now the tornado, but then another walk away. And now they step forward. The hex connects Makoto. They back out. Pure low, pure in trouble, dead. Does have buyback. Are they gonna find anything else? Nightfall starts spraying. He popped his ult and BKB there, so that's one down. Has to swap out the Mjolnir and get Refresher ready. Still just cannot touch 23 Savage. They do not have an angle on this guy. He's playing it so safe and still sitting pretty with everything. Four yeah. staffs forward. And Wind Waker pulls him back. And now the Tornado, they are not buying back on Pudge, though. So there's no chance for a kill. So dealing some more damage. The Hex is there. They bring him down low. Toronto, Tokyo in the grave. Talon 
They've gotten to what feels like an unbeatable point now. There's still 50 seconds left on this Pudge. He buys back at this point. GPK, there's the Tornado lift up. Toronto Tokyo wants to find him, but the Wind Waker, the walk away, he's back in the Shadow Realm. There's no point to hit this guy. The hook not going to connect. And Talon just sitting pretty right outside the base saying, come hit me, I dare ya. Does he manage to find this hook? Toronto Tokyo right in front of him. No, the Wind Waker away, the hook not gonna connect. This, it just doesn't seem fair. It's like Pudge Wars. <laughs> just that one team has every item and the other one has one punch. I mean, Willow... It's not... Yeah, it's tough, man. Like, I'm just sitting here in silence waiting for them to somehow connect something, but it's borderline impossible. Now they find Toronto Tokyo. It doesn't seem like they even care. The Hex was there, but they find another Lincolns in a second. He's out. I mean, this is definitely some disgusting stuff you're gonna see in your pubs. And it feels like the only thing that's gonna be a limiting factor is 23 himself. Like him messing up and somehow getting caught. Yeah, but he has, has think of how crazy of a safety net he has, right? Yeah. He has Wind Waker, Pike, Lincoln's BKB, and Dawn ulti with Ags. Like what more can you possibly want for a safe siege except an Aegis? And they Tornado. Just... Oh. They hexed him, but he got worm off. Okay, and now he runs away. And it's X Machina for the Pudge. So they managed to get a couple of items while this is going on. Jabs jumps forward, finds it. Toronto Tokyo in trouble, ends up being brought down. That's Pure. a dieback. Looking for something, anything. Can they connect onto him? Jabs again gets saved by it. Oh, 23 Savage. He went to save Jabs. And now he gets caught. Wait, 23 Savage bought back. If he dies again, that could be it. Jabs, strike, oh. almost dead. Disarm onto Q. Signs of life in what felt like a hellscape that was the Radiant base. Patience is the name of the game, and they finally got a bit impatient there and went in too far with the Willow, trying to save Jabs. He will buy back, though. They know they have a five on four. This is quite aggressive. Yeah, it very much is. I mean, uh, again, an, an interesting decision to go in at this point. Disarm onto all of them. Looks for the hook, finds him. Now tries to back out. And with the Dawnbreaker ultimate, it's scary. Makoto chasing, hunting. Nightfall gets stunned. Is it going to be long enough duration? Oh, the damage coming out from Nightfall. It's so strong. Already a couple gone. Jabs doesn't have buyback. Throws out the Terrorize. The connection is there. Pure needs to back out, wanting to bring down anybody. As they retreat, GPK still on the hunt. The Hex, he immediately found him. GPK is pissed. He wants more. Can they find him? Tornado, lift up. I'm not done with you yet. Get back over here. The Hex comes out. But do they have friends? Can they get there in time? Slow down. Hook, not going to be on the mark. Nightfall chasing. Has a dead shot ready. But they don't want to chase out of the base. God, that was so expensive for Talon. I mean, sure. You don't lose anything critical in terms of any structures, but effectively a window now open for Bat Boom. The question is, considering how extremely precise they need to combine their spells to find these kills, it's one thing to do it in your base. How do you do it when you go out on the map and you don't have vision and position advantage, right? Oh, yeah. Now you have a couple of targets that are really juicy to find. All three cores of the enemy team have expended their buyback, so finding any of them is enormous, but that's the key word here is finding them, right? It's so difficult to get it set up, but should Bet Boom somehow manage, they might just be saving this from about, I think it was about 20,000 net worth disadvantage just a moment ago, turned to six. I mean, that is the thing, right? Like, they expended so much on the side of Talon, and what did they get for arranged racks? Yeah. I mean, it really was not what they needed. Um, a, another key item that gets picked up at this point, 23 has finished the Revenant's brooch, so a way to connect onto Nightfall and try and bring him down. But it's like what you said, if you manage to find one of these heroes, it could be an issue. If, if Talon ever get a little bit too separated, oh, wait, Roche? Nightfall goes for it, okay. Yeah, this is just a clean. There's no way you get here. This is actually just insane. Oh, man. So they managed to claim it. There is a refresher shard still in, which Toronto Tokyo is going to pick up now. And that buyback status that you're talking about, there's a large window here. Let's see what Beck Boom can do. 
Talon. They have to solve their waves. Their bottom wave is way too big. It's actually going to take the lane of barracks if they don't defend there. Everybody runs out from Bethel. Somehow we got another one. <laughs> Who would have thunk it? Nah, this one isn't a 68-minute game, Gabe. This is a 78-minute game. You think so? Uh, it might be longer, actually. Like it's it. going to be difficult for Talon to end, right? Because they spent these buybacks, and now they're against a Roche advantage. Right. So you're probably just chilling, right? I don't think... They don't have much interest in going aggressive, and if Bet Boom try to push, good luck, you yeah. know? No, absolutely. It, it's so difficult to push into this Willow, into this Marcy catch, into the Inch, just throwing impetuses with huge damage from range. The smoke screen that you can't save people in, <laughs> like... You know, I'm, I'm going to be honest. I'm like, you know, anticipating that Talon are going to come away with this. You see the craziness mm -hmm. from the Dark Will and all that. But I, I just went through the realization that if Bed Boom win, we might have another another game like this <laughs> that happens afterwards. Yep. I don't know. If, uh, Definitely not out of the question. Well, they are up on the high ground. Okay, give me your give me your best take. Okay. How do you push? How do you push? Yeah. What's what? How do you get to place all five bed boom heroes perfectly? Let's say they can go wherever they want. How are okay. you going to place them? Uh, Nightfall up front and center. Okay. Which is tough because Pudge has the Aegis, um, because he has now buyback. You have Undying right behind him. Willow is ta ta tagged onto him there, and then you get the double hit because Willow's 25. But no, instead. Just step up, and that's already a tier three tower gone. Wait a minute now. Wait a minute now. The hook, the connection. Q, he's in trouble. Oh, Bet Boom, have you actually done it? There's a buyback. This is one of the two heroes that still have one. That went way better than I expected on the first high ground. That's quite inspiring, honestly, for Bet Boom to see this happening. Okay. I fall. I fall. Cheese! The save come out from the aisle. Pure. He's in no man's land. One more damage there. Look at the desolator! The hits coming in from the aisle. GPK comes out, goes for the disarm, and then the back away. Pudge back alive again. Needs to BKB, needs to escape. The tricks of the trade. Chasing. They're waiting for Makoto. Wants his moment, and they find him. Is it going to be enough damage? Yes! They take down Makoto. Can they get any more, though? Nightfall, the hook, again, pure. He's on his man. Can they bring down this Willow? Goes for this to walk away. And the damage coming out. The Isle is doing so much of it. Save and Nightfall doing it all together. But they managed to kill off that Muerta. Now the buyback looks for more. Toronto, Tokyo with his axe. He's so freaking tanky on this Undying. 10,000 HP on Toronto, Tokyo. Looking for more. Bet boom. They're going to claim the game. How do you do that? How? How? You were right, Gabe. It didn't reach 70 minutes. <laughs> it was close. It was very, very close. Holy shit. I actually can't believe Bet boom just ended it like that. Given how difficult the how? fights looked in their own base, they just, I mean, at some point you just go for it, right? They have the advantage of the Aegis and Cheese there, and they just run in, pop all their stuff, and hope that Talon make a mistake and get caught, and they did. Mikoto, the first one to play a little over-aggressive there, jumping in and getting Hex and killed. No buyback on him. Jabs as well as 23. One after the other, they fall without that buyback, but man. That's, okay, I'll be honest with you. That's a difficult one to recover from from oh, Talon. Oh, yeah. Because you felt like this was in the bag, right? Oh, it, absolutely. You were pushing. You were so confident that you bought back three cores to try to right. end the game. You didn't need to buy those heroes back. You had all three waves in the enemy base. So a little bit of maybe getting ahead of themselves and, I don't know, the pressure of the stage, a little bit of panic. And now you have to, after that crazy game, <laughs> no, get have five minutes <laughs> to calm down and go for it one more time. That is uh, quite the challenge. You know, there's something in that that inspired me a little bit. Because when I, when I saw the crowds come out, when all the p players were there, I did feel like the crowd was a little bit more favoring Talon. The cheers were maybe slightly louder. But I think we saw a little bit of empathy from the crowd when they saw 23 Savage never being targetable. They won him over. Bed Boom won over the crowd a little bit uh, there at the end and able to come away with the victory. And I don't even know what the hell to expect in this game three. I mean, you talk about reset, but even just in terms of draft, like the, the draft was not standard by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, I, they can't make it crazier than this, right? Absolutely. Well, early.
<laughs> surely, surely that never ends well. But let's head on back to the panel. Let them break down that insanity from game two. Thank you very much, indeed. Lyrical, Sinrin, this was a, uh, an amazing game to watch. And I think that all our talk of potentially, you know, Bad Boom having sometimes struggles with the, the emotional side of things and a slightly choke, we can throw that out the window, please. A game like this coming out on top here, Fear, this is the mental resilience proof that we could ask for. I mean, where to begin with this one? There's so much, but I think the one thing that really we can take a note of is just like, how Bet Boom were able to stay in this game. It wasn't going well for them. They held their high ground time and time again. Maybe it's a little bit impatience from Talon as well. We saw Bet Boom last game kind of fall into that trap. It's these high grounds here at the road to the international. They can get you every time. Mm -hmm. I mean, first, I want to start off by giving credit to Talon because that draft was innovative. It was fresh. It was one of the most fun things we've seen at this road to the international. And I thought that Playing Carry Willow into Invoker Pudge would be a death sentence, but they played around it so beautifully, especially Makoto on this tricky. This tricky did so much for them by way of disrupting fights, by way of protecting Willow, just by being so in your face. And it looked like they were going to do it till the very end, but Betfum, they really pulled through. And I, I just have to commend GPK on this on this hex. This hex won them the game. Like these two hexes, these two catches changed everything for them because all of a sudden you're not in your base, you're not defending, you're not depending on a hook to be able to defend your high ground when all of them are uncatchable. No, you're taking Roche and you are the aggressors. And when you are the aggressors on that boom, you can actually take these fights instead of watching your buildings be hit from a thousand range away. GPK ended that game with zero deaths. 69 minute game, zero deaths. I don't think you can ask for anything nicer. And it's just, they're the first team as well. I mean, throughout the whole DPC year, we talked about uh, them not being able to recover from some of these losses. Uh, they're the first team in the lower bracket that managed to win the second game after losing the first one. I think Talon, they made a mistake going for these like double buybacks on the jabs, jabs and 23, when there was no buyback on Undying. This was what kind of, they could have prolonged the game for another couple of more minutes, uh, but uh, they decided to, you know, We'll have to take this risk 60 minutes into the game. We'll try to end it. Didn't end well for them. How would you analyze this game, <laughs> I mean, I am Bad Boom. I am like so happy because I got my Pudge on my Piodota, my Cattail. I have my <laughs> six slot Night 4 Murta. I got my GPK Invoker, all three Eagle, Egoist. Like, I'm gonna solo carry this game. This is what Bad Boom needs to draft. Throw that Thailand the Dazzle, like, timing push it out of the, into the trash can. Full ego, 1v9 on three courts. This is the kind of bet boom that I know. Yeah, I mean, they, they played a little bit more for the late game. We... <laughs> I felt like I needed to be silent for that moment for a little bit. I love seeing that. That, that is that is some, some emotional release there, Fear. Oh, it definitely was. They have to be really relieved to be still in the international after that one. Last patch or last TA may have been the race pack one. Now we have the untargetable carry meta yeah. where we have Morta can't be targeted. We have this Dark Will who can't be targeted. It's very difficult to play against these heroes that just can't be targeted. Yeah. Imagine and if you haven't played Dota in like three years and you... <laughs> Tune in to watch this, and you're like, what the <laughs> hell is that? You know, I'm watching Wind Waker and the heroes that can't be targeted going into like 60 plus minute games. It's a wild one. That's actually the thing. I, I think that the Spell Prism, too, is so OP. I mean, we saw 23 Savage keep the Spell Prism over any tier five item because the CDR with the Wind Waker and the Shadow Realm, you're just invulnerable forever. And it actually feels more dangerous to let that kind of willow near your buildings than it is to fight her outside of your base. I'm starting to see that the key to solving Willow is fighting outside of your base where she can't siege. Yeah, the, the cooldown reduction definitely uh, going crazy on 23 Savage Willow. And that is a second near 70 minute game in a row and the players still have to play another one. So they're taking this time to have a little bit of a breath of fresh air. I saw a lot of people in the arena also going for that breath of fresh air. And uh, for everybody watching, we have a little bit of a refreshment here as well with uh, our final entries to the short film contest.
are amazing this last one definitely getting a laugh out uh, from uh, from as well as the crowd uh, that was the 10th video that we've watched over the least last few days and uh, all of them are finalists because they're all fantastic but there's going to be one that's going to be a little bit better than everything else and that's going to be revealed in the climate pledge arena next week so you got to stay tuned for that one as we you know we caught our breath we are ready uh over and under what is this is this going to be another 70 minute game here moon <laughs> I think so. I think Talon's oh, going to go back to that turtle strat again. And this time, Bedboom is going to do the same strat where they're going to have three scaling cores. So another seven minute game, guys. So warm up some popcorn. I mean, I think Talon's strategy right now is they are playing five cores right now. Like, their supports in the last two games have not bought a single support item. True. Yeah. They have, like, literally, there's Midas's both games, right? You're not buying, I guess there's one Glimmer in the last game on the AA, but, like, they're just building to scale. There's PKBs, there's mm -hmm. Bashers. The Q is trying to scale as well. It, more than anything, Jabs was playing support last game. And I think that's just their style now. I think they realize they are a team that wants to, like, play for the late game. They're not going to build support items. They want every core to be very scary. I think it's kind of hard to play against when there's, like, five threats you have to deal with. How do you strategize? Who are you focus firing if the gold is spread evenly amongst, like, four players? Yeah, and also I think there are some heroes that these teams are looking at as, uh, okay, guys, let's not give that away again. Uh, Moon mentioned to me earlier that he thinks some Wirtzes can't be given away. I think the Invoker also to GPK, that cannot be given away. I mean, this is his best hero. He died zero times in a game versus Ricky, where they picked Ricky specifically to counterpick the Invoker. So I'm, I'm just curious to see what the changeups are going to be now after a break like that, because both of these teams must be tired. They both probably said, okay, guys, no way. We are not doing this again. Yeah, I'm really glad that they changed the type of the hero that Pure played in the second game, because going from Tidehunter, which is you know a lane dominator, but not a hero that can move around the map and get stuff done. And in the second one, he plays Pudge, and some of these hooks were pretty amazing, you know. And the, after they won the game, you could see him on the camera feeling himself. He's like, "Yeah, I, I did this," and he really did. Some of these hooks were pretty top notch. Uh, having refresher, using the double hook, uh, he was all over the place. And also, whenever he plays some of these aggressive heroes, when he's dictating the tempo of the game, Game, he really shines the most. I thought already game two was very different from game one in terms of the heroes picked Moon. Are there any heroes in particular you would like to either see make a comeback or you would like to not see this game? I would love to not see another event on Phantom Assassin and Nightfall. I really feel like uh, this Mortis, this uh, Ebony, I don't even really mind seeing like a Luna or Spectre or Nightfall. Just don't like, uh, it's gonna be Mortis, Spectre, Luna, whoever gets like one of these carries and goes late game. And off laner, like you said, pure on a playmaker. I think Baboom got this. Baboom got this. All right. Okay, Moon, you keep changing your mind. Yeah. Pick a team. <laughs> pick, a team. pick a team very right clear. now. He's in a bandwagon. Whatever <laughs> team wins oh, last Lord. series, he's already jumping ship. I, mean, I can't really. Uh, Talon is like they're so good at late game, but like some of the itemization, like the Midas Edge and the Swift Blink Weaver, my brain just thinks like something wrong. Well, we're gonna have to wait and see what's uh, what's coming our way here because. I, I, mean, I, it, I don't think it can be another 72-minute game. I think Why not? maybe from Talon it can, but we must not forget 
that Bedroom was here this morning. They played already earlier today. Uh, and yeah, they got a 2-0, they got momentum going, but stamina surely is a thing. And if I'm, if I'm the coach here, I'd say, you know what, guys? We're just going all in. We're considered the strongest laning stage team. Why not capitalize on that? Sounds so simple. But can you, though? You're exhausted if you're like, looking at a real fight. That's a real strategy, tying your opponent out. And will they have the stamina to get in a quick game win not the early game? I don't know. It'll be Do hard. They look they're exhausted like to you? Yeah, they don't. They're like six <laughs> young guys stretching. That you. They're not like, it's like 30 years old. We're pushing 30. These guys that's are like true, young. Right. They're like stretching. They're 20 or something. In this is like just another day in Russia for them. That's <laughs> yes, and don't forget, we talk about Talon being a late game team. Yeah. And Bedroom does, did have short match durations this road to TI, but they have always historically been a late game team. And they had the highest average match duration. I think it was either the Lima Major or the one after that, but they were taking these games minute 65, minute 70. It was during that um, first pick TB carry meta a few months ago. So they're, they're no stranger to taking games very long. I think what we learned from this series so far is whoever's in control of the game, wins the early game, is ahead in the mid game, that's the team that loses. So whoever is ahead in the game is losing. This is great, <laughs> great logic coming out. Let's see what will happen in game number three. Talon Esports versus Bet Boom Team. Game three. Oh, maybe logic is just out of the window for this third game and we don't know what's coming our way we've only had one third game earlier in the road to the international and that was on day one series one uh, it's been a little while I was also in the upper bracket and we all know that uh, emotions run high uh, both up and down in the lower bracket so uh, I think it's gonna be very important to see if people can uh, can wipe their slate clean you know it's just another game of dota we've heard so many players mention it that their advice to themselves when they're in this situation is just treat it like another game of Dota 2. Stay calm, cool, you know, it might go to minute 70, but just stay focused. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Uh, in the band so far, Lacoste, we see quite a little bit of a repeat of what we've seen in uh, the first game, actually, with a lot of, a lot of strength banned out already. And is it unusual to see Talon go into the bonus time a little bit for that second ban. Uh, they, they need to have something prepared. I mean, they already s showed us in the second game that they're going to play different heroes. I don't think anyone coming into the series would expect them to pick some of these heroes. You know, getting uh, this Marcy, playing Ricky, playing uh, Kerry Dark Willow, which has been seen before. But uh, yeah, they probably have a couple of other strats yeah, prepared I, for this one, but uh, yeah, it, it's kind of difficult to say because th these are the type of the players that can pretty much play anything. Mm -hmm. Five seconds I mean, remaining. During TI, every day you feel like there's a new meta that is being shaped, and that's one of the funnest things about this tournament. But I want to comment on the consistent Centaur bans that are coming out of Talon because if you look at all of their previous matches, they don't ban out Centaur in that first phase, but they do versus Bedboom because honestly, Bedboom look like a different team when Pure can initiate these fights consistently for them. Because in that last game on Pudge, he was entirely dependent on landing a hook to take the fight. And if they didn't land the hook, there was no way for them to engage in Talon. In that first game, Tidehunter is too long of a cooldown to do that reliably. So if you give any kind of short CD stun initiation to pure, Betboom can fight Talon so much more easily. So this Centaur ban is just perfect through and through. Looks like they banned the, chose to ban Chaos Knight. So once again, they're giving up the Morta and they banned their own Dawnbreaker. They took the Tusk, but it's no Dawn Tusk. So it's going to be interesting to see how Talon follows up in the second phase and giving the Nightfall with Murta again. But you did like seeing uh, Kuyu on his Tusk, right? The melee, no, basically, the, you mentioned yes. the only melee position yes. for that is currently in the yes. meta. That's that's Q's specialty. I really feel like Q is a melee, melee uh, support specialist, and he really sets up the Mikoto's games really well. One hero I really like against Tusk, maybe not straight away, but uh, I think you might need to get rid of Grimstroke because this hero kills Tusk. The silence is the leash mechanic. You throw Grim ulti on one of the heroes that you are trying to focus, and Tusk can blink Snowball, save him because he's going to get leashed immediately. Hmm. Oh, no, no, no. They gave up Spirit Breaker. This hero is a monster late game. 
This and what, what does it do for Vetpum? It gives them that easy initiation, that short cooldown initiation on, on pure. pure. On it could potentially pure. be flexed to GPK, but if you have a Spirit Breaker, there's not difficulty for you to take a fight. You just have the vision and you go in over and over again, and it's so difficult to catch him. So this was a mistake giving this away. I feel like you give anything but this hero away. That sounds like a high tempo early game strat, though. Nothing of the, of the late game. Or does Spirit Breaker uh, work beast. all the time? He's a beast league, and this Spirit game is so hard to stop. Game. I mean, there, to be fair, there is an Invoker, and there is a Shadow Demon in the pool, which are some of the better heroes against the Spirit Breaker. I think yeah. Shadow Demon specifically, because you Shadow do, is the best. you can like go through the BKB or the Purge, get rid of that Bulldoze. That's why that hero is so annoying. It's just, he's going in and out and you just can't stun him, right? It's obnoxious and he does a lot of damage. He does everything pretty much. Pretty much. Yeah, <laughs> like it's all you need to get your scaling, strong lane, and they left the Grimstroke, so they pick up the, they burn the Murta Phoenix, which I felt like it should be the Murta Grimstroke instead. So now they're going to get the Grimstroke Spray Breaker, in case people at home don't know, the combo is to you. So uh, Inkspell the Spirit Breaker, so he gets bonus move speed, and you get the Inkspell move speed talent bonus, so he even charges even stronger, stun into stun. So you have to ban Shadow Demon here, make sure Bev Boom, yes. I believe. So Elephant in the room, Invoker, still in the pool, GPK looking at that Invoker, eyeballing it. Also, another solution to Spirit Breaker, I feel could any, a reliable, a strong laner from mid that builds you. So something like Alina, could be an effective answer. It's also something that could lane against a potential invoker. Yeah, that's a good point. I wanted to mention that maybe supports on Talon this time around are not going to be able to go as greedy. You will need like one Yule Scepter to deal with this Spirit Breaker because it's going to become super annoying if you can't stop him from charging in. You're going to be in a lot of trouble. Yeah, I know one of the Talon strategies against Spirit Breaker that they did early in the tournament where I tried to copy was Morphling. And uh, so team started like uh, always having Morphling in mind against Spirit Breaker. However, that's the issue with that is that if the Spirit Breaker team clicks AA, now you can't Morphling. Uh, and the reason why Morphling counters uh, Spirit Breaker is because now you get Spirit Breaker in your team. Of course. First. That's always the counter, just become the broken hero. Exactly. <laughs> but how do you feel about Morphling overall in this meta compared to the more popular carries we've been seeing like Spectre or CK? Morphling um, takes some time to come online. I feel like uh, the strength of the hero before is you would buy Agadims to take away the stats, but now that that's gone, you lose, you just become a regular range carry. So why pick a regular range carry Morphling when you know you can pick Dark Willow, which cannot be targeted, mm -hmm. or Murta, which also cannot be targeted, and uh, Luna, targeted. which farms at a thousand GPM. So it's not, it's like at a lower tier list compared to the other carries. Oh, they're doubling down on it. Wow. We talked about like those heroes being in the pool, good for Spear Breaker. Bethboom doesn't really care, and Talon, they're like, we'll take both of them. So this is not going to be an easy game for Spear Breaker to charge into until he has BKB. That'll help for some Invoker, but Shadow Demon will always be good. Also, they take the Invoker away from yes. Bethboom. I mean, this is a contested hero between both of these mids. It's their most played hero, and you have that natural Yule Scepter built into this Invoker. So mm -hmm. you have a means with dealing the Spirit Breaker. He's never going to be able to charge you mid or kill you. And one of the heroes Moon mentioned was Luna. It's not an option anymore now that you do have Shadow Demon on your team, so that's definitely gone for Bedboom to pick it. Maybe Spectre could come in, but then again, you're also creating delusions of the Spectre, making her not move in a fight, but uh, maybe they need to risk it a little bit more and just try to kill this Shadow Demon with Spectre, Spirit Breaker, one hero that provides vision. They're gonna call those Storm, I think, because yeah, they, they want to do the uh, like comfort match thing again. They've, they've, they've been doing this all like uh, group stage. They wanted it earlier today. They wanted it group stage. So like, even though they counter pick it themselves, picking Storm into Invoker, mm -hmm. a hero that uh, that traditionally counters Storm because EMP burn his mana in lane. They are like, I do I DC. I just want to go and play my hero at TI. Yeah. Took my Invoker. I'll play my other hero, which is Storm. I think you go Terror Blade or Morphling here for 23. Both look good. I know a lot of teams have been prioritizing having TB for Spear Breaker in the laning stage. Really strong lane. You've got a Shadow Demon on your team. Mm -hmm. Any high agility hero might be good. What about some good old Faceless Void? They don't have any kind of save inside a Chrono. The, the combo with the Invoker eventually is going to be there. Time Dilation kills Spirit Breaker as well. Might be too much lockdown for a Faceless Void against a Spear Breaker. You do get like chains on pretty hard. And that can be a little bit rough, but it's possible. I'm, uh, whenever I see Faces Void in this meta, it's like hard to pick it because uh, you run out of damage. Everybody has a blade mill on heart, so you can't really kill anyone in the Chronosphere. Mm -hmm. And uh, other than that, like 
Yeah, you get the cool EMP with the, the Cataclysm combo, but then I don't think the Spirit Breaker is gonna die because he's gonna have like 4,000 HP late game type deal. And one cool combination they have with the Spirit Breaker Kato is whenever Spirit Breaker charges, you get the refresh, you get a second Spirit Breaker charge. And also the new build on Spirit Breaker where you go for Refresher as your like fourth, fifth yes. item, yes. and then the enemy carry, if you don't have anything to just lock it down, you can kill him. Like if you don't have any kind of save, they can kill you from 100 to zero. Yes. So they're doing their own, I'm going to have Spirit Breaker on my team strategy. This is awesome. I I felt like Bad Woman should have seen this coming because Talon did it before and maybe they could have preemptively blocked it or some AA, but Storm is uh, also pretty decent, I hear, against Morphling because it's a lot of magic damage versus uh, Morphling, which is what he's weak against. Yeah, and he has just a natural Lincoln Sphere buyer too, which makes it harder for Spirit Breaker to do his job versus him up until he gets his Octarine Axe. Mm -hmm. But, so what is the solution to this Morphling now? There's no Vessel Buyer right now on the side of Bad Boom. they don't really have any heal reduction. So we did this Dark in a... Willow carry. Yeah, we did <laughs> <laughs> It's good for Smurf, right? It, it is, it is, armor, it is. Right? You're not wrong, but yeah, it probably but should ban it. You can also turn into Willow and use the strat against him, no? You can target Willow if you have a Wind Waker, Octarine, like literally untargeted sure. for like spell 15 seconds. Why not? But you are right, you can technically do that, but... There are ways around it. Well, if you're in the shadow and you just have to throw a Bramble down randomly every single time, which is a little annoying, but if you're good at it, sure. you won't be able to do it. But there's not many heroes that like just ignore the high armor of Morphling, and I think Willow is a perfect hero for that. In Nightfall, if I'm Nightfall right now, I, just, I see Morphling, I see Invoker, and I'm Nightfall, the first thing I'm going to come to my head is I'm going to pick Naga Siren. Because it's such a Nightfallish hero, you outskill the more playing, yeah. you push the lanes out, delay the game, you get six slots, so your Spirit Breaker will get six slots, they, they can't end the game with more fling type deal. And then probably Ben jabs Brewmaster, because they're banning Night Stalker, which is a dead giveaway that they want Brewmaster. Yeah, we Another saw option would be a Scotty Buyer, right? Like Terrorblade. But the thing about Terrorblade is playing against the AoE damage Invoker and Disruption. Mm -hmm. Maybe Naga actually sounds like the better Illusion hero of the two. Yeah, because Terrorblade can get countered by the Shadow Demon, but the uh, Naga doesn't. Naga's actually getting a Shadow Demon because you don't only really care if you ball one Illusion, you just have so many. And it's also getting an Invoker because you can dispel Cold Snap because you're rushing Manta style. Uh, there is one, uh, you know, Tala could throw in a, a wrench here because if they are very worried about it, there is also the option of them picking it up because Jab's hero is last. We all know Jab's last. Oh, you're right, Naga. you're right. The awfully <laughs> Naga Star and the legendary Jab's. We lost to that. It's yeah. no joke, honestly. No, you just no. Cut waves, pull wave, drag waves. You can't really lose the off lane, and then the Q on Tusk just didn't keep ganking mid. You can't really punish it. So you give the carry free form, but you don't really care because Mikoto's winning his lane. Yeah, I mean, I think there's four carry heroes that look pretty good. The Naga you mentioned look good. PL would also be really good in this game. Yeah, would be amazing. Uh, Dark Willow, and if you're feeling spicy. Oh, they banned it. They banned it. And perhaps a Drow if you're feeling spicy. Ooh, Drow Ranger. That was the fourth on my list. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, Moon, like, what happened to Bloodseeker? Because this hero with shard has percentage-based damage. Everybody has 5,000 HP. Maybe it's not the best against Shadow Demon because it takes away your damage, but against Morphling, he's on low HP all the time, pretty much. Is that potentially viable? It's definitely viable because uh, all the heroes right now have uh, really more heart, so they get 5,000 damage. So eventually, you just like do a ton okay. of damage. Um, is this an offlane puck? <laughs> offlane puck? What is happening here? Maybe it's a Japs offlane invoker and a puck mid. I don't know. Your man. guess is good <laughs> as mine. <laughs> hey, but if we're guessing, maybe Bad Boom is guessing as well, which uh, might put their last pick in a little bit more of a tricky situation. I kind of like this puck pick, even though we don't know where it's going, because you have an extra solution to the Storm Spirit early on. I mean, puck traditionally has been his counter with the coil early on, whether it's from mid or not. But you also have the hero on your team who's going to buy Yule Scepter as an extra defense against Spirit Breaker. Also, you're playing against these two damage-dealing backline supports, like Keeper of the Light and Enchantress. You're going to need some added jump, right? Your Morphling can't really go in first. He needs to have the fight set up for him. Your Shadow Demon can't do it. Your Invoker cast spells from the back. And your Tusk isn't going to do it reliably. So you have this puck with the coil. It'll do his job. Yeah, Bad Poop, they have very limited amount of lockdown. So this puck... Uh... They're still not showing where it's going, but uh, this hero can be easily killed. Like, you can easily dodge the charge. It needs to be Storm Spirit, or you, you need to misuse your abilities to be ganked. Yeah, and this is the PL that you talked about, Fear. Do you want to elaborate on it? 
Oh, it's just a really hard to kill PL this game. Like, toss Shadow even do nothing. With Invoker, you can always get out of the Ice Wall and Cold Snap combo. Really good versus the Morphling as well. Morph can't man fight a PL almost ever. Puck is very good versus PL, though, and that's probably why they picked it. They expect it to come out. But with the new way the PL plays, like with the Aghanims and sitting back, it's a lot harder to get on top of them. So they realize these games go late game. So they're playing for the late game here. They want to have the better scale. Yeah, and it will be the offline Invoker. I believe that's a first for us. That's a something. That's a something. You put offline invoker versus PL? I feel like PL's free farming that lane. He is indeed. He's going to free that... farm, he's going to buy Midas, he's going to get Ags, and you're going to have a tough time going Hagrid. And trust me, when you play more versus PL, you are on a timer. So Talon have to try to look to end this game early. Oh, Talon put themselves on a timer a little bit. But correct me if I'm wrong, but 23 Savage is considered the best Morphling player in the world. He considers himself to be, but oh. yes, he's very confident in the hero. He loves the hero. But with that being said, I don't think Morphling will outscale the Storm Spirit plus PL duo core of Red Boom. And Invoker is already countered inside of this game. Spirit Breaker is going to catch him easily. PL is going to win in lane, and they have jump to get him. So yeah, it's a tough one for Talon, but they have their signatures, so. Yeah. Yeah. That being said, Japs is the GOAT. He won uh, with a Swiftling Weaver. He can't win with anything. <laughs> he, he can win with a Swiftling Invoker this game. He can do, if anyone's going to do something unconventional and win the game, it's definitely Japs. Oh, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. It's a game three. I think everybody's going to have a great time either way. And the great times are going to get even greater because they're going to listen to Lyrical and Cinderin. Thank you so much, Shiver. And indeed, we're here for another one. You know, sometimes what happens is you get like a crazy game one game and a crazy game game two, and then three is a stomp. But we've got offlane invoker, so it's either a stomp or it's going to be insane again. What do you think? I'm ready for a 67 minute stomp in this one. <laughs> okay. That's <laughs> what it's going to be. I mean, it's kind of interesting those two games were that close in duration, right? Right. They're both. It's like this narrow little window. Oh, tier fives come out, one crazy fight, and things get things get handled. In all seriousness, though, I think this game is less likely to reach that point, but I wouldn't, still wouldn't be surprised <laughs> if it does. You know, the, the way these teams play and the way this the meta is shaping up is generating <laughs> these very long duration games, and they've definitely picked for it. Now, let's see how this smoke transpires before we analyze the drafts a little bit more here about how they're going to put the lanes and what they're trying to do. Talent oh. will break here. Just on the edge, Nightfall. Has to take Doppelganger level one. That's a win. Yeah, at the same time, it's not that significant because I think the nature of this bottom lane is relatively defensive from the PL side. I think he just wants to hit creeps anyway the first couple of waves without... He's not going to go super aggro with a lance and running at the enemy off lane. So it's, it's maybe... It's probably okay. Now, what I wanted to talk about quickly here is Caudal in this game because I think uh, Bedboom's lineup is really interesting. I love when Caudal has multiple friends to use Chakra on. Storm is a classic... You obviously, you give him more mana, he can jump further in the fights, he can do more damage. But the Spirit Breaker Caudal is also a really interesting synergy, because giving Spirit Breaker mana all the time and giving him the double charge in a fight is actually incredibly powerful. And you look at Bet Boom's lineup, they can push waves forever. Oh, yeah. Spirit Breaker, Storm, and Caudal. <laughs> like, Talon are going to be hard-pressed if they are in a timer like Moon Meander said. They're going to be hard-pressed to actually get the waves in the right position to go high ground, right? It's just going to be these elusive heroes pushing from the trees, jumping with zero commitment. Um, and I'm curious to see how Talon handled it. I, I think it's interesting, too, because they can go back to what uh, I think Moon said on the panel in, in between game number one and game number two, that he felt like the way that you beat Talon is you get three scaling cores and you just try and outbeat them in the late game. And it does feel like in a lot of ways that's the direction that Betboom have gone as this series has progressed. They say, okay, we're going to come up with answers uh, that are later and later to deal with you. Um, but then the question is, how do you deal with the experience of Talon and the decision making uh, that they are capable of in those late game scenarios. I, I still can't believe that the last game ended in the fashion that it did so quickly. I kind of wonder, you know, now going into this game number three, if the momentum's going to stay with Bedboom um, or if Talon's going to be able to revitalize themselves a bit. Uh, I, I would say, speaking of experience in the late game, I think given how Talon has a lot of experience with that, I feel like that last game must have been... It must feel quite bad because, yeah. honestly, that felt like... As crazy as the defense and the win was for Bedboom, I really feel like Talon dropped the ball deal it, deal in, it, the, in the stage of the game that's supposed to be their forte over every other team in this tournament. Like, that's supposed to be where they shine, is that super late game. But they made the buyback mistakes. They didn't have the cold veins when it mattered the most, right? So, 
Yeah. Um, it it, it makes me less confident that if Talon managed to get there, that they're just going to outperform Bet Boom in a super late game situ situation, especially because I think this is an incredibly good PL game. Right. Uh, I think what was talked about in the panel is a really good point. Fear was pointing out PL's way of playing is different now than it used to be. It's le even <laughs> you. It's almost unbelievable, but it's even less commitment. <laughs> you can actually win fights from a thousand range away if you're farmed enough. So I that's mean, going to be something Talon have to solve somehow. Well, the other thing they're going to need to solve. I mean, I was we were watching Trent and I the game earlier today, and he was saying that GPK's best hero is Storm, and you're looking at this mid matchup again He's into something obliterating that's Mikoto. thought of as a counter, right? Like Pug against wow. Storm, 15 and three versus eight and zero. Oh. GPK knows how to play this Storm. I think this is the, in the first few waves, this is the biggest victory today relative to lane theory, right? Of how this goes that we've seen in any lane. 17 for three against what's probably going to be 11-0 here on the puck. It might not sound like much, but the fact that GPK will more than likely get the faster level six could lead to, you know, some sideline uh, side lane shenanigans. Maybe he will even kill the puck if there's a bit of a misstep from Makoto. So... Yeah, that's very good news for him in that lane. Particularly when you consider that there's a Spirit Breaker in this one. Obviously, oh, yeah. you're in a position three, not always wanting to make the same type of rotations, but it's definitely possible when level six comes around the Storm. Yeah, that's one of the good things for Puck in this game, obviously, which was part of the rationale behind picking it, is that it's one of the hardest heroes in the game to charge. Yeah. Uh, but once Spirit Breaker gets Shadow Blade, the dynamic can change quite drastically. You get caught out of nowhere if you don't have sentries down or a gem. Um, all of a sudden, the, the matchup that you meant to counter can be dangerous, especially because of the follow-through that the team has with the Storm, right? Storm plus Spirit Breaker is a very fearsome duo once the map breaks down and the lanes get pushed. So let's talk about this off-lane Invoker for a second. Something that we oh, haven't got yeah. to even talk about at all. Universal Hero now uh, building into a Wraith Band, trying to get some extra armor. How much of a concern is it not getting levels on this guy in the same fashion because you're dual laning? Uh, I think it's the right call from Talon if they did want both Invoker and Puck to give Puck the levels because of the better matchup against Spirit Breaker and Storm than Invoker has. Uh, but yeah, as far as core Invoker offlane, we've seen quite a few support Invokers this tournament have success. So you're not going to have less experience than that, right? You're going to have the same uh, or more. But the, the odd thing for me is how he's going to find impact with the Exhort, right? Because you want Sunstrike kills when you're playing this hero as Exhort. But where are they going to come from? The Tusk is playing in your lane against PL tough ask, right? Mid lane, when Storm gets six, probably also kind of tricky to kill. Maybe top? I don't know. Disrupt into Sunstrike combo with Morph Waveform? I mean, yeah, it definitely feels like it's playing more for that late game scenario. Maybe like after a oh. disruption or something. And well, Thra, Tokyo does take a lot of damage there. And with the hits coming in, well, just like that, Jabs manages to get involved and get a kill. Q, he's going to pay the price as he falls after. As we all expected, <laughs> offlane invoker kills Ench oh. minute five in his lane. <laughs> well, maybe he's in some more trouble with oh, the creep right is. in front. DL, I think back to the days when it used to be P is the answer to Invoker out of the mid lane. True, actually. That's damn, that's some old school knowledge right there. That I would have not thought of that matchup, actually. That's true. GPK, he's in no man's land, but he turns to fight in Toronto, Tokyo right there. Sunstrike coming in for the help. Another couple of hits. GPK gets the kill onto Q, but the miss uphill. Makoto can't quite finish the job. Hey, GPK, eat some tangos. <laughs> they just filled up his entire backpack with tangos in half a second. Toronto gave him one, save gave him two, and left. Well, he's going to munch on that for a while. I don't know where the third one went. Did he give it back to Ench? He might have. Yeah. Maybe he destroyed it. He's like, I don't want your food. Looking now, six-minute mark. Uh, save is in a very awkward position here. <laughs> actually going to deny the rune. And probably madness. escape too. Hard to run down that Coddle who's very quick. Double bounty runes and up top. Looking for a bash. Almost got it onto 23 Savage, but. How do you know? Well, <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> Almost got the kill, if not for the bash. See, there it was. Clearly. Why are you guys calling me out like that? <laughs> I mean, if you uh, if you know what's coming next, yeah, I have a business proposal for you. But <laughs> if you can predict RNG, oh, Jabs is in big ass trouble here. No Wex point. 
just getting cycloned, or rather, hurricaned into the PL. About to get a bash. Okay. All right. <laughs> no, not quite. Trouble. Mining light pushback. Pure still hurting as the hits come oh, through. The tower the tower oh, the tower shot. Oh, Not enough. Survives. Okay, that will be the rundown. Q gets him. And oh, double wisdom runes got by Talon. Makoto got in and snuck one. That is actually huge here because the laning stage right now is going very well for Bet Boom overall. PL, as we talked about, will be free farming against this invoker, but not only that, he got a kill on two assists. The storm mid is doing great against the puck. PL has 20 denies, by the way. Yikes. That is quite unusual. They're going to try to turn this into something, though. Can they do enough damage? Moving forward, it will dodge one. Sun Strike hits. All right, Jab's been getting the practice in on this offlane invoker. I think his best bet there was to just snap the coil instantly. I'm actually surprised he didn't do it. There's three heroes hitting him, right? Yeah. You take that damage, you take the stun, and then you can at least use your doppelganger to dodge a spell, like maybe a snowball, maybe you can dodge Sunstrike, you know? But there was maybe a way of living there? Don't know. Not able to get out. Unfortunate for him. And now... Koto, nice silence. Oh! Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Haste in a pop. Relax, Lyrical. It wasn't that exciting. All right, here comes GPK. Haste in. Push back. Look at it. Steal. Bet Boom are putting a lot of emphasis on getting GPK the start that they want. I think it's a recipe for success, too. I feel like a lot of the game's bed boom struggle is where GPK loses his lane and, and plays recovery. I think the way their team dynamic works, uh, Nightfall is in a lot of their games farming very much for a very long time. So if GPK is enabled, that can bridge that gap while Nightfall farms it up. And the good news is this game, Pure, is also going to be super active, right? Like, you oh, cannot... You can technically just farm jungle with Spirit Breaker with a Midas for 20 minutes. I would not advise it, but it is a valid strategy. I don't think that's the plan here, though. No. Not Ollie's in trouble. Didn't quite manage to catch him with the Illuminate Blast. The disruption will be there. And Ollie hits the deck. So making use of this haste drone, as you mentioned it, getting active with GPK, what they need to do. Um, likely that it, on the side of Talon, I mean, who are you going to be playing with? Like the Tusk Puck, probably? Yeah, for me, the X Factor here is the Sun Strike. I actually think Jabs is going to be very important with this particular spell in this game. That sets up enough there to 23, get the kill. Nice so one. yeah, I mean, if he can make it happen like that, it's very clutch. Yeah, Tusk Puck plus Sunstrike can kill quite a few of the heroes here. Uh, Spirit Breaker, I actually think they can kill anyone at this point. They should be able to with those two plus a Sunstrike. Should be fine. Midas coming out for Nightfall. He is going to keep ramping up. Yeah, Talon with a, a little bit of an aggressive maneuver here. It's difficult for them to truly pressure this tower, though Toronto Tokyo has shown up. He's taking a center conqueror. That's probably going to be the end of that. Well, and in the meantime, mid is sort of a back and forth, but it's up top where you're cutting waves on pure. The creeps hitting into the tier one tower. This tower is eventually going to go down. Yeah. He will go Midas on the Spirit Breaker. Like I said, it is valid but I don't think he's going to just flat out be spam farming for the next 10 minutes. I think there's a good... I think there's good reason to look for skirmishes even while you feel like you have a good strategy with the PL just farming up. Because even making aggressive moves is also safety for Nightfall, right? It's like yeah. the best defense in this game might actually just be a strong offense because if the enemy team is putting out fires, PL will be completely unaccounted for for the next 15 minutes. On the other thing that we're seeing is that PL definitely is not going to be showing up to any type of a fight. Oh, no. Uh, he has got the Midas as well and going straight Ags after, so not even stopping for one of those little items along the way. A very slow pace, and it is definitely going to be up to the combination of GPK on Storm pairing together with Save refilling his mana to make some stuff happen. But I don't, I don't know if he can shut down all of the Heroes of Talent. I mean, somebody is going to be getting some farm on the map, for sure. Oh, yeah. I mean, Talon are going to get their own. I don't think this is going to be a significant advantage for Bet Boom network-wise. Then it's about how the lineups phase off when, when we're 25, 30 minutes in. Because Invoker went Midas, he's going to be farming. Uh, Puck with a Witchblade is probably going to find a couple of kills, I would assume. Oh, yeah, 23 on more. We don't really need to cover that too much. He's shown, he's shown what he can do in this hero. He'll be keeping up on farm with the PL, probably. Most definitely. And in the meantime, GPK also content to sit here and get to where he needs to be, even with the sort of kill runes. 
um, which is maybe a little bit surprising. Gets the DD, doesn't make for any type of a play, and instead they're going to try and go on to pure. So with this wraparound, having Dream Coil should be more than enough to find pure as he tries to run away, not going all that fast. Yeah, Shadow Demon also very good at dealing with the, the Spirit Breaker. It's one of Spirit Breaker's nightmare matchups. It's the reason Talon picked at this game is to counter that one hero, because Demonic Purge is all game is going to remove Bulldoze, which is a big problem for Spirit Breaker. And once Bulldoze is removed, if you're charging with the Demonic Purge on, you're barely moving. Uh, you can save people with Disruption from the Nether Strike combination. It's just a really feels good matchup from the support role. But still, despite killing that Spirit Breaker, it is a 2k gold lead now for Bet Boom, getting the mid tower on GPK. Big punish. Doesn't really make that Spirit Breaker kill worth it at all when you lose that tower for it. Betboom are also going to try to convert this into something extra. Nice scan coming out here from Talon. I mean, they smoked right in front of them. There, there was no way that Talon did not see that. Uh, and will be going immediately at the Tier 1 tower. GPK stepping up front and center. They have a Troll Creep too, so this is going to go down. Yep. Uh, Talon have shown that they will let the Tier 1 towers go for not a whole heck of a lot. But they do have Dream Coil back up in five seconds. So as they retreat, this might be a moment where Bet Boom are gonna have to be a little careful. It's all coming together. And I, I just wanna I feel like we didn't cover this, but this hero, uh, the PL on Nightfall, is I wanna say the hero that he made a name for himself with. Uh, we we've talked about player hero combinations. Hang on, let's see if he actually survives this. Oh. We'll snap it instantly this time. Breaks, chase, sunstrike out! Is it enough? Doppelganger gets out of there, but the Shadow Demon ulti on top. Will it be enough to make him pop? Not quite. 50 HP. Ollie going to disrupt himself, trying to stay alive. Pure getting hit. Q also dropping lower and lower. So Q is going to die. Pure barely surviving. Both heroes getting away. Oh, nothing at 23 Savage. He switches over. Almost got that Nether Strike off, continuing to run in. 23 chasing. A couple more hits. Still a ways away before Charge is going to be back up on his morph. But with a one last right click, it's enough to take down the Enchantress. Very, very close there. Nightfall getting out. It's obviously huge for Bet Boom. But I'm surprised Talon got a good, that good fight out of it afterwards, right? They committed so many spells on the PL who then lives. And the counterplay comes through and they immediately lose a hero. But they still turn that into somewhat of an even exchange. Actually coming out slightly ahead because of the nature of the heroes that they killed versus the ones they lost. Um, but yeah, just to finish off my thought from before, Nightfall, the two heroes that I feel like he made a name for himself with was PL and Ursa. Mm. Uh, and Ursa we're not really seeing being very popular in the patch right now, so I think he's just happy in an elimination game like this, you know, everything is on the line. He gets to play one of his absolute trademarks in a game that is looking really good in. And likewise, we talked about it, and I think the panel talked about it as well. Shiver mentioned 23 Savage when he originally made his first splash on the big scene. Think back to that Genespris lineup with Gunner. Uh, it was on the Morph lane back when Morph Shaker was still a thing. Uh, and pairing it together in this game with the Spear Breaker, I mean, on the other team, it's it's one of the best heroes that you yeah. can grab with it. So For sure. this is going to be a, a battle of the Siggies, as people say. See who yep. comes out on top. I don't know what people you talk to. The people I talk to don't say that. <laughs> I think you're actually the only person who says that. Dude, that's an Avery line. You can't take that. This is definitely... That does not make it any better. <laughs> now it's you and Avery saying it. That's even worse. If you want to mimic people... Yes. Like, here's a little crash course for you, okay, my friend? If you want to mimic people, Avery is like at the absolute bottom... Oh, no. ...of people you want to mimic. That's it. That's the lesson. That's very simple. <laughs> Well, 15 minutes in as we all get a little bit of a lesson in who to mimic and who not to. We've got a thousand gold separating the two teams. And Bat Boom trying to hunt with GPK and save. Not sure if they're going to be able to find quite anybody there, but get a deep ward down, and that's already Hagen and Scepter done for Nightfall. He's farmed. It's impressive that Morph is keeping up this well, though. I mean, I, I was saying they were probably going to be quite even, but. Given the the way this last fight with Morph showing up and spending quite a lot of time in the fight, he's still he's still keeping it. They're basically neck and neck here. Um, I wonder if this dynamic changes now with the axe coming out. If this is when PL starts overtaking Morph a little bit in speed. Um, obviously, he will also be. We talked about the chakra friends. PL also loves getting chakra, so that's another one. Gross. Just keep his farm running in fights. Double spirit lance is very strong. 
effectively, cr it just generates your entire armor of uh, army of juxtapose instantly, right? If you get double phantom lands off with the eggs. Yeah, that could be a huge problem. And, you know, we've talked about just the one-on-one -on -one of Morphling getting all the mana drain, but, I mean, you're going to have kind of an invoker sitting around, not moving too quickly. Um, even the Shadow Demon and the, the Tusk could potentially be problems uh, once they get all that mana drain from them. But, I mean, the, the big question is, are we actually going to see any of those fights? I, I feel like as much as, you know, having the Ags is nice for Nightfall, might just wait for Diffusal Blade too, and who knows, maybe a oh, couple more sure. items. I, I mean, we saw a game the other day with K1. Yeah. Effectively, <laughs> I think he got his first assist like 40 minutes in the game or something, 35. And he went this exact order of items as well. He went Treads, Midas, Ags, Diffusal. I think he got Manta and then showed up to a fight, didn't get an assist, farmed another item, and then I think he got an assist. If I remember correctly, it was a it was a long rock, rocky road for the PL before he got involved. That is a Hector classic. But it, the thing is, it feels good, right? It's you're playing a high pressure game. There's a lot on the line. Feeling like if nothing happens, you're comfortable is really good for player mentality, right? Obviously, some of the great teams in the world will play higher risk stuff and take you know, play aggressively and win the game that way and just outclass their opponents. But in these games where it's so so slow, yeah. You don't you don't wanna go down on on timing, right? No. You wanna feel like, okay, the average game time in this series is sixty eight minutes. We don't wanna feel like we're under pressure at fifty five, you know? And I think neither team feels that. I personally am favoring the Betboom lineup slightly in the later portions of the game, especially because I think Caudal is a real wild card in this one with Chakra and an inevitable Ags. But, you know, Morph Invoker are exceptionally strong late gamers, and Puck has changed a lot since a few years ago. This hero doesn't fall off. It used to, have to, it hit, used to hit a wall at like minute 40, 45, where it's like, okay, what can you really do now? But with the talents and the itemization that you can go for now, Puck can carry games ultra late as well. So Talon probably aren't too worried either. Well, and this is just their normal operating speed as well, right? Like, yes. They, they could go into this with two random heroes that don't do anything. Oh, I like that play by the Spearbreaker too. Pure putting his courier onto the hard camp so he can charge away. Yep. Pretty nice. I mean, you have a lot of brain power for this if there's no fighting. Then you can use all your energy on <laughs> how can I farm the most efficiently? Which, again, brings me back to game one, where yeah. Betboom didn't stack a single camp for their Sven. <laughs> you know? You're not getting over it. <laughs> no, I mean, what about this game, you know? Yeah. Like, That's stack true. some camps for your Storm, your Spirit Breaker, you have Caudal to stack with, you have Inch Creeps to stack with, PL can farm stack. Uh, they're, they're not putting a lot of emphasis on it, and I, it's kind of interesting for me to see because we have other teams in this tournament that stack the crap out of the jungle, right? Team Liquid, for example, are putting a lot of emphasis on it. Gaming Gladiators are putting a lot of emphasis on it. Those two teams are looking quite good right now. So I think maybe there's a little bit of a lesson to be learned for other teams in prioritizing that more. The slower the game gets, the more it's about economy. That's also how you bring your supports into the game better later, because they get both experience and gold for you farming ancient stacks, right? So everybody benefits. It does feel like the type of thing that, uh, you know, will give you that little extra edge. And granted, Bedboom are still farming out a huge chunk of the map themselves. Uh, they're with a slight lead right now. Uh, again, probably due to some of those Midas's. Jeb's the one with it on the side of Talon. Uh, and they're actually going to go for a smoke play themselves now on Bedboom. And heading towards the area that Talon are sitting in as they go for an early Roche. Oh, this would be huge if they could get there. Are they going to realize what's going on? It seems like it. Drawing the straight line here is pure. He knows exactly what's happening. He has the Octarine Core and his Spirit Breaker. Still needs to really respect the Shadow Demon. Ollie in a very good position right now. Oh, Roche, it's not low enough to jump in. Do they have enough there? Tries to back out, able to get out of the pit for the moment. 23 low, but Jabs, he's already gone. Q is in trouble, going to fall. 23, can he get out? Save is gone, but it's not nearly enough. Talon, they lose three for only one, and Makoto, he's still in trouble. Roche is now low and bet. Oh, he got the mana from the vortex. This one off as they find Chase and finish Ollie. I mean, it's just devastation in the pit. I love that play from GPK. They have to read that Roche is happening. He's just jumping in first. He's jumping in first, immediately repositioning himself so he doesn't get counterplayed by the puck. And 
Honestly, that was a super good snowball from Q. Almost instant on the initiation to offset the initial, you know, pressure that they were putting with the Storm as well as Spirit Breaker. But the problem was, even though that snowball goes off, they, they can't re reset, right? They have no. no, there's no exit path for the dire lineup. And this is effectively Bet Boom getting a complete freebie. That is huge. And one of the moments, too, where you think about it, none of those plays were made in game number one or game number two by Talon. They never felt compelled to make right. some type of pressure play as oh. that boom, <laughs> getting close to destroying their own I mean, uh, I was allies. I was about to say they've learned, but I'm, it's so close every time that I don't know. <laughs> I think they're just, they're rolling like a 20-sided die every time. And if Ollie? it's five or lower, they die. <laughs> Ollie? Oh, careful there, buddy. He's solving up, and okay, 23 is going to finish it off, so Q gets the shard. No, but I, I think that, that that last fight is really telling of maybe Talon's position in this game, and if they're feeling like they have to get something done earlier. You would also think they feel that way when they go Vessel on Invoker, right? Like, you're going this tempo item that's meant to kill on an Exhort Invoker offlane? Mm. But then you're still just farming jungle. So is this vessel serving a purpose? Like in that fight that they just had, if Jabs gets caught by anything, he just dies. He has no defensive item. No four staff, no BKB. You know, a lot of the time, Exhort Invokers go pike, and it's for a reason, right? Uh, in this game, vessel into BKB, very delayed, very slow. And I honestly think this is starting to look very scary for Talon. Not I mean, 6k gold is one thing, but the, the overall trajectory of the game with the way their heroes are building up, Bedboom are going to hit an insane timing with Spirit Breaker BKB, the PL Manta, and the Storm BKB, all coming out within two minutes of each other. And right. Talon won't have the solutions yet, so they kind of have to dodge. I mean, I, I, I have been known to have definitely a lot of problems with Bedboom at time. It feels like sometimes their mentality can be a bit fragile, but this series has been a whole new Bedboom, I feel like, in a way. When so many moments have happened where they could have given up, thrown in the towel, they stuck with it, and in this game, they're looking good, and now it's Talon that are going to be the ones that need to respond. You know, you're down 6,000 gold, it was about this time that Bet Boom were in a similar place last game, and they were able to take a fight that was on the opponent's side of the map, reset things a little bit. Can Talon do the same, or are they going to feel content just trying to push this to the later stages? Well, I think the man on your screens right now is the one who's going to have to do it. Because I think this offlane invoker has not accomplished what it wanted to, and Makoto's puck needs time. Uh, a lot of what makes mid puck succeed in many games and feel strong is getting a couple of kills and snowballing off that. He's 3-0 and 2, so he hasn't died. But in comparison to... Uh, he has the same net worth as Storm, but it's not transform It's not translating into the same amount of teamfight impact right now, right? Like, Puck is going to have to disengage a lot. He had to buy the Yule, so a lot of his net worth is defensive in nature. The Storm BKB is a lot more aggressive than the, St than the Puck Yules, right? It's going to convert this into way more damage than the Puck probably can. Um, and he had to buy that Yules or BKB because of the Storm Orchid. So you, you have to... You're, you're itemizing to solve problems. The enemy team is itemizing to pressure you. It's essentially what's going on, right? Um, so, yeah, it, it is a very tall order. And the reason I'm highlighting the morph so much is that I think this game for Talon is going to come down to big plays. I don't think playing, you know, just solid Dota is necessarily going to be enough. Somebody's going to have to pop off here. And the Morphling is the guy who can do it, turning into the Spirit Breaker. Gotta take a chance. Yeah. Absolutely. Probably wait the Aegis out, though. It's a minute away. Fair. I guess you just can see this top tower, to be honest. Like, I like this from Bet Boom a lot as well. Nightfall's alone up here, but since Talon don't have any information to go off, aside from, like, one rogue hero Find showing mid... Jump in. Toronto, Tokyo. Leash. Sprite tries to get away. Is it going to be enough for the kill? Yes! 23 is under control. They bring him down, though! Pure moves in and finishes off the Morphling. Oh, Talon, they lose a couple on that fight and just barely managed to take down Toronto Tokyo. He's very farmed, not an easy kill. Storm is dealing so much damage in these fights. It's it's quite scary, honestly. PL also getting involved there. Um, he did leave the top tower to participate instead. Obviously paid off big time. Dodging is going to feel like now the name of the game a bit, um, particularly after that last fight happens. Still, Aegis expiring. Maybe there's an opportunity there that you can do something. Um, but they are definitely on the side of Talon, gearing up for a later game scenario. Maelstrom, the item of choice for Makoto. Uh, he kind of has to get it against PL, right? You need a lot more just 
AoE damage to deal with these illusions consistently. Um, imagine he's hoping to get a free shard on the puck. You don't really want to buy that if you don't, unless you have to. TP's out before anything comes his direction. Now there's Jabs as BKB, so Ollie. he'll have a little bit more of a presence. That's the Orchid reveal. On to him. Ollie, nowhere left to go, so another pickoff. As you see Talon try and push off these side lanes, but every single kill, more gold into the coffers of Bet Boom. And the, honestly, this is the type of game that Coddle feels the best in, right? You... Your heroes are dominating the map. You're pushing out all the lanes. You can be a mana battery for anybody you want. And if nothing's happening, you can just push waves and farm jungle as a support. So with his shard as well, he just gave GPK a full refill. So he spent all his mana killing a support. It's like nothing happened. He's just straight back down. And Jab's there. You saw too uh, an unfortunate scenario. His Forge Spirits were out in front. That tipped off the PL that he was in the area and was able to doppelganger and get out. Might have been a pickoff potential there. But... Not quite able to find him. It's gonna take a lot to kill this PL, man. Oh, yeah. 3,200 health and 21 armor. We're 28 minutes in. Heart is gonna be completed in two minutes for Nightfall. Wait, what? <laughs> yeah. Jeez. Oh, he is big. That's why you buy this build. If you go Midas Ags and you're uncontested, well, you got 308 CS, right? It's. He started creating some serious distance to morph because 23 has died twice, so... Oh, in towards mid, though. They find and get a freebie. GPK goes down. Pure now caught in the SD ulti. Do they have a way to stop it? Doesn't quite look like it. So getting these types of pickoffs is what you need as talent. The charge is going on to Q. Makoto finds one. Save is there. They cancel the charge. Still thinking about a chase. Oh, great shards. in the shards. But... Sunstrike. Not quite enough, and the heals, that's going to keep Toronto Tokyo alive. It's going to take more of that from Talon, and I think they have to try to make these moves, however hard they may seem, because they kind of have to go and try to collapse on a hero and just blast them instantly and then reset and keep poking and prodding where you can to find kills. You're getting out farmed on the map, so without kills, this lead is going to keep going up from the side of Bed Boom, and that was a nice one. They found the, the Storm, one of the biggest kills in the game. He was 4-0, and zero, so an extra bit of kill bounty there. The biggest winner in that, obviously, Jabs. I think he got almost a 1,000 gold from that kill. He's now going to be working on a link cast. Oh, I'm hearing recall 23. Fine save right away, but the bash, it connects. Can they bring him down? Snowball save. Gets him out of trouble, but can he get away? Now the charge through from 23. He's in Spirit Breaker form. Pulled back in, in Bulldoze, keeping himself alive. Waveform tries to separate. 23 Savage, hoping to escape. Lincoln's, does he have a charge target? Tornado goes out, doesn't connect onto anything. Silence, though, in full strength form. Another Snowball save. Now connects onto Pure. Waveform away. Jabs his charge, Pure on top, charge on charge! Gets his buddy out of trouble. They lose the tusk, but fancy footwork from 23 Savage. Yeah, really good play under pressure there. That was super close. And dying on Morph here is very critical. So nice work in tandem by him and Tusk to get to get 23 out of trouble. Also, it's scary how clutch it needs to be, right? Oh, yeah. You have to. You really have to nail it. You have to turn to... And I wonder if there's value for pure in going Link hits you, actually, on this group. Like, just oh. try, to, try to prevent the Morphling from turning into you. I think it's a super high-value play. You charge into the fight, you pop BKB, and Morph can't ult you. Uh, that will convert into some kills. I, I would actually really like to see that from him, but he is currently eyeing up the, the Kaya Yasha, which is also going to be a standard build for this offlane Spirit Breaker. The only hero in Dota that buys this item, <laughs> I think, pretty much. Primal sometimes, but yeah, it's it's, uh, it's mainly Kaya Sanj, right? Oh yeah, good call. Yeah, Kaya Yasha. Kaya Yasha is like, is there any other hero that buys this? <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, Zeus with the lightning. Oh, true, hands build. lightning hand Zeus build. <laughs> Actually, true. Yeah, that's another one that can't buy it. But if you're you right. find that, you're probably losing the game anyways. So that is not true. No, you like the lightning hands? It's pretty good in some games. Yeah. Okay. All right. But um. Well, a 7,000 gold lead for Betboom. A little bit of stabilization for Talon. You can see Dota Plus feeling a certain way about it, but we've seen bigger comebacks even in just the last game. Yeah. As it gets later and later, that is known to swing a lot more depending upon heck more other variables. Buybacks being the most important. But Roche, it's going to be claimed down bottom by Betboom. And I wonder if they're going to turn this into an immediate smoke. 
Opting to get the Aegis here to Nightfall. I thought they were going to put it on GPK so he could play a super aggressive front. Oh, oh wait, what? That is a big one. That is a very big kill. So that was just a Shadow Blade into Storm TP Blast on the Puck. We talked about this earlier. Once Spirit Breaker has this item, the map for Puck gets really scary. He doesn't have Lincolns. And he's going to feel bad about buying it too, right? He's under so much pressure to deal damage because you kind of need to pick your poison here. Are you going to have a better build against Spirit Breaker? Are you going to have a better build against PL? I wouldn't want to have to make that choice as Puck this game. It's really tough. Like, you feel bad about buying either item, but you need to have them both, it feels. Yeah. So. Just needs a little bit more gold and not going to get it without winning some of these fights. Now, Pure is Shadow Bladed, runs through, finds him. Manta, dodge, turns into the Spirit Breaker form, has Bulldoze going, heal, but the oh. save comes out. Last second, Tornado lift up onto two, waveform away. 23 living, Ollie, not so much. And 23 Savage, get out! Ooh, out of mana. Or no, he actually got it off. Yeah, he had Lincoln's ready again. But it was close. Lincoln's there. If a charge connects, if anything connects, anything breaks the Lincoln's, that will be a dead morph. So again, I mean... Wait, what? Really clutch play? <laughs> uh, hello? Uh, Did yep. somebody forget that? A little olive branch here. Okay, we get it. Bit of ceasefire. <laughs> oh, nice. I, maybe that was intentional. Yeah, let's try to wrap our head around, heads around how that makes sense, what they did. <laughs> Just leaves it behind. Picks it up 10 seconds later. It was a bait. Absolutely. What were they baiting? I mean, yeah, same. <laughs> Me too, buddy. <laughs> um, yeah, so again, clutch escape from 23, but if the, if your highlight reel of this game is running away, yeah, that is, that is a, a problem, right? I mean, this is definitely, it's getting into dire territory. Uh, 13,000 net worth lead. They're gonna, I mean, tell you to take it for me. Oh, God, Ollie, please. It's fine. Invoker shard, so we'll get the EMP pull. I mean, they just need so many items. Honestly, like, you want SD ulti with Aghanims, you want Tusk BKB. All these things are so important to their fights. They're getting a Lincoln Sphere on Invoker for jabs, which you talked about. It can't help. It's just kind of a, a question of, are you going to get choked out across the map and be stuck in your base? That's what it feels like. Without looking, what do you think the next item of Ench is? Um, uh, Midas. Correct. Hey, let's go. <laughs> it's like flying it. out right now. He bought it as I said it, but... But viewers at home, Lyrical was actually not looking at his screen. He was looking away. That's how he casts most of the time. Yeah, makes sense. That explains a lot. <laughs> <laughs> 12,000. I wouldn't mind seeing a Midas on one of these others, but also each item is so integral to even defending the high ground. But they do get the Aghanim Scepter done for Pod. And he's going to need more and more charge from Pure. Turns, Walrus Punch, 23 on him, turns into pure form. Nether Strike, forces away from far away, and they have to just get out, because the, there's no way, like as soon as Bed Boom start collapsing onto you, it's over. This, uh, this Radiant lineup is so terrifying to play against from behind. The whole map is a minefield, you can get jumped, blasted, bursted. You kind of, you kind of need to juggle this really difficult balance of we kind of have to cover each other to not die when they make the move, but we also need to farm the map enough. It's such a difficult balance to strike. And I actually think Talon are doing a pretty good job. They're obviously experienced in this type of gameplay. The problem is they're not gaming. You're staying afloat. It's getting, you know, the gold is ever so steadily going more and more to Bet Boom. And in this game, all three of Bet Boom's cores are going to get enormous. It's just a given. You cannot stop that from happening anymore. There's um, also going to be a fourth core in Enchantress. True. Yeah, I, I, I mean, again, high ground is going to be the great equalizer, maybe. Uh, that's it, what it feels like at this point. Talon kind of have to depend upon, and maybe but that's on Bet Boom's terms, right? Exactly, it's true. No, I mean you're you're not wrong, and they might not give him that opening. Might not I don't ever. think they have to. I, I would not feel under pressure as of playing on Bet Boom's team right now. Just just chill, farm the map. Keep building an advantage. If you see an opportunity, go and kill someone. Otherwise, farm. Go Roche when you can. 
You know, since you did say we might see a 70-minute stomp, you might have been right. <laughs> As they charge on the floor, uh -oh. trying to catch him, the Hex, but Bulldoze from really good. That's already the Aegis down. Makoto wants to chase. They managed to find the Coil onto him right away, but no extra damage. They focused the wrong one. Didn't find the real PL Nightfall too quick on it. GPK gets lifted, also gets chakra And the reset is full. Off across the map. TP's out. And not able to get there in time with the charge on Pure. Pure is level 24 on Spirit Breaker. He's a monster. He is highest level in the game as offlane. GPK for comparison is level 20 on Storm. Jeez. Uh, that's just offlane Spirit Breaker with Midas and a whole map to farm. He has 400 CS. He could go and grab the Wisdom Rune now if he wanted to. Yeah, he almost has more CS than the Morphling. That is crazy. This hero has changed a, a whole lot. Yep. My goodness. It is being banned in a lot of games, this TI, for a reason. Going to be completing his Lincolns now. So there it is. The, the one answer that at times it's felt like they've had on the exactly. side of Talon of turning into the Spear Breaker, now that's taken away from them. He is tired of 23 shit. Okay. That could be only... This thing could be only one cow in this town. <laughs> And it's the OG cow. It's ready with the taunt, ready with the bodying powerfulness of it. 4,000 HP and continues to just eat up every wave. And Talon, now they are going to make a move across the map here, but their waves are pushing in. They might see pure, but you don't really want to go onto the space cow. I don't know if you get to choose your target here. You're just running in blind and hoping you find some sort of good start and that it forces an error from Bed Boom. Toronto Tokyo, they find him at the beginning. Walrus Punch, a couple quick kills, still not dead, but the waveform, that'll be enough to secure it. So Talon managed to get on the board for what feels like the first time in a very long time. Let's see what their last kill was. It's all the red dots down there, all yeah. the few of them. They killed a courier and nice. a ward and another ward. Uh, well, they killed GPK's Invoker minute 28, so it's been 10 minutes. Trying Talon to are back, you. baby. <laughs> Killed back. the inch. <laughs> Doing what they can. I mean, it, it is one of those moments where, as Bet Boom, you just need to keep farming and get to that, like, indomitable space. And for Talon, hoping to get a good fight around the Roche timing, which they have done. Roche capable of responding in 10 seconds. We'll see what the actual timing ends up being, as save is already set up down bottom here. I'm going to highlight Purist 25 talent here, plus 20% greater bash chance. Has the opportunity to maybe just flat out chain bash the morph. They find it immediately right on top of GPK starting to fall so quickly. That was a lot of damage out from 23. Does already pop BKP though. GPK can port to... No, actually he can't port. He, does, he has cooldown, so they can't recall him again. Well, somewhat low on the HP. Oh, and it's a long rush time. I mean, Morphling is getting to a pretty high damage amount with the Butterfly Daedalus completed. But having the freedom in these fights to actually hit is maybe another story. I guess that's the other thing, is that eventually Morph can turn into PL, too. Uh, PL can get a Lincoln's as well. Yeah. Not out of the question for this game, to be honest. I mean... Is it worth it over, say, a butter jump? Please? Oh, find okay. him. Pull back. Snowball save. Onto creeps, onto illusions. Wants to back out. Jabs, throws out the meteor. Q backs away in his BKB. Tornado to cover. Toronto Tokyo throwing some impetus shots, hitting from far away. Q walrus punch is dead. Now the rest of Talon uh -oh. need to find their way out of this fight. Charge through onto two. Wants to get onto save. Gets him. Wave for him through. That's a snipe. That one is hard to deal with. As they manage to find a kill, but do they have anything after? Gem still on the deck. 
charge. 23 Savage finds him. A couple more hits. Half HP, Nightfall there. EMP, jabs, needs to back out. BKB chase, do they have anything to kill him? Deafening Blast there for the pushback, but the Hex comes out. Ollie there for the save. Nightfall, he gets caught by the ultimate. Already onto him, trying to take him down. Doppelgamer to walk away. They don't have the damage though, and not another save on deck. 23 Savage is going to fall. Bet boom. It's just easier for them. I was really surprised Talon went for that play. They don't have their tusk there. That's the that's been 23 savior like five fights in a row. The snow, defensive snowball not present. He flat out just commits everything. Waveforms in and starts going on the PL, who's obviously going to doppelganger reset there. And then you're out of tools to play defensively on your morphling. You get cornered. You get killed. That is going to cost them dearly. Roche will also be going the way of Bet Boom. There's absolutely no way you can test this without your Morphling alive. Respawning in five seconds. Nightfall now getting 25 talent as well. So now his doppelganger cooldown is 5.3 seconds oh, no. with the spell prism. Well, if there's any slight silver lining for Talon, it's that it was an extra 15 seconds they had to wait on the Roche to spawn, which might give them enough time on Talon for Morphling to be back up, but again, if you're Bed Boom, I don't know if you have to go high ground again. You can keep farming up if they feel so inclined. But also, Bed Boom, it's been a long day for them. They had to play earlier today in the opening matchups. We'll see if they maybe feel the need to try and push this tempo and take to high ground earlier. Yeah, how much adrenaline do you have, guys? I know, right? Are the depots running low? <laughs> They have been playing Dota for a very long time. Yeah. What time did they start? 10 a.m. start. Hex out. Catches Q. GPK. Couple more hits. BKB. Fish punch. The charge is going to be there. And does have the snowball. Waiting for the blink away. Tries to get out, but no such luck. Yeah, they're drawing the line for the high ground push. There's a couple of ways of going about this. You can go super aggressive and utilize your Aegis and Cheese to start diving heroes in the base, or you can let PL poke and prod, take the tower with a thousand cuts, and see which one is their preferred method. I genuinely think in this situation, with the advantage they have, this is the kind of fight where Boom will actually not struggle that hard to go high ground. I think Talon's chance of defending here is so slim, as long as Nightfall can play like this, you're going to keep Illuminated healing him. He's going to keep poking the tower. He has the heart. So if you want to kill the PL, it needs to be a full-on commit. But his Doppelganger cooldown is five seconds. Oh, yeah. So how do you find that commitment? Oh, it's not easy. Will get the Meteor Ham. Meteor's down. Does a little bit of damage there. Disruption. Now turning on to GPK with the PL illusions. Those die. Makoto with Lincolns on him. Still sitting back sitting pretty. Tusk back up in five seconds. Bet boom. Do they stick around? Nightfall is barely being tickled. They're going to start to try and build up the Shadow Poisons, but it's a slow, steady burn that's not really doing that much. And honestly, Pure is just on the other side of the map. Nightfall, too strong, too hard to deal with. It's just going to finish off that range racks, and they might just go for more. Talon, you need to come up with an answer. They got to do something here. Got to find an answer. And Doppelganger, they even enchant the PL illusion. GPK thought about a jump, trying to bait something out. 23 Savage, still not anything online to really deal with this type of pressure. They have charge at the ready. They have so many different ways to get offensive on Bet Boom. But the slow, steady burn down, they have to go finally. There's the punch, finding the backline. GPK, but if Jeezy gets it off, will it be enough? Barely able to escape. Toronto Tokyo is going to die. Q under fire, has buyback. Now 23 Savage, on to one. Still waiting with Alacrity and everything else. It looks OK. They do have a cold snap, but they just can't go in. That was about as good of a jump as it's going to get. You got two heroes caught immediately by the Puck Tusk combo and a huge amount of burst, but GPK just barely gets off the cheese, and at that point, that fight is not going to go your way anymore. Forcing out the Q buyback. And Bet Boom are going to chill. Their Aegis still has two minutes left on it, so when Toronto Tokyo spawns, they still have a good minute of sieging if they want to. And obviously, they don't have any concerns about the waves, because guess what? Spirit Breaker, Storm, and Caudal will always be able to take care of the map. I, I, we, we need to come up with an answer for Spirit Break, okay? He's, he's about to pass the PL in terms of uh, CSing and everything. This is, this is a whole new world of absurdity that we've been blessed with for a while now. 
Cure is a monster. Although he is running into the middle of the base there. Yeah, probably should call that one off. That's the real test. Can you commit into five heroes and live? Honestly, I think he can if he pops all his stuff. So. Has Refresher too, like... Yep. Whatever, he can do whatever he wants. Siege round two. Nightfall has double damage, but it's gonna let the Illusions do the job. No need to commit his real hero. Step by step. I mean, he's probably never getting the melee barracks lands. He could get the range. The melee are gonna help regen it. The mantra of never go high ground is strong, but will it be strong enough to finally punish them here? They have the real PL in. The Spear Breaker not showing on the wave. EMP connection. Q ooh, wanted that punch, but can't quite get it. Still, the buildings are falling. I mean, Nightfall can do this. He's just up front and center. 30 seconds left on this Aegis. They need something, anything, but they are not going to get it. A second lane of Rax is going to be claimed as Bet Boom takes dominant control further of this game and even going to move forward for the next one. Surely Talon has to stop it here. They have to make some type of a play as they will go for the disruption. Doppelganger take over the illusion. Hit into the real Nightfall Makoto trying to stop it. They are doing nothing to this hero though. And just like that, I mean, you can see Jabs is on the other side of the map right now, finishing off his Hex. Yeah, this is probably the one chance Talon are going to get if they somehow want to miraculously turn this game around. It has to be off the back of Hexes. They need to just flat out burst PL in a Hex uh, before the saves can come out. They don't have any truly natural save on Bet Boom's side, like a Heart Dispel or anything of that sort. They have Glimmer Cape and Force Staff on Caudal, though. Um, so it's going to be a tough ask, but I think Bet Boom are not going to give them any other targets than the PL. They're yeah. going to put him in front. If you can't kill this guy, you can't win. Um, We'll see if they will chill for the final, I say final Roche, because it seems very unlikely for Talon to be able to hold in the base against another Aegis. So they will probably be fighting for the Roche too. And I'm sure for Bet Boom right now, there's a part of them that would like to go high ground and just close out this game after such a long day full of Dota. But of course, it does become a little bit scary if you do happen to step just a bit too far forward. We've seen leads thrown before. And this would be one of the biggest of all time if they did happen to do it. Pure up on the top side. And 49 minutes in, it does look like Bet Boom are going to be making that safer play. Yeah. Just a, another 11 minutes for the prophesized 60 minute stomp. <laughs> See if it happens. See if Talon can hold out that long, it's a tough ask. This is. The disadvantages are mounting every minute. Bet Boom's heroes are getting bigger and bigger, and you're picking up the pieces in your base, scavenging for scraps here while the enemy team is just controlling the entire map. Spirit Breaker now closing in on level 30 sometime soon, which, you know, given a little bit of time in the map, maybe we're looking at that five to 10 minutes away if no fight breaks out. Curious just farming. I mean, it really is just nothing going into the favor of Talon at all. They have been completely corralled inside of their base and trying to set up for a fight that Bet Boom are not giving them. They're not even giving them an opportunity to take that engagement, saying, come and deal with us instead. Yeah, and, well, yep, that's, uh, that's even more voice lines <laughs> drop down in front of them. Haster and spawns. I mean, the other problem is that, like, Talon eventually do need to leave their base to go at the Roche fight at the very least, surely. Maybe not. Surely. Surely. Giving that one up feels like it's just delaying the death sentence. Those jabs. Fairly farmed on this Invoker offlane, but has not been able to get the most out of this hero so far. 4-4 four, four, and 5 as the recalls come out. Oh, this is an interesting play. They've showed all their heroes bottom. Now they're going to recall them top one by one and then probably smoke and try to catch them inside the base for the killing blow. This is a very unpredictable move actually here for Talon. So a quite creative idea if they do choose to go for it. Or maybe they just recalled everyone up here to farm a centaur camp together. That's also, I mean, that's <laughs> kind of wholesome. It also feels like you put somebody in a headlock and then you just like let him go to do a backflip or something. It's like you kind of had him in a nice little grasp there. Yeah. <laughs> Instant Roche spawn. Oh no, are they going to get it on Talon? 
dude, there's no way. There's no way. Oh, why did Betbo go up here? <laughs> why? Don't do the backflip. Just, just choke him out. Are they gonna get? I mean, okay, seriously. So okay, the... here it is. Divine Rapier. All and... in. Okay. 23. He's ready to go. Scan hits. They do see the illusion. Now Makoto baps away. They're still under a smoke. BK jumps forward, finds one. Waveform, how much damage can they take? They absolutely rip through him. That's going to do it. They find and kill 23 Savage. Easy as pie. And Divine Rapier now in the hands of Nightfall. That might be the shortest Rapier I've ever seen. You're he held it for five seconds. Oh, no. Yeah, that's... The Cursed Blade. If only he hadn't bought Rapier, this might not have been over yet. <laughs> well, it's 54,000 <laughs> net worth, there's a chance. Uh, more than 1,000 net worth a minute. All right, eight more minutes, Talon. You could do it. Let's see. They go through. Buybacks abound. And oh my god, are they going to respect the buyback, dude? Oh no, Pure, how are you going to tip them now? Oh, jeez. Well, that is going to be the retreat after the buyback. And you can see here, again, the quick jump. They, they just didn't stand a chance. It was way too much damage. And of course, the random bash coming out from Pure. Feeling it right now. Oh my god, that's some pent up aggression right there. So, Rapier in hand. And this is why we only buy the sturdiest tables for TI, by the way. <laughs> Good craftsmanship needs to be able to handle some pent-up frustration. <laughs> <laughs> All right, 62K. I believe this is the second highest gold lead a team has had this event. Okay. Did the uh, last one win? I think so, right? I mean, I don't think anybody threw an 80k gold lead. I don't think that's ever happened. Surely it can't happen here. Uh, I don't remember what the record was this tournament. I think it was about 80 or something. Well, Puck is queuing up a Rapier too. Might not need it if they can get the pick off onto PL. It just makes him stronger. Pure. Found. Well, wrist punch. Control. Down to about two-thirds HP. GPK goes through, trying to take down Q. He's still surviving. Well, not anymore. 23 Savage slept. Waveform back. Buyback from another. So they did get the kill onto the Spirit Breaker. And that gave him a lot of gold, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that was 3,000 gold <laughs> spread across multiple heroes with the pure kill. Another 20 of those, boys. Wait, and he bought it. Puck got the rapier off of that. Okay. Wait a minute. Wait, um, are you telling me there's a chance? The hex, the bash, the control, the walrus punch, the stun. Where's the damage though? Where's the puck? They don't quite have it. He's not going to be able to quite do enough. Makoto goes down. That is the buyback. 23 Savage hoping, hoping for anything, but there is nothing left. Bet Boom has taken it all. GG is called. Cinder, and you were right. The 54 minutes stop. It can't be stopped. <laughs> yeah. An 80k lead to finish it off for Bet Boom. I mean, in reality, when you look back at this game, the last 35, 40 minutes, Talon just couldn't find anything on the map, right? All their lanes are pushed in all the time. Every time they try to make a move, Bet Boom are ready. They're counterplaying them. They're out farming them. They're getting the Roches. And, you know, ultimately, it, it's. For Talon, the, the game you got to look at here is obviously this is a, a shame to go out on a game like this. You know, you had two marathons, and the second game was definitely within their reach. And oh, very much favored, right? The regret of those late game buybacks in game number two that put you in this position to begin with and just cannot cannot finish it off. But Bet Boom has got to be so relieved. They fought tooth and nail in that second game to even get this chance to show this lineup. Absolutely. And, and now they did it. They un unbelievable performance. This to me feels like one of those team transforming experiences for Bet Boom. You know, if they make some type of a run here, I feel like this might be one of those games, one of those series that you look back on and see that's where it began. We'll see if it ends up happening for them indeed. For Talon, this is where it's going to end. Uh, very solid performance. Uh, incredibly impressive late game prowess that we saw from this team. But in the end, that boom, we're able to come away with the victory. And with that, we're going to head on back to the panel.
Thank you very much, Lyrical and Sindarin. This was, uh, it was the shortest game of the series with 54 minutes. Uh, but Bad Boom makes it through and they make it out of the road to the international towards the international. And we're going to break down exactly how that happened here in this third game. Effie, you mentioned it, this Phantom Lancer. There were not a lot of answers for it. And yeah, it, it was textbook PL game, honestly. Uh, I think there was a little bit of a drop choke by Talon in this one, just taking the Tusk and giving away the SB. It, it put them in a really odd position, but for the most part, I do respect the fight. They fought all the way until the very end on Talon. Uh, maybe they had a window to win this game early on if they were able to get that first Roche, but that boom, they beautifully contested the first Roche, and that was just the turning point of the game where it was a slow grind until the very end, right? You take away the Roche from Talon, you just outfarm them, you choke them out, you methodically wait until the next Roche, you just take more and more of the map, and you let your PL do its thing, and that's what happened. That's a short summary. Uh, anything to add for that, Moon? Space cow. Mucho balancero, guys. <laughs> Praise the cow. The <laughs> spear break. It all comes down to this one. I mean, we can't really pit it all on that one hero. Surely, Lacoste, because this game, it still was a long battle. For yeah, it definitely was. I, I want to highlight uh, GPK, uh, his performance in the last two games, whole series, but especially <laughs> last two games, because they he died only one time in over two hours, which is pretty <laughs> impressive. For someone, you know, like a GPK, this is a huge success and also managing to make a comeback. Flawless performance from start to finish in the laning stage. He dominated the mid matchup, playing with Keeper of the Light. This has been their bread and butter throughout the DPC. They know how to use this combo and they were dominating. He was all over the place going for the right items, picking up this early Orchid to be able to deal with some of these heroes. And later on, you know that there's going to be Lincolns because you do have Spirit Breaker on the team. So have something else to proc that Lincolns with. Yeah, thank you for those thoughts. Uh, we're going to hear some more thoughts because we're heading over for a winner's interview. It's Nightfall, who's standing by with Pyrian and Saberlight. Thank you, Sheeps. You ruined that bit a little tiny bit, but that's okay. I am not qualified to interview this man after a series like that, so I am going to hand off to my colleague, the esteemed Saberlight. Saberlight, if you would please do the interview for me. Good evening, Seattle. Uh, it's your boy Saberlight uh, with another winner's interview. I have uh, Mr. Nightfall. You just played an incredible free game series. How do you feel? feel amazing. Every game was kind of hard, but uh, we managed to win it. So uh, I'm really proud of my team and uh, happy that we qualified to Uchai. I'm proud of you as well. All right, uh, you are going to play at the Climate Pledge Arena in five days. How are you going to spend this five-day break? Probably just uh, nothing unusual, just play pubs, play screams, uh, learn from our games, because I don't think we played uh, that good today. So I'll learn from our mistakes and come back stronger. That's it. Uh, spoken like a true winner. All right, all right. Uh, you have any questions for me? What's, what's the best hero on position three right now, in your opinion? Uh, all right, thank you for the question, Nightfall. Um, so I think Breaker is a strong hero. I think the, the way uh, Pure played was, was very good. Uh, I liked it a lot. I would recommend pick it in TI as well. All right, and for the final question, you have a bunch of fans supporting you here. Uh, any, any words of, uh, of support? Uh, thank you, everyone who came here. Like, I feel the support. Everyone, like... Uh Screaming and like uh, saying Nightfall or like Bad Boom, let's go. So I really feel the support. Keep supporting us. Uh, love, love all the fans. All right, that was Nightfall and that was uh, me, the second best off, uh, second worst offlaner from this tournament. And this is Pyrian. Thank you, Saberlight. Tremendous work. My job's in danger. Second best offlaner. Second best offlaner. There you go, Shifa. Back to you guys. Thank you very much. I think Pyrian, you might. I mean. You might be soon out of a job at this rate. I thought that interview was great. Thank you so much, Saberlight. Of course, Nightfall, congratulations uh, making it to the international top eight. And this, this match, I feel like a lot of the talk fear that we've had about Bad Boom, I mean, we got to revisit it. 
Sure. I mean, we definitely can. I think this series in particular, like her resilience to be able to hold out and like they didn't really crush the laning stage like they normally do to win games. They played very long games against a team that is very good in the late game. But I must say their drafting was very impressive here as well. Like being able to pick the heroes that they did and GPK, as mentioned, he did super well in this series. Overperformed, I want to say. And of course, Nightfall, just a stable carry. Fortunately for Talon here, like the drafting just wasn't quite good enough, honestly, at the end of the day, and it was exposed by Bedboom. Yeah, but we were talking earlier about how Bedboom's problem throughout the year has always just been, or not throughout the year, throughout the last couple of years with these players is that they do very well online, but in these high pressure environments, playing in front of a crowd, they don't do well. I feel like after today, you can't say that anymore because not only did they have an exhausting day playing two series, they played the longest series <laughs> out the road to TI so far, and they came out on top. So I feel like they've conquered Demon here and the five day break will do them very well. They conquered a demon, they conquered Talon here in this uh, best of three. They were the first team in the lower bracket to push to a third game and they closed it out successfully. So, and uh, every, every happy story for Bedboom as a sad story for Talon. And for that, uh, we're heading over to Pyrian for the excerpt interview with Sunbi. Yeah, thanks, Sheebs. I am here with Sumbi. Sumbi, first of all, commiserations, dude. That was an amazing series. You must be proud of your players for, for just such a, a great three-game series. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my boys are the best. They're absolutely the best. Yeah. So I thought that you guys had a pretty good season third in Riyadh. You must be proud of them for, for what they've accomplished this year. I am absolutely proud of what they were able to do. I, you know, it sucks uh, our road ends here, but um, they really are champions through and through. So thinking about next season, obviously you've got a lot of confidence in them. What are you hoping to do in the coming year? I hope um, our boys can continue to show that Southeast Asian Dora has a lot to show and that uh, we are worthy of uh, lifting up a trophy one day. Well, I would absolutely agree with that. Do you have any words for the many talent fans out there around the world supporting you this year? Um, thank you so much, guys. Um, it's probably quite late in Southeast Asia. Uh, it was a tough journey. Okay, well, thank you for taking the time to talk to us and better luck next time. Shiva, back to you. Thank you very much, Pyrian. Times like these, this is when teams need their support the most. So all love goes out to Talon and all their fans that were really hoping that this run was going to be going a little bit deeper. But uh, Betboom put a stop to that. So this series comes to a close. And Moon, with that, your appearance on this panel comes to a close as well. So I would love to hear some final thoughts on the, on the series we just watched. I feel like Bad Boom adapted really well. Game two, game three, they went back to their three comfort cores and pure number one tight enter, and they just showed their true talent of Dota. Yeah. And it just came down to uh, them having more comfort and confidence, pure slamming the table of passion when he's playing his comfort hero, give me spirit breaker, he's so happy. And that, that, that is really infectious in the team when people start slamming this, they're getting hype. It can kind of catch us on the TI stage. The whole team gets hyped together, and then when you win, then you get the best high ever, and then I feel like Bebo is going to go into the playoffs and the Climate Pledge Arena, and they're going to be a scary team. Yeah, they look to be a very scary team. Thank you so much, Moon. And we, of course, are moving forward to our final series of the day. More Dota to be had. We are going to witness a best of three elimination once again. <laughs> Thank you for that. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll follow that up. Elimination once again, ladies and gentlemen. Virtus Pro and Entity, they'll go up against each other in the best of three. And before we watch that series, we're going to learn a little bit more about Entity. So this year, it's out of pretty well for us with Lima Major. We had like some really crazy tiebreakers that had to go on until the next day against OG and, and Tundra. It was super, super contested. And we had to play the next day after and there we actually like barely qualified to the Lima Major. So that was already like a success in the beginning because we still started like into the year with, I guess, higher expectations than last year, but we were still like, I guess, considered underdogs. The way we dropped out of the tournament was a little bit like disappointing. We, we all thought that we could have gone further. Um, but yeah, it was still nonetheless like a great start. Following that strong start, Entity hit a rocky patch in the season. 
They missed out on the next two majors, and to add to their challenges, they were pushed into a tiebreaker just to retain their spot in Division One. Didn't really know what was going wrong, but you could feel like uh, expectations were high. We played a super contested region, and everybody like was getting sadder and sadder. In the end, of course, we also decided to like change things up, and we had a small roster change. It was really like a roller coaster. Uh, it started really high, then it went super down. Like holy moly! Like uh, we were rock bottom. Like we actually were like, what's going on? What's going on? Over the course of this TI qualifier, we had to beat Enigma, we had to beat Secrets, we had to beat Luna Galaxy, which also played incredibly well. And then when we in the end when we won, it was like a big relief, of course, but we all looked back at the year uh, and we were like, holy shit, we actually made it, you know, like... <laughs> Last year when we went to the TI, we went with a really try-hard mood. We were all like super focused, super work mood. But I think the first TI you never forget. It was a big dream that we all wanted to to get to get to. We dreamed of for for almost forever. It was a really really cool like special feeling for sure. I think we are better prepared. Like we're already taking it a little bit more relaxed. Of course, still play very focused and try as hard as you can, but not like overthink it that you're playing for TI. Ideally, you just completely forget about this, uh, even though it is TI, but you just play like your any day game because then you're not stressed out. You just play in your comfort zone. You're not too scared, but also not too crazy. And I think we're definitely going to do better this year. Yeah, Entity definitely had a trial by fire last year when they had a uh, best of one elimination round and over 100 minutes minutes, game, long, brawl. I can't even know what to describe it as because at some point, that's just not uh, Dota 2 anymore. But it was fantastic. They're ready this time to make a deeper run. They need to win here, though. And as you can see, we got a little bit of a, we got a, little bit of a change. Saber Lie, you took over for Perian's job already. Who are you coming for next? Uh, you know, all the funny guys, Slacks. That's, that's my <laughs> main target. So I can do all the goofy stuff instead of him. And I have to say, what a handsome interviewer for the last one. Oh. And the, the non bold guy was okay as well. <laughs> that's very good. Very humble for you as well. And uh, we want to talk about this upcoming matchup because uh, this is a big one. We got Virtus Pro and Entity here. And I want to just straight up hear your thoughts about going into this series. How do you feel about it? What are you expecting to see? I mean, I think both of the teams are, are quite strong. Uh, VP, they, they lost to Bedmo, who, who we just saw is a, is a very tough team to beat. And Entity, they're, they're playing really good. They, they just won a series today. So I'm very excited to, to see uh, how they match up one against the other. I'm also a big uh, Watson Egoisto fan, so <laughs> we'll see what the, what the man pulls out. Yeah, let's focus our attention a little bit uh, first on, on Virtus Pro, because there's a lot of first timers on Virtus Pro. And, and Effie, we want to talk a little bit about uh, Noticed, who uh, definitely made a big splash on the main screen on Friday. Yeah, I mean, this Bristleback game was his first ever game at the main stage, right? And he absolutely crushed it. I mean, he was playing against Viper, he was playing against Hoodwink, he's playing versus Team Spirit. Come on, the best team in the tournament is what people are saying they are, the team everybody expects to win. And he completely destroyed that game. It was a very, very impressive debut from him here. Yeah, and then a big debut for uh, all of Virtus Pro earlier this group stage as well. They made their staple on the international. You can see here, Lacoste, they have a lot of great statistics going for them. Absolutely. I want to point out Kiritic, uh, the, the most kills so far on Spectre. I don't think this hero is going to be given to him because he plays it really well. I'm not sure if he was the one, you know, who started this trend with the Urn of Shadows, but this was the first time that I saw it in the group stage. It was also like an older build, but he kind of reinvented it and uh, he feels very comfortable. He's uh, also like the driving force of the team. Same goes for the notice. If these two guys are having a good time, you know that uh, this team is going to rock. Yeah, the team has rocked already. Virtus Pro are making waves again, pushing it to a game three against Team Spirit is already a, quite the achievement. And now they are looking to prolong their run here. Entity, though, they will do their best to also make a deep run. They've paced each other once before, where Entity came out on top, but we're going to have to see what happens when they meet again. Yeah. 
Seattle. They are looking to go deep. They're looking to go far, but Virtus Pro is standing in their way. recent and only matchup that they had earlier this year in Riyadh. How much would you say have Virtus Pro been able to learn from Entity in the series that they had earlier today against Thunder? Uh, there's always a lot to learn, I believe, when you are watching, especially Entity. They're a team that oftentimes will go back for comfort picks, especially on Storm Stormer. He does like picking up that Batrider and Voker, so they have to know that's coming. They have to prepare for it. And one thing I want to say about VP is like, I haven't seen this team a whole lot this year, and it's mainly because they've been gatekept by the other amazing Eastern yeah. European teams. And like, they're good though. They're actually really good, and I'm excited to see more of them. Yeah, I mean, I didn't know that much of VP coming into this road to TI because, like Fear mentioned, they were always coming around fourth place during the DPC. We didn't get to see them internationally. But now that I have watched them, I have to say I'm really impressed because they really embody the spirit of Eastern European Dota more than any other EU team here. I mean, they are the typical aggression that you would expect to come from a banner like Virtus Pro. A lot of the EEU teams have changed their playstyles recently to be more late game oriented, more farm oriented, more disciplined, more so like defensive, not really taking any fights. But from what I've seen of this VP, they are constantly running at you. They're picking carries that run at you. They're picking off laners that run at you. It's, it's really refreshing to see this kind of Dota come out of an Eastern European team because it's been a while, Saber really. True. I mean, for me, uh, the standout is Curlitage uh, because before TI, I'm just spamming pups, and I swear to God, every other pup I'm playing against this guy, and he's rank two, and he's owning, <laughs> and it's just really annoying uh, laning against him. I think he's like he's one of the the new era like inspired carry players, similar to Watson. So that's why I'm interested to see this this carry matchup because I think both of the players have like uh, this like you know anime arc uh, going on where they'll like one v five the game. It's like uh, the new age of Toros, basically. Yeah, Eastern Europe, they produced uh, a lot of good players in 2022, 2023 as well. Uh, and I, I just want to point out that uh, Virtus Pro, they managed to take the game of Spirit, as we mentioned, but they also took the game only game from, P from LGD because they didn't bleed until they met them. And it was on the first day of the group stage. I was covering some of these games and I'm like, man, these guys are good, you know, I want to see more. And when they played, even in the games where they lost, they looked really good. Like they. As Effie said, they're going for some of these earlier timings. Uh, sometimes it does work against gaming gladiators that did lose because they got necroed two times in a row. But uh, you can see, you know, this uh, man behind them, G, he has a lot of experience. He goes back to Dota one days and, uh, you know, we haven't seen him much lately, but he's a really smart guy. I had a chance to play with him for a short period of time back in the days and uh, I learned a lot in just playing for like two, three weeks with him. Yeah, for people that are curious how long it has been since we have seen G, the last time he was at an international it was uh, 2015. That's a very long time ago. This is also his first time uh, coaching at an international, as he has been uh, playing for a very long time. Uh, very happy to see him back. And in the coaching chair, it has been working out. I think when we want to talk about these two teams, we've got to talk about their play style, Effie. Uh, Virtus Pro, I mean, we have four Eastern European teams here, okay? This is a lot of Eastern European teams, most ever been. Uh, and Virtus Pro is a special one because you might say they're the real embodiment of Eastern Europe. Yeah, like I mentioned earlier, they're not playing for this turtle kind of strategy that we see coming out of teams like Nine Pandas or Butt Boom. They, they play for kills. They pick these Spectres, they pick these Dunes, these CKs, these often Wraith Kings, and even if it looks greedy, they are finding ways to constantly intercept the enemy timings and go in. So this is a team that you have to be very careful with in the drafting stage. Uh, I think it was Lacoste who mentioned this Spectre in particular just looks so good in their hands. 
it cannot be given away because if you have your carry being active around minute 20, that may be a little dangerous for a team like Entity because although they did win versus Tundra today, they won after they survived that early mid game, mm -hmm. right? They didn't win that early mid game. They just kind of turtled their way through until Watson got to that critical mass where he could carry. Yeah, when we're looking at this matchup, uh, fear. We got ourselves, as Saberlight said, Kiritish number two leaderboards, Watson number one on the leaderboards. And like number six as well, I think. It, yeah. True. <laughs> yes, like two slots in the top ten. <laughs> like, how does that translate into competitive Dota? I mean, it just shows that you're really good at the game, right? And then once you get into a competitive atmosphere, then you have to like have a team that knows how to play around you. And I think with Entity, that really showed in the series earlier today that they played for Watson. They lost the early game, and eventually Watson did get online. He carried his team to victory. And it's kind of shown in Virtus Pro as well. Like they, he has some very niche picks. I think he popular Spectre for the most part in this tournament. Every time he gets Spectre, they pick it up with a Grim Stroke as well. They know how to play around these high MMR. Players players and they're delivering. So does that mean also you would want both teams to be focusing them during the game, like try and shut them down if they are the win condition? Definitely have to deal with VP Spectre. As far as Entity, I don't think there's one single hero that Watson plays that you just have to get rid of because mm. he has a pretty big hero pool. But yeah, I think the VP Spectre is just way too strong. When we're talking about hero pools, I, I always have to think about Stormstormer. One of the first times I saw him play him, it's got to be Invoker. He was, even when Invoker wasn't, uh, wasn't very popular cost, he still played it time and time again. And now Invoker is popular. So is that something that you hope Virtus Pro is going to address, maybe in the terms of a ban? Uh, potentially, this is how Stormstormer made the name for himself. The guy was grinding for a really long time and uh, really glad that he's uh, successful because he can play anything. He also plays a couple of these niche hero picks. Uh, uh, Batrider that Fear mentioned, uh, he also banged out Visage, he also plays everything meta pretty much. His hero pool was limited, I would say, at the start of the DPC, but uh, he really adapted and it shows his quality. He's also, like, I would say one of the guys in the team, especially when they played at the start of the DPC with Toby, he needed to be the one carrying the team. If he's having a bad game, Entity was losing. If he's having a great time, most of the time Entity was winning. Yeah, he's really had a glow up, honestly, <laughs> over this last year because typically you would only think of Stormstormer as the invoker, bat rider, puck guy, but he's gotten to a point where his hero pool is really large. I mean, we've seen him bust out bat riders, which are really cute. Nobody else is experimenting with the hero. We've seen him play TA, we've seen him play Visage, we've seen him play uh, Primal Beast, which he never really touched before a couple of months ago. So, yeah, just. Kudos to him, because it takes a lot to be a player who came into the competitive scene only good at a few heroes. Diversify your hero pool that much in mm -hmm. under a year, that's very impressive. What I can say from uh, my time with, with Entity is that uh, he is also the, the heart of the team. Like, uh, regardless of his uh, Dota performance, uh, the guy is like really just like a nice human to, to hang out with. So. I don't know if it's still uh, like it, but uh, yeah, he's just the, the glue that, uh, that holds the team together. So yeah, big shout out to him, to my boy. Yeah, and I think from all the interviews that he's done and the times we've seen him on camera, I think that that heart is still very much there and it's definitely uh, carrying on the spirit here of Entity. And we'll see how far they get because last year they, they got to this point. To this point in the playoffs, of course, it was a slightly different roster. We had a little bit of a shakeup with Watson. This is his first international. Gabby joined as the offlaner as well. And it has, I think, fear, they struggled a little bit at the start, but they definitely made him fit very well. That's just pretty normal. You bring in a new player coming from a different region, right? So it's going to take some time until you can mesh, figure out what the play style. And of course, Gabby also moved from Kerry. Yeah, Gabby did move from carry to offlane, and seems, seems to suit him well. Can it suit him well in game number one? We're gonna find out as we get into it. Virtus Pro versus Entity. Game one. Into the nitty gritty of it we go. The draft always uh, very, well, for a lot of people, very exciting part. For a lot of people, very strategic part. And some people will take this time to get some extra snacks. And that is totally okay as well, because we heard it already. This team, both of these teams, uh, like um, fast paced 
games. And that means aggression, that means you do have to have your beverage ready. The first couple of bands come out. We got Virtus Pro on the Radiant side, Entity on the Dire side. And the first couple of bands actually came out very fast, uh, leading into uh, now a little bit of a pause as uh, Virtus Pro might have been thrown slightly off, uh, off course with the bands. We got Kunka removed, Primal Beast, Chaos Knight, and Muerta removed on Virtus Pro with Bristol and Phoenix banned on the side of Entity, who have first pick, Lacoste. Yeah, uh, I just want to ask Saberlight, you know, how, how do you prep uh, coming into the series knowing that a lot of your heroes is going to be banned out in the first phase? Because we've been in this tanky meta for quite some time now. Yeah, uh, I mean, personally, I don't do any prep. I just leave that <laughs> to my coach, uh, Bulba, so I, I just focus on clicking buttons. But uh, it's, uh, yeah, the, the meta got a little bit stale where, like, the, the mid laners and the off laners are basically the same, and most of them are just strength heroes that buy uh, blade mill into heart, especially on mid laners. I hate it when, uh, you know, people do it on tight. I don't want to point any fingers, but, you know, uh, enough is enough. <laughs> so I think these bands are kind of what we expected. The, the note is Bristol and the uh, Curly Teach uh, Spectre. And you know, the, the OP mid laners from the VP side. So I'm, uh, I'm interested to see what Entity is going to first pick. I would imagine something like some uh, support pick to open the draft. Your favorite heroes in the pool right now. Do you remember? Which one? You just did the interview. Remember what you said? Oh, right. <laughs> it is, actually. Yeah. You're right. The <laughs> Dayless Spirit Breaker in the game them. right now. This could be a, a run back, potentially. Yeah. I feel like both Noticed and uh, Gabi play, play the hero, so I'm surprised they didn't pick it. I think maybe they... Uh, I mean, Tusk is okay against Breaker, because theoretically you can like position yourself in the, in the way of the charge, and then you just snowball to cancel it. So you can cancel charge, but uh, overall, I think this breaker hero has like a lot of potential. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he just feels like strong at every stage of the game, and he's so annoying to play against because he's cutting every wave. He's so hard to catch, and he just postpones games for too long. So I would be surprised if it goes ignored. But I mean, if the Tusk is in the pool and the Dawn is in the pool, you know the Dawn's going to come out at some point. Maybe it gets taken away. Maybe it gets banned in the next phase. But it is something that. Uh, VP have to think about now. Yeah, and there he is. So uh, what we discussed last game when the Spirit Ray comes out, you need to look towards Yule Scepter Builders on the side of Entity. Like, they had the same thing, Spear. Invoker. Or Invoker <laughs> they <mean>. literally <laughs> had everything you wanted for Spirit Breaker. Yeah. I mean, it didn't matter. It, did it not matter. literally did not matter. So well, how they, do you counter this hero? I don't really know. I mean, they also had uh, offlane Invoker, so there's uh, you <laughs> know true. ups and downs, ups and downs. True. Maybe a mid lane Invoker, you know? That would be, if it's still left in the pool after this ban phase. I mean, I think Spirit Breaker is counterable. Like, anything that can build a Yule Scepter, if Shadow Demon is still in the pool, if Invoker is still in the pool, there are ways to play around the hero. It's not the end-all, be-all. Last game was a little bit of a... It's, it's hard to gauge based off of that, because it was such a good PL game, too, yeah. and PL had a great start. So we didn't get to see Talon's ability to maneuver around the Spirit Breaker at any point. I mean, I will say that, yeah, Yules is great for the hero, but this hero just, just he's a money bank. He just gets money out of nowhere. He buys BKB, he buys Refresher, and at that point, your Yules doesn't really matter very much, right? It's uh, true. I also like to, what the, uh, Effie said about the Dawnbreaker. I think the hero is okay against Spirit Breaker. Oh, they even banned it. Yeah. It's a good against Spirit Breaker because you can match the, the global thing. And uh, I also know Entity like this. Tusk uh, Dawnbreaker combo because uh, from the backstage info I got, uh, they got absolutely destroyed in Dream League with this uh, lane, and Watson was uh, crying that they need to learn how to play it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, Invoker for Stormstormer still in the pool. The Pugna does come out from VP, which is a good hero versus Invoker generally. Also, a good hero paired up with Spirit Breaker because you have all the extra sustain coming out of Life Drain that any hero that goes in benefits from. So I wonder if they're still looking at it, but I'd be surprised if they aren't. There's also the Shadow Demon that Entity should be considering at this point. With this Pugna in pool, there is no Ancient Apparition, so he doesn't have to care about uh, you know, this healing cancellation. So he can keep the distance, and you have like one of the better heroes in the front line with the Spirit Breaker. I just want to touch upon more about the second band that Entity did, this Grimstroke. I feel like this is the hero, at least like top three, top four of the tournament, because the hero provides you with so many things. The Silence Against the Tusk, the Leash mechanic that I mentioned in the previous series where you can't really do much, but they're going to bang out Chen. They are undefeated with the Chen. So far, we've seen Chen punishing some of the 
like weaker off lanes where they can defend themselves if they if they can kill the creep it's going to provide you with a strong laning su support uh, and morphling you know you don't have enough damage most of the time to kill this hero early on yeah, and we saw Morphling against Spearbreaker attempted in the previous game, because you can turn into Spearbreaker and, you know, still pretty pretty okay. It might not be exactly the same. Uh, previous game didn't work out. We mentioned the Phantom Lancer problems that time around. I'm sure that uh, Entity is going to be aware of that. But it is a answer. I think uh, Entity just need to be uh, uh, wary of, uh, like, a illusion angle from Virtus Pro, because neither Chen nor Morphling are not even uh, Tusk are uh, particularly good at dealing with illusions, but I do like their uh, second phase bands of the AA and Grim, because both of the heroes are pretty solid against Morph, so they wanted this Morph to like counter Spirit Breaker, and now VP doesn't have really supports to deal with the, the Morph, so they need to counter him with, with a core. So they could potentially pick PL here, but uh, oh, Entity no, will have the 18 pick to counter it. <clears throat> yeah, I mean... For carries right now, I think Naga could be a good choice potentially for them. That is good. Also, can't deal with PL. Maybe a little too early for that hero, but it's also very good. We saw in the last game. But they need to make a decision: do they want to go that illusion route now, or are they going to wait a little bit for it? Yeah, I do like Naga. I also like a potential TB versus the Smurfling because you can pick. I mean, the Pugna is going to do a good job at defending it, but you can pick a secondary support like Phoenix that gives your draft a lot of protection. Ooh, this Doom. Okay, Doom is a great counter to Morphling. Oh yeah, that's Should sexy. Doom him. That's very sexy. I, I actually forgot about this matchup. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, that one's rough, because uh, there's actually nothing you can do on Morph against Doom. Once you get Doomed, there's no healing, you get percentage damage. This matchup is extremely rough. And it's also good against Chen in lane. You just eat this creep, you buy Vanguard. Um, yeah, big problem for, for Entity, in my opinion. Yeah, they haven't played any Doom. Like, these Eastern European teams, they love to play Doom on multiple positions, so keeping this as a flex, potentially for uh, offlane if necessary. But, uh, yeah, stopping the healing and also mana burn. These two things Morphling doesn't really like to play into. Yeah, and Pangolier, really horrible, abysmal, atrocious win rate this tournament, but... I mean, I, it still does a really great job at disrupting enemy tempo drafts, right? Because it comes online very early. You can just get side lane rotations of Swashbuckle. You don't need to be dependent on your Rolling Thunder. But when you're playing against a Chen lineup and it's going to start picking up pace and pushing down these towers, Pango is probably the best mid hero that can do that from a really early standpoint. With the Rolling Thunder, you can actually set up for these kills. So it makes a lot of sense here. All right, Saberlight, you are playing Doom this game, right? Yeah. You're against Morph Chen, and you have a Spearbreaker Doom game lane. How are you going to lane this? Uh, I mean, it's OK. You're against uh, two range heroes, so just Doom presses the W, pushes the wave in, and then you pull the wave. And then, you know, the two range heroes, they, neither of them want to tank the, the creep wave. So they're just crying. They're, you know, super confused as what's to happening. And then suddenly, minute four, you have Vanguard, and no one cares, and you're chilling. So you think they can win the lane or go even? Uh, I mean, it's not an easy lane by any means, but I think they can draw the lane. All right. Cool. Yeah, here's the Stormstormer Invoker. Uh, we mentioned before Tornado, very good against Spirit Breaker. It's his signature hero, but now you also have ways to buff up your Morphling, right? You've got the tag team bonus damage and the alacrity that's going to be placed on this Morphling. So you're looking at very very early Roshans, very early objective yeah. taking coming out from Entity. And they also don't have any cooldowns inside of Entity, so they can keep fighting all the time. Uh, there's going to be a downtime where Doom is used, the Pangolier no Rolling Thunder, so it could be potentially punished. You know, the Spirit Breaker they also don't rely on any cooldown, but uh, Morphling with uh, two, three items and the Roche taking potential that Effie mentioned with the tag team. There's a lot of buffs uh, how you can just amplify the damage of Morphling in this game. Entity has to be very careful with these bans, I think, because Peel does look like a problem, kind of like mm. the last series we just watched. Very similar situation where supports don't deal with them, Invoker's not really the best against them, and Morph is not good either. They're still looking for a carry on for this pro here. They banned Troll, which seemed a little bit weird, I think, right now. When there is a Naga, there is a PL in the pool, so they have to prepare something to at least make it uncomfortable to pick an Illusion hero on their last pick here. Maybe the Troll ban indicates that they're comfortable in the timing that this Chen plus Invoker lineup will give them, and 
if an illusion hero comes out, they maybe feel like they can just end the game before. Yeah. I mean, the other that point. question is, does Kiritich play these heroes? Do you know Saberlight? Uh, I don't, but I would assume he, he can play it. He hasn't played them yet, so maybe they know more than us. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure uh, they did more prep than, than I did for this panel, so. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm a bit worried for Entity because I don't see like a particularly great offlaner for them that lanes with Tusk. Usually what you want with Tusk is, uh, you know, some Dawnbreaker that's going to like have a high kill threat and you just kill the, the carry. Or you pick a range hero such as Visage, something like that. But the problem with those heroes is that they are not particularly great against Tango. Like, I don't know if they can Visage. So, and on top of that, VP will have a counter pick. So they need to blind pick a hero that's okay with us and that also can't be like a super counter pick. Dazzle is still in the pool, which is a bit of a surprise if you are looking into range hero. But uh, true. Seems like I, mean, I think not. they really had to can, like deal with the illusion factor. Like if they pick a visage or something there and peel comes out, yeah. like that's just GG. That's true. <laughs> and Shaker does deal with illusions and I think it fits their draft pretty good. Uh, I'm just a little bit worried about the lane. I think that Shaker is not a great lane, but it can work. Templar Assassin as the overall last pick. Will that go mid or will it be carry? A carry Templar Assassin. Kiritish plays it. So that matchup is really, it's going to be great in lane, right? The Shaker doesn't want to play against this, but Morph is pretty happy in this matchup later on in the game because he does have such high armor. So they're really going to play the Temple here. I guess they realize that the Doom will take care of the Morph, right? Just get farmed on the TA, and then you can just snowball the game. Yeah, I mean, it's good against Tusk, it's good against Chen, Invoker, and Shaker. The only issue for the TA is the Morphling, but I mean, if TA wins its lane and snowballs a little bit, then you have that shard to think about. That TA shard is really good at killing Morphling early on. They might be able to make some plays off of that. So it's not the worst pick. I, I, I see why they went for it. I also like that they put a Spirit Breaker 5 with the, with the TA and then a Pugna 4 with uh, Doom. So they have ranged, uh, ranged melee in both of the lanes. So their lanes are way stronger than uh, Entity's lanes, in my opinion. Uh, so it, it will depend. If they, can, uh, if they can build big enough lead in the early game, I think they, they got this game. Yeah, and putting the Doom on uh, position three in this game means that they want to get that early level six on it. They want to take that Morphling threat out of the game as soon as possible. So they, they want to give him farm priority, XP priority, and potentially get a rotation coming through that Twin Gate and running down that Morphling the second Doom gets level six. Yeah, we did mention that Entity, that they have really good drafts that can keep fighting all the time with the Templar Assassin as the last pick. This is going to give them some tempo because the four heroes that they picked, uh, you know, very limited in terms of uh, tower damage, except Pagna, but also you need to be able to take Roche. Well, let's see who takes Roche and let's see who takes game one. Before we head to the game, though, we're first going to check in uh, with Coach Metrim with Tsunami. Thank you very much. I am joined by Metrum for the second time today. Uh, what you uh, what you been up to for the last five hours? I'm just watching Bad Boom games against Talon. I'm yeah, just chilling, waiting. Yeah, of course. Usually you want uh, your next game to start as fast as possible, but it's still fine. It's still fine. You said you were watching that Bad Boom game, but did you see their Spirit Breaker? It looked pretty good, and yet you picked Tusk first over the Spirit Breaker. What's up with that? But look, now they had to move their Spirit Breaker to like not core all, so we'll see if the Spirit Breaker is going to have the same impact that Pure had. Okay, the equation might have changed, and maybe uh, maybe the environment around here changed. I know it's, uh, it's Sunday night here in North America, but guys, it's the last series of the Road to the International! You ready? Let's get it started! And it's already started, but we just have first blood. <laughs> Fishman's managed to be able to take down FNG there. Uh, but they actually get the trade kill in return. Katomi dies in response to Sayush. She's able to find him. So one to one already on the board here as we get ourselves into this game one. Uh, what should be an exciting get the best of three, really. Fog down here in the lower bracket. Entity versus versus pro. Uh, and some exciting things to talk about in terms of picks. The way yes. things have ended up from versus pro, this last pick TA. Uh, what does it sort of say to you in terms of what they're going to be going for with timings? Hey, they're looking for lane dominance, right? They're looking for really early aggression versus a bit of a greedy draft in a way that can be coming out from Entity. And the, the lane matchup in particular, right? He sees the Shaker, so he's looking for that best hero that can be able to do with it. Yes, he will have to have some concerns versus the Morphling as game progresses, because the Morph, that matchup with high armor, being able to turn into TA, get the refraction and stuff like that, could be problematic, but can definitely see why that he would like 
to have this pick. They want to have this early tempo base with their draft. So looking forward to see what we're going to get. In terms of tempo, we're seeing here again on the replay, of course, versus Pro. They went straight in for some action, yep. uh, but does, of course, bite them as Fishman on Entity. The one to get the first blood here in that first bit of a fight. Mm -hmm. And let's see how these do lanes do end up going down. You know, I'm, I'm wondering to see how this Earthshaker bottom. I think this is probably the one that I'm looking at the most in the laning phase to struggle. How he's going to end up doing? What Katomi and him are going to be able to do with creep manipulation and stuff like that? Because seeing him starting with Fissure, you already know he doesn't really want to play straight up in the lane versus this Templar Assassin. No, absolutely not. Doesn't want to be in a situation where he's trading, as uh, Kiritish is going to be more than happy to, yeah. to set up, especially with a, yeah, a few good hits from, from the meld setups. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see also like the, the way that VP kind of styled this to deal with this morphing. I think uh, it was Lacoste who had mentioned it. Something that morphing doesn't like to play against is this anti kind of healing, these mana burns and stuff like that, which is going to come out, right? Pango's going to get the Diffu. They're going to have the Doom always, which is going to dress versus the morphling and versus the Chen in some way. So some interesting adaptations coming out here that not a lot of teams have been doing. And overall, what sort of uh, your, your impressions been from both of these teams with their performances so far in this run at the, the Road to the International? I mean, unexpected, I think, would be the word for me. I think Entity has definitely shown a lot of promise throughout the year, but VP, I don't think any peop anybody really came in being like, VP is going to be get making it like top eight and stuff like that, just kind of coming out of nowhere here. They look good. They yeah. honestly do. Absolutely, and certainly impressing. And uh, we'll see if they can continue to impress in this series with their own bit of play. You know, yeah. As said, carry TA, not something that a lot of teams are playing right now in this patch. So very much their own style. Yeah, but you can, yeah, the, the pick, though, overall, can definitely see why it can look so good. The lane just looks absolutely incredible. And it's going to give them that extra bit of roast, right? They have the Pango minus armor. They're going to have the TA. They have extra forms of objective taking with that Pugna who can take towers in the early game. So, yeah, looking for early tempo on the side of VP. And I'm, look, I'm also happy to see more Chen, right? Like, we saw one Chen yesterday. I mean, it it dominated, it, right? right? Yeah. The game was just completely over pretty much 10 minutes in or something I mean, that was like the 20-minute so. victory, right? That it was. Chen involved in. Yep. I don't think that'll be the case this time around by any means for Entity. I think they have a much later kind of style that they're going for, but happy to see the hero either way. Oh, they're going to try and get aggressive onto Gabby. Be fine. As you see, just not too easy really for Entity to trade with the two of them. If FNG gets in with the setup, it's going to easily allow Kiratish to get some of the big, hard, heavy hits in off the back of a Mel. Yeah, this is going to be, it's going to be slow recovery for Gabby for sure. But they're at least pulling the lane back constantly with these fissures and stuff like that. So at least he's getting something down here with this double melee versus a strong lane that VP's gone for. Yeah, FNG holding back the two of them quite nicely. He knows his power. Given all the space in the world for Kiratish to free farm in this same safe lane. And Watson, on the other hand, not having the freest time by any means. He's playing versus a pretty aggressive lane. This Pugna, this Doom, we've seen how much damage they're able to do. I mean, Bet Boom was kind of the team that brought this one the most this year. They were the ones who were just running this Doom Pugna constantly. So, VP taking a page out of their book. And yeah, it's, it's definitely slowing down Watson here, especially because he has a Chen. You know, this hero does take a little bit of time to ramp up inside that laning phase to be able to protect these core heroes. And especially just depending on what creep you get too, right? Stormstormer, though, in the mid lane. Having an excellent to so time so far here versus Squad X. We saw him struggle a little bit in the early game last time around up on that Invoker, but this time, in this matchup, he's doing great. Uh, absolutely in his ele element. Pretty much his best hero right, oh, yeah. over the years. Yep, and that's what you want to do when you're at TI, right? Get these players ex as comfortable as possible. Have that late game scaling. And it's a hero that it's going to be a great enabler for this Morphling too, right? They have a lot of buff up, tag team, alacrity, etc. too, so. For sure. And as we heard, I think, earlier in the day from uh, Storm Stormer, you know, he wanted to just turn up and pull off cool plays. Exactly. It's not really a cool hero to pull off cool plays on than Invoker. Yep. And he's got a lot of different things that he can dispel, right? In a way, he can stop these life drains and stuff. He can remove the Spirit Breaker Bulldoze, the Shield Crash and stuff. So Tornado overall is going to be very effective throughout this game. Now, one to one still at the moment. Both teams are quite fine in the action. And, uh, across the board, but some slight bit of an edge for the CS overall for Entity. Mm -hmm. Which is a big deal, honestly. I, I'm, I'm astonished how well Gabby's been able to just get free last hits down. He's at 20 CS already on this Earthshaker. And we're already seeing a movement coming out also. Katomi's looking to get active. He sees this Shaker's getting a lane, so he's looking to actually perhaps get a kill up top to set up Watson for success. It could be difficult with the wave as close as it is to Virtus Pro's tower. And yeah, now we're seeing FNG since he sees that there's no one down bottom and TI's not really under pressure at all, too. He's making a little bit of moves around himself. I mean, yeah, anytime sort of it's left in that Kiritish versus Gabby situation, yeah, Kiritish, he, he wants to be on his own, right? Oh, yeah. He wants to be soaking up the solo XP. He doesn't need any help. No, absolutely. And then if he's able to get like the early level six, then when he, he can just push Gabby out by himself, too. So a cool decision here coming up. VP to match that. 
And yeah, Katomi's movement is not connecting just yet, but he's still lingering up top, waiting to see an opportunity. You can see his skill build, too. He's 0, zero 1 right now, level 3 on the Tusk. He's just trying to find an opportunity, but not quite able to just yet. And he's actually going to go back down towards the bottom with Fishman as well. So the old school combo, the snowball of the creeps, perhaps, could be coming into play. Couldn't find anything top, but still on this side of the map. It's not necessarily going to be any easier. Virtus Pro holding the creep wave right by the tier one. This is a tough gank to get successful. They have to time it pretty perfectly with this refraction, so see if they can get the angle. Yeah, it's not look easy that, yeah, whatsoever. Diving this tower does not feel good. No. And they also now know Pango is missing from mid lane, so there's a chance also that if he does make a rotation down, even not level six, could be a bit scary. I mean, Fishman's still waiting. They're looking for a movement. Kiritish. He's got the melt down. set up. He's just going to have the backup of FNG charging across over towards Gabby. Gabby turns with the Fisher. Got the Ghost as well in and hitting in on security, slowing him down. Sunstrike. They're bringing him low. So they can quite finish him off. Another melt. They can. Messi and the sentry's prepared. Gabby slaps him down. They can maybe turn for FNG as well. As Gabby Ghost. Fishman chase him down. There's no escape for FNG. Double kill for Gabby as Fishman's patience pays off. What a play. I mean, the Ghost. Look at that slow that comes in. He was ready with the sentry. Absolutely. Perfectly done. So sort of similar stuff, right, that we saw in the in the Celery game on the channel, right? That's yes. The Ghost early game, early yeah. laning stage. It's pretty brutal. And that's a big deal because they did draft themselves in a way for lanes on the side of EP. And right now, the lanes definitely looking in favor of the side of Entity with these small little moves. Gabby now set up for success to get six perhaps before that TA even. Yeah, I mean, th those two kills are huge. It's going to put him well on the way towards the blink. Half halfway already on the, the goal for the blink dagger. Mm -hmm. Those two kills. And yeah, top of the board on net worth. Yeah, and I love that we see, I mean, it's, of course, as you said, you know, most comfortable here on the Invoker. He's got his three points wex, gets that one little value point for the Exhort. All these things do matter. That little extra damage onto that TA. Now, Virtus Pro looks like they're going to shift their attention up towards the top. Let me see if they themselves can set up for something. FNG and Sayish ready to back up notice. They're going to try and lead in over towards the Tusk. They've got any further control. Kato, he might even actually be able to turn. He turns Ooh, the and gets caught by a bash. So versus Pro able to make something happen out of their own movement. As it is, though, just a support kill. No snowball for you. Tried to hold it as long as he could, but that bash does get him. Two to three. I mean, that was the top lane. When you look at the, the other sort of areas of the map, is there anywhere else the Virtus Pro can make his place? I mean, Stormstormer. Mid, mid for sure. They have level six on Pango. TP backup is going to be coming in, but it's a lot of stun, a lot of bash, a lot of control. And Stormstormer, he cannot walk away from that one. Getting punished there. Stepping up a little too far, getting a bit too cocky. Ah, yeah, definitely too far, especially because Spiritbreaker just went missing from top, right? Yeah. Versus Squad X is now level six. Should be able to set himself up also for a rune. It'll spawn top, though. But a charge coming in, Katomi. Any time to snowball, he will. This time around, he'll be able to play his way over towards the mid, but Squadix is there waiting for him. As they dive forward, swashbuckle in. Katomi tries to push them back with his shards. And they'll still take him down. Sayish there with a the double damage right click, finishes off the job. Another kill to be found by Versus Pro around the mid. Nicely done. Looking to play around that mid hero instead of playing around their Doom and TA right now. It looks to be a bit of a better answer. Arcane Boots finished up. Very nice versus that Quaswex Invoker. Gabby's timing, though, for his blink is the one thing I'm looking at. It's this is be strong. It's insane how fast it is with the lane that he was put up against, right? He's in a double melee lane versus a Spirit Breaker TA. He is going to have it. He's going to be probably one of the most farmed heroes in the game. So this could cause some big repercussions in this. I mean, it's going to be 10 minutes in. He hasn't finished. So don't think they'll expect that coming out from the side of uh, VP. I mean, what once that's there, where do you think Gabby and Entity as a whole are going to be looking for that first big hit? Are you trying to set up and back up to get the jump on Kiritish bottom, or, or would you look somewhere else for the easier kill? That's a good question. Could, could maybe be mid, honestly. If they want to go for the more priority tower, then he can just get a catch, because it's not going to be expected, the fact that he's going to be able to get it. But we'll have to see where they want to make that move. Right now, they're actually dragging Stormstormer toward bottom, so maybe it is going to be for that TA. All right, yeah, Stormstormer and Katsomi on the way down towards the bottom. It's a tough one to get, though. Like, the positioning that he's going to be, he's going to be very deep, far away for the Earthshaker to catch up. I mean, they're going to have a pretty good read of what, what camp he's on with how far away from the... You know, how, how long he's been away from that bottom wave, bottom lane. Tough for just the two of them to go for him. If they have the third, and then perhaps Fishman... Then they'd have the way to be able to break that refraction quickly and actually go for it, but... Not going to be the case. They'll just settle for the tower pressure. That should be a tower that Versus Pro will let fall. 
I yep. can't imagine they'll put too many resources and, in trying to hold this. And I imagine Gabby, I, I say I imagine this, I think he's going to hide himself. He's not I imagine he's not going to show it, right? Show it. No, he's yeah, he's going to. Uh, ah. The trap actually saw the That's crew, true, and they set the trap over the crew, so they were looking. They were looking, so. Uh, they probably know that that blink dagger's there waiting for Gabby, yep. so unlikely to catch Virtus Pro by surprise, despite the fast timing. Ten minutes, honestly, that is abs With Arcane Boots and Abrasive, that is absurdly fast. Level 8, too. It's not like he's low level. It's not like he's just level 6. He's very high level as well. See what connection he's going to be able to find with it. Because so far, though, even though those lanes for Anthony looking good, the gold right now for the side of VP, it did trickle to that 2k for a quick second there. Getting some good efficiency. Yeah, they don't quite have a, a smoke on them. I think Katom is getting one shipped out towards the bottom lane. So okay. we'll have to wait if they want to make a smoke play around this Gabby Blink Dagger. Accurate you know, he's feeling confident when he's able to sort of sit mid and farm this way. Doesn't oh, yeah. feel that there's anything that they can throw at him right now that's going to threaten him as a TA. I mean, they're just farming the map completely right now. Pugna stacking, or getting some uh, ancient stacks at the ready. FNG also was kind of just sitting, waiting for an opportunity, maybe breaking smokes. They're just playing the farm game. Midas has started to get queued up, of course, noticed. We'll be able to build Squatics. up that one. Squadix. He's actually going to find Gabby and start to tease around with him down bottom. See if Gabby's able to make his way out of this one. Could be a bit tricky, Squadix. He's, blink. He's got a rev up here with the Rolling Thunder, but Gab yeah, with the blink, Gabby should be fine. He has got further back up, and indeed, Squadix doesn't want to keep chasing. Might get turned on here. Smoke from Katomi that you mentioned from before. Gabby looking to make a hit. They always have the Sunstrike as well, too, so a bit of burst. He's two supports. Gabby! It's a good target. An easy jump straight away onto the two of them with the slam. Very and nice. he'll take down Sayesh. FNG's going to try and escape this, but the shards from Katsumi will trap him in. I mean, they kind of walked into that one, Fog. They, they oh, knew yeah. that there was a Shaker with a blink around. I guess they didn't quite expect to, him to be waiting up by the Twin Gate, but he was. That was uh, one of the easiest slams Gabby would have done. It is the two supports, though. So that's probably the one thing that they're taking from it. They're probably like, okay, Echo Slam's on cooldown. You, Cores, you guys are safe, but catching the two supports, well worth it for Entity. Well worth it for Gabby. Yeah, easy jump for him. Looks like he's oh, yeah. going to the, the blink straight into the Lincoln Sphere. Okay, I mean, they're looking for the Doom Solutions very yep. early on, I guess. It's got to be a very farmy mid game that we've been coming. Getting very used to at this tournament. Even this Chad is going to be hitting some creeps with Solar Crest for some time. No, all the Midas's are getting queued up. How many total are we going to have in this one? Probably a lot. Probably at least like two or three, I guess. I mean, for VP in these sort of positions where, as you say, they've obviously got the Doom, the, the TA that wants to be hitting creeps. When you look at their supports with the Pango and what they're up against, is it easy for those three heroes to make aggressive moves, trying trying to get in onto Entity's half of the map? What's yeah, I would I would say so. Just because they have like this, they have the Pango. They have a lot of early aggressive heroes that can get involved too. And TA is an early mid game hero, so I think the Midas is fine. Now they'll go and look to try and take down Fishman. Offensive no Snowball comes into play, and they do have TP backup coming in. Squadix tries to get the connection onto Fishman, does find it. They'll knock back Katom with the old, but Katom is able to pop the stick and walk this one off. FNG into the tower. FNG goes down. A failed attempt there from VP around the mid that gets immediately punished by Entity with the TPs. Five heroes rotating from Entity. I mean, they're looking to play, make these plays happen. They've got Gabby with this Blink Dagger, so I think he's going to look to be incredibly active on this Earthshaker. Get that space opened up for the Morphling to have that success. Feel like for VP, they're probably still going to look to play fast, even though they are going for like this Doom Midas and stuff like that. Kirtich yeah. is having an amazing game. And he's actually going to maybe get involved. The smoke is popped. No, oh, no, okay. He, he's no, going to take it off and yep. start hitting the Ancients. He's not interested in making these sort of moves. I wonder, uh, but notice he is. You know, They yeah. want to get him, get some usage done with that ultimate on the Doom. I'm wondering if Kirtich does opt to go for the early shard that we usually see these TAs. Since he's playing versus the Morphling and stuff, it does feel like it has some value. Right now, he has the Blink. Don't storm up. Up. He's not. Ooh, that was a very, very fast. Very cool Quick Ghost Walk response there from Stormstormer. He walks it off. Meanwhile, other side of the map, Gabby, he's able to find Sayesh. In the return, though, he will fall. Kiritish able to turn with the Arbor. help of Squadix to take him down. Stormstormer keeps his distance, gets the ice wall down. So we'll manage to walk away one for one. Uh, Kiritish will take that all day. It's an echo slam to kill this Pugnan, and he comes in and gets a big cleanup kill. So I mean, that, that was insane happy. reactions as well, because he didn't have vision on the high ground up top either, did he, Stormstormer? I don't, I don't believe so. It's just like absolutely instant. Very, very quick reactions. Now, without that, he would have been dead for sure if they caught him with the Doom. 
always moments for VP if they do find any early kills right now with this Deso finished up. They can easily go for these Brocious early on. FNG, he's pretty dead. Free kill for Watson. Bit of a suicide right there. <laughs> Gets punished. Unnoticed. Back in the same position. Once more, VP, they they really want to keep looking for the action. I yes. think sort of the third smoke in the last two, three minutes, or even less than that. They're yeah. just go, go, go. Hasn't been complete success really with the last few plays. See if they're any luckier this time around. Squadix and Sayesh looking to get deep into Entity's half of the map. They have this, great ways. This to... man's not really a kill that they want to settle for, though. No. 